Section 1 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, A History of the World in Story, Song, and Art. Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 1. An August Morning with Farragut by w h overend american painter painting frontispiece in eighteen sixty four admiral farragut decided to attack the city of mobile and destroy the blockade runners that infested that port early on the morning of august fifth he sailed into the bay mobile was defended by fort morgan and fort gaines several gunboats and the ram tennessee and the entrance to the harbor was closed by torpedoes and piles the union fleet sailed over the torpedoes with the loss of but one ship passed the forts dispersed the confederate vessels and forced the tennessee to surrender after a severe engagement soon after the forts invested by a land force surrendered and the port was effectually closed the desperate character of the battle may be inferred from the spirited orders given by admiral farragut when preparing for the engagement these were as follows strip your vessels and prepare for the conflict send down all your superfluous bars and rigging trice up or remove the whiskers footnote rods extending on either side of the bowsprit to spread the jib End of footnote. put up the splinter nets on the starboard side and barricade the wheel and steersman with sails and hammocks lay chains or sandbags on the deck over the machinery to resist a plunging fire hang the sheet chains over the side or make any other arrangement for security that your ingenuity may suggest it will be the object of the admiral to get as close to the fort as possible before opening fire the ships however will open fire the moment the enemy opens upon us with their chase and other guns as fast as they can be brought to bear use short fuses for the shell and shrapnel and as soon as within three or four hundred yards give them grape if one or more of the vessels be disabled their partners must carry them through if possible but if they cannot then the next astern must render the required assistance the howitzers must keep up a constant fire from the time they can reach with shrapnel until out of its range end of section one this recording is in the public domain Section 2 of the United States Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The United States, Volume 2, Part 1 The Colonies Win Their Freedom Historical Note In the Middle States, affairs were going badly for the Continentals. In September 1777, the British won the Battle of Brandywine and captured Philadelphia. After an unsuccessful attack on the British lines at Germantown, Washington went into winter quarters at Valley Forge, where the army suffered cruelly from cold and hunger. But meanwhile the capture of Burgoyne's army had shown Europe that the colonies were a worthy foe for the mother country, and in February 1778 France struck a blow at her ancient enemy by recognizing the United States and sending a fleet and army to aid them in their struggle for independence. After the evacuation of Philadelphia by the British in the summer of 1778, the scene of warfare shifted to the southern colonies. Here the British at first met with complete success. In 1779 and 1780, Georgia and South Carolina were overrun by their forces, and in June 1780, the American army under Gates was so badly defeated at the Battle of Camden that for some time after the only resistance in the South was by partisan bands under such leaders as general marion in the same year benedict arnold's plot to surrender west point to the british was discovered this period was perhaps the darkest of the whole war but with the destruction of a british force at king's mountain by the backwoodsmen of carolina the tide of victory turned against the british gates was replaced by green and after a brilliant campaign the new commander succeeded in driving the british from carolina when the summer of seventeen eighty one arrived cornwallis commander of the british forces in virginia was at yorktown expecting the english ships the only force opposing him was under lafayette 
whom Cornwallis called the boy. Suddenly Washington made one of his unexpected moves and appeared before Yorktown with a large army. At the same time, a strong French fleet cut off all hope of succor from the sea. On the 19th of October, 1781, Cornwallis surrendered and the colonies were free, although it was not until September 3, 1783, that the formal treaty of peace was signed. End of section 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 3. Congress and Valley Forge, 1777 to 1778. By John Fisk. The army suffered under drawbacks which were immediately traceable to the incapacity of Congress. Just as afterwards in the War of Secession the soldiers had often to pay the penalty for the sins of the politicians. A single specimen of the ill-timed meddling of Congress may serve as an example. At one of the most critical moments of the year 1777, Congress made a complete change in the commissariat which had hitherto been efficiently managed by a single officer, Colonel Joseph Trumbull. Two commissary generals were now appointed, one of whom was to superintend the purchase and the other the issue of supplies, and the subordinate officers of the department were to be accountable, not to their superiors, but directly to Congress. This was done in spite of the earnest opposition of Washington, and the immediate result was just what he expected. Colonel Trumbull, who had been retained as commissary general for purchases, being unable to do his work properly without controlling his subordinate officers, soon resigned his place. The department was filled up with men selected without reference to fitness, and straightway fell into hopeless confusion, whereby the movements of the armies were grievously crippled for the rest of the season. On the 22nd of December, Washington was actually prevented from executing a most promising movement against General Howe, because two brigades had become mutinous for want of food. For three days they had gone without bread, and for two days without meat. The quartermaster's department was in no better condition. The dreadful sufferings of Washington's army at Valley Forge have called forth the pity and the admiration of historians. But the point of the story is lost, unless we realize that this misery resulted from gross mismanagement rather than from the poverty of the country. As the poor soldiers marched on the 17th of December to their winter quarters, their route could be traced on the snow by the blood that oozed from bare, frost-bitten feet. Yet at the same moment, says Gordon, hogsheads of shoes, stockings, and clothing were lying at different places on the roads and in the woods, perishing for want of teams or of money to pay the teamsters. On the 23rd, Washington informed Congress that he had in camp 2,898 men, unfit for duty, because they are barefoot and otherwise naked. For want of blankets, many were fain to sit up all night by fires, instead of taking comfortable rest in a natural and common way. Cold and hunger daily added many to the sick list, and in the crowded hospitals, which were for the most part mere log huts or frail wigwams, woven of twisted boughs, Men sometimes died for want of straw to put between themselves and the frozen ground on which they lay. In the deficiency of oxen and draft horses, gallant men volunteered to serve as beasts of burden, and yoking themselves to wagons, dragged into camp such meagre supplies as they could obtain for their sick and exhausted comrades. So great was the distress that there were times when, in case of an attack by the enemy, scarcely two thousand men could have been got under arms. When one thinks of these sad consequences wrought by a negligent quartermaster and a deranged commissariat, one is strongly reminded of the remark once made by the eccentric Charles Lee, when with caustic alliteration he described Congress as a stable of stupid cattle that stumbled at every step. End of section 3. This recording is in the public domain. Section 4 of the United States, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. 
Baron Steuben, Drilling the Colonial Troops at Valley Forge by Edwin A. Abbey, American Artist, 1852 Painting, page 4 In 1777, the French government was seriously contemplating giving aid to the American colonies in their struggle for independence. It was clear that, brave as were the colonial troops, they had little organization or training, and the French sent over Baron von Steuben, one of the most experienced soldiers of Germany, to remedy this lack. Washington's little army was in winter quarters at Valley Forge, cold, hungry, and in need of everything. Drilling troops was the work of a sergeant, the English had always thought, but this honored officer took a musket in his own hands and taught them. Generals, colonels, and captains were fired by the contagion of his example and his tremendous enthusiasm, says John Fisk, and for several months the camp was converted into a training school in which masters and pupils worked with incessant and furious energy. Steuben was struck with the quickness with which the common soldiers learned their lessons. He had a harmlessly choleric temper, which was part of his overflowing vigor, and sometimes, when drilling an awkward squad, he would exhaust his stock of French and German oaths and shout for his aide to come and curse the blockheads in English. Viens, mon ami Walker, he would cry. Viens, mon bon ami. Sacre bleu. God verdamme the gaucherie of these badauds. Je ne puis plus. I can curse them no more. Yet, in an incredibly short time, as he afterward wrote, these awkward fellows had acquired a military air, had learned how to carry their arms, and knew how to form into columns, deploy, and execute maneuvers with precision. End of section 4. This recording is in the public domain. Section 5 of the United States this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 5, The Message of Lydia Dara seventeen seventy seven by elizabeth f ellet on the second day of december seventeen seventy seven late in the afternoon an officer in the british uniform ascended the steps of a house in second street philadelphia immediately opposite the quarters occupied by general howe who at that time had full possession of the city the house was plain and neat in its exterior and well known to be tenanted by william and lydia dara members of the society of friends it was the place chosen by the superior officers of the army for a private conference whenever it was necessary to hold consultations on subjects of importance and selected perhaps on account of the unobtrusive character of its inmates whose religion inculcated meekness and forbearance and forbade them to practise the arts of war the officer who seemed familiar with the mansion knocked at the door it was opened and in the neatly furnished parlour he met the mistress who spoke to him calling him by name it was the adjutant-general and he appeared in haste to give an order this was to desire that the back room above stairs might be prepared for the reception that evening of himself and his friends who were to meet there and remain late and be sure lydia he concluded that your family are all in bed at an early hour i shall expect you to attend to this request when our guests are ready to leave the house i will myself give you notice that you may let us out and extinguish the fire and candles having delivered this order with an emphatic manner which showed that he relied much on the prudence and discretion of the person he addressed the adjutant-general departed lydia betook herself to getting all things in readiness but the words she had heard especially the injunction to retire early rang in her ears and she could not divest herself of the indefinable feeling that something of importance was in agitation 
while her hands were busy in the duties that devolved upon her her mind was no less actively at work the evening closed in and the officers came to the place of meeting lydia had ordered all her family to bed and herself admitted the guests after which she retired to her own apartment and threw herself without undressing upon the bed but sleep refused to visit her eyelids her vague apprehensions gradually assumed more definite shape she became more and more uneasy till her nervous restlessness amounted to absolute terror unable longer to resist the impulse not of curiosity but surely of a far higher feeling she slid from her bed and taking off her shoes passed noiselessly from her chamber and along the entry approaching cautiously the apartment in which the officers were assembled she applied her ear to the keyhole for a few moments she could distinguish but a word or two amid the murmur of voices yet what she did hear but stimulated her eager desire to learn the important secret of the conclave at length there was profound silence and a voice was heard reading a paper aloud it was an order for the troops to quit the city on the night of the fourth and march out to a secret attack upon the american army then encamped at white marsh lydia had heard enough she retreated softly to her own room and laid herself quietly on the bed in the deep stillness that reigned through the house she could hear the beating of her own heart the heart now throbbing with emotions to which no speech could give utterance it seemed to her that but a few moments had elapsed when there was a knocking at her door she knew well what the signal meant but took no heed it was repeated and more loudly still she gave no answer again and yet more loudly the knocks were repeated and then she rose quickly and opened the door it was the adjutant-general who came to inform her they were ready to depart lydia let them out fastened the house and extinguished the lights and fire again she returned to her chamber and to bed but repose was a stranger for the rest of the night her mind was more disquieted than ever she thought of the danger that threatened the lives of thousands of her countrymen and of the ruin that impended over the whole land something must be done and that immediately to avert this widespread destruction should she awaken her husband and inform him that would be to place him in special jeopardy by rendering him a partaker of her secret and he might too be less wary and prudent than herself no come what might she would encounter the risk alone after a petition for heavenly guidance her resolution was formed and she waited with composure though sleep was impossible till the dawn of day then she waked her husband and informed him flour was wanted for the use of the household and that it was necessary she should go to frankfort to procure it this was no uncommon occurrence and her declining the attendance of the maid-servant excited little surprise taking the bag with her she walked through the snow having stopped first at headquarters obtained access to general howe and secured his written permission to pass the british lines the feelings of a wife and mother one whose religion was that of love and whose life was but a quiet round of domestic duties bound on an enterprise so hazardous and uncertain whether her life might not be the forfeit may be better imagined than described lydia reached frankfort distant four or five miles and deposited her bag at the mill now commenced the dangers of her undertaking for she pressed forward with all haste towards the outposts of the american army her determination was to apprise general washington of the danger she was met on her way by an american officer who had been selected by general washington to gain information respecting the movements of the enemy according to some authorities this was lieutenant colonel craig of the light horse he immediately recognized her and inquired whither she was going in reply she prayed him to alight and walk with her which he did ordering his men to keep in sight to him she disclosed the secret after having obtained from him 
a solemn promise not to betray her individuality since the british might take vengeance on her and her family the officer thanked her for her timely warning and directed her to go to a house near at hand where she might get something to eat but lydia preferred returning at once and did so while the officer made all haste to the commander-in-chief preparations were immediately made to give the enemy a fitting reception with a heart lightened and filled with thankfulness the intrepid woman pursued her way homeward carrying the bag of flour which had served as the ostensible object of her journey none suspected the grave demure quakeress of having snatched from the english their anticipated victory her demeanour was as usual quiet orderly and subdued and she attended to the duties of her family with her wonted composure but her heart beat as late on the appointed night she watched from her window the departure of the army on what secret expedition bound she knew too well she listened breathlessly to the sound of their footsteps and the trampling of horses till it died away in the distance and silence reigned through the city time never appeared to pass so slowly as during the interval which elapsed between the marching out and the return of the british troops when at last the distant roll of the drum proclaimed their approach when the sounds came nearer and nearer and lydia who was watching at the window saw the troops pass in martial order the agony of anxiety she felt was too much for her strength and she retreated from her post not daring to ask a question or manifest the least curiosity as to the event a sudden and loud knocking at her door was not calculated to lessen her apprehensions she felt that the safety of her family depended on her self-possession at this critical moment the visitor was the adjutant-general who summoned her to his apartment with a pale cheek but composed for she placed her trust in a higher power lydia obeyed the summons the officer's face was clouded and his expression stern he locked the door with an air of mystery when lydia entered and motioned her to a seat after a moment of silence he said were any of your family up lydia on the night when i received company in this house no was the unhesitating reply they all retired at eight o'clock it is very strange said the officer and mused a few minutes you i know lydia were asleep for i knocked at your door three times before you heard me yet it is certain that we were betrayed i am altogether at a loss to conceive who could have given the information of our intended attack to general washington on arriving near his encampment we found his cannon mounted his troops under arms and so prepared at every point to receive us that we have been compelled to march back without injuring our enemy like a parcel of fools it is not known whether the officer ever discovered to whom he was indebted for the disappointment but the pious quakeress blessed god for her preservation and rejoiced that it was not necessary for her to utter an untruth in her own defence and all who admire examples of courage and patriotism especially those who enjoy the fruit of them must honour the name of lydia dara end of section five this recording is in the public domain section six of the united states read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone molly pitcher seventeen eighty seven by kate brownlee sherwood twas hurry and scurry at monmouth town for lee was beating a wild retreat the british were riding the yankees down and panic was pressing on flying feet galloping down like a hurricane washington rode with his sword swung high mighty as he of the trojan plain fired by a courage from the sky halt and stand by the guns he cried and a bombardier made swift reply 
wheeling his comrades into the tide, he fell neath the shot of a foeman nigh. Molly Pitcher sprang to his side, fired as she saw her husband do, telling the king in his stubborn pride, women like men to their homes are true. Washington rode from the bloody fray up to the gun that a woman manned. Molly Pitcher, you saved the day, he said as he gave her a hero's hand. He named her sergeant with manly praise. Her war-brown face was wet with tears. A woman has ever a woman's ways. And the army was wild with cheers. End of section 6 this recording is in the public domain. Section 7 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 7. The Capture of Major Andre, 1780, by Jared Sparks. Benedict Arnold, a trusted officer in the Continental Army, offered for a large sum of money and a commission in the British Army to betray to the British West Point, the strongest fort on the Hudson River. Major Andre, a young British officer, was sent by the English to meet an agent of Arnold and make the final arrangements. The following extract tells the story of his capture. He was hanged as a spy, but everyone wished that the traitor Arnold could have been in his place. The Editor When he, Andre, and Smith, his guide, a loyalist, separated, it seemed to have been understood that Andre would pursue the route through White Plains and thence to New York. But after crossing Pines Bridge, he changed his mind and took what was called the Tarrytown Road. He was probably induced to this step by the remarks he had heard the evening before from Captain Boyd, who said the lower party had been far up the Tarrytown Road, and it was dangerous to proceed that way. As the lower party belonged to the British, and Andre would of course be safe in their hands, it was natural for him to infer that he should be among friends sooner in that direction than in the other. A law of the State of New York authorized any person to seize and convert to his own use all cattle or beef that should be driven or removed from the country in the direction of the city beyond a certain line in Westchester County. By military custom also, the personal effects of prisoners taken by small parties were assigned to the captors as a prize. It happened that on the same morning on which Andre crossed Pines Bridge, seven persons who resided near Hudson River on the neutral ground agreed voluntarily to go out in company armed, watch the road, and intercept any suspicious stragglers or droves of cattle that might be seen passing toward New York. Four of this party were stationed on a hill where they had a view of the road for a considerable distance. The three others, named John Paulding, David Williams, and Isaac Van Wart, were concealed in the bushes at another place and very near the road. About a half mile north of the village of Tarrytown, and a few hundred yards from the bank of Hudson River, the road crosses a small brook, from each side of which the ground rises into a hill, and it was at that time covered over with trees and underbrush. Eight or ten rods south of this brook, and on the west side of the road, these men were hidden and at that point Andre was stopped, after having traveled from Pines Bridge without interruption. The particulars of this event I shall here introduce, as they are narrated in the testimony given by Paulding and Williams at Smith's trial, written down at the time by the judge advocate, and preserved in manuscript among other papers. This testimony having been taken only eleven days after the capture of Andre, when every circumstance must have been fresh in the recollection of his captors, it may be regarded as exhibiting a greater exactness in its details than any account hitherto published. In answer to the question of the court, Paulding said, Myself, Isaac Van Wart, and David Williams were lying by the side of the road about half a mile above Tarrytown and about 15 miles above Kingsbridge on Saturday morning between 9 and 10 o'clock, the 23rd of September. We had lain there about an hour and a half as near as I can recollect, 
and saw several persons we were acquainted with, whom we let pass. Presently, one of the young men who were with me said, There comes a gentleman-like looking man, who appears to be well-dressed and has boots on, and you would better step out and stop if you don't know him. On that I got up, and presented my firelock at the breast of the person, and told him to stand, and then I asked him which way he was going. Gentlemen, said he, I hope you belong to our party. I asked him what party. He said, the lower party. Upon that I told him I did. Then he said, I am a British officer out of the country on particular business, and I hope you will not detain me a minute. And to show that he was a British officer, he pulled out his watch, upon which I told him to dismount. He then said, My God, I must do anything to get along, and seemed to make a kind of laugh of it, and pulled out General Arnold's pass, which was to John Anderson, to pass all guards to White Plains and below. Upon that he dismounted. Said he, Gentlemen, you'd best let me go, or you'll bring yourselves into trouble, for your stopping me will detain the general's business. And said he was going to Dobbs Ferry to meet a person there and get intelligence for General Arnold. Upon that, I told him I hoped he would not be offended, that we did not mean to take anything from him, and I told him there were many bad people who were going along the road, and I did not know, but perhaps he might be one. When further questioned, Paulding replied that he asked the person his name, who told him it was John Anderson, and that when Anderson produced General Arnold's pass, he should have let him go, if he had not before called himself a British officer. Paulding also said that when the person pulled out his watch, he understood it as a signal that he was a British officer, and that he meant to offer it to him as a present. All these particulars were substantially confirmed by David Williams, whose testimony in regard to the searching of Andre, being more unique than Paulding's, is here inserted. We took him into the bushes, said Williams, and ordered him to pull off his clothes, which he did, but on searching him narrowly, we could not find any sort of writings. We told him to pull off his boots, which he seemed to be indifferent about. But we got one boot off and searched in that boot and could find nothing. But we found there were some papers in the bottom of the stocking next to his foot, on which we made him pull his stocking off and found three papers wrapped up. Mr. Paulding looked at the contents and said he was a spy. We then made him pull off his other boot, and there we found three more papers at the bottom of his foot within his stocking. Upon this, we made him dress himself, and I asked him what he would give us to let him go. He said he would give us any sum of money. I asked him whether he would give us his horse, saddle, bridle, watch, and one hundred guineas. He said yes, and told us he would direct them to any place, even if it was that very spot, so that we could get them. I asked him whether he would not give us more. He said he would give us any quantity of dry goods, or any sum of money, and bring it to any place that we might pitch upon, so that we might get it. Mr. Paulding answered, No, if you would give us one thousand guineas, you should not stir one step. I then asked the person who had called himself John Anderson, if he would not get away if it lay in his power. He answered, Yes, I would. I told him I did not intend he should. While taking him along, we asked him a few questions, and we stopped under a shade. He begged us not to ask him questions, and said when he came to any commander, he would reveal all. He was dressed in a blue overcoat and a tight body coat that was of a kind of claret color, though a rather deeper red than claret. The buttonholes were laced with gold tinsel, and the buttons drawn over with the same kind of lace. He had on a round hat and nankeen waistcoat and breeches, with a flannel waistcoat and drawers, boots, and thread stockings. The nearest military post was at North Castle where Lieutenant Colonel Jameson was stationed with a part of Sheldon's Regiment of Dragoons. To that place it was resolved to take the prisoner, and within a few hours he was delivered up to Jameson with all the papers that had been taken from his boots. End of Section 7. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 8 of The United States this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 8. A Visit to General Marion, 1781, by Charles Carlton Coffin. 
General Marion was north of Charleston, not far from the Santee River, when a British officer came with a flag of truce to see him about exchanging prisoners, and was taken into the camp blindfolded. The officer had heard much about Marion, and instead of finding, as he had expected, a man of noble presence in an elegant uniform, he saw a small, thin man in homespun clothes. Around were Marion's soldiers, some of them almost naked, some in British uniforms which they had captured, a motley set with all kinds of weapons, large muskets, rifles, shotguns, swords made by country blacksmiths from millsaws. The business upon which the officer had come was soon settled. "'Shall I have the honor of your company to dinner?' said Marion. The officer saw no preparation for dinner. A fire was burning, but there were no camp kettles, no Dutch ovens, no cooking utensils. "'Give us our dinner, Tom,' said Marion to one of his men. Tom was the cook. He dug open the fire with a stick and poked out a fine mess of sweet potatoes. He pricked the large ones to see if they were done, blew the ashes from them, wiped them on his shirt sleeve, placed the best ones on a piece of bark, and laid them on the log between Marion and the officer. I fear our dinner will not prove so palatable to you as I could wish, but it is the best we have, said Marion. The British officer was a gentleman and ate of the potatoes, but soon began to laugh. I was thinking, he said, what some of my brother officers would say if our government were to give such a bill of fare as this. I suppose this is only an accidental dinner. Not so, for often we don't get even this. Though stinted in provisions, you of course draw double pay. Not a cent, sir. We don't have any pay. We are fighting for our liberty. The officer was astonished. They had a long and friendly talk, and the officer, bidding Mary and goodbye, went back to Georgetown. Colonel Watson was in command of the British there. What makes you look so serious? Colonel Watson asked. I have cause to look serious, the officer replied. Has Marion refused to treat? No, sir, but I have seen an American general and his officers, without pay, almost without clothes, living on roots and drinking water, and all for liberty. What chance have we against such men? The officer was so impressed by what he had seen that he could fight no more, but disposed of his commission and returned to England. General Green sent Marion and Lee south to get between the British and Charleston and cut off their supplies. They marched to Fort Watson, a strong fortification on the east bank of the Santee River, about 50 miles north of Charleston. It was built of logs, stood on a hill, and was garrisoned by 120 men commanded by Lieutenant McKay. They sent him a message to surrender, but he was a brave officer, and informed them that he intended to defend the fort. He knew that Lord Rawdon would soon be there to aid him with several hundred men. Marion and Lee knew that Lord Rawdon was on the march, and they resolved to capture the fort before he arrived. They saw that there was no well in the fort, and that the garrison had to come out and creep down to the river to obtain water. The riflemen soon stopped that. Then McKay set his men at work digging a well, and carried it down to the level of the lake and had a good supply of water. Lee and Marion knew that there was a large amount of supplies inside the fort, for besides what was inside, there were boxes and barrels outside. Some of the militia tried to creep up and get a barrel, but the garrison killed one and wounded another. A brave Negro named Billy, with Marion, looked at the supplies, saw that one of the hogsheads was only a few feet from the edge of the bluff, and resolved to try what he could do. He crept very near without being seen. Then, before the British could fire upon him, he was crouched behind the hogshead. The ground was a declivity, and soon the British soldiers saw that the hogshead was in motion. They fired at it, but they could only see some black fingers clasping the chims, and in a few minutes the hogshead disappeared down the hill. Billy obtained an axe, broke open the hogshead, and found that he had captured 150 shirts, 100 knapsacks, 50 blankets, and 6 cloaks. He distributed them to the soldiers, many of whom had no shirts. Marion named the Negro Captain Billy, and everyone treated the brave fellow with great respect. Rawdon was close at hand. Marion and Lee could see the light of his campfires on the hills in the west. Whatever was done must be done quickly. But what could they do? They had no cannon, and even if they had, they could not batter down the fort. But a brighter thought came to Colonel Mahan, to build a tower which would overlook the fortification. As soon as night came, all the axes in the camp were in use. The British could hear the choppers and wondered what was going on. 
but they were astonished in the morning when they saw a tower higher than the fort and a swarm of men on the top firing through loopholes and picking off with their rifles every man who showed his head above the parapet lord rawdon had not come and lieutenant mackay saw that he would soon lose all his men and that he must surrender before noon the americans were in possession of the fort and all its supplies end of section eight this recording is in the public domain recording by colleen mcmahon section nine of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section nine when cornwallis surrendered seventeen eighty one by burton egbert stevenson spring and summer sped by quietly enough with much visiting back and forth but one crisp morning in early october our neighbor of berkeley rode up to our door and plunged at once into the heart of the business which had brought him you know i suppose mrs randolph he began that that old fox cornwallis is caught at last at yorktown and must soon surrender yes thank god said my mother "'Twill be such a sight as may never again be witnessed in America. "'I am going to take my boy to see it, "'and I should be glad to have yours, too, if you'll let him go.' "'Oh, mother!' I cried. "'She looked at us a moment with frightened eyes. "'Take my boy into the midst of the fighting?' she protested. "'Oh, not so bad as that, madam,' laughed Mr. Harrison. "'We will view it all from a perfectly safe distance. "'I will answer for that. "'May he go?' I think his good humor and courtesy, as much as the passionate pleading in my eyes, won her over. "'Would you like to go, Stuart?' she asked, and I knew from her look that she consented. "'Right, madam,' cried our visitor heartily, as I threw my arms about her. "'You are right not to deny the boy.' My cup of happiness was full to overflowing, and as we rolled away that afternoon in the great Harrison coach— i fear it was only my mother who wept at parting that was an enchanted journey down the peninsula and i was almost sorry that it had come to an end when toward evening of the second day we rumbled up to oldham mr samuel harrison's place some few miles above yorktown on the river such a sight as awaited us the next morning when we were led forth to view the contending armies from the top of a little hill near the bank of the york which the french had evacuated the day before in their advance we could see a great part of their position quite clearly on the right were our troops with the artillery in the centre near the commander's quarters there the french lines began artillery first and then the infantry stretching to the very bank of the river below us Away in the distance we could dimly see the British works closely girdling the little town, and still beyond this a half-dozen British men-of-war lay anchored in the stream. Far out on the bay we could just discern the white sails of the blockading squadron of French ships. Mr. Harrison pointed out to us how our troops were ever creeping nearer and nearer to the British works, but he had more important things to do, so he left us presently, confiding us to the care of old Shad, and warning us not to leave the hillock where we were stationed. We had small wish to do so, and we sat for hours looking at the scene, until suddenly, away on the right, the artillery began to thunder. The fire ran along the line until every battery, American and French alike, was pouring shot and shell into the British works as fast as the sweating men could serve the guns. The enemy replied but feebly, and after a time fell silent altogether. A dense cloud of smoke settled over the ramparts and was carried slowly out to sea, where it lay banked against the horizon like a great thundercloud. We ate the lunch that Shad had brought for us, and spent the afternoon watching the cannonading. 
Mr. Harrison came back to us as evening fell, but we tarried where we were with no thought of dinner, for the French battery near the river had opened upon the British ships with red-hot ball, and presently we saw one of them wrapped in a torrent of flame. The fire spread with amazing speed, running along the rigging and to the very tops of the mass, while all around was thunder and lightning from the cannon. Even as we gazed, there came a blinding flash of flame that rent the ship asunder, and ten seconds later a mighty roar, which told us the fire had reached the magazine. The blazing fragments fell back one by one into the river and disappeared. "'Come, boys, we must be going,' said Mr. Harrison at last, and we followed him, awed and silent." Another British ship was set in flames next day, and in the three days that followed we could see our soldiers working like beavers in the trenches, which advanced every hour nearer the enemy. Meanwhile, all Virginia had come to see the spectacle, and on the morning of the 17th was gathered in a great throng exultantly watching the work of our batteries, when, of a sudden, the firing ceased. A murmur of anxiety ran through the crowd. "'What is it? What has happened?' asked everyone, looking fearfully into his neighbor's face. "'Could it be that, after all, the prize was to escape? "'Some thought that the munitions had run out. "'Some that the French ships had been driven away, and a great force under Clinton landed. "'But presently came word that Cornwallis had had enough and asked a parley.' What joy there was that night at every board within reach of the good news, and in what mighty bumpers did loyal Virginia drink the health of the first of Virginians and his men. How shall I describe the stirring spectacle which took place next afternoon? To the right of the Hampton Road, the Patriot Army was drawn up, veterans of six years' service, with torn and faded regimentals, while to the left, facing them, were the French, brilliant as toy soldiers. Down the road, for more than a mile, stretched this living avenue. Presently there broke forth a great storm of cheering, and I saw the tears rolling unchecked down Mr. Harrison's face as he gazed at a man sitting a white charger, riding slowly along the line. "'Tis the general,' he whispered. "'This is his hour of triumph and reward. God knows how he has earned it. Near him, on a great bay horse, rode General Rochambeau, gorgeous in white and gold. He was, no doubt, a gallant soldier, and great general, but there was something in the quiet dignity of the other which caught and held the eye, which fired the imagination, which needed no ornament to set it forth. Men and women sobbed aloud as they saw him there that day, and cheered between their sobs like mad things, and thanked the God that had given him to America. Then a great silence fell upon the crowd. There came the beat of a drum from the British line, and the conquered troops marched slowly out of their entrenchments, seven thousand of them and more, their colors cased, their arms reversed. Colors and arms alike were surrendered to the victors, while the regimental bands played a quaint old air, forgot these many years, the world turned upside down. End of Section 9 This recording is in the public domain. Section 10 of the United States This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 10. George III Acknowledges the Independence of the Colonies. 1782. By Elkanah Watson. Soon after my arrival in England, having won at the insurance office one hundred guineas on the event of Lord Howe's relieving Gibraltar, and dining the same day with Copley, the distinguished painter, who was a Bostonian by birth, I determined to devote the sum to a splendid portrait of myself. 
The painting was finished in most admirable style, except the background, which Copley and I designed to represent a ship, bearing to America the intelligence of the acknowledgment of independence, with a sun just rising upon the stripes of the Union, streaming from her gaff. All was complete save the flag, which Copley did not deem prudent to hoist under present circumstances, as his gallery is a constant resort of the royal family and the nobility. I dined with the artist on the glorious 5th of December, 1782, after listening with him to the speech of the king, formally recognizing the United States of America as in the rank of nations. Previous to dining, and immediately after our return from the House of Lords, he invited me into his studio, and there, with a bold hand, a master's touch, and, I believe, an American heart, attached to the ship the Stars and Stripes. This was, I imagine, the first American flag hoisted in Old England. At an early hour on the 5th of December, 1782, in conformity with previous arrangements, I was conducted by the Earl of Ferrers to the very entrance of the House of Lords. At the door he whispered, Get as near the throne as you can. Fear nothing. I did so, and found myself exactly in front of it, elbow to elbow with the celebrated Admiral Lord Howe. The lords were promiscuously standing as I entered. It was a dark and foggy day, and the windows being elevated and constructed in the antiquated style, with leaden bars to contain the diamond-cut panes of glass, increase the gloom. The walls were hung with dark tapestry, representing the defeat of the Spanish Armada. I had the pleasure of recognizing in the crowd of spectators Copley and West the painter with some American ladies. I saw also some dejected American royalists in the group. After waiting nearly two hours, the approach of the king was announced by a tremendous roar of artillery. He entered by a small door on the left of the throne, and immediately seated himself upon the chair of state, in a graceful attitude, with his right foot resting upon a stool. He was clothed in royal robes. Apparently agitated, he drew from his pocket the scroll containing his speech. The commons were summoned, and after the bustle of their entrance had subsided, he proceeded to read his speech. I was near the king, and watched with intense interest every tone of his voice and expression of his countenance. After some general and usual remarks, he continued, I lost no time in giving the necessary orders to prohibit the further prosecution of offensive war upon the continent of North America, adopting, as my inclination will always lead me to do, with decision and effect, whatever I collect to be the sense of my Parliament and my people. I have pointed all my views and measures in Europe, as in North America, to an entire and cordial reconciliation with the colonies. Finding it indispensable to the attainment of this object, I did not hesitate to go to the full length of the powers vested in me, and offer to declare them, here he paused, and was in evident agitation, either embarrassed in reading his speech, by the darkness of the room, or affected by a very natural emotion. In a moment he resumed, and offer to declare them free and independent states, in thus admitting their separation from the crown of these kingdoms, I have sacrificed every consideration of my own to the wishes and opinions of my people. I make it my humble and ardent prayer to Almighty God that Great Britain may not feel the evils which might result from so great a dismemberment of the empire and that America may be free from the calamities which have formerly proved in the mother country, how essential monarchy is to the enjoyment of constitutional liberty. Religion, language, 
interests, and affection may, and I hope will, yet prove a bond of permanent union between the two countries. It is remarked that George the Third is celebrated for reading his speeches in a distinct, free, and impressive manner. On this occasion he was evidently embarrassed. He hesitated, choked, and executed the painful duties of the occasion with an ill grace that does not belong to him. I cannot adequately portray my sensations in the progress of this address. Every artery beat high and swelled with my proud American blood. It was impossible not to revert to the opposite shores of the Atlantic and to review, in my mind's eye, the misery and woe I had myself witnessed in several stages of the contest and the widespread desolation resulting from the stubbornness of this very king, now so prostrate, but who had turned a deaf ear to our humble and importunate petitions for relief. Yet I believe that George the Third acted under what he felt to be the high and solemn claims of constitutional duty. The great drama was now closed. The Battle of Lexington exhibited its first scene. The Declaration of Independence was a lofty and glorious event in its progress and the ratification of our independence by the king consummated the spectacle in triumph and exultation. This successful issue of the American Revolution will in all probability influence eventually the destinies of the whole human race. End of Section 10 This recording is in the public domain. Section 11 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 11. When Washington Resigned His Commission. 1783, by R. M. Devins. For the last time he assembled them, his soldiers, at Newburgh, when he rode out on the field, and gave them one of those paternal addresses which so eminently characterized his relationship with his army. To the tune of Roslyn Castle, the soldier's dirge, his brave comrades passed slowly by their great leader, and filed away to their respective homes. It was a thrilling scene. There were gray-headed soldiers who had grown old by hardships and exposures, and too old to begin life anew. Tears coursed freely the furrowed cheeks of these veterans. Among the thousands passing in review before him were those, also, who had done valorous service when the destiny of the country hung tremblingly in the balance. As Washington looked upon them for the last time, he said, I am growing old in my country's service and losing my sight, but I never doubted its justice or gratitude. Even on the rudest and roughest of the soldiery, the effect of his parting language was irresistible. On the 4th of December, 1783, by Washington's request, his officers in full uniform assembled in Francis Tavern, New York, to take a final leave of their commander-in-chief. On entering the room and finding himself surrounded by his old companions in arms, who had shared with him so many scenes of hardship, difficulty, and danger, his agitated feelings overcame his usual self-command. Every man arose with eyes turned towards him, Filling a glass of wine and lifting it to his lips, he rested his benignant but saddened countenance upon them and said, With a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous as your former ones have been honorable and glorious. Having drunk, he added, 
I cannot come to each of you to take my leave, but shall be obliged to you, if each of you will come and take me by the hand. A profound silence followed, as each officer gazed on the countenance of their leader, while the eyes of all were wet with tears. He then expressed again his desire that each of them should come and take him by the hand. The first being nearest to him was General Knox, who grasped his hand in silence, and both embraced each other without uttering a word. One after another followed, receiving and returning the affectionate adieu of their commander, after which he left the room in silence, followed by his officers in procession, to embark in the barge that was to convey him to Paulus Hook, now Jersey City. As he was passing through, the light infantry drawn up on either side to receive him. An old soldier, who was by his side on the terrible night of his march to Trenton, stepped out from the ranks, and reaching out his arms, exclaimed, "'Farewell, my dear general, farewell!' Washington seized his hand most heartily, when the soldiers forgot all discipline, rushed toward their chief, and bathed him with their tears." The scene was like that of a good patriarch taking leave of his children, and going on a long journey from whence he might return no more. Having entered the barge, he turned to the weeping company upon the wharf, and waving his hat, bade them a silent adieu. They stood with heads uncovered until the barge was hidden from their view, when, in silent and solemn procession, they returned to the place where they had assembled. Congress was at this time in session at Annapolis, Maryland, to which place Washington now proceeded, greeted along his whole route with enthusiastic homage for the purpose of formally resigning his commission. He arrived on the 19th of December, 1783, and the next day he informed Congress of the purpose for which he had come, and requested to know whether it would be their pleasure that he should offer his resignation in writing or at an audience. A committee was appointed by Congress, and it was decided that on Tuesday, December 23rd, the ceremonial should take place. When the hour arrived, the President, General Mifflin, informed him that that body was prepared to receive his communications. With a native dignity, heightened by the solemnity of the occasion, the General rose. In a brief and appropriate speech, he offered his congratulations on the termination of the war, and having alluded to his object in appearing thus in that presence, that he might resign into the hands of Congress the trust committed to him, and claim the indulgence of retiring from the public service. He concluded with those affecting words which drew tears from the eyes of all in that vast assembly. I consider it an indispensable duty to close this last act of my official life by commending the interests of our dearest country to the protection of Almighty God and those who have the superintendence of them to His holy keeping. Having now finished the work assigned me, I retire from the theater of action, and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body, under whose orders I have so long acted, I here offer my commission, and take my leave of all the employments of public life. After advancing to the chair, and delivering his commission to the President, he returned to his place and remained standing, while General Mifflin replied, reviewing the great career thus brought to a close, and saying in conclusion, The glory of your virtues will not terminate with your military command. It will continue to animate the remotest ages. We join with you in commending the interest of our country to Almighty God, beseeching Him to dispose the hearts and minds of its citizens to improve the opportunity afforded them of becoming a happy and respectful nation. And for you we address to Him our warmest prayers, that a life so beloved may be fostered with all His care, 
that your days may be as happy as they have been illustrious, and that he will finally give you that reward which this world cannot bestow. End of section 11. This recording is in the public domain. Section 12 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The United States, Volume 2, Part 2. Life in Revolutionary Days. Historical Note. At the commencement of the Revolution, the colonists of America were husbandmen, merchants, mechanics, and fishermen, who were occupied in the ordinary duties of their respective callings, and were sober, honest, and industrious. But when the struggle for independence began, new fields for exertion were opened, and a great change was suddenly wrought in the American people. Many who were before only known in the humble sphere of peaceful occupations soon shone forth in the cabinet or in the field. The war, too, did much to wear away local peculiarities and prejudices. But the revolution introduced at the same time greater looseness of manners and morals. An army always carries deep vices in its train, and communicates its corruption to society around it. Besides this, the failure of public credit so far put it out of the power of individuals to perform private engagements, that the breach of them became common, and at length were scarcely disgraceful. Education suffered, in common with other kindred interests. In several colleges the course of instruction was suspended, the hall was exchanged for the camp, and the gown for the sword and epaulette. After the war, interest in education revived, and before the end of the period several colleges and other institutions of learning were established in different sections of the country. During the war, the commerce of the United States was suppressed, but it revived on the return of peace. Arts and manufactures made considerable progress in the United States during this period. Cut off by the war from foreign sources of supply, the people of the United States had been obliged to look to their own industry and ingenuity to furnish articles needed in the struggle and for the usual occupations of life. On the return of peace, many branches of manufacture had become so firmly established that they held their ground, even against the excessive importations that immediately followed. Agriculture was greatly interrupted during the war by the withdrawing of laborers to the camp and by the distractions which disturbed all the occupations of society. But within a few years after peace was established, the exports of products raised in the United States were again considerable. Charles A. Goodrich End of Section 12 This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 13. The Mescianza at Philadelphia. 1778 by John F. Watson The British spent the winter of 1777-78 to in Philadelphia. To pass the time, they gave balls and other entertainments. The most noted of these was the Mescianza, the editor. This is the appellation of the most splendid pageant ever exhibited in our country. Footnote this was written in 1843, end footnote, if we accept the great federal procession of all trades and professions through the streets of Philadelphia in 1788. The Mescianza was chiefly a tilt and tournament with other entertainments, as the term implies, and was given on Monday the 18th of May, 1778, at Wharton's country seat in Southwark, by the officers of General Sir William Howe's army, to that officer, on his quitting the command to return to England. A considerable number of our city bells were present, which gave considerable offence afterwards to the Whigs, and did not fail to mark the fair as the Tory ladies. The ill-nature and the reproach have long since been forgotten. 
the company began to assemble at three to four o'clock at Knight's Wharf, at the water edge of Green Street in the Northern Liberties, and by half past four o'clock in the afternoon, the whole were embarked in the pleasant month of May in a grand regatta of three divisions. In the front of the whole were three flatboats, with a band of music in each of them, rowed regular to harmony. At this assemblage of vessels progressed barges rowed on the flanks. Light skimming stretched their oary wings to keep off the multitude of boats that crowded from the city as beholders, and the houses, balconies, and wharves were filled with spectators all along the river sides. When arrived at the fort below the Swedes Church, they formed a line through an avenue of grenadiers and light horse in the rear. The company were thus conducted to a square lawn of one hundred and fifty yards on each side, and which was also lined with troops. This area formed the ground for a tilt or tournament. On the front seat of each pavilion were placed seven of the principal young ladies of the country, dressed in Turkish habits, and wearing in their turbans the articles which they intended to bestow on their several gallant knights. Soon the trumpets at a distance announced the approach of the seven white knights, habited in white and red silk, and mounted on grey chargers, richly caparisoned in similar colours. These were followed by their several esquires on foot. Besides these there was a herald in his robe, these all made the circuit of the square, saluting the ladies as they passed, and then they ranged in line with their ladies. Then their herald, Mr. Beaumont, after a flourish of trumpets, proclaimed their challenge in the name of the Knights of the Blended Rose, declaring that the ladies of their order excelled in wit, beauty, and accomplishments those of the whole world, and that they are ready to enter the lists against any knights who will deny the same, according to the laws of ancient chivalry. At the third repetition of the challenge, a sound of trumpets announced the entrance of another herald, with four trumpeters dressed in black and orange. The two heralds held a parley when the black knight proceeded to proclaim his defiance in the name of the Knights of the Burning Mountain, then retiring there soon after entered the black knights, with their esquires, preceded by the herald, on whose tunic was represented a mountain, sending forth flames, and the motto, I burn forever. These seven knights, like the former ones, rode round the lists, and made their obeisance to the ladies, and then drew up fronting the white knights, and the chief of these having thrown down his gauntlet, the chief of the black knights directed his esquire to take it up. Then the knights received their lances from their esquires, fixing their shields on their left arms, and making a general salute to each other by movement of their lances, turned round to take their career, and encountering in full gallop, shivered their spears. In the second and third encounter they discharged their pistols. In the fourth they fought with their swords. From the garden they ascended a flight of steps, covered with carpets, which led into a spacious hall, the panels of which were painted in imitation of Siena marble, enclosing festoons of white marble. In this hall and the adjoining apartments were prepared tea, lemonade, etc., to which the company seated themselves. At this time the knights came in, and on their knee received their favours from their respective ladies. From these apartments they went up to a ballroom, decorated in a light, elegant style of painting, and showing many festoons of flowers. The brilliancy of the whole was heightened by eighty-five mirrors, decked with ribbons and flowers, and in the intermediate spaces were thirty-four branches. On the same floor were four drawing-rooms, with sideboards of refreshments, decorated and lighted in the style of the ballroom. The ball was opened by the knights and their ladies, and the dances continued till ten o'clock, when the windows were thrown open, and a magnificent bouquet of rockets began the fireworks. These were planned by Captain Montressor, 
the chief engineer, and consisted of twenty different displays in great variety and beauty, and changing General Howe's arch into a variety of shapes and devices. At twelve o'clock midnight, supper was announced, and large folding doors, before concealed, sprung open and discovered a magnificent saloon of two hundred and ten feet by forty feet, and twenty-two feet in height, with three alcoves on each side, which served for sideboards. The sides were painted with vine leaves and festoon flowers, and fifty-six large pier glasses, ornamented with green silk artificial flowers and ribbons. There were also one hundred branches trimmed, and eighteen lustres of twenty-four lights hung from the ceiling. There were three hundred wax tapers on the supper tables, four hundred and thirty covers, and twelve hundred dishes. There were twenty-four black slaves in oriental dresses, with silver collars and bracelets. Towards the close of the banquet, the herald with his trumpeters entered and announced the king and the royal family's health with other toasts. Each toast was followed by a flourish of music. After the supper, the company returned to the ballroom and continued to dance until four o'clock in the morning. I omit to describe the two arches, but they were greatly embellished. They had two fronts in the Tuscan order. The pediment of one was adorned with naval trophies, and the other with military ones. Major André, who wrote a description of it, although his name is concealed, calls it the most splendid entertainment ever given by an army to its general. The whole expense was borne by twenty-two field officers. The managers were Sir John Rottlesby, Colonel O'Hara, Majors Gardiner and Montressor. This splendid pageant blazed out in one short night. Next day the enchantment was dissolved, and in exactly one month all these knights and the whole army chose to make their march from the city of Philadelphia. When I think of the few survivors of that gay scene who now exist, of some whose sprightliness and beauty are gone, I cannot but feel a gloom succeed the recital of the fate. I think, for instance, of one who was then the queen of the Meschianza, since Mrs. L., now blind and fast waning from the things that be, to her I am indebted for many facts of illustration. She tells me that the unfortunate Major André was the charm of the company. Lieutenant André, his esquire, was his brother, a youth of about nineteen, possessing the promise of an accomplished gentleman. Major André and Captain Oliver Delancey painted themselves the chief of the decorations. The Siena marble, for instance, on the apparent side walls, was on canvas, in the style of stage scene painting. André also painted the scenes used at the theatre, at which the British officers performed. The proceeds were given to the widows and orphans of their soldiers. The waterfall scene, drawn by him, was still in the building when it lately burnt. She assures me that, of all that was borrowed for the entertainment, nothing was injured or lost. They desired to pay double if accidents occurred. The general deportment of the officers was praiseworthy therein. There were no ladies of British officers, save Miss Ochmuty, the new bride of Captain Montresor. The American young ladies present were not numerous, not exceeding fifty. The others were married ladies. Most of our ladies had gone from the city, and what remained were, of course, in great demand. The American gentlemen present were aged non-combatants. Our young men were Whigs generally, and were absent. No offence was offered to the ladies afterwards for their acceptance of this instance of an enemy's hospitality. When the Americans returned, they got up a great ball to be given to the officers of the French army and to the American officers of Washington's command. When the managers came to invite their guests, it was made a question whether the Mesquianza ladies should be invited. It was found they could not make up their company without them. They were therefore included. When they came, they looked differently habited from those who had gone to the country they having assumed the high headdress, etc., of the British fashion. And so the characters, unintentionally, 
were immediately perceived at a glance through the hall, but lots being cast for partners, they were soon fully intermixed, and conversation ensued as if nothing of jealousy had ever existed, and all umbrage was forgotten. End of section 13. This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nate. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 14. A New England Thanksgiving Dinner in 1779. By Juliana Smith. Dear Cousin Betsy, when Thanksgiving Day was approaching, our dear Grandmother Smith, nay Jerusha Mother, great-granddaughter of the Reverend Richard Mother of Dorchester, Massachusetts, who is sometimes a little desponding of spirit, as you well know, did her best to persuade us that it would be better to make it a day of fasting and prayer, in view of the wickedness of our friends, etc., the vileness of our enemies. I am sure you can hear Grandmother say that, and see her shake her cup border. But indeed there was some occasion for her remarks, for our resistance to an unjust authority has cost our beautiful coast towns very dear, the last year, and all of us have had much to suffer. But my dear father brought her to a more proper frame of mind, so that by the time the day came she was ready to enjoy it almost as well as Grandmother Worthington did, and she, you will remember, always sees the bright side. In the meanwhile, we had all of us been working hard to get all things in readiness to do honour to the day. This year it was Uncle Simeon's turn to have the dinner at his house, but of course we all helped them as they helped us when it is our turn, and there is always enough for us all to do. All the baking of pies and cakes was done at our house, and we had the big oven heated and filled twice, each day, for three days, before it was all done, and everything was good, though we did have to do without some things that ought to be used. Neither love nor money could buy raisins, but our good red cherries dried without the pits did almost as well, and happily Uncle Simeon still had some spices in store. The tables were set in the dining hall, and even that big room had no space to spare when we were all seated. The servants had enough ado to get around the table and serve us all without oversetting things. There were our two grandmothers side by side. They are always handsome old ladies, but now many thought they were handsomer than ever and happy they were able to look around upon so many of their descendants. Uncle and Aunt Simeon preside at one table, and father and mother at the other. Besides us five boys and girls, there were two of the Gales and three Elmers, besides James Brown and Ephraim Coles. We had them at our table, because they could be best supervised there. Most of the students had gone to their own homes for the weeks, but Mr. Skiff and Mr. Blank were too far away from their homes. They sat at Uncle Simeon's table, and so did Uncle Paul and his family, five of them in all, and cousins Finn and Paul. Then there were six of the Livingston family next door. They had never seen a Thanksgiving dinner before, having been used to keep Christmas Day instead, as is the wont in New York and Province. Then there were four old ladies who have no longer homes or children of their own, and so came to us. They were invited by my mother, but uncle and Aunt Simeon wished it so. Of course, we could have no roast beef. None of us have tasted beef this three years back, as it all must go to the army, and too little they get, poor fellows. But my quittimost hunters were able to get us a fine red deer, so that we had a good haunch of venison on each table. These were balanced by huge chines of roast pork at the other ends of the table. Then there was on one a big roast turkey, and on the other a goose, and two big pigeon pasties. Then there was an abundance of good vegetables of all the old sorts, and one which I do not believe you have yet seen. Uncle Simeon had imported the seed from England just before the war began, and only this year was there enough for table use. It is called celery, and you eat it without cooking. It is very good served with meats. Next year, Uncle Simeon says he will be able to raise enough to give us all some. 
It has to be taken up, roots and all, and buried in earth in the cellar, through the winter, and only pulling up some when you want it to use. Our mince pies were good, although we had to use dried cherries, as I told you, and the meat was shoulder of venison instead of beef. The pumpkin pies, apple tarts, and the big Indian puddings lacked for nothing save appetites by the time we had to get around to them. Of course we had no wine. Uncle Simeon has still a cask or two, but it must all be saved for the sick, and indeed for those who are well, good cider is a sufficient substitute. There was no plum pudding, but a boiled suet pudding, stirred thick with dried plums and cherries, was called by the old name and answered the purpose. All the other spice had been used in the mince pies, so for this pudding we used a jar of West India preserved ginger which chanced to be left of the last shipment which Uncle Simeon had from there. We chopped the ginger small and stirred it through with the plums and cherries. It was extraordinary good. The day was bitter cold, and when we got home from meeting, which father did not keep over long by reason of the cold, we were glad enough of the fire in uncle's dining room, but by the time the dinner was one half over, those of us who were on the fireside of one table was forced to get up and carry our plates with us around to the far side of the other table, while those who had sat there were glad to bring their plates around to the fireside to get warm all but the old ladies, who had a screen put behind their chairs. Uncle Simeon was in his best mood, and you know how good that is. He kept both tables in a roar of laughter with his droll stories of the days when he was studying medicine in Edinburgh, and afterwards he and father and Uncle Paul joined in singing hymns and ballads. You know how fine their voices go together. Then we all sang a hymn, and afterwards my dear father led us in prayer, remembering all absent friends before the throne of grace, and much I wished that my dear Betsy was here as one of us, as she has been of yore. We did not rise from the table until it was quite dark, and when the dishes had been cleared away, we all got around the fire as close as we could, and cracked nuts, and sang songs, and told stories. At least some told, and others listened. You know nobody can exceed the two grandmothers at telling tales of all the things they have seen themselves, and repeating those of the early years in New England, and even some in the old England, which they had heard in their youth from their elders. My father says it is a goodly custom to hand down all worthy deeds and traditions from father to son, as the Israelites were commanded to do about the Passover, and as the Indians here have always done because the word that is spoken is remembered longer than the one what is written. Brother Jack, who did not reach here until late on Wednesday, though he left the college very early on Monday morning, and rode with all due diligence considering the snow, brought an orange to each of the grandmothers, but alas, they were frozen in his saddle-bags. We soaked the frost out in cold water, but I guess they was not as good as they should have been. End of section 14。section 15 of the United States。read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter。A call on Lady Washington in 1780 by Charles D. Platt。O Lady Martha Washington has come to Morristown, and we must go, and quickly so each in her finest gown, and call at Colonel Ford's to see that dame of high renown. So spake the dames of Hanover, and put on their array, of silks to wit, and all that's fit to grace a gala day, and called on Lady Washington in raiment bright and gay. Those were the days of scarcity in all our stricken land, when hardships tried the countryside, want was on every hand when they called on Lady Washington in fine attire so grand. And don't you think we found her with a speckled homespun apron on, with knitting in hand, that lady so grand, that stately Lady Washington, when we came to Morristown that day with all our finest fixins on? She welcomed us right graciously, and then, quite at her ease, she makes the glancing needles fly as nimbly as you please. And so we found this courtly dame as busy as two bees. 
for while our gallant soldiers bear the brunt of war quoth she it is not right that we delight in costly finery so spake good martha washington still smiling graciously but let us do our part quoth she and speedily begin to clothe our armies on the field and independence win good-bye good-bye we all did cry we're going home to spin end of section fifteen this recording is in the public domain section sixteen of the united states this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 16. How People Traveled in Revolutionary Times. 1775-1781. to By John Back McMaster. A journey of any length was beset with innumerable difficulties and delays. Towns and cities between which we pass in an hour were a day's journey apart. For all purposes of trade and commerce, 250 miles was a greater distance then than 2,500 miles now. A voyage across the ocean to London or Liverpool, a trip across the prairies to the Pacific coast, is at present performed with more ease and comfort and with quite as much expedition as a hundred years since a journey from boston to new york was made it was commonly by stages that both travellers and goods passed from city to city insufferably slow as such a mode of conveyance would seem to an american of this generation it had in seventeen eighty four but lately come in and was hailed as a mark of wonderful progress the first coach and four in new england began its trips in seventeen forty four the first stage between New York and Philadelphia, then the two most populous cities in the colonies, was not set until 1756, and made the run in three days. The same year that the Stamp Act was passed, a second stage was started. This was advertised as a luxurious conveyance, quote-unquote, being a covered jersey wagon, and was promised to make the trip in three days, the charge being two pence the mile. The success which attended this venture moved others, and in the year following it was announced that a conveyance described as the flying machine, quote-unquote, being a good wagon with seats on springs, would perform the whole journey in the surprisingly short time of two days. This increase of speed was, however, accompanied by an increase of fare, the charge being twenty shillings for the through trip and three pence per mile for way passengers. When the revolution came, most of these vehicles ceased to ply between the distant cities, horseback travelling was resumed, and a journey of any length became a matter of grave consideration. On the day of departure, the friends of the traveller gathered at the inn, took a solemn leave of him, drank his health in bumpers of punch, and wished him Godspeed on his way. The Quaker preacher, Hicks, setting out in 1779 for yearly meeting, remarked, quote, we took a solemn leave of our families, they feeling much anxiety at parting with us on account of the many dangers we were exposed to, having to pass not only through the lines of the armies, but the deserted and almost uninhabited country that lay between them. End quote. With the return of peace, the stages again took the road, but many years elapsed before traffic over the highways became at all considerable. While Washington was serving his first term, two stages and twelve horses sufficed to carry all the travelers and goods passing between New York and Boston, then the two greatest commercial centers of the country. The conveyances were old and shackling, the harness made mostly of rope, the beasts were ill-fed and worn to skeletons, the ordinary day journey was forty miles in summer, but in winter, when the roads were bad and the darkness came on early in the afternoon, rarely more than twenty-five. In the hot months the traveller was oppressed by the heat and half-choked by the dust. When cold weather came, he could scarce keep from freezing. One pair of horses usually dragged the stage some eighteen miles, when fresh ones were put on, and if no accident occurred, the traveller was put down at the inn about ten at night. Cramped and weary, he ate a frugal supper and betook himself to bed, 
with a notice from the landlord that he would be called at three the next morning. Then, whether it rained or snowed, he was forced to rise and make ready, by the light of a horn lantern or a farthing candle, for another ride of eighteen hours. After a series of mishaps and accidents, such as would suffice for an emigrant train crossing the plains, the stage rolled into New York at the end of the sixth day. The discomforts and trials of such a trip, combined with the accidents by no means uncommon, the great distance from help in the solitary places through which the road ran, and the terrors of ferryboats on the rivers, made a journey of any distance an event to be remembered to the end of one's days. Such was the crude state of the science of engineering that no bridge of any considerable length had been undertaken in the States. No large rivers had yet been spanned. While going from Boston to Philadelphia in 1789, Breck crossed the Connecticut at Springfield, the Housatonic at Stratford, the Hudson at New York, the Hackensack and Passaic between Paul's Hook, now Jersey City, and Newark, the Raritan at New Brunswick, the Delaware at Trenton, and the Neshamung at Bristol, on what were then known as ferryboats. The crossing of any of these streams was attended by much discomfort and danger, but the wide stretch of water which flowed between Paulus Hook and the city of New York was especially the dread of travellers. There, from December till late in March, great blocks of ice filled the river from either bank far out to the channel. On windy days the waves were high, and when the tide ran counter with the wind, covered with white caps. Horse boats had not yet come in. The hardy traveller was, therefore, rowed across in boats such as would now be thought scarcely better than scows. In one of her most touching letters to her husband, Mrs. Burr describes to him the alarm occasioned by his making the dangerous crossing. How she had anxiously waited for his return hoping that the dangers of the passage would deter him, how, when she heard that he was really embarked, she gave herself up to an agony of fear as she thought of him exposed in the little boat to the rough waters and the boisterous winds, and what thankfulness she felt when her son brought word of his safe arrival at Paul's Hook. Even a trip from Brooklyn to New York, across a river scarce half as wide as that separating the city from New Jersey, was attended with risks and delays that would now be thought intolerable. Then, and indeed till the day thirty years later, when the rude steamboats of Fulton made their appearance on the ferry, the only means of transportation for man and beast were clumsy rowboats, flat-bottomed, square-ended scows with sprit sails, and two-masted boats called periaglas. In one of these, if the day were fine, if the tide were slack, if the watermen were sober, and if the boat did not put back several times to take in belated passengers who were seen running down the hill, the crossing might be made with some degree of speed and comfort, and a landing effected at the foot of the steps at the pier which, much enlarged, still forms part of the Brooklyn slip of the Fulton Ferry. But when the wind blew with the tide, when a strong flood or an angry ebb was on, the boatmen made little headway, and counted themselves happy if, at the end of an hour's hard pulling, the passengers were put ashore opposite Governor's Island, or on the marshes around Wallabot Bay. In summer these delays, which happened almost daily, were merely annoying, and did no more harm than to bring down some hearty curses on the boatmen and the tide. But when winter came, and the river began to fill with huge blocks of ice, Crossing the ferry was hazardous enough to deter the most daring. Sometimes a rowboat would get in an ice jam and be held there in the wind and cold for many hours. At others a periagua would go to pieces in the crash, and the passengers, forced to clamber on the ice, would drift up and down the harbour at the mercy of the tide. It is not improbable that the solicitude of Mrs. Burr for the safety of her husband was heightened by the recollection of such an occurrence which took place but a few months before. Nor were the scows in the best of weather less liable to accidents than the rowboats. It was on these that horses, wagons, and cattle were brought over from city to city, for the butchers of the fly market drew their supplies of beef and mutton from the farms that lay on the hills towards Flatbush and what is now Williamsburg. Every week small herds of steer and flocks of sheep were driven to the ferry, shut up in pens, 
and brought over the river, a few at a time, on the scows. The calmest days, the smoothest water, and a slack tide were, if possible, chosen for such trips. Yet even then, whoever went upon a cattle-boat took his life in his hands. If a sudden gust of wind struck the sails, or if one of the half-dozen bullocks became restless, the scow was sure to upset. No one, therefore, who was so fortunate as to own a handsome carriage would trust it on the boats if the wind and sea were high, or much ice in the river, but would wait two or three days for a gentle breeze and smooth water. But it was not solely by coaches and ferry-boats that our ancestors travelled from place to place. Packet sloops plied between important points along the coast, and such of the inland cities as stood upon the banks of navigable rivers. The trip from New York to Philadelphia was thus often made by packet, to South Amboy, thence by coach to Burlington, in New Jersey, where a packet was once more taken to the Quaker City. A similar line of vessels ran between New York and Providence, where coaches were in waiting to convey travellers to Boston. This mode of conveyance was thought to be far more comfortable than by stage wagon, but it was, at the same time, far more uncertain. Nobody knew precisely when the sloops would set sail, nor when once started, how soon they would reach their haven. The wind being favourable, and the waters of the sound quite smooth, the run to Providence was often made in three days. But it was not seldom that nine days, or two weeks, were spent in the trip. On the Hudson were many such sloops, bringing down again timber and skins from Albany, to be exchanged for broadcloth, half-thicks, and tummies at New York. They ceased to run, however, when the ice began to form in the river, trade was suspended, and the few travellers who went from one city to the other made the journey on horseback or in the coach. In summer, when the winds were light, two weeks were sometimes spent in sailing the 150 miles. The difficulties, indeed, which beset the English traveller John Maud on his way to Albany would now be rarely met with in a canoe on the rivers of the northwest. Burr, on his way from Albany to attend court, changed from sloop to wagon ere his journey was ended. Travellers by these packets often took boat as the vessel floated slowly down the river, rowed ashore and purchased eggs and milk at the farmhouses near the bank, and overtook their vessel with ease. The present century had long passed its first decade before any material improvement in locomotion became known. Our ancestors were not wholly unacquainted with the great motive power which has within the lifetime of a generation revolutionized every branch of human industry and enabled great ships of iron to advance in the face of wind and waves, and long trains of cars to traverse the earth at a speed exceeding the pace of the fleetest horse. Before the close of 1787, Fitch at Philadelphia and Ramsey at Shepherdstown, Virginia, had both moved vessels by steam. Before 1790, a steamboat company had been organized at Philadelphia, and a little craft built by Fitch had steamed up and down the Delaware to Burlington, to Bristol, to Bordentown, and Trenton. Before 1800, Samuel Morey had gone up the Connecticut River in a steamer of his own construction and design, and Elijah Ormsby, a Rhode Island mechanic, had astonished the farmers along the banks of the Seekonk River with the sight of a boat driven by paddles. Early in this century, Stevens placed upon the waters of the Hudson a boat moved by a watt engine. The same year, Oliver Evans ran a paddle-wheel vessel on the waters of the Delaware and the Shreedukil. Fulton, in 1807, made his trip to Albany in the famous Clavon, and used it as a passenger boat till the end of the year but he met with the same opposition which in our time we have seen expanded on the telegraph and the sewing machine and which some time far in the future will be encountered by inventions and discoveries of which we have not now the smallest conception no man in his senses it was asserted would risk his life in such a fire-boat as the clermont when the river was full of good packets before the year eighteen twenty came the first boat had steamed down the mississippi to new orleans the first steamboat had appeared upon the lakes, and the Atlantic had been crossed by the steamship Savannah, but such amazing innovations as these found little favour with men accustomed from boyhood to the stagecoach and the sailboat. In 1810, nine days were spent in going from Boston to Philadelphia. At the outbreak of the Second War with England, 
a light coach and three horses went from Baltimore to Washington in a day and a half. The mail wagon, then thought to make the journey with surprising speed, left Pennsylvania Avenue at five in the morning, and drew up at the post office in Baltimore at eleven at night. Ocean travel was scarcely known. Nothing short of the most pressing business, or an intense longing to see the wonders of the old world, could induce a gentleman of 1784 to leave his comfortable home and his pleasant fields, shut himself up in a packet, and breathe the foul air of the close and dingy cabin for the month or seven weeks spent in crossing the Atlantic. A passage in such a space of time would, moreover, have been thought a short one for it was no very uncommon occurrence when a vessel was nine, ten, eleven weeks, or even three months on a voyage from Havre or Madrid to New York. So formidable was this tedious sail, and the bad food and loathsome water it entailed, that fewer men went over each summer to London than now go every month to South America. In fact, an emigrant steamer brings out each passage from Queenstown more human beings than a hundred years ago, crossed the ocean in both direction in the space of a twelfth month. So late as 1795, a gentleman who had been abroad was pointed out in the streets even of the large cities with the remark, There goes a man who has been to Europe. End of section 16section seventeen of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tapin section seventeen abraham devonport seventeen eighty by john g whittier in the old days a custom laid aside with breeches and cocked hats the people sent their wisest men to make the public laws and so from a brown homestead where the sound drinks the small tribute of the mayan ass waved over by the woods of ripo wams and hallowed by pure lives and tranquil deaths Stamford sent up to the councils of the state wisdom and grace in abraham davenport twas on a may day of the far old year seventeen hundred eighty that there fell over the bloom and sweet life of the spring over the fresh earth and the heaven of noon a horror of great darkness like the night in day of which the norland sagas tell the twilight of the gods the low-hung sky was black with ominous clouds save where its rim was fringed with a dull glow like that which climbs the crater's sides from the red hell below birds ceased to sing and all the barnyard fowls roosted the cattle at the pasture bars lowed and looked homeward bats on leathern wings flitted abroad the sound of labour died men prayed and women wept all ears grew sharp to hear the doom blast of the trumpet shatter the black sky that the dreadful face of christ might look from the rent clouds not as he looked a loving guest at bethany but stern as justice and inexorable law meanwhile in the old state house dim as ghosts sat the lawgivers of connecticut trembling beneath their legislative robes it is the lord's great day let us adjourn some said and then as if with one accord all eyes were turned to abraham davenport he rose slow cleaving with his steady voice the intolerable hush this well may be the day of judgment which the world awaits but be it so or not i only know my present duty and my lord's command to occupy till he come so at the post where he hath set me in his providence i choose for one to meet him face to face 
no faithless servant frightened from my task but ready when the lord of the harvest calls and therefore with all reverence i would say let god do his work we will see to ours bring in the candles and they brought them in then by the flaring lights the speaker read albeit with husky voice and shaking hands an act to amend an act to regulate the shad and elwive fisheries whereupon wisely and well spake abraham davenport straight to the question with no figures of speech save the ten arab signs yet not without the shrewd dry humour natural to the man his awestruck colleagues listened all the while between the pauses of his argument to hear the thunder of the wrath of god break from the hollow trumpet of the cloud and there he stands in memory to this day erect self-poised a rugged face half seen against the background of unnatural dark a witness to the ages as they pass that simple duty hath no place for fear end of section seventeen recording by alan mapstone Section 18 of The United States, read for LibriVox.org. The United States, Volume 2, Part 3, The First Years of the Nation. Historical Note. During the Revolution, the colonies had stood together, but when the war came to an end, each one began to think what would be best for itself. In 1787, a convention was decided upon to form a more perfect union, and then it was that the Constitution of the United States was written. Very important questions came up for settlement. How much power should be given to the central government, and how much to each state? How long should President's term of office be? How should the states be represented? There was a vast amount of debate and discussion, but finally the Constitution was submitted to the states. The Federalists were eager for its ratification. The Anti-Federalists opposed chiefly on the ground of its giving so much power to the central government. The consent of nine states was necessary for adoption. Between December 7, 1787, and February 6, 1788, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, and Massachusetts had signified their acceptance. Maryland came into line in April, South Carolina in May. Then there was a month's delay. At last, the Federalists carried the day in New Hampshire and a few days later in Virginia, and the Constitution was adopted. After the adoption of the Constitution, each state chose electors to vote for a president. Every vote was cast for Washington, and in 1789 he became president of the United States. The first difficulty for the new nation to meet was the lack of money. The United States had a poor financial rating because what the Continental Congress had borrowed had never been repaid. Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury, made two propositions to Congress. The first was to tax foreign goods brought into the country. The second was somewhat startling, for he wished the whole government to assume the debt of each state. This was finally done, and now every creditor of each state became anxious to have a strong central government in order that he might get his money. End of section 18. This recording is in the public domain. Section 19 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. America by Samuel Francis Smith. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side, let freedom ring. My native country, thee, land of the noble free, thy name I love. I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and templed hills, my heart with rapture thrills, 
like that above. Let music swell the breeze, and ring from all the trees sweet freedom's song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that breathe partake, let rocks their silence break, the sound prolong. Our Father's God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright, with freedom's holy light, protect us by thy might, great God, our King. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan Section 20 How Philadelphia Celebrated the Ratification of the Constitution, 1788, by John Bach McMaster Philadelphia was the first large city to receive the news of the adoption of the Constitution, and there the popular rejoicings put on a more impressive form. It was known so early as the 26th of June that New Hampshire had assented, but everyone felt that the Constitution could never be firmly set up while so great and populous a state as Virginia held out. When, therefore, the post that came in on the evening of the 2nd of July brought letters telling that Virginia was federal, the doubts and fears that had tormented men for seven months were put at rest. It was instantly determined that the coming 4th of July should be made the occasion for a great display of federal spirit, that there should be speeches and toasts and a procession and that the procession, it was said, should be such a one as the continent had never seen. Not a moment was wasted, and by the night of the third all was ready. The pavements had been swept, the trees had been lopped, ten ships had been procured, dressed in bunting and anchored in the Delaware, one at the foot of every street from the North Liberties to South Street, they were typical of the ten ratifying states. As the first rays of the morning sun came over the eastern bank of the Delaware, the ship Rising Sun, which lay at the foot of Market Street, fired a national salute, the bells of Christ Church rang out, and each of the ten vessels on the river ran up to her masthead a broad white flag, which, spread by a stiff breeze from the south, displayed the name of the commonwealth for which she stood. Meanwhile the procession was fast forming in the city, but the sun had been four hours up before it began to move. Every trade, every business, every occupation of life was represented— there were saddlers and gunsmiths, stone-cutters, tanners, brewers, merchants, doctors, shipwrights, and stocking-makers. The cordwainers sent a miniature shop. The rope-makers marched each with a bunch of hemp and a piece of rope in his hand. The Manufacturers' Society delighted the crowd with the spectacle of a huge wagon drawn by ten horses and neatly covered with cotton cloth of their own make. On the wagon were a lace loom, a printing mill, a carding, and a spinning jenny of eighty spindles. Compared with the cunningly and exquisitely wrought machines now to be found in the mills and factories of New England, they would seem rude and ill-formed, but they were among the newest inventions of the age, and were looked on by our ancestors as marvels of mechanical ingenuity. There, too, were represented in succession— Independence, the French Alliance, the Definitive Treaty, the Convention of the States, and the Federal Roof, a huge dome supported by thirteen Corinthian columns. 
but the cheering was never so loud as when the Federal ship Union came in sight. She had, it was whispered among the crowd, been built in four days. Her bottom was the barge of the ship Alliance, and was the same that had once belonged to the Serapis, and had been taken in the memorable fight by Paul Jones. She mounted twenty guns, and had upon her deck four small boys, who performed all the duties of a crew, set sail, took a pilot on board, trimmed the sheets to suit the breeze, threw out the lead, cast anchor at Union Green, and set off dispatches to the President of the United States. When the end of the procession had passed Union Green, Wilson gave the address— Hopkinson wrote the ode, which, printed in English and in German, was scattered among the people and sent off on the wings of carrier pigeons to the ten ratifying states. That night the streets of the city were bright with bonfires and noisy with the shouts of revelers who had taken too many bumpers to the French king, to the American Fabius, and the builders of the federal roof. But the rejoicings did not end with the day. For months afterward, the newspapers gave unmistakable evidence of the pleasure with which the great mass of the people contemplated the new plan. The word federal became more popular than ever. It was given by town committees and selectmen as names to streets in numberless towns, and was used as a catchword by tradesmen and shopkeepers. One advertisement informed the public where the federal minuet was to be obtained. In another, a dancing master announced that he would give instruction in the federal minuet. A third invited gentlemen who visited the city to put up their horses at the federal stables. A number of designs were suggested for a lady's federal hat. Federal punch became the drink of the day. In the shipping news, in the list of packets that had arrived and brigs that had sailed, appeared notices that the sloop Anarchy, when last heard from, was ashore on Union Rocks, that the scow Old Federation, imbecility master, had gone to sea, and that on the same day the staunch ship Federal Constitution, with public credit, commercial prosperity, and national energy on board, had reached her haven in safety. End of Section 20 This recording is in the public domain. Section 21 of the United States this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 21. The First Inauguration Day, 1789, by John Bach McMaster. In every great city, from Boston to Baltimore, societies for the encouragement of manufacturers had sprung up since the war and were flourishing. That at Boston put forth an address urging the manufacturers of the great seaports to join with it in checking importation. The members of the Society in Delaware took a solemn pledge to appear on the first day of January in each year, clothed in goods of American make, to foster the growth of flax and wool, and to discourage the purchase of cloth abroad. The Society at Philadelphia had, at great cost and labor, secured the models of a cotton carter and a cotton spinner built a factory, and began the manufacture of cotton goods. The result was a speedy return to old habits of simplicity and frugality. Young women wore plainer clothes and made haste to surpass their mothers in skill at the spinning wheel. Young men drank American porter and beer and were not ashamed to be seen in homespun stockings and homemade jeans. 
Politicians found the surest way to win the hearts of their constituents was to appear dressed in American broadcloth. The town of Hartford could think of no gift so appropriate for John Adams on his way to be inaugurated vice president as a roll of cloth from its own looms. All true patriots heard with joy that on the auspicious day when the American Fabius stood forth to take the oath of office, he was clad from head to foot in garments whose material was the product of American soil. His inauguration fell on the last day of April. Washington quitted Mount Vernon on the 16th of the month in company with Colonel Humphreys and Mr. Thompson, and came by the most direct road through Baltimore and Philadelphia to New York. The journey, even at that time of year, might easily have been made in five days, but he was much delayed by the hearty receptions given him along the entire route. From every village and hamlet through which the road lay, the people poured forth to welcome him, and to testify, by shouts and blessings, their love and gratitude for the great things he had done. He was feasted at Alexandria. He was entertained at Georgetown. He was warmly received at Philadelphia. The people of that city had selected Gray's Ferry on the lower Shykill as the place to meet him, and had taxed their ingenuity to the utmost to devise decorations worthy of the occasion. The bridge, a mean and rude structure, was hidden under cedars and laurel, flags and liberty caps. Two triumphal arches were put up, and signals arranged to give warning of his coming. At last, about noon on the twentieth, the flag in the ferry garden was dropped, and soon after the President was seen riding slowly down the hill and under the first arch, where a laurel crown was let fall upon his head. From the bridge he went on in company with Governor Mifflin and the troops to Philadelphia, where he lay that night. The moment he entered the city limits, the bells of all the churches were rung, and in the language of that time a food de joie was fired. The president was much affected, and, says an eyewitness, as he moved down Market Street to the city tavern, every face seemed to say, Long, long, long live George Washington! Early the next morning, the Philadelphia horse rode with him to Trenton, where a yet more pleasing reception awaited him. On the Assumpic Bridge, over which, twelve years before, he led his little army on the night before the Battle of Princeton, the women of Trenton had put up a triumphal arch. Thirteen columns supported it, and were surmounted by a great dome adorned with a sunflower, and the inscription, To Thee Alone. Beyond the bridge was gathered a bevy of women and girls, who, as the President passed under the dome, came forward to greet him, singing and strewing the way with flowers. Washington was greatly touched, and thanked them in a few neatly turned sentences. From Trenton, the Huntington horse accompanied him to Rocky Hill, where the Somerset horse met him and escorted him to Brunswick. Thence the Middlesex horse took him to Woodbridge, and the Essex horse to the barge at Elizabethtown Point. Once on board, the little craft was rowed by thirteen pilots through the Kill von Kull, and out into the broad bosom of the most beautiful of harbors, Around him on every side crowded an innumerable navy of track scouts and shallops, barges and rowboats, gay with flags and black with shouting men. Before him, just visible in the distance, lay the low hills and the white houses of the great city, and as the barge sped swiftly toward them, the Spanish warship Galveston saluted with thirteen guns. The ship North Carolina replied, a third salute was fired by the artillery as Washington climbed the stairs at Murray's Wharf and was welcomed by Clinton, the senators and representatives, and escorted through dense lines of cheering citizens to the house made ready for his use. 
At night the sky was red with bonfires, and the streets and coffee-houses full of revellers. It was the twenty-third of the month. But as a few finishing touches were yet to be given to Federal Hall, the ceremonies of inauguration were put off till the 30th. On the morning of that day, the people went in crowds to the churches to offer up prayers for the welfare of the new government and the safety of the President. Precisely at noon, the procession, which had been forming almost since sunrise, moved from Washington's house on Cherry Street, through Queen Street, Great Dock, and Broad Streets, to Federal Hall. As the head of the line reached the building, the troops divided, and Washington was led through the midst of them to the Senate Chamber, where both houses were formally introduced to him. When the members were again seated and the noise had subsided, Adams, who had already been inaugurated, informed the President that the time had come for the administration of the oath of office. Washington rose, and followed by the members of the two houses, went out on the balcony of Federal Hall, from which he could be seen far up and down Wall Street, and by the multitude that filled Broad Street, the Chancellor of New York tendered the oath, and when the ceremony was over, turning toward the people, cried out, Long live George Washington, President of the United States. The crowd took up the cry, and amid the joyous shouts of the citizens and the roar of the cannon on the battery, Washington went back to the Senate chamber and delivered his inaugural. That night there were bonfires in all the streets and moving transparencies in the windows of the Spanish minister's house. End of section 21. This recording is in the public domain. Section 22 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 22. The Death of Washington. 1799. The following account is that given by Mr. Lear, Washington's private secretary combined with some facts given by Mr. Custis. The Editor Between two and three o'clock on Saturday morning, December 14th, he, footnote, Washington, end of footnote, awoke Mrs. Washington and told her that he was very unwell and had had an ague. She observed that he could scarcely speak and breathed with difficulty and would have got up to call a servant, but he would not permit her lest she should take a cold. As soon as the day appeared, the woman, Caroline, went into the room to make a fire, and Mrs. Washington sent her immediately to call me. I got up, put on my clothes as quickly as possible, and went to his chamber. Mrs. Washington was then up, and related to me his being ill as before stated. I found the general breathing with difficulty, and hardly able to utter a word intelligibly. He desired Mr. Rawlins, one of the overseers, might be sent for, to bleed him before the doctor could arrive. I dispatched a servant instantly for Rawlins, and another for Dr. Crake, and returned again to the general's chamber, where I found him in the same situation as I had left him. A mixture of molasses, vinegar, and butter was prepared to try its effects in the throat, but he could not swallow a drop. Whenever he attempted it, he appeared to be distressed, convulsed and almost suffocated. Rollins came in soon after sunrise and prepared to bleed him. When the arm was ready, the general, observing that Rollins appeared to be agitated, said, as well as he could speak, Don't be afraid. And when the incision was made, he observed, The orifice is not large enough. However, the blood ran pretty freely. Mrs. Washington, not knowing whether bleeding was proper or not in the general situation, begged that much might not be taken from him, lest it should be injurious, and desired me to stop it. But when I was about to untie the string, 
the general put up his hand to prevent it, and as soon as he could speak, he said, More. More. Mrs. Washington being still very uneasy, lest too much blood should be taken, it was stopped after taking about half a pint. Finding that no relief was obtained from bleeding, and that nothing would go down the throat, I proposed bathing it externally with sal volatile, which was done, and in the operation, which was with the hand, and in the gentlest manner, he observed, It is very sore. A piece of flannel dipped in sal volatile was put around his neck, and his feet bathed in warm water, but without affording any relief. In the meantime, before Dr. Craig arrived, Mrs. Washington desired me to send for Dr. Brown, of Port Tobacco, whom Dr. Craig had recommended to be called, if any case should ever occur that was seriously alarming. Dr. Dick came about three o'clock, and Dr. Brown arrived soon after. Upon Dr. Dick seeing the general, and consulting a few minutes with Dr. Craig, he was bled again. The blood came very slow, was thick, and did not produce any symptoms of fainting. Dr. Brown came into the chamber soon after, and upon feeling the general's pulse, the physicians went out together. Dr. Craig returned soon after. The general could now swallow a little. Calomel and tartar emetic were administered, but without any effect. The weather became severely cold, while the group gathered nearer to the couch of the sufferer. He spoke but little. To the respectful and affectionate inquiries of an old family servant, as she smoothed down his pillow, how he felt himself, he answered, I am very ill. To Mrs. Washington he said, Go to my desk, and in the private drawer you will find two papers. Bring them to me. They were brought. Upon looking at them he observed, These are my wills. Preserve this one, and burn the other which was accordingly done. In the course of the afternoon he appeared to be in great pain and distress from the difficulty of breathing, and frequently changed his posture in the bed. On these occasions I lay upon the bed and endeavored to raise him and turn him with as much ease as possible. He appeared penetrated with gratitude for my attentions, and often said, I am afraid I shall fatigue you too much and upon my assuring him that I could feel nothing but a wish to give him ease, he replied, Well, it is a debt we must pay to each other, and I hope, when you want aid of this kind, you will find it. He asked when Mr. Lewis and Washington Custis would return. They were then in New Kent. I told him about the twentieth of the month. The general servant, Christopher, was in the room during the day, and in the afternoon the general directed him to sit down, as he had been standing almost the whole day. He did so. About eight o'clock in the morning he had expressed a desire to get up. His clothes were put on, and he was led to a chair by the fire. He found no relief from that position, and lay down again about ten o'clock. About five o'clock Dr. Craig came into the room, and upon going to the bedside, the general said to him, Doctor... I die hard, but I am not afraid to go. I believed from my first attack that I should not survive it. My breath cannot last long. The doctor pressed his hand, but could not utter a word. He retired from the bedside, and sat by the fire absorbed in grief. Between five and six o'clock, Dr. Dick and Dr. Brown came into the room, and with Dr. Craig went to the bed when Dr. Craig asked him if he could sit up in the bed. He held out his hand, and I raised him up. He then said to the physicians, I feel myself going. I thank you for your attentions, but I pray you to take no more trouble about me. Let me go off quietly. I cannot last long. About ten o'clock, he made several attempts to speak to me before he could effect it. At length he said, I am just going. Have me decently buried, and do not let my body be put into the vault in less than three days after I am dead. I bowed assent, for I could not speak. He then looked at me again and said, Do you understand me? Yes, I replied. 
"'Tis well,' said he. The last words which he ever uttered on earth. With surprising self-possession he prepared to die, composing his form at full length and folding his arms on his bosom. About ten minutes before he expired, which was between ten and eleven o'clock Saturday evening, his breathing became easier. He lay quietly. He withdrew his hand from mine and felt his own pulse. I saw his countenance change. I spoke to Dr. Crake, who sat by the fire. He came to the bedside. The general's hand fell from his wrist. I took it in mine and pressed it to my bosom. Dr. Crake put his hands over his eyes, and he expired without a struggle or a sigh, December 14th, 1799, in the sixty-eighth year of his age, after an illness of twenty-four hours. End of section twenty-two Section 23 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Valerie Marino. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 23. Red Jacket and the Missionary. End of the 18th Century. By Charles H. L. Johnston. Numerous white missionaries now came to the country of the Indians, endeavoring as well as they could to establish Christianity among the savages. One of these, a missionary named Cram, made a long speech to the Senecas, telling them there was but one religion, and unless they adopted it, they could not prosper, that they had lived all their lives in darkness, and that his object in talking to them was not to get away their lands or money, but to turn them towards the true gospel. Finally, he asked them to state their objections, if they had any, to the adoption of his religion. He closed his address with a strong appeal to their reasoning powers, and after he had finished speaking, the Seneca chiefs retired for a conference. After several hours of talking, Red Jacket came from the tent in which they had been seated and, striding forward, delivered the following speech, which stands as one of the greatest examples of Indian eloquence that is known to history. Friend and brother, he began, it was the will of the Great Spirit that we should meet together this day. He orders all things, and he has given us a fine day for our council. He has taken his garment from before the sun and has caused the bright orb to shine with brightness upon us. Our eyes are opened so that we see clearly. Our ears are unstopped so that we have been able to distinctly hear the words which you have spoken. For all of these favors we thank the Great Spirit and Him only. Brother, this council fire was kindled by you. It was at your request that we came together at this time. We have listened with attention to what you have said. You have requested us to speak our minds freely. This gives us great joy, for we now consider that we stand upright before you and can speak what we think. All have heard your voice and all speak to you as one man. Our minds are agreed. Brother, you say that you want an answer to your talk before you leave this place. It is right that you should have one, as you are a great distance from home, and we do not wish to detain you. But we will first look back a little, and tell you what our fathers have told us, and what we have heard from the white people. Brother, listen to what we say. There was a time when our forefathers owned this great land, meaning the continent of North America, a common belief among the Indians. Their seats extended from the rising to the setting of the sun. The Great Spirit had made it for the use of Indians, and he had created the buffalo, the deer, and other animals for food. He made the bear and the deer, and their skins served us for clothing. He had scattered them over the country and had taught us how to take them. He had caused the earth to produce corn for bread. All this he had done for his red children because he loved them. If we had any disputes about hunting grounds, they were generally settled without the shedding of much blood. But an evil day came upon us. Your forefathers crossed the great waters and landed on this island. Their numbers were small. They found friends and not enemies. They told us they had fled from their own country for fear of wicked men and had come here to enjoy their religion. They asked for a small seat. We took pity on them, granted their request, and they sat down amongst us. We gave them corn and meat. They gave us poison, spiritous liquor, in return. The white people had now found our country. Tidings were carried back, and more came amongst them. Yet we did not fear them. We took them to be friends. They called us brothers. We believed them and gave them a large seat. 
At length their numbers had greatly increased. They wanted more land, they wanted our country, our eyes were opened, and our minds became uneasy. Wars took place, Indians were hired to fight against Indians, and many of our people were destroyed. They also brought strong liquors among us. It was strong and powerful, and has slain thousands. Brother, our seats were once large, and yours were very small. You have now become a great people, and we have scarcely a place left to spread our blankets. You have got our country, but you are not satisfied. You want to force your religion upon us. Brother, continue to listen. You say that you are sent to instruct us how to worship the great spirit agreeably to his mind, and if we do not take hold of the religion which you white people teach, we shall be unhappy hereafter. You say that you are right and we are lost. How do we know this to be true? We understand that your religion is written in a book. If it was intended for us as well as you say, why has not the great spirit given it to us, and not only to us? But why did he not give to our forefathers the knowledge of that book with the means of understanding it rightly? We only know what you tell us about it. How shall we know when to believe, being so often deceived by the white people? Brother, you say there is but one way to worship and serve the great spirit. If there is but one religion, why do you white people differ so much about it? Why not all agree, as you can all read the book? Brother, we do not understand these things. We are told that your religion was given to your forefathers and has been handed down father to son. We also have a religion which has been given to our forefathers and has been handed down to us, their children. We worship that way. It teaches us to be thankful for all of the favors we receive, to love each other, and to be united. We never quarrel about religion. Brother, the great spirit has made us all, but he has made a great difference between his white and red children. He has given us a different complexion and different customs. To you he has given the arts, to these he has not opened our eyes. We know these things to be true. Since he has made so great a difference between us and other things, why may not we conclude that he has given us a different religion according to our understanding? The great spirit does right. He knows what is best for his children. We are satisfied. Brother, we do not wish to destroy your religion or take it from you. We only want to enjoy our own. Brother, you say you have not come to get our land or our money, but to enlighten our minds. I will now tell you that I have been at your meetings and saw you collecting money from the meeting. I cannot tell what this money was intended for, but suppose it was for your minister, and if we should conform to your way of thinking, perhaps you may want some from us. Brother, we are told that you have been preaching to white people in this place. These people are our neighbors. We are acquainted with them. We will wait a little while and see what effect your preaching has upon them. If we find it does them good and makes them honest and less disposed to cheat Indians, we will then consider again what you have said. Brother, you have now heard our answer to your talk, and this is all we have to say at present. As we are going to part, we will come and take you by the hand, and hope the Great Spirit will protect you on your journey and return you safe to your friends. End of section 23. Recording by Valerie Marino. Section 24 of The United States This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2020 The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 24 The Burning of the Philadelphia 1804 by Cyrus Townsend Brady The piratical people of the Barbary states seized the vessels of all nations that did not pay them tribute, and held officers and crews as slaves in a horrible servitude. In 1803 the American frigate Philadelphia, when blockading the harbor of Tripoli, was captured by the pirates and refitted. Decatur, with the permission of Commodore Preble, set off in a little catch, the Intrepid, to destroy her. The Editor It had been arranged that the attack of the catch should be supported by the siren's boats, but delay occurring, Decatur decided not to wait for them, remarking to his officers, The fewer the numbers, the greater the honor. It was still early evening, and with beating hearts the men on the brig watched the little ketch speed into the harbour toward the Philadelphia. The frigate lay swinging to the wind under the guns of the Bashaw's castle, 
and protected on every side by the powerful land batteries and forts, mounting over 115 heavy guns, beside numberless smaller pieces, and manned by 25,000 men. On either side, reaching toward the entrance of the harbour, like the horns of a wide crescent, were arranged three smart cruisers, two large galleys and nineteen gunboats. The group of vessels resembled an open mouth, at the back of which was the Philadelphia. Into these jaws of death Decatur boldly sent the intrepid. The breeze being still fresh, though dying, drags composed of buckets, spare spars and canvas were cast astern to diminish the speed of the vessel coming on too rapidly, as any attempt to take in sail would have been suspicious. As the hours of the evening wore away, the wind fell, and she crept slowly up the harbour. The evening was balmy and pleasant. The moon in that tropic land had flooded the heavens with mystic light, bathing the minarets and towers of the sleeping town upon the shores with silver splendour. Lights twinkled here and there in the white-walled city, and the Philadelphia herself was brilliantly illuminated by long rows of battle-lanterns, which sent beams of yellow luster to mingle with the soft moonlight upon the sparkling water. The frigate's foremast had been cut away in the effort to get her off the reef, her topmasts were housed, and the lower yards lay athwart ship on the gunwales. The lower rigging was set up, and, as it was afterward learned, all her guns were shotted. A heavy crew, probably three hundred and fifty men, was on board. What must have been the sensations of the men in that little ketch as they glided along? To what were they going? Destruction? Victory? What would be the end of it? By Decatur's orders, the men had concealed themselves by laying flat upon the decks, behind the bulwarks, rails, masts, bits, etc., and only a few of the seamen, dressed like Sicilian sailors, with Decatur and the pilot aft to con the ship, and an old battle-scarred veteran at the wheel, were visible. Eighty-three men in a little ramshackle boat, a cockle shell, were going into a harbour defended by scientifically constructed and well-armed batteries to attempt to take a thirty-eight-gun frigate, full-manned and armed, and surrounded by a fleet of small boats carrying fifty to sixty more guns, all bearing upon the Philadelphia herself, in expectation of just such an attack. The attack itself to be delivered in the bright moonlight and in the early evening, about half after ten o'clock. The very audacity of the conception strikes one with amazement, and to its boldness is largely due to immunity the attackers enjoyed. That anybody should attempt such a thing was absolutely incredible. The thoughts of the young men doubtless went back to home and friends, sweethearts and wives, but, with the determination of heroes, they schooled their beating hearts, nerved their resolution, and stifled any sensations of trepidation which might naturally possess them. As they approached the Philadelphia, Decatur ordered the seamen at the wheel to head the ketch for the bows of the latter ship, determining to lay his vessel athwart the hawse of the frigate and board from thence. As they drew near, the Tripolitan hailed. By Decatur's direction, the pilot answered that they were traders from Malta who had lost their anchors in the recent storm, and desired the privilege of riding by the Philadelphia for the night, that is, attaching their boat to the frigate's cables until morning. This not unusual request was granted as a matter of course, and after assuring the watchful Tripolitan that the brig in the offing, about which he had made inquiry, was an English schooner, the transfer, the siren's boat, which was swinging astern, was manned by the sailors upon the deck, and a line carried forward to the port-sheet cable. At this moment a sudden shift of wind took the ketch back, and she hung motionless, directly in line with the frigate's battery, and not forty yards away. The position was one fraught with the greatest danger. If they were discovered now, they were lost. 
The pilot, however, by decatur's orders, amused the enemy with descriptions of the cargo and sea gossip in his lingua franca, the common language of the Mediterranean, until the boat got away, and the catch feeling the breeze moved forward again. The coolness and resource of their young commander had saved them. The Tripolitans, with ready kindness, soon to be ill-requited, had sent a boat of their own with a cable leading from the port quarter of which they desired the catch to lie. With great presence of mind the Americans intercepted the boat and took the cable back to the catch themselves. Two lines were fastened together and then passed in board, where the men, lying down on the deck, grasped it in their hands without rising and lustily hauled away, breasting the intrepid steadily in toward the frigate. As the catch gathered way, she shot into the moonlight between the shadows cast by the masts of the Philadelphia, when the Tripolitan commander at once discovered her anchors hanging over her bows in plain sight. Indignant at the deception which had been practiced, but still unsuspicious of the true character of the stranger, he ordered the fasts immediately to be cut. At the same moment some of his crew discovered the men upon the decks of the catch. The alarm was instantly given. The cry, Americanos, Americanos, rang out over the water. The Americans sprang to their feet, and though the catch at this time lay directly under the broadside of the Philadelphia, and could have been blown out of the water by her heavy guns, disregarding their peril in their wild desire for action after their long restraint, they gave such a pull upon the line that before it could be cut the catch had sufficient way to strike the side of the philadelphia where eager hands at once made her fast not an order had been given nor a sound made decatur now shouted the command borders away and sprang at the main chains midshipmen morris and laws who were beside him leaped forward at the same instant Laws dashed in through a port, but the pistols in his boarding belt caught between the gun and the port sill, the foot of Decatur slipped, and Charles Morris was the first man to stand upon the deck of the Philadelphia. A second after, the other two men were with him, and the rest of the crew poured in over the rail, and with cutlasses or boarding pikes charged down upon the astonished Tripolitans. The weapons were cold steel, the watchword Philadelphia. No firearms were used, for Preble's strict orders had been to carry all with the sword. Without cheers and with desperate energy, the little band dashed at the masses of astonished and terrified men before them, and the whistle of the cutlasses, the ring of steel against steel, the thud of the pike as it buried itself in some beating heart, alone gave evidence for the fell purpose of the stern borders. Their attack was pressed home with such vigor that the Americans could not be denied. Forming a line from bulwark to bulwark, they cleared the deck. After a short but fierce resistance, in which upward of twenty Tripolitans were killed, those remaining on the upper deck jumped overboard, where many of them were killed by Anderson and his boat crew, or were drowned, others concealing themselves below to meet a worse fate later. A similar scene was enacted on the gun deck by Lawrence, Bainbridge, McDonough, and others, during and following the action above. Only the watchword in the darkness and excitement had prevented several of the Americans from attacking each other. In ten minutes the ship was captured. Not an American had been wounded, so far. Decatur would have given half his life to have brought her out, and many naval officers have believed that he could have done so. It would have been a matter of extreme difficulty in face of the dangers, especially as there was not a yard crossed nor a sail bent, and as he had received positive orders not to attempt it, he had to obey. The catch had been filled with combustibles, and they were immediately passed on board. The crew had been divided into several different parties, and each body of men, under the direction of an officer, had been carefully instructed just what was to be done. With remarkable speed and order, 
each group proceeded to its appointed station and speedily arranging the inflammable matter applied the torch so rapidly was this done that those charged with the duty of starting the fires below were almost cut off from escape by the flames and smoke from the conflagration above in less than thirty minutes the ship was on fire in every direction and the americans had regained the catch decature was the last man to leave the philadelphia the bowfast and the grapnels on the intrepid were hastily cut the sweeps manned and instant endeavour was made to get clear for some unaccountable reason however the ketch clung to the frigate broad sheets of flame came rushing out from the latter's ports and played over the deck of the intrepid the situation was serious it was the most critical moment of the enterprise all the powder on the intrepid in default of a magazine was stored upon the deck covered only by a tarpaulin over which the flames were roaring in another moment they would be blown up they retained their presence of mind however and soon discovered that the stern fast had not been cast off decature and others sprang upon the taffrail in the midst of the flames and as no axes were at hand hacked the line asunder with their swords the intrepid was clear after a few lusty strokes which carried them a little distance away the men stopped rowing and gave three hearty american cheers they waited until success was achieved and then in the midst of further danger gave tongue to their emotions a significant action at the same moment the startled tripolitans awoke to life the minutes of stupor with which they had witnessed the attack which they hardly comprehended gave place to energy the rolling of the drums upon the shore mingled with the wild shouts and cries of the excited soldiery lights appeared upon the parapets and immediately the roar of a heavy gun which sent a shell over the ketch broke the silence as if this had been a signal every battery and every vessel in the harbour awoke to action and commenced a furious cannonade solid shot shells canister and grape shrieked and screamed in the air about the devoted intrepid casting up beautiful jets d'eau upon the surface of the bay which the flames from the burning philadelphia rendered as light as day the americans having cheered to their hearts content bent to their oars and with such energy as they probably never had used before they speedily fled from the harbour the spectacle they were leaving was one of awe-inspiring magnificence the frigate from her long cruise in the tropic latitude was as dry as paper and burned like tinder the flames ran upon the lofty spars in lambent columns and clustered about the broad tops in rosy capitals of wavering and mysterious beauty as the fire spread the guns of her battery became heated and in sullen succession they poured forth their messengers of death upon the harbour and the affrighted town toward which the starboard broadside bore it was a death song and a last salute for as the eager watchers gazed in melancholy triumph upon the results of their own destructive handiwork she drifted ashore and with a frightful explosion which seemed to rend the heavens and surface the sky with fire she blew up a moment of silence supervened which was broken by the roar of the batteries resuming the cannonade strange to say the intrepid passed through the fusillade unharmed one man being slightly wounded and the grape-shot passing through a sail the moon had set and the eager watchers on the siren finally lost track of the vessel in the darkness their burning anxiety as to her fate was not relieved until a boat dashed alongside and a manly figure clad in a sailor's rough jacket and grimed with smoke sprang on board triumphantly announcing their safe arrival it was decature in 1815 decature succeeded in compelling the day to abandon his attacks on american vessels to surrender his prisoners and pay for all property destroyed. 
End of section 24. Section 25 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 25 the trials of the british minister in jefferson's administration eighteen o three to eighteen o nine by james parton the system of precedence was abolished this was settled at a cabinet meeting early in the first term when the whole barbarous code of precedence was swept away these rules were substituted one residence to pay the first visit to strangers and among strangers whether native or foreign first comers call first upon later comers to this rule there was allowed one exception foreign ministers from the necessity of making themselves known pay the first visit to the secretary of state which is returned two when brought together in society all are perfectly equal whether foreign or domestic titled or untitled in or out of office the president amplified these rules thus the families of foreign ministers arriving at the seat of government receive the first visit from those of the national ministers as from all other residents members of the legislature and of the judiciary independent of their offices have a right as strangers to receive the first visit no title being admitted here those of foreigners give no precedence difference of grade among the diplomatic members gives no precedence at public ceremonies to which the government invites the presence of foreign ministers and their families a convenient seat or station will be provided for them with any other strangers invited and the families of the national ministers each taking place as they arrive and without any precedence to maintain the principle of equality or of pell-mell and prevent the growth of precedence out of courtesy the members of the executive will practice at their own houses and recommend an adherence to the ancient usages of the country of gentlemen in mass giving precedence to the ladies in mass in passing from one apartment where they are assembled into another all this with the friendly humane usages that grew out of it or were akin to it agreeable as it was to most persons shocked some ladies and offended all men who owed their importance solely to rank or office mr jackson english minister in eighteen o nine being a gentleman of sense and good humour was amused and pleased during his first conference with president madison which proved to be very long when a negro servant brought in some glasses of punch and a seed cake just as might have been done in a farmhouse of the day but his wife lamented that her husband after having been accustomed to treat with the civilized governments of europe should have to negotiate with the savage democrats of america it so chanced that the british minister from eighteen o three to eighteen o nine with whom jefferson had most to do mary by name but not by nature was a fanatic of etiquette and it appears that previous to his presentation to the president he had not heard of the business-like manner in which the affairs of the white house were conducted he was stunned at the manner of his reception it made an impression upon his mind which neither explanation nor the lapse of years could even soften much less obliterate and really when we consider that he had passed his life at courts where the nod the smile the frown the glance the tone the silence the presence the absence of the head of the government 
were matters of importance to be noted recorded transmitted and weighed we ought not to laugh at this mr mary as we do besides as mr jefferson remarks poor mary had learned nothing of diplomacy but its suspicions without had enough to distinguish when they were misplaced nevertheless he comes down to us borne on a pillow of laughter and he remains to this day one of the stock jests of washington thus he recounted his woes three years after the event to mr josiah quincy of massachusetts the ablest federalist in congress and one of the worthiest i called on mr madison who accompanied me officially to introduce me to the president we went together to the mansion house i being in full official costume as the etiquette of my place required on such a formal introduction of a minister from great britain to the president of the united states on arriving at the hall of audience we found it empty at which mr madison seemed surprised and proceeded to an entry leading to the president's study i followed him supposing the introduction was to take place in the adjoining room at this moment mr jefferson entered the entry at the other end and all three of us were packed in this narrow space from which to make room i was obliged to back out in this awkward position my introduction to the president was made by mr madison mr jefferson's appearance soon explained to me that the general circumstances of my reception had not been accidental but studied i in my official costume found myself at the hour of reception he had himself appointed introduced to a man as president of the united states not merely in an undress but actually standing in slippers down at the heels and both pantaloons coat and underclothes indicative of utter slovenliness and indifference to appearances and in a state of negligence actually studied i could not doubt that the whole scene was prepared and intended as an insult not to me personally but to the sovereign i represented it is just possible that mr jefferson thought that morning of the time when governor morris kicked his heels four months in london waiting for the promised answer of the british government to as reasonable and urgent a communication from president washington as one government ever made to another and then had to leave england without getting it possibly also it did happen to occur to his memory that mr adams had been kept vainly waiting three years in england for a reply to the same proposals perhaps too he remembered the period when he was himself presented to the king of england by mr adams and the king froze to them both an example which was followed by the king's friends and society generally so that it required courage for a courtier to show them anything more than cold civility at an evening party and this while well, they were only asking the king to stay the bloody ravages of the indians by giving up the seven posts within the boundaries of their country he may too have thought of the time when he as secretary of state would send an important communication to the british minister at philadelphia and wait many months for an answer but if he failed to answer a letter within three or four days he would be goaded by a second perhaps he thought the time had come to show the federalists that he did not accept great britain at her own valuation and did not believe she was fighting the battle of man and liberty against bonaparte it may be too that he knowing the childish politics of europe and what ridiculous importance was attached there to trifles may have paused before ringing for a pair of shoes not down at the heels and wondered if his old slippers duly reported to bonaparte might not drive another nail into the bargain for louisiana just concluded by mr livingston and mr monroe to the great joy of president and people all these thoughts may have flitted through the president's mind and held back his hand from the bell rope but in all probability he had no thoughts of the kind and only wore the clothes he usually did while at work but poor mary's troubles were not yet at an end he and his wife dined one day at the white house and when dinner was announced the president offered his arm to the lady nearest him at the moment mrs madison not to mrs mary who was on the other side of the room insult upon insult poor mary made such an outcry at this in washington that mr madison deemed it best to explain the circumstances to monroe the american minister in london that he might be prepared to meet mary's version mr mary did relate his grievances to the english minister for foreign affairs who however forbore to mention it to monroe if he had monroe was ready for him for besides being fully alive to the humour of the affair he had seen a few weeks before 
in an official london drawing-room the wife of an under-secretary of state accorded precedence over his own mrs mary went no more to the white house and her husband went only when official duty compelled but nothing could tire the placable good nature of jefferson some time after desirous to restore social intercourse he caused mr mary to be informally asked whether he and his wife would accept an invitation to a family dinner at the president's house and receiving as he understood an affirmative intimation mr jefferson sent the invitation written with his own hand mary rose to his opportunity he wrote to the secretary of state asking whether the president of the united states had invited him as a private gentleman or as british plenipotentiary for if as a private gentleman he must obtain the king's permission before he could accept if in his official character he must have an assurance that he would be treated with the respect due to it madison with short civility waived the solution of this problem and the matter dropped but it was not till eighteen o nine that british interests in america were confided to abler hands some other points of public etiquette were now settled on rational principles once and forever the fussy incompetence recently in power had been concerned to know the relation which the president sustained to the governors of states precisely how much more exalted a president was than a governor the exact degree of deference a governor would show a president and the forms in which deference should be expressed in july eighteen o one the governor of virginia asked the president to indicate the etiquette which he thought should regulate the communications between the state governments and the general government his reply in substance was let there be no special etiquette between president and governor each being the supreme head of an independent government no difference of rank can be admitted they are equals let us continue then as in general washington's time to write freely just as public business requires and with no more ceremony than obvious propriety and convenience dictate if it be possible he said to be certainly conscious of anything i am conscious of feeling no difference between writing to the highest and lowest being on earth end of section twenty five this recording is in the public domain section twenty six of the united states read for librivox dot org by sonia the claremont's first advertisement long before the end of the eighteenth century there were attempts to navigate by steam power but for the lack of a practical steam engine they failed in seventeen eighty two james watt produced his engine and then experimenters were numerous in both england and america a boat made by john fitch in america reached a speed of seven knots an hour in seventeen ninety seven robert fulton a pennsylvania boy of irish parents succeeded in building the claremont whose trial ship took place on the hudson river august seventh eighteen o seven in less than a month as is seen by the following advertisement she was making regular trips between new york and albany fulton can hardly be said to have invented steam navigation but he was certainly the first to make it a practical and financial success the editor the public is informed how to take passage on the claremont september second eighteen o seven the north river steamboat will leave paulus hook ferry on friday fourth of september at six in the morning and arrive at albany on saturday in the afternoon provisions good berth and accommodations are provided the charge to each passenger as follows to newburgh three dollars time fourteen hours to poughkeepsie four dollars time seventeen hours to esopus four and a half dollars time twenty hours to hudson five dollars time thirty hours to albany seven dollars time thirty six hours for places apply to william vandervoort number forty eight courtland street on the corner of greenwich street end of section twenty six this recording is in the public domain section twenty seven of the united states read for librivox dot org the united states volume two part four the louisiana territory historical note by treaties made at the close of the french and indian and the revolutionary wars florida and the louisiana territory that is the country west of the mississippi 
and also both shores at its mouth, were given to Spain. In 1800, a secret treaty was made between Spain and France, by which all this area except Florida was retroceded to France. America was deeply interested, for no one knew to what length French ambition might go. Moreover, American commerce might easily be prohibited from passing out through the mouth of the Mississippi. President Jefferson sent Robert R. Livingston and James Monroe to France with authority from Congress to offer Napoleon $2 million in cash for the island of New Orleans. Napoleon surprised them by offering to sell the whole Louisiana Territory, and in behalf of the American people, they purchased it for the sum of $15 million. Quote, by making this purchase, Jefferson more than doubled the area of the United States. Before 1803, that area was 827,844 square miles. Jefferson's purchase added over 900,000 square miles, out of which have since been formed the states of Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, and the two Dakotas, with a great part of the states of Minnesota and Colorado, and also the Indian Territory, including Oklahoma. West of the Louisiana Territory and north of the Spanish possessions was a magnificent and fertile country where white men had never set foot. To what nation Oregon belonged was doubtful. Its great river had been discovered in 1792 by Captain Robert Gray of Boston in the good ship Columbia, whose name he gave to the river. The illustrious British sailors Cook, Mears, and Vancouver had explored parts of the coast. In 1804, President Jefferson sent an overland expedition under Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. These explorers ascended the Missouri River to its sources, then found the Valley of the Columbia and explored it down to the Pacific Ocean, thus strengthening our claim to the possession of Oregon, unquote. John Fisk. End of Section 27. This recording is in the public domain. Section 28 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 28. Napoleon Plans to Sell Louisiana. 1803. By A. E. Winship and Robert W. Wallace. Know merely, Lucien, that I had decided to sell Louisiana to the Americans. This was the startling announcement made by the first consul of France to his younger brother, while disporting himself in his bath, scented with cologne water. The graphic story is narrated by Lucien Bonaparte in his memoirs, published in Paris in 1882. The evening before the incident of the bath, Joseph Bonaparte visited his brother Lucien with a piece of news that kept them from the theater for a night. The general wishes to alienate Louisiana, said Joseph. Bah, said Lucien, who will buy it from him? The Americans. The idea. If he could wish it, the chambers would not consent to it. And therefore, responded Joseph, he expects to do without their consent. That is what he replied to me. What? He really said that to you? That is a little too much. But no, it is impossible. It is a bit of brag at your expense. No, no, insisted Joseph. He spoke very seriously. And what is more, he added to me that this sale would furnish him the first funds for war. The brothers parted for the night with the understanding that they would visit Napoleon early the next morning, when they hoped to dissuade him from alienating the colony. The morning found them both at the Tuileries, just as Napoleon had entered his bath. He invited them in. The conversation reverted at once to Louisiana, the brothers endeavoring to dissuade him. Lucien quietly, Joseph more warmly, from alienating the territory, and both urging the point that 
the chambers will not give their consent to it. Gentlemen, said Napoleon from his perfumed bath, think what you please about it, but give up this affair as lost, both of you. You, Lucien, on account of the sale in itself. You, Joseph, because I shall get along without the consent of any one whomsoever. Do you understand? At this, Joseph lost his temper, and approaching the bathtub, replied in an angry tone, You will do well, my dear brother, not to expose your plans to parliamentary discussion, for I declare to you that I am the first one to place himself, if it is necessary, at the head of the opposition which cannot fail to be made to you. This vehement resolution was met by more than Olympian bursts of laughter from Napoleon, which angered Joseph still more, and led him to exclaim, Laugh, 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 then, none the less I will do what I say, and although I do not like to mount the tribune, this time they shall see me there. Upon this Napoleon lifted himself halfway out of his bath, and said in a tone energetically serious and solemn, You will have no need to stand forth as orator of the opposition, for I repeat to you that this discussion will not take place for the reason that the plan, which is not fortunate enough to obtain your approbation, conceived by me, negotiated by me, will be ratified and executed by me all alone. Do you understand? By me, who snapped my fingers at your opposition. By this time Joseph was close to the bathtub, his face red with anger, and heated words about to pass his lips, when Napoleon suddenly sank himself into the water of which the tub was full, and a wave splashed Joseph from head to foot. He had received, says Lucien, all over him the most copious ablution. But the perfume flood calmed Joseph's anger, and he contented himself with letting the valet sponge and dry his clothes, the brothers meanwhile regretting greatly that the valet had remained a witness of this serious folly between such actors. End of section 28. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 29 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 29. The Bargain Purchase of the Louisiana Territory. 1803. By James Parton. Bonaparte's plan was to invade England, a thing of immense difficulty and vast expense. He wanted money, and dared not press the French people further at the beginning of a war. On Easter Sunday, April 10, in the afternoon, after having taken conspicuous part in the revived ceremonies of the occasion, Mr. Monroe being still many leagues from Paris, but expected hourly, the first consul opened a conversation with two of his ministers upon Louisiana. One of these ministers, who reports the scene, was that old friend of Jefferson's, Barbet Marbois, for whom, twenty-six years before, he had compiled his Notes on Virginia, a gentleman ten years resident at Philadelphia, where he married the daughter of a governor of Pennsylvania. The other minister had served in America under Rochambeau, during the Revolutionary War. I know, said the First Consul, speaking with passion and vehemence, I know the full value of Louisiana, and I have been desirous of repairing the fault of the French negotiator who abandoned it in 1763. A few lines of a treaty have restored it to me, and I have scarcely recovered it, and I must expect to lose it. But if it escapes from me, it shall one day cost dearer to those who oblige me to strip myself of it than to those to whom I wish to deliver it. 
The English have successively taken from France, Canada, Cape Breton, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and the richest portions of Asia. They shall not have the Mississippi, which they covet. I have not a moment to lose in putting it out of their reach. I think of ceding it to the United States. I can scarcely say that I cede it to them, for it is not yet in our possession. If, however, I leave the least time to our enemies, I shall only transmit an empty title to those Republicans whose friendship I seek. They only ask of me one town in Louisiana. But I already consider the colonies entirely lost. And it appears to me that, in the hands of this growing power, it will be more useful to the policy, and even to the commerce of France, than if I should attempt to keep it. He paused to hear the opinion of the two ministers. Barbet Marbois said in a long discourse, The province is as good as gone. Let the Americans have it. The other said at great length, No, there is still a chance of our being able to keep it. It will be time to give up so precious a possession when we must. The three continued to converse on the subject till late at night, and the master broke up the conference without announcing his decision. The ministers remained at St. Cloud. At daybreak, Barbet Marbois received the summons to attend the first consul in his cabinet. Dispatches had arrived from England, showing that the king and ministry were entirely resolved upon war, and were pushing preparations with extraordinary vigor. When Monsieur Marbois had read these, Bonaparte resumed the subject of the evening's conversation. Irresolution and deliberation, he said, are no longer in reason. I renounce Louisiana. It is not only New Orleans that I will cede. It is the whole colony, without any reservation. I renounce it with the greatest regret. To attempt obstinately to retain it would be folly. I direct you to negotiate this affair with the envoys of the United States. Do not even wait the arrival of Mr. Monroe. Have an interview this very day with Mr. Livingston, but I require a great deal of money for this war, and I would not like to commence it with new contributions. If I should regulate my terms according to the value of those vast regions to the United States, the indemnity would have no limits. I will be moderate, in consideration of the necessity in which I am of making a sale. But keep this to yourself. I want fifty million francs, and for less than that sum I will not treat. I would rather make a desperate attempt to keep those fine countries. Tomorrow you shall have your full powers. The deed was done. The rest was merely the usual cheapening and chaffering that passes between buyer and seller when the commodity has no market price. Mr. Monroe's arrival was well-timed. For Mr. Livingston had lost all faith in the possibility of getting New Orleans by purchase, and was unprepared even to consider a proposition for buying the whole province. He evidently thought that the French ministers were all liars together, and he looked upon this sudden change of tone, after so many months of neglect or evasion, as a mere artifice for delay. "'If Mr. Monroe agrees with me,' said Livingston, to Talleyrand a day or two before Monroe's arrival. We shall negotiate no further on the subject, but advise our government to take possession. The times are critical, and though I do not know what instructions Mr. Monroe may bring, I am perfectly satisfied they will require a precise and prompt notice. I am fearful, from the little progress I have made, that my government will consider me a very indolent negotiator. Talleyrand laughed. I will give you a certificate, said he, that you are the most importunate one I have yet met with. But Mr. Livingston soon discovered that all had really changed with regard to Louisiana. On the day after Monroe's arrival, while sitting at dinner with him and other guests, Livingston espied Monsieur Barbet Marbois strolling about in his garden. During the interview that followed, business made progress. Marbois took the liberty of telling a few diplomatic falsehoods to the American minister. Instead of the fifty millions, which in his History of Louisiana, he says Napoleon demanded, 
He told Mr. Livingston that the sum required was one hundred millions. He represented the first consul as saying, Well, you have charge of the treasury. Make the Americans give you one hundred millions, pay their claim, and take the whole country. Mr. Livingston was aghast at the magnitude of the sum. After a long conversation, Marbois dropped to sixty million, the United States to pay its own claimants, which would require twenty million more. It is in vain to ask such a thing, said Livingston. It is so greatly beyond our means. He thought, too, that his government would be perfectly satisfied with New Orleans and Florida, and had no disposition to extend across the river. Then it was that Mr. Monroe, fresh from Washington, and knowing the full extent of the President's wishes, knowing his aversion to the mere proximity of the French, came upon the scene with decisive and most happy effect. In a few days all was arranged. Monsieur Barbet Marbois' offer was accepted. Twenty days after the St. Cloud Conference, and eighteen days after Mr. Monroe's arrival, the convention was concluded, which gave imperial magnitude and completeness to the United States, and supplied Napoleon with fifteen millions of dollars to squander upon a vain attempt to invade and ravage another country. Monsieur Marbois related that as soon as the three negotiators had signed the treaties, they all rose and shook hands. Mr. Livingston gave utterance to the joy and satisfaction of them all. We have lived long, said he, but this is the noblest work of our whole lives. The treaty which we have just signed has not been obtained by art nor dictated by force, and is equally advantageous to the two contracting parties. It will change vast solitudes into flourishing districts. From this day the United States take their place among the powers of the first rank. The United States will re-establish the maritime rights of all the world, which are now usurped by a single nation. The instruments which we have just signed will cause no tears to be shed. They prepare ages of happiness for innumerable generations of human creatures. Mississippi and Missouri will see them succeed one another and multiply, truly worthy of the regard and care of providence in the bosom of equality, under just laws, freed from the errors of superstition and bad government. End of section 29. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 30 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Taking Possession of Louisiana Territory by Tour de Tourstrup. Painting, page 114. On the 20th of December, 1803, Louisiana was turned over to the American commissioners, General Wilkinson and Governor Claiborne. The commissioners had come to New Orleans and encamped just outside the walls of the city three days before, and sent a messenger asking for a conference in which they might arrange for the transfer. On the 20th, the Americans marched into the city, led by the commissioners, and were received by Lazare. The French commander delivered to Claiborne the keys of the city. The French flag descended from the staff in the square, and was replaced by the American flag. There was no very great enthusiasm, because the people had nothing to do about making the change, and they did not know what it might mean for them. End of section 30. This recording is in the public domain. Section 31 of The United States. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 31. Exploring the Louisiana Territory by James Parton. In 1804, the government sent out a party, 
under Meriwether Lewis and James Clark, to explore the new purchase from France. They were to cross the continent, trace the Missouri River to its source, and open negotiations with the various Indian tribes along their way. The Editor the party consisted of two officers and forty-three men. They sailed up the Missouri in three boats. The largest was fifty-five feet long, drew three feet of water, had ten feet of deck in the stern, and a ten-foot forecastle. It was propelled by twenty-two oars, the side being provided with a large square sail, and it had movable sides that could be raised so as to protect the crew from the fire of an enemy. The other two boats, one of six and one of seven oars, were open. Beside the boats, they had two horses, designed to be led along the banks for occasional use in exploring and hunting. Their stores consisted of a great quantity of ammunition, a supply of concentrated food of various kinds, and fourteen bales of Indian presents, such as richly laced coats, flags, medals, knives, tomahawks, beads, mirrors, handkerchiefs, ribbons, and paints. Starting up the Missouri on that bright May morning in 1804, the whole party seemed to have been possessed with a quiet, modest confidence in the success of the expedition. In such an affair as this, imaginary perils usually far transcend the real dangers. The private soldiers as we learn from the diary of a sergeant, expected to pass through a country possessed by numerous powerful and warlike nations of savages, of gigantic stature, fierce, treacherous, and cruel, and particularly hostile to white people. Rumor had also given out that the mountains that lay in their path were inaccessible to human effort, but they all seemed fully resolved to accomplish the purpose of the government and satisfy the high expectations of the people, unless prevented by absolute impossibilities. Sailing about twenty-five miles a day, never hasting, seldom resting, pausing now and then to hold talks with the Indians, or to secure supplies of game, they kept steadily on their way. In a month they were past the Kansas River. They celebrated the Fourth of July by firing a swivel at sunrise and sunset, drinking a glass of grog all round, and naming a creek on which they encamped, Independence. August 2nd, 1804, they held a grand council on some high land adjoining the river, which, in consequence, has borne the name ever since of Council Bluffs. Soon they came to their first buffalo, and discovered the prairie dog, and at last, November 2nd, six months after starting, they went into winter quarters among the Mandan Indians, 1,610 miles above the mouth of the Missouri River. After a winter of no great hardship, during which they subsisted upon elk, buffalo, antelope, deer, porcupine, prairie dogs, and wild turkeys, they were ready, April 7, 1805, to resume the ascent of the river. The large boat, however, they sent back to St. Louis, with their diaries, bales of furs, horns of the antelope, and thirteen of their number, while thirty-one men and one squaw formed the party for further exploration. May 3rd, 1805, they passed a stream to which they gave the name Two Thousand Mile River. Then they came to the region of the grizzly bear, an animal none of them had either seen or heard of but in hunting which they had remarkable success. Having arrived at the forks of the Missouri, they tried their skill at bestowing suitable names upon the various branches and neighboring streams. The north branch they called Jefferson, the south, Gallatin, the middle, Madison. One small river above the forks they named Philosophy, and another below they called Maria, after the president's youngest daughter. Another branch was called Wisdom, another Philanthropy. All of these names had but one object, which was to do honor to the President. August 11, they passed 3,000 Mile Island, and August 18, they left the Missouri, and after working their way across the mountains, 
with exceeding difficulty by a road which is still called Lewis and Clark's Pass. They bought twenty-seven horses and one mule of the Indians, which brought them in three weeks to the Columbia River. They buried their saddles upon its banks, entrusted their horses to the Indians, and having made canoes, they embarked and floated down toward the ocean. In just a month they reached tidewater and heard of ships. Eleven days more brought them to where huge waves came rolling in from the broad Pacific. November 15, 1805, one year and six months after leaving the Mississippi River, they saw the Pacific. But now winter was upon them. They constructed huts, made salt, sent out hunting parties, gained the friendship of the Indians, and made themselves comfortable until the 23rd of March, 1806, when they started on their return. The last entry of Captain Lewis's journal, written on the 23rd of September, 1806, was as follows. Tuesday, 23rd, descended to the Mississippi and round to St. Louis, where we arrived at 12 o'clock, and, having fired a salute, went on shore and received the heartiest welcome from the whole village. They had been gone two years, four months, and ten days, long before they had been generally given up as lost, and this unexpected return was the great sensation of that year. Never, says Mr. Jefferson, did a similar event excite more joy through the United States. The humblest of its citizens had taken a lively interest in the issue of this journey, and looked forward with impatience for the information it would furnish. Captain Lewis's diary was published in London in a costly, solid quarto, and in Philadelphia in two volumes, octavo. The maps and charts, the observations and specimens which were very numerous and most accurately taken, were deposited among the archives of the government. Congress made a grant of land to all the members of the party, and the President appointed the two chiefs to important territorial governorships. End of Section 31 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 32 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 32. Lewis and Clark at the Source of the Missouri from their journal monday august the twelfth eighteen o five this morning as soon as it was light captain lewis sent drewyer to reconnoitre if possible the route of the indians in about an hour and a half he returned after following the tracks of the horse which we had lost yesterday to the mountains where they ascended and were no longer visible Captain Lewis now decided on making the circuit along the foot of the mountains, which formed a cove, expecting by that means to find a road across them, and accordingly sent Drewyer on one side and Shields on the other. In this way they crossed four small rivulets near each other, on which were some bowers or conical lodges of willow brush, which seemed to have been made recently. From the manner in which the ground in the neighbourhood was torn up, the Indians appeared to have been gathering roots. But Captain Lewis could not discover what particular plants they were searching for, nor could he find any fresh track till at the distance of four miles from his camp he met a large plain Indian road which came into the cove from the northeast and wound along the foot of the mountain to the southwest approaching obliquely the main stream he had left yesterday. Down this road he now went toward the southwest. At the distance of five miles it crossed a large run or creek, which is a principal branch of the main stream into which it falls, just above the high cliffs or gates observed yesterday, and which they now saw below them. 
Here they halted and breakfasted on the last of the deer, keeping a small piece of pork in reserve against accident. They then continued through the low bottom along the main stream, near the foot of the mountains on their right. For the first five miles the valley continues towards the southwest, from two to three miles in width. Then the main stream, which had received two small branches from the left in the valley, turns abruptly to the west through a narrow bottom between the mountains. The road was still plain, and, as it led them directly towards the mountain, the stream gradually became smaller till, after going two miles, it had so greatly diminished in width that one of the men, in a fit of enthusiasm, with one foot on each side of the river, thanked God that he had lived to bestride the Missouri. As they went along, their hopes of soon seeing the waters of the Columbia arose almost to painful anxiety when, after four miles from the last abrupt turn of the river, they reached a small gap formed by the high mountains which recede on each side, leaving room for the Indian road. From the foot of one of the lowest of these mountains, which rises with a gentle ascent of about half a mile, issues the remotest water of the Missouri. They had now reached the hidden source of that river, which had never yet been seen by civilized man. And, as they quenched their thirst at the chaste and icy fountain, as they sat down by the brink of that little rivulet, which yielded its distant and modest tribute to the parent ocean, they felt themselves rewarded for all their labours and all their difficulties. They left reluctantly this interesting spot, and, pursuing the Indian road through the interval of the hills, arrived at the top of a ridge from which they saw high mountains partially covered with snow still to the west of them. The ridge on which they stood formed a dividing line between the waters of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. They followed a descent much steeper than that on the eastern side, and at the distance of three-quarters of a mile reached a handsome, bold creek of cold, clear water running to the westward. They stopped to taste for the first time the waters of the Columbia and after a few minutes followed the road across the steep hills and low hollows till they reached a spring on the side of a mountain. Here they found a sufficient quantity of dry willow brush for fuel, and therefore halted for the night. End of section 32 Recording by Alan Mapstone Section 33 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 33. Sacagawea, 1804, by Edna Dean Proctor. Sacagawea was the Indian woman who acted as a guide to the Lewis and Clark expedition to the Pacific Ocean. The Editor Shoshone Sacagawea, captive and wife was she, on the grassy plains of Dakota, in the land of the Minitari. But she heard the west wind calling, and longed to follow the sun, back to the shining mountains, and the glens where her life begun. So when the valiant captains, fain for the Asian sea, stayed their marvellous journey in the land of the Minotari, the red men wondering weary, Omaha Mandan Sioux, friendly now, now hostile, as they toiled the wilderness through, glad she turned from the grassy plains and led their way to the west, her course as true as the swans that flew north to its reedy nest, her eye as keen as the eagle's when the young lambs feed below, her ear alert to the stags at morn, guarding the fawn and doe. Straight was she as a hillside fir, lithe as the willow tree, 
and her foot as fleet as the antelopes when the hunter rides the lee embroidered tunic and moccasins with braided raven hair and closely belted buffalo robe with her baby nestling there girl of but sixteen summers the homing bird of the quest free of the tongues of the mountains deep on her heart impressed shoshone sakagawea led the way to the west to missouri's broad savannas dark with bison and deer while the grizzly roamed the savage shore and the cougar and wolf prowled near to the cataract's leap and the meadows with lily and rose abloom the sunless trails of the forest and the canyons hush and gloom by the veins of gold and silver and the mountains vast and grim their snowy summits lost in clouds on the wide horizon's brim through sombre pass by soaring peak till the asian wind blew free and lo the roar of the oregon and the splendour of the sea some day in the lordly upland where the snow-fed streams divide a foam for the far atlantic a foam for pacific's tide there by the valiant captains whose glory will never dim while the sun goes down to the asian sea and the stars in ether swim she will stand in bronze as richly brown as the hue of her girlish cheek with broidered robe and braided hair and lips just curved to speak and the mountain winds will murmur as they linger along the crest shoshone sakagawea who led the way to the west end of section 33 this recording is in the public domain recording by alan mapstone section 34 of the united states read for librivox.org the united states volume 2 part 5 the war of 1812 Historical note. To prevent England from interfering with American commerce and from exercising what she claimed to be her right of search, war was declared against Great Britain in 1812. This was an audacious act, for England had sixty times as many warships as the United States, and although she was also at war with France at the time, she had a large and well-trained army. In this war, the advantage on land was with the British and on the sea with the Americans. The attempts of the United States to invade Canada were defeated by the land battles of Queenstown Heights and Lundy's Lane, and counterattacks on the Northwest Territory and on northern New York were frustrated by Perry's naval victory on Lake Erie and McDonough's on Lake Champlain. On the ocean, especially in the first part of the war, the Americans won a series of brilliant victories, and the exploits of the Constitution, the Wasp, the United States, and the Essex aroused the wildest enthusiasm throughout the country. But by the close of the war, superior numbers enabled the British to establish a blockade of the principal ports that kept most of the American frigates idly at anchor. In the summer of 1814, a British fleet sailed up the Chesapeake Bay and landed a force of soldiers that entered Washington with little difficulty and burned the government buildings. Napoleon having been dethroned, the British were able to send more soldiers to America. Early in 1815, a strong force of Wellington's veterans attempted to capture New Orleans, but were defeated with heavy loss by a small force of riflemen under General Jackson. This battle was unnecessary as news was on the way of a treaty of peace that had been signed at Ghent two weeks before. By the terms of the treaty, matters were left as they were before the war, but as the struggle with Napoleon was over, England had no further occasion to assert her right of search. End of section 34. This recording is in the public domain. Section 35 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 35, 
what caused the second war with england eighteen twelve by agnes c blount england was hard pressed in a life-and-death struggle with napoleon to recruit both army and navy conscription was rigidly and ruthlessly enforced yet more england claimed the right to impress british-born subjects in foreign ports to seize deserters in either foreign ports or on foreign ships and most obnoxious of all to search neutral vessels on the ocean highway for deserters from the british flag it was an era of great brutality in military discipline desertions were frequent also thousands of immigrants were flocking to the new nation of the united states and taking out naturalization papers england ignored these naturalization papers when taken out by deserters let us see how the thing worked out a passenger vessel is coming up new york harbor an english frigate with cannon pointed swings across the course signals the american vessel on american waters to slow up sends a young lieutenant with some marines across to the american vessel searches her from stem to stern or compels the american captain to read the roster of the crew forcibly seizes half a dozen of the american crew as british deserters and departs leaving the americans gasping with wonder whether they are a free nation or a tale to the kite of english designs it need not be explained that the offence was often aggravated by the swaggering insolence of the young officers they considered the fury of the unprepared american crew a prime joke in vain the government at washington complained to the government at westminster england pigeonholed the complaint and went serenely on her way searching american vessels from canada to brazil or an english vessel has come to hampton roads to wood and water an english officer thinks he recognizes among the american crews men who have deserted from english vessels three men defy arrest and show their naturalization papers high words follow broken heads and broken canes and the english crew are glad to escape the mob by rowing out to their own vessel is it surprising that the ill feeling on both sides accumulated till there lacked only the match to cause an explosion the explosion came in eighteen o seven h m s leopard cruising off norfolk in june encounters the united states ship chesapeake at three p m the english ship edges down on the american loaded to the water-line with lumber and signals a messenger will be sent across the young english lieutenant going aboard the chesapeake shows written orders from admiral barclay of halifax commanding a search of the chesapeake for six deserters he is very courteous and pleasant about the disagreeable business the orders are explicit he must obey his admiral the american commander is equally courteous he regrets that he must refuse to obey an english admiral's orders but his own government has given most explicit orders that american vessels must not be searched the young englishman returns with serious face the ships were within pistol shot of each other the men on the english decks all at their guns the americans off guard lounging on the lumber piles quick as a flash a cannon shot rips across the chesapeake's bows followed by a broadside and another and yet another that riddle the american decks to kindling wood before the astonished officers can collect their senses six seamen are dead and twenty-three wounded when the chesapeake strikes her colors to surrender but the leopard does not want a captive she sends her lieutenant back who musters the four hundred american seamen picks out four men as british deserters learns that another deserter has been killed and a sixth has jumped overboard rather than be retaken takes his prisoners back to the leopard which proceeds to halifax where they are tried by court-martial and shot 
it isn't exactly surprising that the episode literally set the united states on fire with rage and that the american president at once ordered all american ports closed to british war vessels the quarrel dragged on between the two governments for five years england saw at once that she had gone too far and violated international law she repudiated admiral barclay's order offered to apologize and pension the heirs of the victims but as she would not repudiate either the right of impressment or the right of search the american government refused to receive the apology other causes fanned the flame of war the united states was now almost the only nation neutral in napoleon's wars to cripple english commerce napoleon forbids neutral nations trading at english ports by way of retaliation england forbids neutral nations trading with french ports and the united states strikes back by closing american ports to both nations it means blue ruin to american trade but the united states cannot permit herself to be ground between the upper and nether millstones of two hostile european powers then sharp as a gamester playing his trump card napoleon revokes his embargo in eighteen ten which leaves england the offender against the united states then governor craig of canada commits an error that must have delighted the heart of napoleon who always profited by his enemy's blunders well-meaning but fatally ill and easily alarmed craig sends one john henry from montreal in eighteen o nine as spy to the united states for the double purpose of sounding public opinion on the subject of war and of putting any federalists in favor of withdrawing from the union in touch with british authorities craig goes home to england to die henry fails to collect reward for his ignoble services turns traitor and sells the entire correspondence to the war party in the united states for ten thousand dollars that spy business adds fuel to fire then there are other quarrels a deserter from the american army is found teaching school near cornwall in canada he is driven out of the little backwood schoolhouse pricked across the field with bayonets out of the children's view and shot on canadian soil by american soldiers an outrage almost the same in spirit as the british crew's outrage on the chesapeake also in spite of apologies the warships clash again the english sloop little belt is cruising off cape henry in may of eighteen eleven looking for a french privateer when a sail appears over the sea the little belt pursues till she sights the commodore's blue flag of the united states frigate president then she turns about but by this time the president has turned the tables on the little sloop and is pursuing to find out what the former's conduct meant darkness settles over the two ships beating about the wind what sloop is that shouts an officer through a speaking trumpet from the american decks what ship is that bawls back a voice through the darkness from the little englander then before any one can tell who fired first in fact each accuses the other of firing first the cannon are pouring hot shot into each other's hulls till thirty men have fallen on the decks to the little belt apologies follow of course and explanations but that does not remedy the ill in fact when nations and people want to quarrel they can always find a cause war is declared in june of eighteen twelve by congress End of section thirty five. Section thirty six of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section thirty six how winfield scott rescued the irishman by james barnes in eighteen twelve general scott then a young lieutenant colonel of twenty-six years was taken prisoner by the british at the battle of queenstown the editor scott was in the cabin of the transport when he heard a loud voice demanding admission from the sentry at the cabin door and insisting upon the right to see him this the sentry vigorously denied 
scott hastened to the sentry's side and there found one of his own men much excited with some difficulty he quieted him and found out what was the matter they're sorting out every man who's got a bit of a brogue sir cried the soldier who showed a trace of his ancestry in his speech and they are going to send them over the seas to be tried for high treason there's young tom mcculloch who the same as myself was born in norfolk and mccurdy who was born in new york and they declare that all will be hanged for fighting against the king now it happened that there were a number of irishmen who were actually born in ireland but had emigrated to america and had enlisted in the american ranks there were even among the non-commissioned officers a few hardy old veterans of the revolution who could claim the emerald isle as the place of their birth scott saw that his presence on deck was at once necessary he was placed under no restraint on board the vessel and so brushing by the sentry in two leaps he was up the ladder and stood on the quarter-deck there he saw the prisoners numbering over two hundred standing under a guard of marines in the waist an officer was calling their names from a list in his hand twenty-three men had already been separated from the others and stood to one side with forlorn and disconsolate looks they had already been told off as prisoners to be detained and sent to england for trial scott stood out on the deck before them the officer looked up from the paper he was reading well sir he asked what can i do for you you can explain scott replied the reason for this discrimination i was led to understand that all of the men placed aboard this vessel were to be sent to the united states for exchange there are some traitors here the officer replied subjects of his majesty who have been taken in arms against him and we are led to believe that there are also not a few deserters from our service we have a right to investigate i deny that right sir scott replied a man who enlists in the army of the united states and fights as provided under the constitution becomes a citizen and is entitled to all privileges and protection and i warn you sir that the interests of every man shall be looked after you forget your position sir replied the officer hotly you're a prisoner and i order you below to the cabin i am on my parole scott thundered and you can send me to my cabin by the use of force only for i decline to go it is my privilege to look after the personal safety of my men the officer waved his hand toward the twenty-three disconsolate ones who stood lined up against the bulwarks this is my answer he replied these irish renegades are traitors and will be tried as such any more of their ilk will suffer the same fate thomas mcnulty he read in a loud voice from the list he had in his hand scott now turned to the americans if there is a man named mcnulty among you he said i order him not to step forward and as your commanding officer i order not one of you to reply to a question addressed to you by any british officer aboard this ship in any manner whatever they cannot force you to speak therefore keep silent the men looked at their tall leader with hope mingled with admiration had he said the word unarmed as they were they would have thrown themselves upon the marine guard that at a whispered order from a young red-coated lieutenant had brought their pieces to the ready i know my rights i tell you scott added and though a prisoner they still exist let these men be returned as they were before no replied the officer these we are sure of twenty-three traitors who will suffer traitors fates turning to the officer of the guard he ordered that the unfortunate men collected should be taken off in the longboat waiting alongside and put on shore to be transferred to another ship scott's anger was now beyond all bounds stretching himself to his full height he pointed to the poor fellows that were being hustled toward the gangway observe you this he said for every one of those men an englishman will be set apart to abide the sentence placed upon them my country does not forget those who serve her in time of need then walking over to where the prisoners were he swept through the marines and grasped some of his men by their extended hands 
good-bye my lads he said don't fear keep up your courage no harm shall come to you with that he turned and acknowledging the salute of his own men who stood at attention with their fingers to their cap brims he went below in a few minutes the ship was under way it is a peculiar characteristic of the good officer and natural soldier that his men are always his first thought over and above all else should be their interest and welfare and let private soldiers once understand that this is the case and duty is exalted to almost a religion affection and a desire to serve take the place of instilled obedience self-sacrifice becomes a pleasure a handful of men animated by this spirit will fight harder than thrice their number without it scott always had this peculiar gift he would call upon men for almost superhuman endeavor and under his leadership they never failed to respond as soon as he reached boston scott went on to washington and in a short time was exchanged he drew up a report of the occurrence on board the cartel and informed the secretary of war of the matter and this very same day a report was presented to congress and immediately a passage of an act of retaliation followed this was on march three eighteen thirteen scott never allowed himself to forget and never lost sight of the unfortunate irishmen in the latter part of may at the capture of fort george where many prisoners were taken he picked out twenty-three as hostages to receive the same punishment that should be meted out to his own brave soldiers much unnecessary suffering followed perhaps for the english retaliated but scott's prompt redemption of his promise saved his irish troops a strange sequel to this occurrence took place two years afterward when he was on leave of absence and recovering from his wounds he was passing one of the piers on the east river new york city when suddenly he heard the sound of loud cheering stopping for an instant he found himself surrounded by a lot of excited men some of whom rushed forward endeavoring to take his hand or even to touch him they were the same twenty-three who had just that moment been landed after their long imprisonment they almost crushed their still weak and wounded general in their arms so great was their enthusiasm and gratitude it might be mentioned that he wrote to the department at washington on their behalf claiming full pay for their services during the time of their imprisonment and soliciting patents for land bounty both petitions it is pleasing to record were granted end of section thirty six this recording is in the public domain section thirty seven of the united states read for librivox .org by sonia on the capture of the guerriere by philippe Frenot. long the tyrant of our coast reigned the famous guerriere our little navy she defied public ship and privateer on her sails in letters read to our captains were displayed words of warning words of dread all who meet me have a care i am england's guerriere on the wide atlantic deep not her equal for the fight the constitution on her way chanced to meet these men of might on her sails was nothing said but her waist the teeth displayed that a deal of blood could shed which if she would venture near would stain the deck of the guerriere now our gallant ship they met and to struggle with john bull who had come they little thought strangers yet to isaac hull better soon to be acquainted isaac hailed the lord's anointed while the crew the cannon pointed and the balls were so directed with a blaze so unexpected isaac so did maul and rake her that the decks of captain dacre were in such a woeful pickle as if death with scythe and sickle with his sling or with his shaft had cut his harvest fore and aft thus in thirty minutes ended mischiefs that could not be mended masts and yards and ship descended all to david jones's locker such a ship in such a pucker drink about to the constitution she performed some execution did some share of retribution for the insults of the year when she took the guerriere may success again await her let who will again command her bainbridge rogers or decatur nothing like her can withstand her with a crew like that on board her who so boldly called to order one bold crew of english sailors long 
too long our seamen's jailers, Dacre and the Guerriere. End of section 37. This recording is in the public domain. Section 38 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapin. The Shannon and the Chesapeake, 1813, by Thomas Tracy Bouvet. The captain of the Shannon came sailing up the bay. A reeling wind flung out behind his pennons bright and gay. His cannon crashed a challenge, and the smoke that hid the sea was driven hard to windward and drifted back to lee. The captain of the Shannon sent word into the town. Was Lawrence there, and would he dare to sail his frigate down, and meet him at the harbour mouth, and fight him gun to gun? For honour's sake, with pride at stake, until the fight was won. Now long the gallant Lawrence had scoured the bitter main, With many a scar and wound of war his ship was home again. His crew, relieved from service, were scattered far and wide, And scarcely one, his duty done, had lingered by his side. But to refuse the challenge, could he outlive the shame? Brave men and true, but deadly few, were gathered to his fame. Once more the great ship Chesapeake prepared her for the fight. I'll bring the foe to town in tow, he said, before to-night. High on the hills of Hingham, that overlooked the shore, To watch the fray and hope and pray, for they could do no more, The children of the country watched the children of the sea, When the smoke drove hard to windward, and drifted back to Lee. How can he fight, they whispered, with only half a crew? Though they be rare to do and dare, yet what can brave men do? But when the Chesapeake came down, the stars and stripes on high, stilled was each fear, and cheer on cheer resounded to the sky. The captain of the Shannon, he swore both long and loud, this victory, where'er it be, shall make two nations proud. Now onward to this victory, or downward to defeat. A sailor's life is sweet with strife, a sailor's death as sweet. And as when the lightnings rend the sky, and gloomy thunders roar, And crashing surge plays devil's dirge upon the stricken shore, With thunder and with sheets of flame the two ships rang with shot, and every gun burst forth a sun of iron crimson hot. And twice they lashed together, and twice they tore apart, and iron balls burst wooden walls and pierced each oaken heart. Still from the hills of Hingham men watched with hopes and fears, while all the bay was torn that day with shot that rained like tears. The tall masts of the Chesapeake went groaning by the board, the Shannon's spars were weak with scars when Broke cast down his sword. Now woe, he cried, to England, and shame and woe to me. The smoke drove hard to windward and drifted back to Lee. Give them one breaking broadside more, he cried, before we strike. But one grim ball that ruined all for hope and home alike laid Lawrence low in glory, yet from his pallid lip rang to the land his last command, Boys, don't give up the ship. The wounded wept like women when they hauled her ensign down. Men's cheeks were pale, as with the tail, from Hingham to the town, they hurried in swift silence, while towards the eastern night the victor bore away from shore and vanished out of sight. Hail to the great ship Chesapeake, hail to the hero brave, who fought her fast, and loved her last, and shared her sudden grave. And glory be to those that died for all eternity. They lie apart at the mother heart of God's eternal sea. End of section 38. This recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 39 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 39. How Perry Saved the Northwest, 1813, by Charles Morris. In 1813, Oliver Hazard Perry, a young naval officer who had never seen an engagement, was sent to Lake Erie to build a fleet from trees then standing in the forest and to conquer the british vessels on the lake the editor in a moment everybody was astir the boatswain's whistles called the men to the capstans and at the command of up anchor the vessels were soon free to move but the wind was unfavorable for leaving the harbor and the crews had to resort to oars in aid of their sails the instructions to the commanding officers chiefly consisted in the brief but famous one of nelson if you lay your enemy close alongside you cannot be out of place on reaching the open waters the enemy was sighted five or six miles away and the ships were headed towards him though the light and uncertain wind interfered much with progress perry for some time sought to gain the windward position but at length gave up the effort and decided to square away under the lee of the islands replying to the sailing master's remonstrance that this would bring him to leeward of the enemy i don't care to windward or to leeward they shall fight to-day but again the wind shifted this time a favorable change to the south and the americans now having the weather gauge were put before it and ran down with free sheets upon the enemy the ships were formed in line of battle on the plan decided upon and all hands ordered to clear them for action in the midst of this a roll of bunting was brought up from below and handed to perry on unfolding it there were seen in great white letters upon a blue field lawrence's dying words don't give up the ship my brave lads said perry to his men this flag bears the last words of captain lawrence shall i hoist it ay ay sir came in a hearty response and up to the main truck sped the significant flag it was now about ten o'clock the wind continued light and a broad space still divided the two fleets to hearten the men for the work before them captain perry now ordered food and the usual allowance of grog to be served the mess kits were then cleared away and needful precautions for the coming fight taken such as drenching the decks with water to render harmless any loose powder that might be scattered and sprinkling a layer of sand so as to give the men a good footing even if the decks were wet with blood barclay meanwhile had hove to his ships and was awaiting the americans the vessels drawn up in close array in a line square across the wind the little chippewa and the big detroit at the head against these perry advanced in the lawrence his flagship the little ariel and scorpion leading the way with these he headed for the detroit leaving the remainder of his fleet to come up as rapidly as possible and to deal with the other british craft all being thus disposed the squadron moved slowly onward before the light and baffling wind perry pacing his deck impatiently stopping at intervals for a word to the gun crews all of whom he found eagerly preparing for the fray at one gun were men from the constitution the most of them stripped to the waist and with handkerchiefs tied round their heads to keep their hair out of their eyes i need not say anything to you he remarked you know how to beat those fellows at another gun stood some of his old gunboat men ah 
here are the newport boys he said cheerily they will do their duty i warrant the cheers he got in response showed well the spirit of the men the vessels of the squadron rather drifted than sailed towards the enemy and as noon approached the nearest vessels were still a mile apart while the rear of the american fleet lay far behind far separated as the flagships now were almost beyond the range of the best guns of that day the impatience of the british gunners had grown beyond restraint and a gun roared from the detroit its ball plunging into the water before reaching its goal in a minute or two more a second ball with better aim came crashing through the bulwarks of the lawrence the battle was on through all this frightful turmoil perry stood on his quarter-deck cheering on his men his little brother beside him with no evidence of fear on his face as they stood two musket balls passed through the boy's hat then a splinter was driven through his clothing finally he was knocked headlong across the deck and perry's face paled at the sight but it proved to be only a flying hammock that had struck him and in a minute he was on his feet again all the officers in my division are cut down said lieutenant yarnall his face covered with blood from a splinter that had been driven through his nose can i have others others were given him and he went forward again in a short time he was back with a similar request i have no more officers to give you said perry you must make out by yourself he did make out aiming and firing the guns with his own hands a duty which perry himself was later forced to perform like paul jones of old he kept at this until he had not enough men on the quarter-deck to aim and fire the one gun left in service going to the hatchway he asked for a man from the surgeon one was sent and two others in succession but still perry was obliged to repeat the demand there is not another man left to go said the surgeon then are there none of the wounded who can pull on a rope at this appeal three men crawled up the hatchway ladder to help with the gun tackles these with aid from the purser and chaplain rolled the gun out while perry aimed and fired it this was the last gun fired from the lawrence the next broadside from the enemy left not a single gun that could be worked the vessel itself was a wreck her bowsprit and masts had been in great part shot away while her hull was riddled only fourteen men remained unhurt in her crew of more than a hundred twenty had been killed but the american flag and the blue banner with its motto don't give up the ship floated still and perry remained inspired by its spirit for two hours he had kept up a fight seemingly hopeless from the start and he was still far from the thought of surrender during these two fateful hours the niagara had kept out of the battle but now with a fresher breeze in her sails she was coming briskly up headed for the right of the british line her route would take her a quarter of a mile or more from the lawrence the sight of this unharmed vessel aroused a new hope in the mind of the gallant commander on her deck he might be able to retrieve the fortunes of the day action quickly followed thought throwing off the blue jacket he had so far worn he put on his uniform coat and ordered a boat with four men to be lowered on the side of the lawrence out of the fiery storm his boy brother sprang into the boat with the men yarnall he said to his faithful lieutenant i leave that lawrence in your charge with discretionary power you may hold out or surrender as your judgment and the circumstances shall dictate then taking his pennant and the broad banner with the lawrence motto which had been hauled down and given him he climbed down into the boat and ordered his men to pull away for the niagara as soon as the boat was seen from the british fleet and the purpose of the american commander guessed every gun that could be brought to bear was turned upon it the water all around being churned by round shot grape canister and musket balls through this torrent of shot perry stood erect in the stern of his boat intent on inspiring his men with courage the flag and pennant draped round his shoulders as they neared their goal a round shot plunged through the side of the boat perry took off his coat and plugged the hole with it and thus the side of the niagara was reached the crisis of the battle was now reached stepping on the deck of this fresh ship amid the loud cheers of the crew perry saw at a glance that a splendid opportunity to turn defeat into victory was in his hands how goes the day asked elliot distance had prevented his seeing for himself 
that enough replied perry why are the gunboats so far astern i'll bring them up do so springing into the boat that had brought perry up elliot rowed away as he did so perry's pennant and the blue flag of the lawrence were hauled aloft bringing ringing cheers from every american ship except the lawrence herself on which arnall not having a gun that could be fired hauled down his flag to prevent the useless butchery of his crew on all other vessels hope had replaced doubt and dismay putting up his helm perry drove his new flagship square for the british squadron which was now so bunched that in a few minutes he was in its midst firing from one battery into the chippewa and lady prevost from the other into the detroit hunter and queen charlotte the effect of the close fire on them was disastrous already severely injured by the guns of the lawrence this hot fire from a fresh ship was annihilating the detroit and the queen charlotte tried to swing around and meet him but fouled each other while perry ranging ahead rounded two and raked them both the other american vessels were joining in as they came within range and barclay stood aghast at the slaughter and destruction hurled on his hitherto seemingly victorious ships the crew of the lady prevost fled from the deck leaving their commander lieutenant buchan alone on the quarter-deck with bleeding limbs and staring eyes the tempest of shot and the torrent of destruction were more than even british valor could stand and eight minutes after perry's signal dash into their line a man came to the rail of the british flagship waving a white handkerchief tied to a boarding pike it was the signal of surrender perry was victor in one of the greatest battles of the war two of the british vessels sought to escape the chippewa and the little belt but they were pursued by the scorpion and the trip and brought in as captives captain champlin on the scorpion as he had fired the first now firing the last gun in the fight in honor of the good ship in which his great struggle had been made captain perry accepted the surrender of the british officers on the deck of the lawrence amid the frightful scene of ruin and carnage which it presented but the british had left as frightful scenes on their own decks for the niagara had amply avenged her consort in the destruction wrought this narrative might be prolonged much farther but we must close it with the famous dispatch to general harrison in which perry announced his victory we have met the enemy and they are ours two ships two brigs one schooner and one sloop the news of the victory spread with great rapidity through the nation and was everywhere received with enthusiastic rejoicing for it was felt that it had definitely turned back the tide of british success in that quarter and saved the settlers of the northwest from the terrible visitation of the indian allies of the british harrison aided by perry followed it up with an invasion of canada found proctor and his army in retreat and completely defeated them at the battle of the thames tecumseh the indian leader being killed the northwest was saved end of section thirty nine this recording is in the public domain Section 40 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Meg Huskin. The Battle of Lake Erie. From an Engraving. Painting page 148. The difficulties under which Commodore Perry labored were almost as great in building his fleet as in winning his famous victory. R. M. Devins says, At Presque Isle, ninety miles west of Buffalo, a peninsula extending a considerable distance into the lake encircles a harbor, on the borders of which was the port of Erie. At this place, Commodore Perry was directed to locate and superintend a naval establishment, the object of which was to create a superior force on the lake. The difficulties of building a navy in the wilderness can only be conceived by those who have experienced them. There was nothing at this spot out of which it could be built, but the timber of the forest. Shipbuilders, sailors, naval stores, guns, and ammunition were all to be transported by land, in wagons, and over bad roads. A distance of four hundred miles, either from Albany, by the way of Buffalo, or from Philadelphia, by the way of Pittsburgh. But under all these embarrassments, by the 1st of August, 1813, Commodore Perry had provided a flotilla consisting of the ships Lawrence and Niagara, of twenty guns each, and seven smaller vessels, to wit, one of four guns, one of three, 
two of two, and three of one. While the ships were building, the enemy frequently appeared off the harbor and threatened their destruction. But the shallowness of the water on the bar, there being but five feet, prevented their approach. The same cause, which ensured the safety of the vessels while building, seemed likely to prevent their being of any service when completed. The two largest drew several feet more water than there was on the bar. The inventive genius of Perry, however, surmounted this difficulty. He placed large scows on either side of these two, filled them so that they sank to the water edge, and then attached them to the ships by strong pieces of timber, and pumped out the water. The scows, in this way, buoyed up the ships, enabling them to pass the bar in safety. This operation was performed in the very eyes of the enemy. End of section 40. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Meg Huskin. Section 41 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Star Spangled Banner. 1814 by Francis Scott Key. Never has a patriotic poem come so directly out of the thunder of battle as did the Star-Spangled Banner. Just before the bombardment of Fort McHenry, its author was sent to the British flagship to arrange for an exchange of prisoners. Here he was obliged to remain until the close of the attack. All through the night he watched the bursting of the shells, but in the first dim grey of the morning his vigil was rewarded, for the flag of the United States was still waving over the fort. Then it was that the poem was written. The Editor O oh, say, can you see, by the dawn's early light, What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, Whose broad stripes and bright stars, through the perilous fight, O'er the ramparts we watched, were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. O oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? On the shore, dimly seen through the mists of the deep, where the foe's haughty host in dread silence reposes, what is that which the breeze, or the towering steep, as it fitfully blows, now conceals, now discloses? Now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam, in full glory reflected now shines on the stream. Tis the star-spangled banner. O oh, long may it wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. And where is that band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion a home and a country should leave us no more? Their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Oh, thus be it ever, when freemen shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must, for our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust and the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of The United States this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in September 2020. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, 
Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 42. Tikamsa, the Indian Brigadier General, 1813. By Charles H. L. Johnston. In the fighting of the War of 1812, this great chief showed that he could lead an army almost as well as a white man. His military talent was so great that he was made a brigadier general, a position which, to my knowledge, no other American Indian has ever held among white troops, except General Eli S. Parker, who commanded a detachment of regulars in the army of the Potomac during the War of the Rebellion. The celebrated Shawnee fought bravely at a fierce fight at Brownston, and was also at the siege of Detroit with about seven hundred warriors, when this city capitulated to the British. The whole American frontier was open to the ravages of the Indians and English after this event, and under General Proctor, the combined forces of Redskins and Red Coats swept down upon the border fortress of Fort Meigs, and here captured a number of prisoners, although they did not take the stockade. The Indians under Tikumsa numbered about 1,800 in the fighting at this place, and, giving way to their instincts, they tomahawked all that they could. General Proctor made no attempt to stop them, but was looking calmly at their fiendish work when he saw Tikumsa galloping forward at great speed. Reaching the scene of slaughter, the savage leaped from his horse, and seizing two Indians by the throat, knocked them to the ground. Then, drawing his tomahawk and scarping knife, he cried out, He of you who injures another prisoner will be killed by Tikumsa. How dare you wreak vengeance upon defenseless men? Cowards! Be gone! Cowed by his consuming wrath, the savages slunk away, while the great chief, turning to Proctor, said, why, General, did you not stop this awful massacre? Sir, replied the British General, your Indians cannot be restrained. Be gone, thundered Tikumsa. You are not fit to command. Go home and put on the petticoat of a squaw. Shortly after this, the celebrated Shawnee noticed a small group of Indians nearby who were standing about some prisoners. Yonder are four of your people who have been taken prisoners, said Colonel Elliot to him. You may do as you please with them. Tikumsa, therefore, walked over to the group and found four Shawnees, who, while fighting on the side of the Americans, had been unable to escape the British regulars and had been captured. Friends, said he, Colonel Elliot has placed you in my charge and I will send you back to your nation to have a talk with your people. So saying, he took them with him for some distance, and then sent two of his warriors to accompany them to their own chiefs, where they were discharged, under the promise that they would never fight again against the British during the war. The disasters to the Americans led the government to collect the larger army, which was placed under the command of General Harrison, the hero of Tipi Canoe. Captain Oliver H. Perry built a fleet in Lake Erie, sailed out to attack the British boats, and defeated them. When he had done so, Harrison moved upon Fort Malden, where both Proctor and Tecumseh were stationed. The former burned the fort and retreated with Tecumseh's Indians, meaning to join the other British forces at Niagara, but before the retreat, when Harrison was at Fort Meeks, Tecumseh had sent him a personal challenge which ran, General Harrison, I have with me eight hundred braves. You have an equal number in your hiding place. Come out with them and give me battle. You talked like a brave when we met at Vincennes, and I respected you. But now you hide behind logs and in earth like a groundhog. Give me answer. Tikumsa. Harrison, however, refused to come out, and, as Proctor decided to retreat, Tikumsa seriously meditated a withdrawal from the contest. You always told us that you would never draw your foot off British ground, said he to the English commander. Now, father, we see that you are drawing back, and we are sorry to see our father doing so without seeing the enemy. We must compare our father's conduct to a fat dog, which carries its tail on its back, but, when affrighted, drops it between its legs and runs off. Father, listen. 
the americans have not yet defeated us by land neither are we sure that they have done so by water we therefore wish to remain here and fight our enemy should he make his appearance if we are defeated we will then retreat with our father father you have got the arms and ammunition which our great father sent to his red children if you have an idea of going away give them to us and you may go and welcome for us our lives are in the hand of the great spirit we are determined to defend our lands and if it be his will we wish to leave our bones upon them but proctor would listen to no such talk and pretended from time to time that he would halt and give battle much to the chagrin of the redskins he kept on moving finally he halted on the river thames in michigan near a moravian town and told tecumseh that he would fight it out here with the advancing americans the great chief himself chose the ground for battling with a marsh on one flank and a stream upon the other brother warriors said he to his chiefs we are about to enter an engagement from which i shall doubtless never return my body will remain upon the field of battle then unbuckling his sword he handed it to a chief remarking when my son becomes a noted warrior and able to wield a sword give this to him proctor had placed his guns in the highway and had deployed his regulars between them and a little marsh Another marsh was five hundred yards farther on, to the right, and here the Indians under Tecumseh were stationed, together with some British regulars. The rest of the Indians were sent out in front, upon the extreme right, in a position just in front of the swampy bottom of the larger marsh. The ground was nearly covered with an open growth of trees, without underbrush, so that there was little impediment to fighting. Harrison, as he came up, placed his mounted infantry in front, for this was his strongest force, composed of a splendid body of Kentucky frontiersmen under Colonel Richard M. Johnson, all of whom were well used to border warfare. The infantry was in the rear, with a considerable body on the left flank, turned at right angle to the line, so as to face the Indians in the marsh. They were told to advance at the blast of the bugle, and to fight as they had done at Tipi Canoe, commands which they obeyed quite faithfully. At the shrill note of the horn the horsemen trotted forward. Then, as the British regulars began to pepper them with bullets, they gave a wild cheer, galloped on, and soon were charging right into the lines of the English. Proctor knew that he was badly wanted by the Americans because of his numerous massacres of defenseless non-combatants, and so leaped into a two-horse vehicle in order to escape. But a dozen well-mounted men galloped after him, and seeing that he was about to be captured, the faint-hearted Britisher jumped to the earth, took to the woods, and got safely off. Tecumseh's men, meanwhile, stood their ground and did not, at first, give way before the American advance. But soon the savages posted upon the extreme right before the marsh ran wildly into the woods. The valiant Tecumseh was shot in the arm, but, disdaining to fly, stood up manfully, while his wild, inspiring war-whoop was loudly heard upon the din of battle. Thus he was holding his own men to their work, when the Kentucky cavalry, having dispersed Proctor's regulars, returned to the field of battle. Forming for the attack, they rushed, with a wild cheer, upon the mixed battalion of reds and whites. Johnson himself was soon near the great chief, and shot at him with his pistol. Tecumseh fell, whether from this shot or not, is not definitely known. The tide of conflict rolled by the prostrate form of the mighty Shawnee, and, with fierce cheers of victory, the Americans chased the now routed British and Indians into the forest, securing a complete and overwhelming victory. Near the battlefield, where a large oak lay prostrate by a willow marsh, the faithful Shawnees buried Tecumseh, after the American army, flushed with success, returned to the United States. The British government granted a pension to the widow of the noted warrior, and to his son gave a sword. The willows and rose bushes now grow thick above the mound where repose, in silence and solitude, the ashes of the mighty chief of the Shawnees. 
he struggled in vain against the inevitable and his simple grave is only one of the many monuments which mark the restless overwhelming advance of the conquering americans he fought a good fight his fame is secure upon the golden pages of history End of section 42section forty three of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section forty three the privateers of eighteen twelve by Willis J. Abbott. The declaration of war had hardly been made public when the hundreds of shipyards from Maine to Savannah resounded with the blows of hammers and the grating of saws as the shipwrights worked, busily refitting old vessels or building new ones, destined to cruise against the commerce of John Bull. All sorts of vessels were employed in the service, the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts fairly swarmed with small pilot boats, mounting one long gun amidships, and carrying crews of twenty to forty men. These little craft made rapid sallies into the waters of the Gulf Stream, in search of British West Indiamen homeward bound. Other privateers were huge three-masters, carrying heavy batteries, and able to outsail any of the enemy's ships. On leaving port for a long cruise, these vessels would carry enormous crews, so that captured vessels might be manned and sent home. After a successful cruise, such a privateer returned to port, seldom bringing more than one-fifth of the crew with which she had set out. But the favorite rig for a privateer was that of the topsail schooner, such a rig as the Enterprise carried during the war with France. The famous shipyards of Baltimore turned out scores of clean-cut, clipper-built schooners with long, low hulls and raking masts, which straightway took to the ocean on privateering cruises. The armament of these vessels generally consisted of six to ten cannonades, and one long pivot gun going by the pet name of Long Tom mounted amidships. The crew was usually a choice assortment of cutthroats and seafaring vagabonds of all classes, ready enough to fight if plunder was to be gained, but equally ready to surrender if only honor was to be gained by fighting. Yet history records a few actions in which the privateersmen showed a steadiness and courage worthy of seamen of the regular service. One of the first things to attract the attention of the reader in the dingy files of some newspaper of 1812 to 1815 is the grotesque names under which many of the privateers sailed. The grandiloquent style of the regular navy vanishes, and in its place we find homely names, such as Jack's Favorite, Lovely Lass, Rowboat, Saucy Jack, or True-Blooded Yankee. Some names are clearly political allusions, as The Orders in Council and The Fair Trade. The Black Joke, The Shark, and the anaconda must have had a grim significance for the luckless merchantmen who fell a prey to the vessels bearing these names. Bunker Hill and Divided We Fall, though odd names to sail under, seemed to bring luck to the two vessels, which were very successful in their cruises. United We Stand was a luckless craft, however, taking only one prize— while the achievements of the full-blooded Yankee and the sine qua non were equally limited. Of the poor sailor certainly little was to be expected, and it is with no surprise that we find she captured only one prize. Among the most successful privateers was the Rossi of Baltimore, commanded by the revolutionary veteran Captain Barney, 
who left her, finally, to assume command of the American naval forces of Chesapeake Bay. She was a clipper-built schooner, carrying fourteen guns and a crew of one hundred and twenty men. The destruction wrought by this one cruiser was enormous. In a ninety-days cruise she captured, sunk, or otherwise destroyed British property to the amount of a million and a half dollars, and took two hundred and seventeen prisoners. All this was not done without some hard fighting. One prize, his Britannic Majesty's packet ship, Princess Amelia, was armed with nine pounders and made a gallant defense before surrendering. Several men were killed, and the Rossi suffered the loss of her first lieutenant. The prisoners taken by the Rossi were exchanged for Americans captured by the British. With the first body of prisoners thus exchanged, Barney sent a cool note to the British commander at New Brunswick, assuring him that before long a second batch of his captured countrymen should be sent in. Perhaps the foremost of all the fighting privateers was the General Armstrong of New York, a schooner mounting eight long lines and one long twenty-four on a pivot. She had a crew of ninety men, and was commanded on her first cruise by Captain Guy R. Champlin. This vessel was one of the first to get to sea, and had cruised for several months with fair success when in March 1813 she gave chase to a sail off the Surinam River on the coast of South America. The stranger seemed to evince no great desire to escape, and the privateer soon gained sufficiently to discover that the supposed merchantman was a British sloop of war, whose long row of open ports showed that she carried twenty-seven guns. Champlin and his men found this a more ugly customer than they had expected, but it was too late to retreat, and to surrender was out of the question. So, calling the people to the guns, Champlin took his ship into action with a steadiness that no old naval captain could have exceeded. Close quarters and quick work was the word passed along the gun deck and the Armstrong was brought alongside her antagonist at a distance of half pistol shot. For nearly an hour the two vessels exchanged rapid broadsides, but though the American gunners were the better marksmen, the heavy build of the sloop of war enabled her to stand against broadsides which would have cut the privateer to pieces. Captain Champlin was hit in the shoulder early in the action, but kept his station until the fever of his wound forced him to retire to his cabin. However, he still continued to direct the course of the action, and, seeing that the tide of battle was surely going against him, he ordered the crew to get out the sweeps and pull away from the enemy, whose rigging was too badly cut up to enable her to give chase. This was quickly done, and the General Armstrong, though badly injured, and with her decks covered with dead and dying men, escaped, leaving her more powerful adversary to repair damages and make the best of her way home. Captain Champlin, on his arrival at New York, was the hero of the hour. For a privateer to have held out for an hour against a man of war was thought a feat worthy of praise from all classes of men. The merchants of the city tendered the gallant captain a dinner, and the stockholders in his vessel presented him with a costly sword. But the General Armstrong was destined to fight yet another battle, which should far eclipse the glory of her first. A new captain was to win the laurels this time, for Captain Champlin's wound had forced him to retire, and his place was filled by Captain Samuel C. Reed. On the 26th of September, 1814, the privateer was lying at anchor in the roadstead of Fayal. 
over the land that enclosed the snug harbor on three sides, waved the flag of Portugal, a neutral power, but unfortunately one of insufficient strength to enforce the rights of neutrality. While the Armstrong was thus lying in the port, a British squadron composed of the Plantagenet, 74, the Rota, 38, and Carnation, 18, hove in sight, and soon swung into the harbor and dropped anchor. Reed watched the movements of the enemy with eager vigilance. He knew well that the protection of Portugal would not aid him in the least should the captain of that 74 choose to open fire upon the Armstrong. The action of the British in coming into the harbor was in itself suspicious, and the American had little doubt that the safety of his vessel was in jeopardy. While he was pacing the deck and weighing in his mind the probability of an assault by the British, he caught sight of some unusual stir aboard the hostile ships. It was night, but the moon had risen, and by its pale light Reed saw four large barges let fall from the enemy's ships, and manned by about forty men each, make toward his vessel. In an instant every man on the privateer was called to his post. That there was to be an attack was now certain, and the Americans determined not to give up their vessel without at least a vigorous attempt to defend her. Reed's first act was to warp his craft under the guns of a rather dilapidated castle, which was supposed to uphold the authority of Portugal over the island and adjacent waters. Hardly had the position been gained when the foremost of the British boats came within hail, and Captain Reed shouted, "'Boat ahoy! What boat's that?' No response followed the hail, and it was repeated with the warning, "'Answer, or I shall fire into you.' Still the British advanced without responding, and Reed, firmly convinced that they purposed to carry his ship, with a sudden dash ordered his gunners to open on the boats with grape. This was done, and at the first volley the British turned and made off. Captain Reed then warped his vessel still nearer shore, and bending springs on her cable, so that her broadside might be kept always toward the enemy, he awaited a second attack. At midnight the enemy were seen advancing again, this time with fourteen barges and about five hundred men. While the flotilla was still at long range, the Americans opened fire upon them with the heavy long tom, and, as they came nearer, the full battery of long nine-pounders took up the fight. The carnage in the advancing boats was terrible, but the plucky Englishmen pushed on, meeting the privateers' fire with volleys of musketry and carronades. Despite the American fire, the British succeeded in getting under the bow and quarter of the Armstrong, and strove manfully to board, while the Americans fought no less bravely to keep them back. The attack became a furious hand-to-hand -hand battle. From behind the boarding nettings, the Americans thrust pikes and fired pistols and muskets at their assailants, who, mounted on each other's shoulders, were hacking fiercely at the nettings, which kept them from gaining the schooner's deck. The few that managed to clamber on the taffrail of the Armstrong were thrust through and through with pikes, and hurled, thus horribly impaled, into the sea. The fighting was fiercest and deadliest on the quarter, for there were most of the enemy's boats, and there Captain Reed led the defense in person. So hot was the reception met by the British at this point that they drew off in dismay, despairing of ever gaining the privateer's deck. Hardly did Reed see the enemy thus foiled on the quarter, when a chorus of British cheers from the forecastle, mingled with yells of rage, told that the enemy had succeeded in effecting a lodgment there. Calling his men about him, the gallant captain dashed forward, and was soon in the front rank of the defenders, dealing furious blows with his cutlass, and crying out, 
Come on, my lads, and we'll drive them into the sea. The leadership of an officer was all that the sailors needed. The three lieutenants on the forecastle had been killed or disabled, else the enemy had never come aboard. With Reed to cheer them on, the sailors rallied, and with a steady advance drove the British back into their boats. The disheartened enemy did not return to the attack, but returned to their ships, leaving behind two boats captured and two sunk. Their loss in the attack was thirty-four killed and eighty-six wounded. On the privateer were two killed and seven wounded. But the attack was not to end here. Reed was too old a sailor to expect that the British, chagrined as they were by two repulses, were likely to leave the privateer in peace. He well knew that the withdrawal of the barges meant not an abandonment, but merely a short discontinuance of the attack. Accordingly, he gave his crew scarcely time to rest before he set them to work, getting the schooner in trim for another battle. The wounded were carried below, and the decks cleared of splinters and wreckage. The boarding nettings were patched up and hung again in place. Long Tom had been knocked off his carriage by a carronade shot, and had to be remounted, but all was done quickly, and by morning the vessel was ready for whatever might be in store for her. The third assault was made soon after daybreak. Evidently, the enemy despaired of his ability to conquer the privateersmen in a hand-to-hand -hand battle, for this time he moved the brig Carnation up within range and opened fire upon the schooner. The man of war could fire nine guns at a broadside, while the schooner could reply with but seven. But Long Tom proved the salvation of the privateer. The heavy twenty-four-pound shots from this gun did so much damage upon the hull of the brig that she was forced to draw out of the action, leaving the victory for the third time with the Americans. But now Captain Reed decided that it was folly to longer continue the conflict. The overwhelming force of the enemy made any thought of ultimate escape folly. It only remained for the British to move the 74 Plantagenet into action to seal the doom of the Yankee privateer. The gallant defense already made by the Americans had cost the British nearly 300 men in killed and wounded, and Reed now determined to destroy his vessel and escape to the shore. The great pivot gun was accordingly pointed down the main hatch, and two heavy shots sent crashing through the bottom. Then, applying the torch to make certain the work of destruction, the privateersmen left the ship, giving three cheers for the gallant General Armstrong, as a burst of flame and a roar told that the flames had reached her magazine. This gallant action won loud plaudits for Captain Reed when the news reached the United States. Certainly no vessel of the regular navy was ever more bravely or skillfully defended than was the General Armstrong. But besides the credit won for the American arms, Reed had unknowingly done his country a memorable service. The three vessels that attacked him were bound to the Gulf of Mexico to assist in the attack upon New Orleans. The havoc Reed had wrought among their crews and the damage he inflicted upon the Carnation so delayed the New Orleans expedition that General Jackson was able to gather those motley troops that fought so well on the plains of Chalmette. Had it not been for the plucky fight of the lads of the General Armstrong, the British forces would have reached New Orleans ten days earlier, and Pakenham's expedition might have ended very differently. 
a narrative of the exploits of and service done by the American sailors in the War of 1812 would be incomplete if it said nothing of the sufferings of that great body of tars who spent the greater part of the war season confined in British prisons. Several thousand of these were thrown into confinement before the war broke out, because they refused to serve against their country in British ships. Others were prisoners of war. No exact statistics as to the number of Americans thus imprisoned have ever been made public, but the records of one great prison, that at Dartmoor, show that when the war closed, six thousand American seamen were imprisoned there, 2,500 of whom had been detained from long before the opening of the war on account of their refusal to join the ranks of the enemy. As I write, there lies before me a quaint little book put out anonymously in 1815 and purporting to be the Journal of a Young Man Captured by the British. Its author, a young surgeon of Salem named Waterhouse, shipped on a Salem privateer, and was captured early in the war. His experience with British prisons and transport ships was long, and against his jailers he brings shocking charges of brutality, cruelty, and negligence. The Yankee seamen who were captured during the war were first consigned to receiving prisons at the British naval stations in America. Sometimes these places of temporary detention were moldering hulks moored in bays or rivers, sometimes huge sheds hastily put together, and in which the prisoners were kept only by the unceasing vigilance of armed guards. The prison at Halifax, writes Waterhouse, erected solely for the safekeeping of prisoners of war, resembles a horse stable with stalls or stanchions for keeping the cattle from each other. It is to a contrivance of this sort that they attach the cords that support those canvas bags or cradles called hammocks. Four tiers of these hanging nests were made to hang one above the other, between these stalls or stanchions. The general hum and confused noise from almost every hammock was at first very distressing. Some would be lamenting their hard fate at being shut up like negro slaves in a guinea ship, or like fowls in a hen coop for no crime, but for fighting the battles of their country. Others, late at night, were relating their adventures to a new prisoner, others lamenting their aberrations from rectitude and disobedience to parents and headstrong willfulness that drove them to sea contrary to their parents' wish, while others of the younger class were sobbing out their lamentations at the thoughts of what their mothers and sisters suffered after knowing of their imprisonment. Not unfrequently the whole night was spent in this way, and when, about daybreak, the weary prisoner fell into a doze, he was waked from his slumber by the grinding noise of the locks and the unbarring of the doors, with the cry of, Turn out! All out! when each man took down his hammock and lashed it up and slung it on his back and was ready to answer to the roll-call of the turnkey. From prisons such as this, the prisoners were conveyed in droves to England in the holds of men-of-war and transports. Poorly fed, worse housed, and suffering for lack of air and room, their agony on the voyage was terrible. When they were allowed a few hours' time on deck, they were sure to arouse the anger of the officers by turbulent conduct or imprudent retorts. One morning, as the general and captain of the Regulus transport were walking as usual on the quarter-deck, one of our Yankee boys passed along the galley with his kid of burgoo. He rested it on the hatchway while he adjusted the rope ladder to descend with his swill. The thing attracted the attention of the general, who asked the man how many of his comrades ate of that quantity for their breakfast. 
Six, sir, said the man, but it is fit food only for our hogs. This answer affronted the captain, who asked the man, in an angry tone, what part of America he came from. Near to Bunker Hill, sir, if you ever heard of that place, was the answer. On another occasion, a Yankee and a slightly wounded British Marine got into a dispute and came to blows. The British captain saw the occurrence and accused the American of cowardice in striking a wounded man. "'I am no coward, sir,' said the Yankee. "'I was captain of a gun on board the Constitution when she captured the Guerriere, and afterward when she took the Java.' Had I been a coward, I should not have been there. On one occasion, the prisoners on the transport Crown Prince, lying in the River Medway, took an uncontrollable dislike to the commander of a second transport, lying close alongside. Their spite was gratified quickly and with great effect. The rations served out to the luckless captives of that time consisted of fish and cold potatoes. The latter edible, being of rather poor quality, the prisoners reserved for missiles, and the obnoxious officer could not pace his quarter-deck without being made a mark for a shower of potatoes. Vainly did he threaten to call up his marines and respond with powder and lead. The Americans were not to be kept down, and for some days the harassed officer hardly dared to show himself upon deck. The place of final detention for most of the prisoners taken in the war with America was Dartmoor Prison, a rambling collection of huge frame buildings surrounded by double walls of wood. The number of prisoners confined there, and the length of time which many of them had spent within its walls, gave this place many of the characteristics of a small state, with rulers and officials of its own. One of the strangest characters of the prison was King Dick, a gigantic negro, who ruled over the five or six hundred prisoners. He is six feet five inches in height, said one of the prisoners, and proportionally large. This black Hercules commands respect, and his subjects tremble in his presence. He goes the rounds every day and visits every berth to see if they are all kept clean. When he goes the rounds, he puts on a large bearskin cap and carries in his hand a huge club. If any of his men are dirty, drunken, or grossly negligent, he threatens them with a beating, and if they are saucy, they are sure to receive one. They have several times conspired against him and attempted to dethrone him, but he has always conquered the rebels. One night several attacked him while asleep in his hammock. He sprang up and seized the smallest by his feet and thumped another with him. The poor negro, who has thus been made a beetle of, was carried the next day to the hospital, sadly bruised and provokingly laughed at. King Dick, to further uphold his dignity as a monarch, had his private chaplain, who followed his royal master about, and on Sundays preached rude but vigorous sermons to his majesty's court. On weekdays the court was far from being a dignified gathering. King Dick was a famous athlete, and in the cockloft over which he reigned was to be seen fine boxing and fencing. Gambling, too, was not ruled out of the royal lists of amusements, and the cries of the players mingled with the singing of the negroes, and the sounds of the musical instruments upon which they played made that section of the prison a veritable pandemonium. But, although some few incidents occurred to brighten momentarily the dull monotony of the prisoner's lot, the life of these unfortunate men, while thus imprisoned, was miserable and hateful to them. Months passed, and even years, but there seemed to be no hope for release. At last came the news of the Declaration of Peace. How great, then, was the rejoicing! 
thoughts of home, of friends and kindred, flooded the minds of all, and even strong men, whom the hardships of prison life had not broken down, seemed to give way all at once to tears of joy. But the delays of official action, red tape, and the sluggishness of travel in that day, kept the poor fellows pent up for months after the treaty of peace had been announced to them. Nor were they to escape without suffering yet more severely at the hands of their jailers. Three months had passed since peace had been declared, and the long delay so irritated the prisoners that they chafed under prison restraint and showed evidences of a mutinous spirit. The guards, to whom was entrusted the difficult task of keeping in subjection six thousand impatient and desperate men, grew nervous, fearing that at any moment the horde of prisoners would rise and sweep away all before them. An outbreak was imminent, and the prisoners were like a magazine of gunpowder, needing but a spark of provocation to explode. On April 6, 1815, matters reached a crisis. The soldiers, losing all presence of mind, fired on the defenseless Americans, killing five men and wounding thirty-four. Thus, the last bloodshed in the War of 1812 was the blood of unarmed prisoners. But the massacre, horrible and inexcusable as it was, had the effect of hastening the release of the survivors, and soon the last of the captives was on his way home. End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain. Section 44 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 44, The Horse Marines of 1814, by John Back McMaster. During the latter part of the War of 1812, the British maintained a rigorous blockade of the Atlantic coast. The Editor. The interruption of the coasting trade was indeed a very serious affair. For years past that trade had given occupation to thousands of coasters and tens of thousands of sailors. The shoes made at Lynn, the Yankee notions of Connecticut, the cotton cards, the domestic cottons, the playing cards produced in New England, the flower of the Middle States, the East India goods brought in from abroad, had found a ready market at Charleston, Savannah, and Augusta, whence great quantities of rice and cotton were brought north. On the arrival of the British fleet, this trade, no longer to be carried on in safety by water, began of necessity to be carried on by land. At first some merchants at Boston, having chartered a few wagons, dispatched them with loads to Philadelphia, and even to Baltimore. This was enough. The hint was taken. A new industry sprang up, and by the early summer the roads leading southward exhibited one continuous stream of huge, canvas-covered wagons tugged along by double and triple teams of horses or of oxen. No distance was then too great, and hundreds of them wound their way from Salem and Boston to Augusta and Savannah. An estimate made toward the close of the year places the number of wagons thus employed at four thousand and the number of cattle, horses, and oxen at 20,000. Nor does this seem excessive, for a traveler who drove from New York to Richmond declares that he passed 260 wagons on the way. Such was the stream that the good people of the New England towns along the post road from Boston to New York, scandalized at the wagons that went creaking through their streets every Sabbath, cried out that the tithing men must do their duty. Since the days of the turnpike and quick packet stage, the laws against traveling on the Sabbath had, even in Connecticut, been suffered to go unenforced. Here and there, indeed, a tithing man of the old school would quiet his conscience by calling out, Sunday after Sunday, to the driver of the regular four-horse Boston packet, as, 
loaded with passengers and with steeds at full gallop, it came clattering down the main streets of his native village. But no driver was foolish enough to heed him, and the matter was forgotten by the time the cloud of dust raised by the coach had settled. His inability to cope, single-handed, with a coach and four at full speed, satisfied the town that he had done his utmost to enforce the law. But no such excuse applied to a heavily loaded wagon drawn by six oxen, driven by one man on foot, and the law began to be rigorously applied. In Fairfield and Weathersfield that was especially the case, and these two towns soon became the dread of every wagoneer whom fate brought to them on Sunday. Delays of this sort, coupled with the more serious detentions caused by the unfitness of the wretched ferry boats on the great rivers to do the work that they were thus suddenly called upon to perform, did much to prolong the journey, which must at best have been slow. Even at New York, which now boasted of a steam ferry boat to Paulus Hook, as many as eight and fifteen wagons were often to be seen drawn up in line at the ferry waiting a chance to cross. On several occasions the wagons stood for three days in the street, and so obstructed travel that the teamsters were arrested and fined ten dollars each for blocking the highways. During the summer, when the roads were at their best, the trip from Boston to Baltimore was made in twenty-six days, from Baltimore to Richmond in ten days, and from Baltimore to Augusta in thirty-three days. Two months were thus consumed on the road between Boston and Augusta. From New York to Augusta, the journey was usually made in fifty days, and from Philadelphia in forty-five. That merchants, whose cargoes of boots and shoes, whose boxes of India goods, cotton goods, tinware, hardware and fancy goods were thus entrusted to the honesty of unknown wagoneers, should be most anxious to follow them in their slow progress southward, was most natural. It was seriously suggested, therefore, that the owners of the wagon should name them, as in the case of ships, keep a rough log in which to enter the names of other wagons met on the road, their destination and their condition, and report to the newspapers of each town and city they pass through. All this information should then be published, and copied by newspaper after newspaper for the benefit of shippers. This was done, and in a few weeks every wagon had a name, serious or humorous, according to the temper of the owner. There was teaser and split log, commerce renewed and old times, Neptune metamorphosed, toe the mark, mud clipper, sailor's misery, Cleopatra, Tecumseh, Serval, Jefferson's pride, and don't give up the ship. Entering into the humor of the thing, others procured great streamers bearing the words free trade and teamsters' rights, free trade and oxen's rights, no impressment and hung them to the sides of their wagons. Taking up the jest, the newspapers now began to record the arrival and departure of the wagons in the columns once devoted to ship news, under the headings Horse Marine Intelligence, Horse and Ox Marine News, Jefferson Commerce. Every wagon team was a fleet of fast-sailing wagons, to be regularly cleared at each city on its route. Every teamster now became a captain, whose adventures on the way were duly published as a log in some such form as this. Port of Salem. Arrived the three-horse ship Drognaught, Captain David Allen, sixteen days from New York. Spoke in the latitude of Weathersfield, the Crispin. Friend Alley Master, from New York. Bound home to Lynn, but detained in waiting trial for breach of the Sabbath. The late Northeaster has laid an embargo on many wagons. Saw several scudding under bare poles. Sunday, 17th instant, at 11 a.m., Weatherfield Meeting House bearing west, northerly twenty rods, the graves just under our lee, was boarded from a government cutter called the Tithing Man, who put a prize master on board and ordered us to the first tavern. There, notwithstanding the law that free gigs made free passengers, was detained till midnight, when, upon paying the innkeeper's fees, was released. Others contain accounts of boardings and overhaulings and searchings by custom house officers, who are invariably called douaniers by the Federalist Prince. If the cargo was not of English make and smuggled, the teamster would submit with a good grace and perhaps even court investigation. Thus the story was told of a wagoneer who, when stopped and asked, What are you loaded with? replied, Quintals of Pollock, casks of oil, and dry goods from Eastport. Dry goods from Eastport? exclaimed the Donier, they must be smuggled. The wagoneer protested that they were of American make, but the boxes were broken open, 
and were found to contain not Yorkshire broadcloth and Irish linens, but dried herrings. That all these things should go unnoticed by the verse-makers and ballad-writers of the day was impossible. Indeed, they seized upon the opportunity with eagerness, and provided the new captains with as fine a set of catches as had ever belonged to their brethren of the sea. The favorite was a parody of that stirring hymn of Campbell which begins, Ye mariners of England that guard our native seas. Ye wagoners of freedom, whose charges to the cud, whose wheels have braved a dozen years the gravel and the mud, your glorious hobbocks yoke again to take another jag, and scud through the mud where the heavy wheels do drag. Where the wagon creek is long and low and the jaded oxen lag, Columbia needs no wooden walls, nor ships where billows swell. Her march is like a terrapin's, her home is in her shell. To guard her trade and sailor's rights, in woods she spreads her flag. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Todd. Section 45 of The United States. Read for LibriVox.org. The United States, Volume 2, Part 6. A Period of Growth and Expansion. Historical Note. The purchase of the Louisiana Territory had aroused much interest in the West, and as time passed, thousands of settlers made their way thither and also to the Southwest. The ideal farm was, of course, situated on a river, that produce might be carried by boat, the only easy way of transportation in the early days. The Mississippi was a great avenue of trade, and into it there came from the Ohio, the Missouri, the Tennessee, and the Cumberland watercraft of all sorts, from rafts to steamboats, and all on their way to New Orleans to dispose of their cargoes. Very little of this great amount of trade with the West came to the eastern states for lack of water communication and at length it was decided to dig a canal from the Hudson River to Lake Erie. This canal, which was completed in 1825, greatly stimulated the growth of the West and made New York the commercial center of the United States. An invention that was destined to do even more than the canals and steamboats toward opening up the West was the steam engine. In 1830, there were 23 miles of railroad in the United States. In 1840, there were 2,818, and during the next two decades, the mileage was doubled every five years. The little group of colonies that had clung to the Atlantic coast was fast becoming a mighty nation that would soon stretch from shore to shore. End of section 45. This recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of the United States Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone The Opening of the Erie Canal By John Bark McMaster After eight years of persistent labour, the big ditch, so constantly the subject of ridicule, was finished, and in June the gates at Black Rock were opened, and the waters of Lake Erie for the first time were admitted into the Western Division. Later in the month the capstone of that splendid chain of blocks at Lockport was laid with Masonic ceremonies, but it was not until October that the canal from end to end was thrown open to the public. The celebrations of the opening began at Buffalo, where, on the 26th of the month, a procession of citizens and militia escorted the orator and the invited guests to a gaily decorated fleet lying in wait on the canal. On the Seneca chief, which headed the line, were two painted kegs full of water from Lake Erie. Behind it were the Superior, the Commodore Perry, the Buffalo, and the Lion of the West, a veritable Noah's Ark, containing a bear, two eagles, two fawns, two Indian boys, birds, and fish, all typical of the products of the West before the advent of the white man. When the address had been made, the signal was given, and the Seneca chief, drawn by four grey horses, started eastward on a most memorable journey. 
as the fleet moved slowly along the canal, saluted by music, musketry, and the cheers of the crowd on the bank, the news was carried to the metropolis by the reports of a continuous line of cannon placed along the canal to Albany and down the Hudson to New York. When the last gun had fired at the battery, the forts in the harbour returned the salute and the news that New York had heard the tidings was sent back to Buffalo by a second cannonade. The progress of the little fleet was one continuous ovation, as town after town along the route vied with each other in manifestations of delight. From Albany an escort of gaily dressed steamboats accompanied the fleet down the river to New York, where the entire population, increased by 30,000 strangers, turned out to receive it and whence thousands, boarding every kind of craft, went down the bay to Sandy Hook. There Governor Clinton, lifting the kegs from the deck of the Seneca chief, poured their contents into the sea, saying as he did so, This solemnity at this place, on the first arrival of vessels from Lake Erie, is intended to indicate and commemorate the navigable communication which has been accomplished between our Mediterranean seas and the Atlantic Ocean, in about eight years, to the extent of more than 425 miles, by the public spirit and energy of the people of the State of New York." and may the God of the heavens and the earth smile propitiously on this work and render it subservient to the best interests of the human race. This ceremony over and a grand salute fired, the boats returned to the city, where a fine industrial parade, to which each trade society furnished a float with artisans at work, closed the day. At night there were balls, parties, dinners, and illuminations. End of section 46. This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Todd. The Guest of the Nation by Daniel Webster. In 1824-25, Lafayette was the guest of the United States. He visited every state and was welcomed wherever he went as the friend of the nation. Congress presented him with two hundred thousand dollars and twenty-four thousand acres of fertile land. June 17, 1825, on the fiftieth anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill, the cornerstone of the monument was laid. Daniel Webster was the orator of the day, and as he spoke the following words, Lafayette rose and remained standing until they were ended. The Editor Sir, we are assembled to commemorate the establishment of great public principles of liberty, and to do honor to the distinguished dead. The occasion is too severe for eulogy of the living, but, sir, your interesting relation to this country, the peculiar circumstances which surround you and surround us, call on me to express the happiness which we derive from your presence and aid in this solemn commemoration. Fortunate, fortunate man! With what measure of devotion will you not thank God for the circumstances of your extraordinary life? You are connected with both hemispheres and with two generations. Heaven saw fit to ordain that the electric spark of liberty should be conducted through you from the new world to the old. And we who are now here to perform this duty of patriotism, have all of us long ago received it in charge from our fathers to cherish your name and your virtues. You will account it an instance of your good fortune, sir, that you cross the seas to visit us at a time which enables you to be present at this solemnity. You now behold a field, the renown of which reached you in the heart of France and caused a thrill in your ardent bosom. You see the lines of the little redoubt thrown up by the incredible diligence of Prescott, defended to the last extremity by his lion-hearted valor, and within which the cornerstone of our monument had now taken his position. You see where Warren fell, and where Parker, Gardner, McCleary, Moore, and other early patriots fell with him. Those who survived that day, 
and whose lives have been prolonged to the present hour, are now around you. Some of them you have known in the trying scenes of the war. Behold, they now stretch forth their feeble arms to embrace you. Behold, they raise their trembling voices to invoke the blessing of God on you and yours for ever. Sir, you have assisted us in laying the foundation of this structure. You have heard us rehearse, with our feeble commendation, the names of departed patriots. Monument and eulogy belong to the dead. We give them this day to Warren and his associates. On other occasions, they have been given to your more immediate companions in arms, to Washington, to Green, to Gates, to Sullivan, and to Lincoln. We have become reluctant to grant these, our highest and last honors, further. We would gladly hold them yet back from the little remnant of that immortal band. Ceres and Chalem Redis. Illustrious as are your merits, yet far, oh very far distant, be the day when any inscription shall bear your name, or any tongue pronounce its eulogy. End of section 47. This recording is in the public domain. Section 48 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States, edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 48. The Highest Peak of the Rocky Mountains. By John Charles Fremont. In 1842, John Charles Fremont was sent by the government to explore the Rocky Mountains. On this journey, his great feat was the ascent of the highest peak of the range, afterwards called Fremont's Peak, 13,570 feet above sea level. The Editor I determined to leave our animals here and make the rest of our way on foot. The peak appeared so near that there was no doubt of our returning before night and a few men were left in charge of the mules, with our provisions and blankets. We took with us nothing but our arms and instruments, and, as the day had become warm, the greater part left their coats. Having made an early dinner, we started again. We were soon involved in the most ragged precipices, nearing the central chain very slowly, and rising but little. The first ridge had a succession of others, and when, with great fatigue and difficulty, we had climbed up five hundred feet, it was but to make an equal descent on the other side. All these intervening places were filled with small, deep lakes, which met the eye in every direction, descending from one level to another, sometimes under bridges formed by huge fragments of granite, beneath which was heard the roar of the water. These constantly obstructed our path, forcing us to make long detours, frequently obliged to retrace our steps, and frequently falling among the rocks. Maxwell was precipitated toward the face of a precipice, and saved himself from going over by throwing himself flat on the ground. We clambered on, always expecting with every ridge that we crossed to reach the foot of the peaks, and always disappointed, until about four o'clock, when, pretty well worn out, we reached the shore of a little lake in which there was a rocky island. We remained here a short time to rest, and continued on around the lake, which had in some places a beach of white sand, and in others was bound with rocks, over which the way was difficult and dangerous, as the water from innumerable springs made them very slippery. By the time we had reached the farther side of the lake, we found ourselves all exceedingly fatigued, and much to the satisfaction of the whole party, we encamped. The spot we had chosen was a broad, flat rock, in some measure protected from the winds by the surrounding crags, and the trunks of fallen pines afforded us bright fires. Nearby was a foaming torrent, which tumbled into the little lake about 150 feet below us, and which, by way of distinction, we have called Island Lake. We had reached the upper limit of the piney region, as above this point no tree was to be seen, and patches of snow lay everywhere around us on the cold sides of the rocks. The flora of the region we had traversed since leaving our mules was extremely rich, and among the characteristic plants the scarlet flowers of the Dodecatheon tentatum 
everywhere met the eye in great abundance. A small green ravine, on the edge of which we were encamped, was filled with a profusion of alpine plants in brilliant bloom. From barometrical observations made during our three days' sojourn at this place, its elevation above the Gulf of Mexico is ten thousand feet. During the day we heard what was supposed to be the bleat of a young goat, which we searched for with hungry activity, and found to proceed from a small animal of a gray color, with short ears and no tail, probably the Siberian squirrel. We saw a considerable number of them, and with the exception of a small bird like a sparrow, it is the only inhabitant of this elevated part of the mountains. On our return we saw below this lake large flocks of the mountain goat. We had nothing to eat tonight. La Junesse with several others took their guns and sallied out in search of a goat, but returned unsuccessful. At sunset the barometer stood at 20.522. The attached thermometer, 50 degrees. Here we had the misfortune to break our thermometer, having now only that attached to the barometer. I was taken ill shortly after we had encamped, and continued so until late in the night, with violent headache and vomiting. This was probably caused by the excessive fatigue I had undergone and want of food, and perhaps also in some measure by the rarity of the air. The night was cold, as a violent gale from the north had sprung up at sunset, which entirely blew away the heat of the fires. The cold and our granite beds had not been favorable to sleep and we were glad to see the face of the sun in the morning. Not being delayed by any preparation for breakfast, we set out immediately. On every side as we advanced was heard the roar of waters and of a torrent, which we followed up a short distance until it expended into a lake about one mile in length. On the northern side of the lake was a bank of ice, or rather of snow, covered with a crust of ice. Carson had been our guide into the mountains, and agreeably to his advice, we left this little valley and took to the ridges again, which we found extremely broken, and where we were again involved among precipices. Here were ice fields, among which we were all dispersed, seeking each the best path to ascend the peak. Mr. Pruce attempted to walk along the upper edge of one of these fields, which sloped away at an angle of about twenty degrees, but his feet slipped from under him and he went plunging down the plain. A few hundred feet below, at the bottom, were some fragments of sharp rock, on which he landed, and though he turned a couple of somersaults, fortunately received no injury beyond a few bruises. Two of the men, Clement Lambert and De Cotou, had been taken ill, and lay down on the rocks a short distance below, and at this point I was attacked with headache and giddiness, accompanied by vomiting, as on the day before. Finding myself unable to proceed, I sent the barometer over to Mr. Pruce, who was in a gap two or three hundred yards distant, desiring him to reach the peak if possible, and take an observation there. He found himself unable to proceed farther in that direction, and took an observation where the barometer stood at 19.401, a touch thermometer 50 degrees in the gap. Carson, who had gone over to him, succeeded in reaching one of the snowy summits of the main ridge. Once he saw the peak, toward which all our efforts had been directed, towering eight or ten hundred feet into the air above him. In the meantime, finding myself grow rather worse than better, and doubtful how far my strength would carry me, I sent Basil Lajeunesse with four men back to the place where the mules had been left. We were now better acquainted with the topography of the country, and I directed him to bring back with him, if it were in any way possible, four or five mules with provisions and blankets. With me were Maxwell and Eyre, and after we had remained nearly an hour on the rock, it became so unpleasantly cold, though the day was bright, that we set out on our return to the camp, at which we all arrived safely, straggling in one after the other. I continued ill during the afternoon, but became better toward sundown, when my recovery was completed by the appearance of Basil and four men, all mounted. The men who had gone with him had been too much fatigued to return, and were relieved by those in charge of the horses. But in his powers of endurance, Basil resembled more a mountain goat than a man. They brought blankets and provisions, 
and we enjoyed well our dried meat and a cup of good coffee. We rolled ourselves up in our blankets, and with our feet turned to a blazing fire, slept soundly until morning. August 15th. It had been supposed that we had finished with the mountains, and the evening before it had been arranged that Carson should set out at daylight and return to breakfast at the camp of the mules, taking with him all but four or five men, who were to stay with me and bring back the mules and instruments. Accordingly, at the break of day they set out. With Mr. Pruce and myself remained Basil Lajeunesse, Clement Lambert, Janice, and Decotou. When we had secured strength for the day by a hearty breakfast, we covered what remained, which was enough for one meal, with rocks, in order that it might be safe from any marauding bird, and saddling our mules, turned our faces once more towards the peaks. This time we determined to proceed quietly and cautiously, deliberately resolved to accomplish our object, if it were within the compass of human means. We were of opinion that a long defile which lay to the left of yesterday's route would lead us to the foot of the main peak. Our mules had been refreshed by the fine grass in the little ravine at the island camp, and we intended to ride up the defile as far as possible, in order to husband our strength for the main ascent. Though this was a fine passage, still it was a defile of the most rugged mountains known, and we had many a rough and steep slippery place to cross before reaching the end. In this place the sun rarely shone. Snow lay along the border of the small stream which flowed through it, and occasional icy passages made the footing of the mules very insecure, and the rocks and ground were moist with the trickling waters in this spring of mighty rivers. We soon had the satisfaction to find ourselves riding along the huge wall which forms the central summits of the chain. There at last it rose by our side, a nearly perpendicular wall of granite, terminating two to three thousand feet above our heads in a serrated line of broken, jagged cones. We rode on until we came almost immediately below the main peak, which I denominated the Snow Peak, as it exhibited more snow to the eye than any of the neighboring summits. Here were three small lakes of a green color, each of perhaps a thousand yards in diameter, and apparently very deep. These lay in a kind of chasm, and according to the barometer, we had attained but a few hundred feet above the island lake. The barometer here stood at 20.450, attached thermometer 70 degrees. We managed to get our mules up to a little bench about a hundred feet above the lakes, where there was a patch of good grass, and turned them loose to graze. During our rough ride to this place, they had exhibited a wonderful sure-footedness. Parts of the defile were filled with angular, sharp fragments of rock, three or four and eight or ten feet cube, and among these they had worked their way, leaping from one narrow point to another, rarely making a false step, and giving us no occasion to dismount. Having divested ourselves of every unnecessary encumbrance, we commenced the ascent. This time, like experienced travelers, we did not press ourselves, but climbed leisurely, sitting down so soon as we found breath beginning to fail. At intervals we reached places where a number of springs gushed from the rocks, and about eighteen hundred feet above the lakes came to the snow line. From this point our progress was uninterrupted climbing. Hitherto I had worn a pair of thick moccasins, with soles of parflesh. But here I put on a light, thin pair which I had brought for the purpose, as now the use of our toes became necessary to a farther advance. I availed myself of a sort of comb of the mountain, which stood against the wall like a buttress, and which the wind and the solar radiation, joined to the steepness of the smooth rock, had kept almost entirely free from snow. Up this I made my way rapidly. Our cautious method of advancing in the outset had spared my strength, and with the exception of a slight disposition to headache, I felt no remains of yesterday's illness. In a few minutes we reached a point where the buttress was overhanging, and there was no other way of surmounting the difficulty than by passing around one side of it, which was the face of a vertical precipice of several hundred feet. Putting hands and feet in the crevices between the blocks, I succeeded in getting over it, and when I reached the top, 
found my companions in a small valley below. Descending to them, we continued climbing, and in a short time reached the crest. I sprang upon the summit, and another step would have precipitated me into an immense snowfield five hundred feet below. To this edge of the field was a sheer icy precipice, and then, with a gradual fall, the field sloped off for about a mile, until it struck the foot of another lower ridge. I stood on a narrow crest, about three feet in width, with an inclination of about twenty degrees north, fifty-one east. As soon as I had gratified the first feelings of curiosity, I descended, and each man ascended in his turn, for I would allow only one at a time to mount the unstable and precarious slab, which it seemed a breath would hurl into the abyss below. We mounted the barometer in the snow of the summit, and fixing a ramrod in a crevice, unfurled the national flag to wave in the breeze where never flag waved before. End of section 48 Section 49 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 49 the first telegram by r m evans the announcement of the invention the telegraph and its astonishing capacity was for a long time the most prominent theme of public and private discussion admiration being largely mingled with blank incredulity and not a little ridicule even in congress in the application of professor morse for government aid to enable him to demonstrate the value of his invention by constructing a line between Washington and Baltimore in 1838. There were not wanting learned legislators who treated the idea as a mere chimera. It was the same Congress of which Espy, the Storm King, was asking assistance to test his favorite theory, then so prominently discussed. Both Morse and Espy, says a writer of that time, and the event, became the butt of ridicule, the target of merciless arrows of wit. They were voted downright bores, and the idea of giving them money was pronounced farcical. They were considered monomaniacs, and as such were laughed at, punned upon, and made the standing staple for jokes. One morning, however, a gentleman rose from his seat in the house, quite to the astonishment of everybody, for he had never been known to speak before unless it was to vote or to address the speaker, and said, I hold in my hand a resolution which I respectfully offer for the consideration of the house. In a moment a page was at his desk, and the resolution was transferred to the speaker and by him delivered to the clerk, who read as follows, Resolved that the Committee of Ways and Means be instructed to inquire into the expediency of appropriating $30,000 to enable Professor Morse to establish a line of telegraph between Washington and Baltimore. The gentleman who offered it was Mr. Ferris, one of the New York representatives, a man of wealth and learning, but modest, retiring, and diffident. This being merely a resolution of inquiry, it passed without opposition, and out of regard to the mover, without comment. In time, it came before the committee, all the members of which had, by their public services and brilliant talents, acquired a national reputation. The clerk of the committee read the resolution. The chairman, Mr. Fillmore, in a clear, distinct voice, said, Gentlemen, what disposition shall be made of it? There was a dead pause around the table. No one seemed inclined to take the initiative. It was expected that, inasmuch as the mover of the resolution in the House was a Democrat, the Democratic side of the committee would stand godfather to it there, but not a bit of it. They felt that the whole thing was preposterous and deserving of no countenance. At length, one on the other side broke the ominous silence by moving that the committee instruct the chairman to report a bill to the House. 
appropriating thirty thousand dollars for the purpose named in the resolution this movement motion brought them all upstanding no speeches were made the question was called for the yeas and nays were taken alphabetically and as four had voted on the affirmative side and four on the negative it fell to the lot of governor wallace of indiana whose name came last on the list to decide the question he however had paid no attention to the matter and like the majority of people considered it a great humbug he had not the faintest idea of the importance to his country of the vote he was to cast but as fortune would have it the thought came to mind that mr morse was even then experimenting to the capital with a new-fangled invention having stretched a wire from the basement story to the interim of the senate chamber it was therefore in governor wallace's power to satisfy himself at once in regard to the question of feasibility and he determined to try it he asked lee to consider his vote this was granted he immediately went to the antechamber which he found crowded with representatives and strangers governor wallace requested permission to put a question to the madman morse at the other end of the wire it was granted immediately he wrote the question and handed it to the telegrapher the crowd cried read read in a very short time the answer was received when written out by the operator the same cry of read it read it went up from the crowd to his utter astonishment governor wallace found that the madman at the end of the wire had more wit and force than the congressman at the other the laugh was turned completely upon the committee man but as western men are rarely satisfied with one fall not less than two failures out of three attempts forcing from them any acknowledgment of defeat the governor put a second question and there came a second answer if the first raised a laugh at his expense the second converted that laugh into a roar and a shout he was more than satisfied picking up his hat he bowed himself out of the crowd the good-natured shout following him as he passed along the passages and halls of the capitol as a matter of course governor wallace voted in the affirmative of the motion then pending before the committee and it prevailed the chairman reported the bill the house and senate concurred in its passage and thus was professor morse successful in this his last struggle to demonstrate the practicability of as it has proved the most amazing invention of the age the electromagnetic telegraph if the committee had ignored the proposition there is no telling what would have been the result that the experiment would have been finally made no one can entertain a doubt but when or by whom is the question it is not within the range of ordinary individual fortune to make it and if it was none but professor morse would have hazarded it it appears however that professor morse came to the last stage of discouragement in the prosecution of his appeal to congress before light finally broke in upon him on the very last day of the session the bill relating to his case was the one hundred and twentieth on the senate docket to be acted upon in course concerning this scene a writer in harper's monthly states that during the day professor morse watched the course of legislation from the gallery with nervous trepidation and the deepest anxiety at length worn out by the interminable discussion of some senator who seemed to be speaking against time and overcome by his prolonged watching he left the gallery at a late hour and went to his lodgings under the belief that it was not possible his bill could be reached and that he must again turn his attention to those labors of the brush and easel by means of which he might be enabled to prosecute appeals to congress at a future time he accordingly made his preparations to return to new york on the following morning and retiring to rest sank into a profound slumber from which he did not awake until a late hour on the following morning but a short time after while seated at the breakfast table the servant announced that a lady desired to see him upon entering the parlor he found miss annie ellsworth the daughter of the commissioner of patents whose face was all aglow with pleasure i have come to congratulate you she remarked as he entered the room and approached to shake hands with her to congratulate me replied mr morse and for what why upon the passage of your bill to be sure she replied 
You must surely be mistaken, for I left at a late hour, and its fate seemed inevitable. Indeed, I am not mistaken, she rejoined. Father remained until the close of the session, and your bill was the very last that was acted on, and I begged permission to carry to you the news. I am so happy that I am the first to tell you so. The feelings of Professor Morse may be better imagined than described. He grasped his young companion warmly by the hand, and thanked her over and over again for the joyful intelligence, saying, as reward for being the first bearer of this news, you shall send over the telegraph the first message it conveys. I will hold you to that promise, replied she. Remember, remember, responded Professor Morse, and they parted. The plans of Mr. Morse were now altogether changed. His journey homeward was abandoned, and he set to work to carry out the project of establishing the line of electrotelegraph between Washington and Baltimore, authorized by the bill. His first idea was to convey the wires, enclosed in a leaden tube, beneath the ground. He had already arranged a plan by which the wires insulated by a covering of cotton saturated in gum shellac were to be inserted into leaden pipes in the process of casting. But after the expenditure of several thousand dollars and much delay, this plan was given up, and the one now in use of extending them on poles adopted. By the month of May, 1844, the whole line was laid, and magnets and recording instruments were attached to the ends of the wires at Mount Clare Depot, Baltimore, and at the Supreme Court Chamber in the Capitol at Washington. When the circuit was complete and the signal at the one end of the line was responded to by the operator at the other, Mr. Morse sent a messenger to Miss Ellsworth to inform her that the telegraph awaited her message. She speedily responded to this and sent for transmission the following, which was the first formal dispatch ever sent through a telegraphic wire connecting remote places with each other. What hath God wrought? The original of the message is now in the archives of the Historical Society at Hartford, Connecticut. The practicability and utility of the invention were now clearly and firmly established. End of section 49 this recording is in the public domain. Section 50 of the United States This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 50 A Little Scotch Pioneer in Wisconsin The First Half of the Nineteenth Century By John Muir The thought of striking out into the wilderness to make a home has certain fascination, but whoever attempts it must look forward to years of hard labor before he can see much fruit of his toil. The following account of the first years on a new farm has been chosen as presenting a typical picture of pioneer life in its struggle to transform forests and prairies into the fertile farms that have been the chief source of the nation's wealth. The Editor I was put to the plow at the age of twelve, when my hand first reached but little above the handles, and for many years I had to do the greater part of the plowing. It was hard work for so small a boy. Nevertheless, as good plowing was exacted from me as if I were a man, and very soon I had to become a good plowman, or rather plowboy. None could draw a straighter furrow. For the first few years the work was particularly hard on account of the tree stumps that had to be dodged. Later the stumps were all dug and chopped out to make way for the McCormick Reaper, and because I proved to be the best chopper and stump digger I had nearly all of it to myself. It was dull, hard work leaning over on my knees all day, chopping out those tough oak and hickory stumps deep down below the crowns of the big roots. Some, though fortunately not many, were two feet or more in diameter. And as I was the eldest boy, the greatest part of all the other work of the farm quite naturally fell to me. I had to split rails for long lines of zigzag fences, the trees that were tall enough and straight enough to afford one or two logs ten feet long were used for rails. The others, too knotty or cross-grained, 
were disposed of in log and cordwood fences. Making rails was hard work and required no little skill. I used to cut and split a hundred a day from our short, knotty oak timber, swinging the axe and heavy mallet, often with sore hands from early morning to night. Father was not successful as a rail splitter. After trying the work with me a day or two, he, in despair, left it all to me. I rather liked it, for I was proud of my skill, and tried to believe that I was as tough as the timber I mauled, though this and other heavy jobs stopped my growth, and earned me the title Runt of the Family. In those early days, long before the great labor-saving machines came to our help, almost everything connected with reet raising abounded in trying work, cradling in the long, sweaty dog days, raking and binding, stacking, thrashing, and it often seemed to me that our fierce, over-industrious way of getting the grain from the ground was too closely connected with grave-digging. The staff of life, naturally beautiful, oft-times suggested the grave-digger's spade. Men and boys, and in those days even women and girls, were cut down while cutting the wheat. The fat folk grew lean and the lean leaner, while the rosy cheeks brought from Scotland and other cool countries across the sea faded to yellow like the wheat. We were all made slaves through the vice of over-industry. The same was in great part true in making hay to keep the cattle and horses through the long winters. We were called in the morning at four o'clock and seldom got to bed before nine, making a broiling, seething day seventeen hours long, loaded with hard work, while I was only a small stunted boy. And a few years later my brothers David and Daniel and my older sisters had to endure about as much as I did. In the harvest dog days and dog nights and dog mornings, when we arose from our clammy beds, our cotton shirts clung to our backs as wet with sweat as the bathing suits of swimmers, and remained so all the long, sweltering days. In the mowing and cradling, the most exhausting of all the farm work, I made matters worse by foolish ambition to keep ahead of the hired men. Never a warning word was spoken of the dangers of overwork. On the contrary, even when sick, we were held to our tasks as long as we could stand. Once in a harvest time I had the mumps, and was unable to swallow any food except milk, but this was not allowed to make any difference, while I staggered with weakness and sometimes fell headlong among the sheaves. Only once was I allowed to leave the harvest field, when I was stricken down with pneumonia. I lay gasping for weeks, but the scotch are hard to kill, and I pulled through. No physician was called, for father was an enthusiast, and always said and believed that God and hard work were by far the best doctors. None of our neighbors were so excessively industrious as father, though nearly all of the Scotch, English, and Irish worked too hard, trying to make good homes and to lay up money enough for comfortable independence. Excepting small garden patches, few of them had owned land in the old country. Here their craving land hunger was satisfied, and they were naturally proud of their farms, and tried to keep them as neat and clean and well tilled as gardens. To accomplish this without the means for hiring help was impossible. Flowers were planted about the neatly kept log or frame houses. Barnyards, granaries, etc. were kept in about as neat order as the homes, and the fences and corn rows were rigidly straight. But every uncut weed distressed them. So also did every ungathered ear of grain, and all that was lost by birds and gophers. And this over-carefulness bred endless work and worry. As for money... For many a year there was precious little of it in the country for anybody. Eggs sold at six cents a dozen in trade, and five-cent calico was exchanged at twenty-five cents a yard. Wheat brought fifty cents a bushel in trade. To get cash for it before the ported railway was built, it had to be hauled to Milwaukee, a hundred miles away. On the other hand, food was abundant. Eggs, chickens, pigs, cattle, wheat, corn, potatoes, garden vegetables of the best, and wonderful melons as luxuries. No other wild country I have ever known extended a kinder welcome to poor immigrants. On the arrival in the spring, a log house could be built, a few acres plowed, the virgin sod planted with corn, potatoes, etc., and enough raised to keep a family comfortably the very first year, and wild hay for cows and oxen grew in abundance on the numerous meadows. The American settlers were wisely content with smaller fields and less of everything, kept indoors during excessive hot or cold weather, rested when tired, went off fishing and hunting at the most favorable times and seasons of the day and year, gathered nuts and berries, and in general tranquility accepted all the good things the fertile wilderness offered. 
After eight years of this dreary work of clearing the Fountain Lake farm, fencing it and getting it in perfect order, building a frame house and the necessary outbuildings for the cattle and horses, after all this had been victoriously accomplished and we had made out to escape with life, Father bought a half-section of wild land about four or five miles to the eastward and began all over again to clear and fence and break up other fields for a new farm, doubling all the stunting, heartbreaking, chopping, grubbing, stump-digging, rail-splitting, fence-building, barn-building, house-building, and so forth. By this time I had learned to run the breaking plow. Most of these plows were very large, turning furrows from eighteen inches to two feet wide, and were drawn by four or five yoke of oxen. They were used only for the first plowing, in breaking up the wild sod woven into a tough mass, chiefly by the cord-like roots of perennial grasses, reinforced by the taproots of oak and hickory bushes, called grubs, some of which were more than a century old and four or five inches in diameter. In the hardest plowing on the most difficult grounds, the grubs were said to be as thick as the hair on a dog's back. If in good trim, the plow cut through and turned over these grubs as if the centuries-old wood were soft like the flesh of carrots or turnips. But if not in good trim, the grubs promptly tossed the plow out of the ground. A stout Highland Scot, our neighbor, whose plow was in bad order and who did not know how to trim it, was vainly trying to keep it in the ground by main strength, while his son, who was driving and merrily whipping up the cattle, would cry encouragingly, All her in, fire! All her in! But who in the devil can I haul her in when she won't stop in? His perspiring father would reply, gasping for breath between each word. On the contrary, with the share and coulter sharp and nicely adjusted, the plow, instead of shying at every grub and jumping out, ran straight ahead without need of steering or holding, and gripped the ground so firmly that it could hardly be thrown out at the end of the furrow. Our breaker turned a furrow two feet wide, and on our best land, where the sod was toughest, held so firm a grip that at the end of the field my brother, who was driving the oxen, had to come to my assistance in throwing it over on its side to be drawn around the end of the landing, and it was all I could do to set it up again. But I learned to keep that plow in such trim that after I got started on a new furrow, I used to ride on the crossbar between the handles with my feet resting comfortably on the beam, without having to steady or steer it in any way on the whole length of the field, unless we had to go round a stump, for it sawed through the biggest grubs without flinching. The growth of these grubs was interesting to me. When an acorn or hickory nut had set up its first season sprout a few inches long, it was burned off in the autumn grass fires, but the root continued to hold on to life, formed a callus over the wound, and sent up one or more shoots the next spring. Next autumn, these new shoots were burned off, but the root and calloused head, about level with the surface of the ground, continued to grow and send up more shoots, and so on almost every year until very old, probably far more than a century, while the tops, which would naturally have become tall, broad-headed trees, were only mere sprouts seldom more than two years old. Thus the ground was kept open like a prairie, with only five or six trees to the acre, which had escaped the fire by having the good fortune to grow on a bare spot at the door of a fox or badger den, or between straggling grass tufts wide apart on the porous sandy soil. The uniformly rich soil of the Illinois and Wisconsin prairies produced so close and tall a growth of grasses for fires that no tree could live on it. Had there been no fires, these fine prairies, so marked a feature of the country, would have been covered with the heaviest forests. As soon as the oak openings in our neighborhood were settled, and the farmers had prevented running grass fires, the grubs grew up into trees and formed tall thickets so dense that it was difficult to walk through them, and every trace of the sunny openings vanished. We called our second farm Hickory Hill, from its many fine hickory trees and the long, gentle slope leading up to it. Compared with Fountain Lake Farm, it lay high and dry. The land was better, but it had no living water, no spring or stream or meadow or lake. A well ninety feet deep had to be dug, all except the first ten feet or so in fine-grained sandstone. When the sandstone was struck, my father, on the advice of a man who had worked in mines, tried to blast the rock, but from lack of skill the blasting went on very slowly, and father decided to have me do all the work with Mason's chisels, a long, hard job, with a good deal of danger in it. I had to sit, cramped in a space about three feet in diameter, and wearily chip, chip, with heavy hammer and chisels from early morning until dark, day after day, for weeks and months. In the morning, 
Father and David lowered me in a wooden bucket by a windlass, hauled up what chips were left from the night before, then went away to the farm work and left me until noon, when they hoisted me out for dinner. After dinner I was promptly lowered again, the forenoon's accumulation of chips hoisted out of the way, and I was left until night. One morning, after the dreary bore was about eighty feet deep, my life was all but lost in deadly choke damp, carbonic acid gas that had settled at the bottom during the night. Instead of clearing away the chips as usual when I was lowered to the bottom, I swayed back and forth and began to sink under the poison. Father, alarmed that I did not make any noise, shouted, What's keeping you so still? To which he got no reply. Just as I was setting down against the side of the wall, I happened to catch a glimpse of the branch of a burr oak tree which leaned out over the mouth of the shaft. This suddenly awakened me, and to father's excited shouting I feebly murmured, Take me out! But when he began to hoist, he found I was not in the bucket, and in wild alarm shouted, Get in! Get in the bucket and hold on! Hold on! Somehow I managed to get into the bucket, and that is all I remembered until I was dragged out, violently gasping for breath. One of our near neighbors, a stonemason and miner by the name of William Duncan, came to see me, and after hearing the particulars of the accident, he solemnly said, Well, Johnny, it's God's mercy that you're alive. Many a companion of mine have I seen dead with choked damp, but none that I ever saw or heard of was so near to death in it as you were, and escaped without help. Mr. Duncan taught father to throw water down the shaft to absorb the gas, and also to drop a bundle of brush or hay attached to a light rope, dropping it again and again to carry down pure air and stir up the poison. When, after a day or two, I had recovered from the shock, father lowered me again to my work, after taking the precaution to test the air with a candle and stir it up well with a brush and hay bundle. The weary hammer and chisel chipping went on as before, only more slowly, until ninety feet down when I at last struck a fine hardy gush of water. Constant dropping wears away stone. So does constant chipping, while at the same time wearing away the chipper. End of section 50. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Todd. Section 51 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org. The United States, Volume 2, Part 7. The Mexican War. Historical Note. In 1821, Mexico became independent of Spain, and forthwith invited immigration. During the first half of the 19th century, more than 20,000 people from the United States accepted this invitation and settled in Texas, the northern province of Mexico. They found Mexican law and treatment unsatisfactory, and in 1836, these Texans fought their way to freedom, founded the Republic of Texas, and asked to join the Union as a state. As slavery existed in Texas, the anti-slavery party objected to its admission, and there was a long delay. At length, the pro-slavery party triumphed, and in 1845, Texas was admitted. Mexico not only refused to acknowledge the independence of Texas, but also declared that in any case, the river Nueces was her own northern boundary, while Texas claimed to be bounded by the Rio Grande. The disputed territory was occupied by an American army, and when the Mexicans attempted to drive it out, the United States formally declared war. General Taylor invaded northern Mexico and won battle after battle along the Rio Grande. Kearney took possession of New Mexico and Arizona, and Fremont occupied California. The main army under General Winfield Scott landed at Veracruz, and after several hard-fought battles against superior forces, captured the city of Mexico. This ended the war. By the Treaty of Peace, the United States gained a territory equal in extent to the combined areas of Germany, France, and Spain. End of Section 51. This recording is in the public domain. Section 52 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Ava March Tappan, Section 52, 
Remember the Alamo by Cyrus Townsend Brady The Alamo is an ancient Spanish mission in the present city of San Antonio. Here in 1836, during the Texas struggle for freedom, a band of 180 Americans and Texans, including David Crockett, the famous scout, and James Bowie, inventor of the Bowie knife, were attacked by a Mexican army under General Santa Anna. The Editor on the 23rd of February, 1836, Santa Anna in person appeared before the fort with the advance of his army and demanded its surrender. He had led some 5,000 men of the Mexican regular army, with many camp followers and women, a forced march of 180 leagues from Monclova to San Antonio, across a desert country in the depth of a Texas winter, with its extremes of heat and cold and blasting storm. Only after incredible hardships and great losses had the terrible march been completed. That Santa Anna could do this is no small evidence of his capacity as a leader and his ability to inspire his men to heroic action. His arrival was a complete surprise to the Texans. Many of them were scattered through the town at a fandango at the time. When the alarm was given, they repaired to the Alamo, and Travis met the demand for a surrender by a shot from his battery, at the same time hoisting his flag. This was the white, red, and green banner of the Mexican Republic, with two stars, Texas Coahuila, in the center in place of the familiar eagle and serpent. The lone star flag had not then been adopted. Santa Ana displayed a red ensign, signifying that no quarter would be given, and began erecting batteries with which he opened fire, the Texans replying with good effect. The Mexicans, while greatly outnumbering the garrison, were not yet in sufficient force completely to invest the works, although their numbers were increasing as the different regiments followed the advance guard, and the Texans might easily have escaped. Travis, however, had no thought of retreating. Not he. He immediately dispatched the following appeal for assistance. To the people of Texas and all Americans in the world. Commandancy of the Alamo. Bear, February 24th, 1836. Fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment for twenty-four hours and have not lost a man. The enemy have demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison is to be put to the sword if the place is taken. I have answered the summons with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call upon you in the name of liberty— of patriotism, and of everything dear to the American character, to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy are receiving reinforcements daily, and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. Though this call may be neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible, and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Victory or death. W. Barrett Travis. Lieutenant Colonel, commanding. P.S. The Lord is on our side. When the army appeared in sight, we had not three bushels of corn. We have since found in deserted houses eighty or ninety bushels, and got into the walls twenty or thirty beeves. Brave Travis. Other ringing sentences from his subsequent letters are worth quoting. I shall continue to hold the Alamo until I get relief from my countrymen, or I perish in its defense. Take care of my little boy. If the country should be saved, I may make him a splendid fortune. But if the country should be lost and I should perish, he would have nothing but the proud recollection that he is the son of a man who died for his country. The thought of that little boy adds a touch of pathos to the story of the dauntless cavalier and his devoted band facing fearful odds for liberty and honor, God and Texas, victory or death. Travis also dispatched messengers invoking assistance from adjacent garrisons. Colonel James Butler Bonham, a young South Carolina volunteer, broke through the Mexican lines and rode post-haste to Colonel Fannin at Goliad, some two hundred miles to the southeast. Fannin promptly started out with three hundred men and four guns, but his ammunition wagons broke down, his transportation failed him, his provisions gave out, he could not get his artillery over the rivers, and he was reluctantly forced to turn back. He tried in vain to keep Bonham with him. 
"'I will report to Travis or die in the attempt,' returned the chivalric Carolinian, who had been a schoolboy friend of Travis, as he started back to the fort. At one o'clock in the morning of March 3rd, he succeeded in reaching the fort through the beleaguering army, after a long and dangerous ride, in which he literally took his life in his hands. So far as anyone could see, he came back to certain death with his friends. Honor to him. Travis had received a valuable reinforcement of thirty-two heroic fellows from Gonzales, who dashed through the lines on horses, cutting their way into the Alamo at three in the morning of March 1st. Captain J.W. Smith led them, and they came cheerfully, although they divined what their fate would be if the place was stormed. For eleven days, the siege continued. The Mexicans lost heavily whenever they came within rifle range. On one occasion they tried to bridge the aqueduct, and thirty of them were instantly killed. Sorties were made by the besieged at first, but were soon given over. The bombardment of the works was continuous, but strange to say, no Texan was killed, although the whole garrison was completely worn out by the strain of ceaseless watching and continual fighting. There is no question but they could have cut their way out and escaped at almost any time, but no one dreamed of such a thing. They were there to stay until the end, whatever it might be. Santa Anna would undoubtedly get the fort eventually. Well, he might have it by paying the price. So they reasoned. But that price would be one, in the words of a later revolutionist, that would stagger humanity. Knowing Santa Anna, they could have no doubt of his intentions toward them, especially as he had made no secret of his purpose to put them all to death, unless they surrendered at discretion. The calm courage with which they face this appalling certainty is as noteworthy as the high heroism of their last defense. The last of Santa Anna's army arrived at Bear on the 2nd of March. He allowed them three days for recuperation, and on the 5th held a council of war to decide upon the course to be pursued. The council, like every other, was divided, with a preponderance of opinion in favor of waiting for siege guns to breach or batter down the walls. Santa Anna, however, determined upon an immediate assault, to be delivered at daybreak the next morning. Twenty-five hundred picked men in four columns, commanded respectively by General Duque, Romero, and Morales, were detailed to make the attack. They were provided with scaling ladders, axes, and crowbars in addition to their weapons, and the cavalry of the army was disposed at strategic points to prevent escape, should any of the hundred and eighty defenders succeed in breaking through the assaulting columns. Or possibly their function was to cut down any panic-stricken Mexican who might wish to withdraw from before the death-dealing Texas rifles. Colonel Duque was to lead the main assault on the north side, while a simultaneous attack was to be made on the east and west sides, and at the redoubt covering the sally port from the convent yard. No attack appears to have been contemplated on the stockade on the south wall at first. Accounts of what happened differ widely. It is to be remembered that no American lived to tell the tale, and it is hard to get at the absolute truth from Mexican testimony and the frightened recollections of two dazed women and two servants. Each narrator must build his own account by considering all the testimony and weighing the evidence. This that follows seems to me to be what happened. About four o'clock on Sunday morning, March 6th, the notes of a bugle calling the Mexican troops to arms rang over the quiet plain, across which the first gray light, precursor of the dawn, was already stealing. Bugles all about caught up the shrill refrain. Lights appeared in the circling camps, the trampling feet of hurrying men, neighing of the horses, all apprised the weary garrison that the moment they had expected was at hand. They were instantly assembled. What happened as they fell in on the plaza before they went to their several stations? Tradition has it that Travis paraded them, briefly addressed them, pointed out their certain fate, as he had sworn never to surrender, and bade any who desired to do so to leave him freely and escape while there was yet time. Not a man availed himself of the permission. "'We will stay and die with you,' they cried unanimously, as they repaired to their stations on the outer wall. Cool, calm, and resolute, they waited the breaking of the battle storm. 
undaunted by the prospect, unshaken by the fearful odds before them. America has produced no better soldiers. Even the dozen sick men in the long room of the hospital with Bowie were provided with arms, of which fortunately they had a good supply, and they too shared the same heroic resolution. Ill and well were equally determined. It was early morning when all the dispositions were made on both sides, and the day was breaking clear, cool, and beautiful, a sweet day indeed in which to die for home and country and liberty in the great cause of human freedom. So they may have thought as they looked towards the eastward light for the last time. The quiet watchers on the walls presently detected movements in the dark rank of the besiegers. They were coming then. Music, too, was there. All the bands of the Mexican army stationed with Santa Ana on the battery in front of the plaza were playing a ghastly air called De Guello, Cutthroat. That and the red flag, speaking of no quarter, pointed out a deadly purpose. Well, the Texans needed none of these things to nerve their arms. Rifles were lifted and sighted. The lock strings of the carefully pointed cannon were tightened. They could not afford to throw away any shots. There was no hurry, no confusion. The Mexicans were nearer now. The bugles rang charge. The close-ordered ranks broke into a run. From the east, the west, the north they came, cheering and yelling madly. A shot burst from the plaza. The crack of the rifles broke on the air. A fusillade ran along the walls on every side. The cannon roared out, hurling into the faces of the Mexicans bags filled with hideous missiles. The advancing lines hesitated, paused, halted, fled. The first assault was beaten off. The ground was covered with dead and wounded. Comparative stillness supervened. Well done, brave Texans. Look to your arms again. Snatch a cup of water. Enjoy your moment of respite. They are coming again. The east and west columns had been driven to the north. Colonel Duquet, gallant soul, reformed them on his own brigade. There was a small breach in the north wall. He hurled the mass at it, himself in the lead. The Americans ran to the point threatened. Again the withering rifle fire. Duquet fell, desperately wounded. Mortal man could not face that deadly discharge. The soldiers gave way once more, repulsed a second time. Would they dare come on again? Far off on the east side, the roar of battle still surged around the redoubt covering the convent yard. How went the battle there, thought the triumphant defenders of the plaza, as they gazed on their flying foemen. It was a critical moment for the Mexicans. Santa Anna recognized it, and galloped on the field, leading a reinforcement. He noted that the west wall had been denuded of most of its defenders, and with soldierly decision threw his fresh troops against it, leading them in person, some accounts say. Oh, for a thousand brave hearts and true to man the long lines. The hundred and eighty could not be everywhere. The few at the point of impact died, and the Mexicans entered the plaza at last. At the same time, the officers drove the men up to the third assault on the north wall. Under the eye of Santa Anna, they advanced for a last desperate attempt. Honor to those Mexicans for their bravery, too. In this attack, a bullet pierces Travis's brain. The little boy has only the heritage of an honored and heroic name, then. He falls dead on the trail of a cannon. Bonham is killed serving a gun. The north wall is taken. The redoubt to the east is gained. The stockade is attacked. Other soldiers swarm up to the south wall, break through the gate. They come in on every side. The Texans are surrounded by fire and steel. Some of them run back while there is yet time, and rally in the convent where Bowie lies. Others follow Crockett, now in chief command, to the church to die with him there. The whole Mexican army is upon them now, the nine score against the five thousand at last. The old convent is divided into little cell-like rooms, each with a door opening into the yard or plaza but with no connection between the rooms. A few Texans hold each chamber, and into each smoke-filled enclosure the infuriated troops pour their gunfire and then rush the rooms to writhe and struggle over the bloody pavements until all the defenders are killed. No quarter, indeed. What of the invalids in the hospital fighting from their beds? 
Forty Mexicans fall dead before the door of the long room, before they think to bring a cannon and blow the defenders into eternity. Bowie lies alone in his room, waiting with grim resolution for what is coming, pain from injuries forgotten, fevered pulse beating higher. His bed is covered with pistols, and near his hand lies his trusty knife. A brown, fierce face peers in the door. Another and another. The room is filled with smoke. Yells and curses and groans rise from the floor, where a trail of stricken soldiers reaches from the door to the bedside. And one bolder than his fellows lies on Bowie's breast, with that awful American knife buried deep in his heart. And Bowie has died as he had lived, sword in hand. The only fight left now is in the churchyard. A little handful, bloody, powder-stained, desperate, are backed up against the wall. It is hand-to-hand -hand work now on both sides, no time to reload, bayonet thrust against rifle butt in berserker fury. Hope is lost, but they are dying in high fashion, faces to the foe, striking while they have a heartbeat left. Fire the magazine, says Crockett to Major Evans, the only remaining officer. The man runs towards the church where the powder is stored and is stricken down on the threshold. The Mexicans rush upon Crockett and his remnant. The keen death-dealing Betsy has spoken for the last time. The old frontiersman has clasped it by the barrel now. Swinging this iron war club, he stands at bay, disdaining surrender. The Mexicans are piled before him in heaps. But numbers tell. They swarm about him. They leap upon him like hounds upon a great stag. They pull him down, bury their bayonets in his great heart, spurn him, trample upon him, spit upon him. So he makes a fine end. It is over. Gunner Walker, the last man in arms, is shot and stabbed, tossed aloft on bayonets, in fact. The flag is down. No one is left to defend it longer. Five wounded, helpless prisoners are dragged before Santa Anna, and at his command butchered where they lie or stand, some of the Mexican officers, to their credit be it said, vainly protesting. Six people who were in the fort at the beginning were left alive by the Mexicans. Two women, two children, and two servants. One a Negro slave, the other a Mexican. One hour— one short hour filled with such sublime struggle as has not been witnessed often in the brief compass of sixty minutes. The sun is shining. The plaza is filled with light, the light of morning, the light of heroic death, of self-sacrifice absolute. And the day breaks, a day of eternal remembrance. Wherever men live to love the hero, these will not be forgotten. By the defense of that old deserted Spanish house of prayer, it was consecrated anew to the service of God, through the sufferings of men. Their sacrifice had not been in vain, for the cry that swept Texas to freedom, that drove the Mexican beyond the Rio Grande, was, Remember the Alamo. One scene remains of the splendid story. By Santa Anna's orders, the dead Texans, to the number of 182, were gathered together and arranged in a huge pyramid, a layer of wood, a layer of dead, and so on, and the torch applied. A not unfitting end. As the dead demigod of Homeric days was laid upon his funeral pyre, as the dead Viking of later time was burned with his ship, so these modern heroes. The wind scattered their ashes on the spot their defense had immortalized, and made it forever a hallowed ground. The hundred and eighty had done well. Each one had accounted for more than four of the enemy, for the Spanish casualties are estimated as between six hundred and a thousand, and most was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Texan-Americans had done their best and given their all. Honor to their valor and their courage. On the monument erected at the state capitol at Austin, to commemorate their unparalleled achievement, is graven this significant line. Thermopylae had its messenger of defeat. The Alamo had none. End of section 52。section 53 of the United States。read for LibriVox.org by the Story Girl。the importance of one vote。by W. H. Vale。
In DeKalb County, Indiana, when the election day arrived, there was a man who was in doubt whether to go to the mill or to the polls. Finally, after a certain amount of coaxing, he decided that he would exercise his right of franchise and vote. He voted the Democratic ticket, and a Democratic member of the legislature was elected from his district by a majority of only one vote. That legislature elected a United States senator, and by the vote of the one member from that district, Mr. Hannigan was chosen. Mr. Hannigan took his seat in the Senate and was president of the Senate pro tem when the vote was taken for the annexation of Texas. On the floor, the vote was a tie, and Mr. Hannigan's casting vote decided the question in favor of annexation. And this action brought on the Mexican War, which has so shaped the subsequent history of our country. This illustration certainly brings before us an extreme case, but who knows when another instance may occur proving the same value of one vote. End of section 53. This recording is in the public domain. Section 54 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The World's Story, 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 54. The Storming of Chapel Tepec. 1847, by James Barnes. When General Scott arrived before the city of Mexico with his little army, he found the city defended by a double line of fortifications, strengthened by lakes and marshes. On August the 20th, the outer works were carried by four desperate assaults. After a futile endeavor to arrange terms of peace, the forts of Molino del Rey were stormed and captured in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle, and nothing remained to carry but the almost impregnable castle of Chapel Tepec, the editor. There was no sleep that night for the general or his staff. They had taken the first step to Chapel Tepec. They were on the lower stair, but they would have to fight their way to the very top, and if this day's battle was an earnest of the one that was to follow— there would be between five and six thousand men only left him to enter a city that had comprised among its population nearly eighty thousand men of fighting age. Whether the city would resist his entering, if Chapel Tepec should fall, he could not tell. He was led to suppose it would not. At all events, there was no time to hesitate. Action was necessary. Scott said to one of his officers, if I had ten times the number of men that I now have, I could use them, so every man must fight as if he was ten himself. And that is exactly what they did. By all rules of the game of war that were ever printed, written, or learned, Scott was defeated and repulsed. In fact, he should have been annihilated, if not at Molino del Rey, the first thing on the following morning after this costly victory. The Mexicans might have poured out like an avalanche from the cliffs above, and swept the little blue-coated army out of existence. But such a thought never entered the American private's mind. The general had carried him through tight places before, and he would do it again. There was nothing to prevent him entering the city proper at this very minute. All he had to do was to batter down one of the gates— and rush through into the streets that were filled with the terror-stricken inhabitants. But with Chapel Tepec in the Mexicans' hands, his sojourn in Mexico would have been short. He might have entered, but he would never have left again. It was necessary to pause before delivering the final attack. Scott determined to divert attention by pretending that the city was his destination. So on the 12th of September... A battery, well supported, was sent forward to begin hammering at the gate. 
Four large batteries were planted within easy distance of the castle walls, with orders to begin firing as soon as daylight was sufficient for ranges to be found. Long before the sun had shone above the horizon, the grim, grey dawn was saluted by the red gashes of flame from the cannon's mouths. The shells raising their fiery arches from the burning fuses, the thundering discharges of the Mexican guns that soon replied, almost shook the solid rock. From daylight till it was pitch dark, the artillery duel went on. The Mexicans, though firing from above, displayed, luckily, little accuracy, and the American gunners soon got the range to a dot, and hardly a shot went wild. By nightfall it was evident the fortress was severely shaken, and by the morning of the 13th the storming party were in position. The plan was to advance in two columns. Pillow was to come forward from the west, and Quitman from the southeast. Ahead of the main columns on each side were 250 picked men. Worth's division was to act as a reserve, and Twiggs was to keep up his attack on the gates of the city. The Mexicans had mined the first line of defences, and it was the intention to blow up the Americans if they should ever cross the ramparts, but so keen were the troops, and so swift was the advance, that the picked vanguard reached the first wall and surmounted it alone. They shot down the men who had been left to fire the mines, and were stamping out some of the burning fire trains that led to them as the main division, shouting and cheering, came tumbling over the escarpment. The firing now broke out all along the surface of the hill. Here and there little bands of five or six men could be seen, climbing along like goats, helping with hand and shoulder their comrades above and beneath them. Resistlessly they pushed up. The Mexicans watching from the cathedral spires and the city walls saw the star and stripes, flag after flag, appear as point after point was taken. But for some time from the topmost pinnacle floated the Mexican banner, and then at last it waved, fluttered, and came down. A detachment of the New York Volunteers, led by Lieutenant Reed, and another of the Second Infantry, led by the brave Lieutenant Steele, were the first to gain the inner walls of the citadel. Young Steele was badly wounded, but with the assistance of two men on either side of him he kept moving upward, and when at last he reached the top it was his own hand that lowered the last Mexican banner. As its folds fluttered about him he fell fainting to the ground. Scott, with great difficulty owing to his tremendous size and weight, at last reached the crest and saw the retreating Mexicans streaming away on all sides, and hanging on their flanks pursuing them were bodies of American troops, mad with the desire to kill and to have revenge for the slaughter of their comrades at Molino del Rey. Scott sent orders, ordering the recall of the pursuers. To those about him he raised his voice, almost in supplication, "'Be humane and generous, my boys, as you are victorious,' and I will get down on my bended knee to God for you to-night. It was a long time, however, before the officers could call off their men from the pursuit. The hillsides and plain and the meadow beyond were crowded with dead and wounded Mexicans. In the afternoon a small battery was carried before the gates, and at four o'clock on the next morning, September the 14th, a deputation from the city council waited upon General Scott, and informed him that the government and all the troops had fled from the capital, and that the citizens themselves wished to surrender the city. Scott refused to sign any capitulation, claiming that the city was already in his possession, and about daylight Worth and Quitman advanced, and, practically unmolested, reached the great plaza, and hoisted the colours of the United States on the National Palace. There was some rioting that lasted twenty-four hours, for many soldiers had thrown aside their uniforms, and joining the liberated convicts, carried on desultory firing from the housetops. But with the assistance of the municipal authorities, who apparently were glad to see the American army in possession, 
they were at last driven out and punished. Guards were posted everywhere, and within four days the city was tranquil and cheerful, and the American soldiers everywhere winning their way, not now by force of arms, but by strict maintenance of law and order, and by the magnanimity of their conduct. End of section 54 This recording is in the public domain. Section 55 of the United States Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The United States, Volume 2, Part 8 California Historical Note The Spaniards first visited California in 1533, and a few years later some little exploring was done under Caprillo. Sir Francis Drake came to the country in 1579 and named it New Albion. Two hundred years later, the erection of missions by the Franciscan monks began. The Indians were taught Christianity, and also had to carry on farming and to live in settled communities. In 1826, American immigration from the East took place. After 1840, it was plain that California would eventually become independent of Mexico, and the question of future government arose. Some of the settlers thought it would be best to establish a British protectorate, Others favored annexation to the United States. John C. Fremont, the Pathfinder, headed an exploring expedition to California, and in 1846, with the aid of some of the inhabitants, he seized the town of Sonoma and proclaimed the independence of the country. This was just at the outbreak of the Mexican War, and by orders from the United States government, other parts of the country were seized, so that when General Kearney made his way thither after capturing Santa Fe, the conquest was already nearly completed. In August 1846, California was made a territory of the United States. The discovery of gold in 1848 aroused in all parts of the world a frantic immigration to the western coast. It is estimated that 100,000 persons came during the first year. In 1850, California was admitted to the Union as a state. End of section 55. This recording is in the public domain. Section 56 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 56. When the English Discovered California, 1577-1579, to by Edward Everett Hale. In 1577, Sir Francis Drake set out on a voyage to America. He rounded Cape Horn and sailed fearlessly up the western coast of the continent, sacking a Spanish town or capturing a Spanish treasure ship now and then by way of pastime. He went to the north, hoping to find a passage to the Atlantic, but was driven back by the intense cold. At either the harbor of San Francisco, or some bay not far from there, he stopped to refit his ships, and then crossed the Pacific on his homeward voyage. The Editor The day after they entered this harbor, an Indian came out to them in a canoe. He made tokens of respect and submission. He threw into the ship a little basket made of rushes containing an herb called toba. Drake wished to recompense him, but he would take nothing but a hat, which was thrown into the water. The company of the pelican supposed then and always that the natives considered and reverenced them as gods. In preparation for repairing the ship, Drake landed his stores. A large company of Indians approached as he landed, and friendly relations were maintained between them and the Englishmen during the whole of their stay. Drake received them cautiously but kindly. He set up tents and built a fort for his defense. The natives, watching the English with amazement, still regarded them as gods. One is tempted to connect this superstition with the direct claim which Alarcon had made of a divine origin in presence of these tribes a generation before, though at a point five hundred miles away. Fletcher's description of their houses is precisely like the Spaniard's account of the winter houses of the tribes he met. Quote, those houses are digged round within the earth, and have from the uppermost brims of the circle clefts of wood set up, 
and joined close together at the top like our spires on the steeple of a church which being covered with earth suffer no water to enter and are very warm the door in the most part of them performs the office also of a chimney to let out the smoke it's made in bigness and fashion like to an ordinary scuttle in a ship and standing slopewise at the end of two days an immense assembly called together from all parts of the country gathered to see the strangers they brought with them feathers and bags of tobacco for presents or for sacrifices arrived at the top of the hill their chief made a long address wearying his english hearers and himself when he had concluded the rest bowing their bodies in a dreamy manner quote unquote, and long producing of the same cried oh giving their consent to all that had been spoken this reminds one of the who of the indians of the tison the women meanwhile tore their cheeks with their nails and flung themselves on the ground as if for a personal bloody sacrifice drake met this worship not as alarson had done but by calling his company to prayer the men lifted their eyes and hands to heaven to signify that god was above and besought god quote, to open their blinded eyes to the knowledge of him and of jesus christ the salvation of the gentiles end quote through these prayers the singing of psalms and reading certain chapters of the bible fletcher who was the chaplain says they sat very attentively they observed every pause and cried oh with one voice greatly enjoying our exercises they thus showed a more catholic spirit than the whites had shown who were wearied by the length of the address of the savages drake made them presents which at the departure of the english they returned saying that they were sufficiently rewarded by their visit the fame of this visit extended so far that at the end of three days more on the twenty sixth of june a larger company assembled this time the king himself with a bodyguard of one hundred warriors was with them they called him their hioch he approached the english preceded by a mace-bearer who carried two feather crowns with three chains of bone of marvellous length often doubled such chains were of the highest estimation and only a few persons were permitted to wear them the number of chains indeed marked the rank of the highest nobility some of whom wore as many as twenty next to the mace-bearer came the king himself on his head was a knit crown somewhat like those which were borne before him he wore a coat of the skins of conies coming to his waist his guards wore similar coats and some of them wore coals upon their heads covered with a certain vegetable down almost sacred and used only by the highest ranks the common people followed naked but with feathers every one pleasing himself with his own device the last part of the company were women and children each woman brought a well-made basket of rushes some of these were so tight that they would hold water they were adorned with pearl shells and with bits of the bone chains in the baskets they had bags of tobah and roots called petah which they ate cooked or raw drake meanwhile held his men in military array the mace-bearer then pronounced a long speech which was dictated to him in a low voice by another all parties except the children approached the fort and the mace-bearer began a song with a dance to the time in which all the men joined the women danced without singing drake saw that they were peaceable and permitted them to enter his palisade the women showed signs of the wounds which they had made before coming by way of preparing for the solemnity at the request of the chief drake then sat down the king and others made to him several orations or quote, indeed supplications that he would take province and kingdom into his hand and become their king and patron end quote. with one consent they sang a song placed one of the crowns upon his head hung their chains upon his neck and honoured him as their hyo drake did not think he should refuse this gift quote, in the name and to the use of queen elizabeth he took the sceptre crown and dignity of the country into his hand end quote he only wished says the historian that he could as easily transport the riches and treasures wherewith in the upland it abounds to the enriching of her kingdom at home had drake had any real knowledge of the golden gravel over which the streams of the upland flowed it may well be that the history of california would have been changed 
From this time, through several weeks, while Drake remained there, the multitude also remained. At first they brought offerings every three days as sacrifices, until they learned that this displeases their English king. Like other sovereigns who have had much to do with this race, he found that he had to feed his red retainers, but he had muscles, seals, quote-unquote, and such like, in quantity sufficient for their rations. Drake made a journey into the country. He saw, quote-unquote, infinite company of fat deer in a herd of thousands. He found a multitude of strange, quote-unquote, conies in large numbers, with long tails and with a bag under the chin in which to carry food either for future supply or for their children. Drake erected on the shore a post, on which he placed a plate of brass. Here he engraved the queen's name, the date of his landing, the gift of the country by the people, and left her majesty's portrait and arms. The last were not designed by his artists, as some historians have carelessly supposed, but were on a silver piece of sixpence, quote, showing through a hole made of purpose in the plate, end quote. When the people saw that Drake could not remain, they could not conceal their grief. At last they stole on the English unawares with a sacrifice which, quote-unquote, they set on fire, thus burning a chain and bunch of feathers. The English could not dissuade them till they fell to prayers and singing of psalms, when the sad natives let their fire go out, and left the sacrifice unconsumed. On the 23rd of July, the friends parted, the English for the shores of Asia, the savages to the hills, where they built fires as long as the pelican was in sight. Thus did England take possession of the region which, after near 300 years, proved to be the richest gold-bearing country in the world. Drake gave to the country the name of New Albion, and it bore that name on the maps for centuries. End of section 56「Section 57 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 57. On the California Coast in the Thirties. By Richard Henry Dana, Jr. When Richard Henry Dana, Jr. was a student at Harvard, his eyes became so seriously affected that it was necessary for him to leave college for a time. A trip abroad was planned for him, but he preferred to make a voyage to California by way of Cape Horn in the capacity of a sailor. His notebook developed into the famous Two Years Before the Mast, from which the following extract is taken. The Editor we were turned to early and began taking off the hatches, overhauling the cargo, and getting everything ready for inspection. At eight, the officers of the customs, five in number, came on board and began examining the cargo, manifest, etc. The Mexican revenue laws are very strict and require the whole cargo to be landed, examined, and taken on board again. But our agent had succeeded in compounding for the last two vessels and saving the trouble of taking the cargo ashore. The officers were dressed in the costume which we found prevailed through the country, broad-brimmed hat, usually of a black or dark brown color, with a gilt or figured band round the crown, and lined under the rim with silk. A short jacket of silk or figured calico, the European skirted coat is never worn, the shirt open in the neck, rich waistcoat if any, pantaloons open at the sides below the knees, laced with gilt, usually of velveteen or broadcloth or else short breeches and white stockings. They wear the deerskin shoe, which is of a dark brown color, and, being made by Indians, usually a good deal ornamented. They have no suspenders, but always wear a sash round the waist, which is generally red, and varying in quality with the means of the wearer. Add to this the never-failing poncho, or the serapa, and you have the dress of the Californian. This last garment is always a mark of the rank and wealth of the owner. The gente de raison, or better sort of people, wear cloaks of black or dark blue broadcloth, with as much velvet and trimmings as may be, and from this they go down to the blanket of the Indian, the middle classes wearing a poncho, something like a large square cloth with a hole in the middle for the head to go through. This is often as coarse as a blanket, but being beautifully woven with various colors, is quite showy at a distance. 
Among the Mexicans, there's no working class, the Indians being practically serfs and doing all the hard work, and every rich man looks like a grandee, and every poor scamp like a broken-down gentleman. I have often seen a man with a fine figure and courteous manners, dressed in broadcloth and velvet, with a noble horse, completely covered with trappings, without a real in his pockets, and absolutely suffering for something to eat. The next day, the cargo having been entered in due form, we began trading. The trade room was fitted up in the steerage, and furnished out with the lighter goods, and with specimens of the rest of the cargo. And Mellis, a young man who came out from Boston with us before the mast, was taken out of the forecastle and made supercargo's clerk. He was well qualified for this business, having been clerk in a counting house in Boston. But he had been troubled for some time with rheumatism, which unfitted him for the wet and exposed duty of a sailor on the coast. For a week or ten days all was life on board. The people came to look and to buy, men, women, and children, and we were continually going in the boats carrying goods and passengers, for they have no boats of their own. Everything must dress itself and come aboard and see the new vessel, if it were only to buy a paper of pins. The agent and his clerk managed the sales while we were busy in the hold or in the boats. Our cargo was an assorted one, that is, it consisted of everything under the sun. We had spirits of all kinds sold by the cask, teas, coffee, sugars, spices, raisins, molasses, hardware, crockery ware, tinware, cutlery, clothing of all kinds, boots and shoes from Lynn, calicoes and cotton from Lowell, crepes, silks, also shawls, scarfs, necklaces, jewelry and combs for the women, furniture and in fact everything that can be imagined, from Chinese fireworks to English cartwheels, of which we had a dozen pairs with their iron tires on. The Californians are an idle, thriftless people, and can make nothing for themselves. The country abounds in grapes, yet they buy, at a great price, bad wine made in Boston, and brought round by us, and retail it among themselves at a real, twelve and a half cents, by the small wine glass. Their hides, too, which they value at two dollars in money, they barter for something which costs seventy-five cents in Boston and buy shoes, as like as not, made of their own hides which have been carried twice round Cape Horn, at three and four dollars, and chicken skin boots at fifteen dollars a pair. Things sell, on an average, at an advance of nearly three hundred percent upon the Boston prices. This is partly owing to the heavy duties which the government, in its wisdom, with an idea, no doubt, of keeping the silver in the country, has laid upon imports. These duties, and the enormous expenses of so long a voyage, keep all merchants but those of heavy capital from engaging in the trade. Nearly two-thirds of all the articles imported into the country from round Cape Horn for the last six years have been by the single house of Bryant, Sturgis, and Company, to whom our vessel belonged. This kind of business was new to us, and we liked it very well for a few days, though we were hard at work every minute from daylight to dark and sometimes even later. By being thus continually engaged in transporting passengers with their goods to and fro, we gained considerable knowledge of the character, dress, and language of the people. The dress of the men was as I have before described it. The women wore gowns of various texture, silks, crepe, calico, etc., made after the European style, except that the sleeves were short, leaving the arm bare, and that they were loose about the waist, corsets not being in use. They wore shoes of kid or satin, sashes or belts of bright colors, and almost always a necklace and earrings. Bonnets they had none. I saw only one on the coast, and that belonged to the wife of an American sea captain who had settled in San Diego, and had imported the chaotic mass of straw and ribbon as a choice present to his new wife. They wear their hair, which is almost invariably black or a very dark brown, long in their necks, sometimes loose, and sometimes in long braids, though the married women often do it up on a high comb. Their only protection against the sun and the weather is a large mantle which they put over their heads, drawing it close round their faces when they go out of doors, which is generally only in pleasant weather. When in the house or sitting out in front of it, which they often do in fine weather, they usually wear a small scarf or neckerchief of a rich pattern. A band also about the top of the head with a cross, star, or other ornament is common. Their complexions are various, depending, as well as their dress and manner, upon the amount of Spanish blood they can lay claim to, which also settles their social rank. Those who are of pure Spanish blood, having never intermarried with the Aborigines, have clear brunette complexions, 
and sometimes even as fair as those of English women. There are but few of these families in California, being mostly those in official stations, or who, on the expiration of their terms of office, have settled here upon property they have acquired, and others who have been banished for state offenses. These form the upper class, intermarrying and keeping up an exclusive system in every respect. They can be distinguished not only by their complexion, dress, and manners, but also by their speech. For, calling themselves Castilians, they are very ambitious of speaking the pure Castilian, while all Spanish is spoken in a somewhat corrupted dialect by the lower classes. From this upper class, they go down by regular shades, growing more and more dark and muddy, until you come to the pure Indian, who runs about with nothing upon him but a small piece of cloth, kept up by a wide leather strap drawn round his waist. Generally speaking, each person's caste is decided by the quality of the blood, which shows itself too plainly to be concealed at first sight. Yet the least drop of Spanish blood, if it be only of quadroon or octoroon, is sufficient to raise one from the position of a serf and entitle him to wear a suit of clothes. Boots, hat, cloak, spurs, long knife, all complete, though coarse and dirty as may be, and to call himself Espanol, and to hold property if he can get any. The fondness for dress among the women is excessive, and is sometimes their ruin. A present of a fine mantle, or of a necklace or pair of earrings, gains the favor of the greater part. Nothing is more common than to see a woman living in a house of only two rooms, with the ground for a floor, dressed in spangled satin shoes, silk gown, high comb, and gilt, if not gold, earrings and necklace. If their husbands do not dress them well enough, they will soon receive presents from others. They used to spend whole days on board our vessel, examining the fine clothes and ornaments, and frequently making purchases at a rate which have made a seamstress or a waiting maid in Boston open her eyes. Next to the love of dress, I was most struck with the fineness of the voices and beauty of the intonations of both sexes. Every common ruffian-looking fellow, with a slouched hat, blanket cloak, dirty underdress, and soiled leather leggings, appeared to me to be speaking elegant Spanish. It was a pleasure simply to listen to the sound of the language before I could attach any meaning to it. They have a good deal of the Creole drawl, but it is varied by an occasional extreme rapidity of utterance, in which they seem to skip from consonant to consonant, until, lighting upon a broad open vowel, they rest upon that to restore the balance of sound. The women carry this peculiarity of speaking to a much greater extreme than the men, who have more evenness and stateliness of utterance. A common bullock driver on horseback, delivering a message, seemed to speak like an ambassador at a royal audience. In fact, they sometimes appeared to me to be a people on whom a curse had fallen, and stripped them of everything but their pride, their manners, and their voices. Another thing that surprised me was the quantity of silver in circulation. I never in my life saw so much silver at one time as during the week that we were at Monterey. The truth is, they have no credit system, no banks, and no way of investing money but in cattle. Besides silver, they have no circulating medium but hides, which the sailors call California banknotes. Everything that they buy they must pay for by one or the other of these means. The hides they bring down dried and doubled in clumsy ox carts or upon mules' backs and the money they carry tied up in a handkerchief, fifty or a hundred dollars and half dollars. Monterey, as far as my observation goes, is decidedly the pleasantest and most civilized-looking place in California. In the center of it is an open square, surrounded by four lines of one-story buildings, with half a dozen cannon in the center, some mounted and others not. This is the Presidio, or Fort. Every town has a Presidio in its center, or rather every presidio has a town built round it, for the forts were first built by the Mexican government, and then the people built near them for protection. The presidio here was entirely open and unfortified. There were several officers with long titles and about 80 soldiers, but they were poorly paid, fed, clothed, and disciplined. The governor general, or as he is commonly called, the general, lives here, which makes it the seat of government. He is appointed by the central government at Mexico, and is the chief civil and military officer. In addition to him, each town has a commandant, who is its chief officer, and has charge of the fort and of all transactions with foreigners and foreign vessels, while two or three alcaldes and corregidores 
elected by the inhabitants are the civil officers. Courts strictly of law with a system of jurisprudence they have not. Small municipal matters are regulated by the alcaldes and corregidores, and everything relating to the general government, to the military, and to foreigners, by the commandants, acting under the governor-general. Capital cases are decided by the latter upon personal inspection, if near, or upon minutes sent him by the proper officers, if the offender is at a distant place. No Protestant has any political rights, nor can he hold property, or, indeed, remain more than a few weeks on shore, unless he belong to a foreign vessel. Consequently, Americans and English who intend to reside here become papists, the current phrase among them being, a man must leave his conscience at Cape Horn. But to return to Monterey, the houses here, as everywhere else in California, are of one story, built of adobes, that is, clay made into large bricks about a foot and a half square, and three or four inches thick, and hardened in the sun. These are joined together by a cement of the same material, and the whole are of a common dirt color. The floors are generally of earth, the windows grated and without glass, and the doors, which are seldom shut, open directly into the common room, there being no entries. Some of the more wealthy inhabitants have glass to their windows and board floors, and in Monterey nearly all the houses are whitewashed on the outside. The better houses, too, have red tiles upon the roofs. The common houses have two or three rooms which open into each other, and are furnished with a bed or two, a few chairs and tables, a looking-glass, a crucifix, and small daubs of paintings enclosed in glass, representing some miracle or martyrdom. They have no chimneys or fireplaces in the houses, the climate being such as to make a fire unnecessary, and all their cooking is done in a small kitchen, separated from the house. The Indians, as I have said before, do all the hard work, two or three being attached to the better houses, and the poorest persons are able to keep one at least, for they have only to feed them and give them a small piece of coarse cloth and a belt for the men, and a coarse gown without shoes or stockings for the women. In Monterey there are a number of English and Americans, English or Ingles, all are called who speak the English language, who have married Californians, become united to the Roman Church, and acquired considerable property. Having more industry, frugality, and enterprise than the natives, they soon get nearly all the trade into their hands. They usually keep shops, in which they retail the goods purchased in larger quantities from our vessels, and also send a good deal into the interior, taking hides in pay, which they again barter with our ships. In every town on the coast there are foreigners engaged in this kind of trade, while I recollect but two shops kept by natives. The people are naturally suspicious of foreigners, and they would not be allowed to remain, were it not that they conform to the church, and by marrying natives and bringing up their children as Roman Catholics and Mexicans, and not teaching them the English language, they quiet suspicion, and even become popular and leading men. The chief alcaldes in Monterey and Santa Barbara were Yankees by birth. End of section 57. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 58 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 58. How the Forty Niners Reached California. By Henry Charles Merwin. The length of the voyage from Atlantic ports to San Francisco was from four to five months, but most of the pioneers who came by sea avoided the passage around Cape Horn and crossed the Isthmus of Nicaragua, or, more commonly, of Panama. This, in either case, was a much shorter route, but it added the horrors of pestilence and fever, and of possible robbery and murder, to the ordinary dangers of the sea. All the blacklegs, it was noticed, took the shorter route, deeming themselves no doubt incapable of sustaining the prolonged ennui of a voyage around the cape passengers who crossed the isthmus of panama disembarked at chagres a port so unhealthy that policies of life insurance contained a clause to the effect that if the insured remained there more than one night his policy would be void chagres enjoyed the distinction of being the dirtiest place in the world 
the inhabitants were almost all negroes and one pioneer declared that a flock of buzzards would present a favorable comparison with them from chagres there was first a voyage of seventy-five miles up the river of the same name to gorgona or to cruces five miles farther this was accomplished in dugouts propelled by native indians thence to panama the pioneers travelled on foot or on muleback over a narrow winding bridle path through the mountains so overhung by trees and dense tropical growths that in many places it was dark even at midday this was the opportunity of the indian muleteer and more than one gold seeker never emerged from the gloomy depths of that winding trail originally it was the work of the indians but the spaniards who used the path in the sixteenth century had improved it and in many places had secured the bank with stones now however the trail had fallen into decay and in spots was almost impassable but the tracks worn in the soft calcareous rock by the many iron-shot hoofs which had passed over it still remained and the mule that bore the american seeking gold in california placed his feet in the very holes which had been made by his predecessors painfully bearing the silver of peru on its way to enrich the grandees of spain bad as the journey across the isthmus was or might be the enforced delay at panama was worse the number of passengers far exceeded the capacity of the vessels sailing from that port to san francisco and those who waited at panama were in constant danger of cholera of the equally dreaded panama fever and sometimes of smallpox the heat was almost unbearable and the blacks were a source of annoyance and even of danger Quote, there is not in the whole world remarked a contemporary san francisco paper a more infamous collection of villains than the jamaica negroes who are congregated at panama and chagres in their eagerness to get away from panama some pioneers paid in advance for transportation in old rotten hogs which were never expected or intended to reach san francisco but which springing a leak or being otherwise disabled would put into some port in lower california where the passengers would be left without the means of continuing their journey and frequently without money both on the voyage from panama and also on the long route around cape horn ship captains often saved their good provisions for the california market and fed their passengers on nauseous quote, lobscouse and dunderfunk end quote. scurvy and other diseases resulted an appeal to the united states consul at rio janeiro when the ship touched there was sometimes effectual and in other cases the passengers took matters into their own hands and disciplined a rapacious captain or deposed a drunkard one in view of these uprisings some new york skippers declined to take command of ships about to sail for california supposing that passengers who could do such an unheard-of thing as to rebel against the master of a vessel must be a race of pirates great pains were taken to secure a crew of determined men for these ships and a plentiful supply of muskets handcuffs and shackles was always put on board but such precautions proved to be ridiculously unnecessary there was no case in which the pioneers usurped authority on shipboard without sufficient cause and in no case was an emigrant brought to trial on reaching san francisco in the various ports at which they stopped much was to be seen of foreign peoples and customs and not infrequently the pioneers had an opportunity to show their mettle at santa catarina for example a port on the lower coast of brazil a young american was murdered by a spaniard the authorities were inclined to treat the matter with great indifference but there happened to be in the harbor two shiploads of passengers en route to san francisco and these men threatened to seize the fortress and demolish it if justice was not done thereupon the murderer was tried and hanged many south americans in the various ports along the coast got their first correct notion of the people of the united states from these chance encounters with sea-going pioneers still more of course was the overland journey an education in self-reliance in that resourcefulness which distinguishes the american and in that courage which was so often needed and so abundantly displayed in the early mining days independence in the state of missouri was a favorite starting point and from this place there were two routes the southern one being by way of santa fe and the northern route following the oregon trail to fort hall 
and thence ascending the course of the Humboldt River to its rise in the Sierra Nevadas. At Fort Hall, some large companies which had travelled from the Mississippi River, and even from states east of that, separated, one half going to Oregon, the other turning westward to California, and thus were broken many ties of love and friendship which had been formed in the close intimacy of the long journey, especially between the younger members of the company. Old diaries and letters reveal suggestions of romance, if not of tragedy, in these separations, and in the choice which the emigrant maiden was sometimes forced to make between the conflicting claims of her lover and her parents. In the year 1850, 50,000 crossed the plains. In 1851, immigration fell off, because even at that early date there was a business, quote-unquote, depression, almost a, quote-unquote, panic in California. But in 1852 it increased again, and the plains became a thoroughfare, dotted so far as the eye could see with long trains of white-covered wagons moving slowly through the dust. In one day a party from Virginia passed thirty-two wagons, and during a stop in the afternoon five hundred overtook them. In after years the course of these wagons could easily be traced by the alien vegetation which marked it. Wherever the heavy wheels had broken the tough prairie sod, there sprang up, from the Missouri to the Sierras, a narrow belt of flowering plants and familiar dooryard weeds, silent witnesses of the great migration which had passed that way. Multitudes of horsemen accompanied the wagons, and other multitudes plodded along on foot. Banners were flying here and there, and the whole appearance was that of an army on the march. At night camp fires gleamed from miles through the darkness, and if the company were not exhausted, the music of a violin or a banjo floated out on the still air of the prairies. But the fatigue of the march, supplemented by the arduous labors of camping out, was usually sufficient to send the travelers to bed at the earliest possible moment. The food consisted chiefly of salt pork or bacon, varied, when that was possible, with buffalo meat or venison, beans, baked dough called bread, and flapjacks. The last, always associated with mining life in California, were made by mixing flour and water into a sort of butter, seasoning with salt, adding a little saleratus or cooking soda, and frying the mixture in a pan greased with fat. Men ate enormously on these journeys. Four hundred pounds of sugar lasted for pioneers only ninety days. This inordinate appetite, and the quantity of salt meat eaten, frequently resulted in scurvy, from which there were some deaths. Another cause of illness was the use of milk from cows driven along with the wagon trains, and made feverish by heat and fatigue. Many of the emigrants, especially those who undertook the journey in forty-nine or fifty, were insufficiently equipped, and little aware of the difficulties and dangers which awaited them. Death in many forms hovered over those heavy, creaking, canvas-covered wagons, the quote-unquote prairie schooners, which, drawn sometimes by horses, sometimes by oxen, sometimes by mules, jolted slowly and laboriously over two thousand miles and more of plain and mountain. Death from disease, from want of water, from starvation, from Indians, and, in crossing the Sierras, from raging snowstorms and intense cold. Rivers had to be forded, deserts crossed, and a thousand accidents and annoyances encountered. Some men made the long journey on foot, even from points east of the Mississippi River. One gray-haired pioneer walked all the way from Michigan with a pack on his back. Another enthusiast obtained some notoriety among the emigrants of 1850 by trundling a wheelbarrow laden with his goods from Illinois to Salt Lake City. Often the cattle would break loose at night and disappear on the vast plains, and men in search of them were sometimes lost and died of starvation or were killed by Indians. Simply for the sake of better grazing, oxen have been known to retrace their steps at night for twenty-five miles. The opportunities for selfishness, for petulance, for obstinacy, for resentment, were almost innumerable. Cooking and washing were the labors which, in the absence of women, proved most vexatious to the emigrants. Quote, of all miserable work, said one, washing is the worst, 
and no man who crossed the plains will ever find fault again with his wife for scolding on a washing day End quote. all the pioneers who have related their experiences on the overland journey speak of the bad effect on men's tempers quote, the perpetual vexation and hardships keep the nerves in a state of great irritability the trip is a sort of magic mirror exposing every man's qualities of heart vicious or amiable End quote. End of section 58. Section 59 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 59. Early Business Days in San Francisco, 1849-1853, to 1853, by Henry Childs Merwin. Two years ago, said the Alta California in 1851, trade was a wild, unorganized whirl. Staple goods went furiously up and down in price like wildcat mining stocks. There was no telegraph by which supplies could be ordered from the east, or inquiries could be answered and several months must elapse before an order sent by mail to New York could be filled. A merchant at Valparaiso once paid $20,000 for the information contained in a single letter from San Francisco. Consigners in the East were almost wholly ignorant as to what people needed in California, and how goods should be stowed for the long voyage around the Cape. Great quantities of preserved food, it was before the days of canning, were spoiled en route. Coal was shipped in bulk without any ventilating appliances, and it often took fire and destroyed the vessels in which it was carried. One unfortunate woman, the wife of a Cape Cod sea captain, was wrecked thrice in this way, having been transferred from one coal-laden schooner to another, and later to a third, all of which were set on fire by the heating of the coal and burned to the water's edge. In one of these adventures, she was lashed to a chair on deck, where she spent five days in a rough sea, with smoke and gas pouring from the ship at every seam. Her final escape was made in a rowboat, which landed at a desolate spot on the coast of Peru. Elaborate gold-washing machines, which proved to be useless, and ready-made houses that nobody wanted, were among the articles shipped to San Francisco. The rate of interest was very high, capital being scarce, and storage in warehouses was both insecure from the great danger of fire, and extremely expensive. It was, therefore, nearly impossible for the merchants to hold their goods for a more favorable market. In July 1849, lumber sold at the enormous rate of $500 a thousand feet, 50 times the New England price. But in the following spring, immense shipments having arrived, it brought scarcely enough to pay the freight bills. Tobacco, which at first sold for $2 a pound, became so plentiful afterward that boxes of it were used for stepping stones, and in one case, as Bret Hart has related, tobacco actually supplied the foundation for a wooden house. Holes in the sidewalk were stopped with bags of rice or beans, with sacks of coffee, and on one occasion with three barrels of revolvers, the supply far exceeding even the California demand for that article. Potatoes brought $60 a bushel at wholesale in 1849, but were raised so extensively in California the following year that the price fell to nothing, and whole cargoes of these useful vegetables just arrived from the east were dumped into the bay. In some places near San Francisco, it was really feared that a pestilence would result from huge piles of superfluous potatoes that lay rotting on the ground. Salaritus, worth in New York four cents a pound, sold at San Francisco in 1848 for $15 a pound. The menu of a breakfast for two at Sacramento in the same year was as follows. One box of sardines, $16. One pound of hard bread, $2. One pound of butter, $6. One half pound of cheese, $3. Two bottles of ale, $16. Total, $43. Flour in the mining camps cost four and even five dollars a pound, and eggs were two dollars apiece. A chicken brought $16, a revolver $150, a stove $400. Laudanum was $1 a drop, brandy $20 a bottle, 
and dried apples fluctuated from five cents to seventy-five cents a pound. It is a matter of history that a bilious miner once gave fifteen dollars for a small box of Seidlitz powders, and at the Stanislaus diggings, a jar of raisins, regarded as a cure for the scurvy then prevailing, sold for their weight in gold, amounting to four thousand dollars. As showing the dependence of California upon the East for supplies, it is significant that even so late as 1853, 6,000 tons of hard bread were imported annually from New York. Wages and prices were high, but nobody complained of them. There was, in fact, a disdain of all attempts to cheapen or haggle. Gold dust poured into San Francisco from the launches and schooners which plied on the Sacramento River, and almost everybody in California seemed to have it in plenty. Money, said a pioneer in a letter written at the end of 49, is about the most valueless article that a man can have in his possession here. As an illustration of the lavish manner in which business was transacted, it may be mentioned that the stamp box in the express office of Wells Fargo and Company was a sort of common treasury. Clerks, messengers, and drivers dipped into it for change whenever they wanted a lunch or a drink. There was nothing secret about this practice, and if not sanctioned, it was at least winked at by the superior officers. Huge lumps of gold were exhibited in hotels and gambling houses, and the jingling of coins rivaled the scraping of the fiddle as the characteristic music of San Francisco. The first deposit in the United States Mint of gold from California was made on December 8, 1848, and between that date and May 1, 1850, they were presented for coinage gold dust and nuggets valued at $11,420,000. A lot of land in San Francisco rose from $15 in price to $40,000. In September 1850, bricklayers receiving $12 a day struck for $14 and obtained the increase. The wages of carpenters varied from $12 to $20 a day. Those who did best in California were, as a rule, the small traders, the mechanics and skilled workmen, and the professional men who, by resisting the temptation to hunt for gold, made money by being useful to the community. It may truly be said, remarked the San Francisco Daily Herald in 1852, that California is the only spot in the world where labor is not only on an equality with capital, but to a certain extent is superior to it. Women cooks received $100 a month and chambermaids and nurses almost as much. A resident of San Francisco went to the mines for four weeks and came back with a bag of gold dust, which he thought would astonish his wife, who had remained in the city. But meanwhile, she had been taking in washing at the rate of $12 a dozen, and he was crestfallen to find that her gains were twice as much as his. It was cheaper to have one's clothes sent to China or the Sandwich Islands to be laundered, and some thrifty and patient persons took that course. A valuable trade sprang up between China and San Francisco. The solitude became a village, and the village a city, with startling rapidity. In less than a year, 12,000 people gathered at Sacramento, where there had not been a single soul. Events and changes followed one another so rapidly that each year formed an epoch by itself. In 1853, men spoke of 1849 as of a romantic and half-forgotten past. End of section 59. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 60 of the United States, read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke. The United States, Volume 2, Part 9, The Shadow of Civil War, Historical Note. These events, the Fugitive Slave Law, the John Brown Raid, etc., brought the agitation of the subject of slavery to its highest pitch during president buchanan's administration when the time drew near for the election of a new president the old parties were so broken up that there were four candidates in the field though mr buchanan himself was not one of these out of these four abraham lincoln of illinois was elected he having been nominated by the republican party this being an enlarged form of the free soil party which had itself succeeded the liberty party 
mr lincoln was a man of very moderate opinions in regard to slavery and was not disposed to interfere with it where it was already established by law but his election was regarded by many in the slave states as very dangerous to the interests of slavery and these men resolved to dissolve the union they maintained that the united states consisted of a co-partnership of entirely independent governments and that any state could withdraw from it at will this was the doctrine called state rights which had long been popular in the southern states and especially in south carolina it was therefore very natural that south carolina should take the lead in withdrawing from the union and a convention was accordingly called in that state and adopted december twenty eighteen sixty an ordinance of secession within six weeks similar conventions had been held and similar votes passed in the states of mississippi florida alabama georgia louisiana and texas these states then formed themselves into what was called the southern confederacy and elected jefferson davis of mississippi as president and alexander h stevens of georgia as vice president the new confederacy placed itself boldly upon the righteousness of slavery as a permanent institution and it openly aimed to establish a slave-holding nation in the southern states thomas wentworth higginson end of section sixty this recording is in the public domain Section 61 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan section sixty one the broadcloth mob of boston eighteen thirty five by harriet martineau the author of this article was a well-known english woman who traveled in the united states in eighteen thirty four the editor the abolitionists were warned that if they met again publicly they would be answerable for the disorders that might ensue the abolitionists pleaded that this was like making the rich man answerable for the crime of the thief who robbed him on the ground that if the honest man had not been so rich the thief would not have been tempted to rob him the abolitionists also perceived how liberty of opinion and of speech depended on their conduct in this crisis and they resolved to yield to no threats of illegal violence but to hold their legal meeting pursuant to advertisement for the dispatch of their usual business one remarkable feature of the case was that this heavy responsibility rested upon women it was a ladies meeting that was in question upon consultation the ladies agreed that they should never have sought the perilous duty of defending liberty of opinion and speech at the last crisis but as such a service seemed manifestly appointed to them the women were ready on the twenty first of october they met pursuant to advertisement at the office of their association number forty six washington street twenty five reached their room by going three quarters of an hour before the appointed time five more made their way up with difficulty through the crowd a hundred more were turned back by the mob they knew that a handbill had been circulated on the exchange and posted on the city hall and throughout the city the day before which declared that thompson the abolitionist was to address them and invited the citizens 
under promise of pecuniary reward, to sneak Thompson out, and bring him to the tar kettle before dark. The ladies had been warned that they would be killed as sure as fate, if they showed themselves on their own premises that day. They therefore informed the mayor that they expected to be attacked. The reply of the city marshal was, You give us a great deal of trouble. The committee room was surrounded and gazed into by a howling, shrieking mob of gentlemen, while the twenty-five ladies sat perfectly still, awaiting the striking of the clock. When it struck, they opened their meeting. They were questioned as to whether Thompson were there in disguise, to which they made no answer. They began as usual with prayer, the mob shouting, Hurrah! Here comes Judge Lynch! Before they had done, the partition gave way, and the gentlemen hurled missiles at the lady who was presiding. The secretary, having risen and begun to read her report, rendered inaudible by the uproar, the mayor entered and insisted on their going home to save their lives. The purpose of their meeting was answered. They had asserted their principle, and they now passed out, two and two, amidst the execration of some thousands of gentlemen, persons who had silver shrines to protect. The ladies, to the number of fifty, walked to the house of one of their members, and were presently struck to the heart by the news that Garrison was in the hands of the mob. Garrison is the chief apostle of abolition in the United States. He had escorted his wife to the meeting, and after offering to address the ladies, and being refused, out of regard to his safety, had left the room, and, as they supposed, the premises. He was, however, in the house when the ladies left it. He was hunted for by the mob, dragged from behind some planks, where he had taken refuge. Footnote. Garrison was determined to face the mob, but was finally persuaded that he ought to avoid capture as long as possible. End of footnote and conveyed into the street. Here his hat was trampled underfoot, and brickbats were aimed at his bare head. A rope was tied round him, and thus he was dragged through the streets. His young wife saw all this. Her exclamation was, I think my husband will not deny his principles. Her confidence was just. Garrison never denied his principles. He was saved by a stout truckman, who, with his bludgeon, made his way into the crowd, as if to attack the victim. He protected the bare head and pushed on toward a station house, whence the mayor's office issued, and pulled in Garrison, who was afterwards put into a coach. The mob tried to upset the coach and throw down the horses, but the driver laid about him with his whip, and the constables with their staves, and Garrison was safely lodged in jail for protection for he had committed no offense. Before the mayor ascended the stairs to dismiss the ladies, he had done a very remarkable deed. He had given permission to two gentlemen to pull down and destroy the anti-slavery sign, bearing the inscription Anti-Slavery Office, which had hung for two years, as signs do hang before public offices in Boston. The plea of the mayor is that he hoped the rage of the mob would thus have appeased, that is, he gave them leave to break the laws in one way, lest they should in another. The citizens followed up this deed of the mayor with one no less remarkable. They elected these two rioters, members of the state legislature, by a large majority, within ten days. I passed through the mob some time after it had begun to assemble. I asked my fellow passengers in the stage what it meant. They supposed it was a busy foreign post day, and that this occasioned an assemblage of gentlemen about the post office. They pointed out to me that there were none but gentlemen. We were passing through from Salem, fifteen miles north of Boston, to Providence, Rhode Island, and were therefore uninformed of the events and expectations of the day. On the morrow, a visitor who arrived at Providence from Boston told us the story and I had thenceforth an excellent opportunity of hearing all the remarks that could be made by persons of all ways of thinking and feeling on this affair. 
it excited much less attention than it deserved less than would be believed possible by those at a distance who think more seriously of persecution for opinion and less tenderly of slavery than a great many of the citizens of boston to many in the city of boston the story i have told would be news and to yet more in the country who know that some trouble was caused by abolition meetings in the city but who are not aware that their own will embodied in the laws was overborne to gratify the mercenary interests of a few and the political fears of a few more the first person with whom i conversed about this riot was the president of a university we were perfectly agreed as to the causes and character of the outrage this gentleman went over to boston for a day or two and when he returned i saw him again he said he was happy to tell me that we had been needlessly making ourselves uneasy about the affair that there had been no mob the persons assembled having been all gentlemen an eminent lawyer of boston was one of the next to speak upon it oh there was no mob he said he i was there myself and saw they were all gentlemen they were all in fine broadcloth not the less a mob for that said i why they protected garrison he received no harm they protected garrison from whom or what oh they would not really hurt him they only wanted to show that they would not have such a person live among them why should he not live among them is he guilty under any law he is an insufferable person to them so you may be to-morrow if you can catch garrison breaking the laws punish him under the laws if you cannot he has as much right to live where he pleases as you two law pupils of this gentleman presently entered one approved of all that had been done and praised the spirit of the gentleman in boston i asked whether they had not broken the law yes i asked him if he knew what the law was yes but it could not be always kept if a man was caught in a house setting it on fire the owner might shoot him and garrison was such an incendiary i asked him for proof he had nothing but hearsay to give the case as i told him came to this a says garrison is an incendiary b says he is not a proceeds on his own opinion to break the law lest garrison should do so the other pupil told me of the sorrow of heart with which he saw the law the life of the republic set at naught by those who should best understand its nature and value he saw that the time was come for the true men of the republic to oppose a bold front to the insolence of the rich and the powerful who were bearing down the liberties of the people for a matter of opinion the young men he saw must brace themselves up against the tyranny of the moneyed mob and defend the law or the liberties of the country were gone i afterwards found many such among the young men of the wealthier classes if they keep their convictions they and their city are safe no prosecutions followed i asked a lawyer an abolitionist why he said there would be difficulty in getting a verdict and if it was obtained the punishment would be merely a fine which would be paid on the spot and the triumph would remain with the aggressors this seemed to me no good reason i asked an eminent judge the same question and whether there was not a public prosecutor who might prosecute for breach of the peace if the abolitionists would not for the assault on garrison he said it might be done but he had given his advice against it why the feeling was so strong against the abolitionists the rioters were so respectable in the city it was better to let the whole affair pass over without notice end of section sixty one this recording is in the public domain. Section 62 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13 the united states edited by eva march tappan 
section sixty two on the underground railway about eighteen fifty eight by francis grierson the following selections are from the boyhood recollections of a famous english author and musician who was brought up on the illinois prairie underground railway was a name given to the secret arrangement by which escaped slaves were taken from one anti-slavery man to another until they reached canada or some other place of safety and freedom the editor on certain evenings my father would sit before the big open fireplace and watch with unalloyed satisfaction the burning logs he would see pictures in the blazing wood and he had a science of his own in the mingling of different logs how well that dried hickory burns with the damp walnut he would say taking the tongs and shifting the pieces now a little more to the front now a little farther back he taught me to see castles people and faces in the flames and embers and i knew what colours to expect from the different woods he kept some that were full of sap that would burn slowly others were split up to dry while sitting before the fire on a clear bracing night my father was wont to forget every care and abandon himself to the pure pleasures of the hearth he would dream of the past of friends in the old country and more than once he would remark to me taking the tongs and pointing there's a face that reminds me of poor so and so he loved to revisit the old familiar scenes while the fire gave them momentary life and set them before him in frames of gold and flaming opal then he would tell me stories of the wild animals of the old homestead of the tracks of the marten in the snow and how he discovered its hiding-place of a memorable fox-hunt when one of his friends held the fox up by the tail and another friend cried out from a distance don't hurt the fox don't hurt the fox and of his sojourn in paris during the reign of louis philippe at such times my mother added a spirit of cheerfulness by some joyful exclamation such as there's a letter in the candle as if the simple expression in itself would assist the arrival of good news from afar and when i looked i saw a large flaming blot on the side of the wick pointing toward us i cannot remember whether the letters arrived as the candle so often announced but how vividly i recollect the night when i lay awake in the next room and heard my parents discuss the uncertainty of the future the imminent need of funds to carry on the work of the farm and the possibility of failure and ruin such conversations occurred after the other members of the family had gone to bed but i heard everything and night after night i listened to those talks and racked my brain wondering how it would all end my distress was even greater than that of my mother for she knew what i did not and she could still hope after such talks the quivering song of the cricket dotted the stillness with an accent of deeper melancholy while the heavy pendulum slowly measured out the minutes between midnight and the dismal twilight of dawn we were all sitting quietly together the evening after my visit to the load-bearer's home my mother with the bible in her lap the only book she ever read while in the log-house my father reading a newspaper containing an account of a recent speech by abraham lincoln my mother's face looked paler and more pensive than usual for some days previous to this my father had had a misunderstanding with one of the settlers the only weapon in the house was a double-barreled gun and even this stood unloaded against the wall in a corner of the sitting-room no dog was kept on the place for the reason that a dog was regarded as one of the things most likely to cause trouble with the neighbours the wind was blowing across the prairie from the east my mother seemed apprehensive and i must have caught some of the thoughts which filled her mind with gloomy presentiments 
during a lull of the wind a sound reached us from the prairies it might have been a shout or a call how vividly it all comes before me now she looked inquiringly at my father who was absorbed in his newspaper and heard nothing i needed no words to tell me what she was thinking her face assumed a grave and anxious look i was hoping the sound might be nothing more than the noise of belated travellers passing on horseback when we heard it again like a confused mumbling menace this time a little nearer still disguised in the muffled wind she walked into the next room greatly agitated but instantly returned and began to read in the prayer-book my father had just put aside his newspaper when a low hollow murmur came from the prairie what can it be asked my mother in a voice scarcely audible without answering he went into the next room for the ammunition took the gun from the corner and began to load with buckshot it seemed to me he had never looked so tall so grim so determined as when he rammed the wadding down with the ramrod then he went to the front door and listened my mother sat with closed eyes like one in a trance until it seemed to me as if by some unaccountable hocus-pocus we had been thrust into a world where pantomime and mystery had taken the place of speech and we were waiting for some sudden and terrible stroke of destiny what was going to happen was it the end of all things at the log house my father decided not to go out by the front way and after the light was removed he opened the kitchen door and stood outside in the dark the moon is just rising said my mother in a half whisper looking through the window of the front room then i looked and as the clouds drifted by i saw the moon in the shape of a gleaming scythe a sudden chill of autumn had come to the house she hurried out to beg my father to come in but he was creeping from corner to corner and from tree to tree with the gun held before him cocked and ready for that deadly aim for which he was so well known after going as far as the smoke-house and waiting there some time he returned he thought the sounds must have been due to some prowling animal he was about to give up further search when the moaning was again heard out a little beyond the trees and then as my mother stood trembling at the door a voice shouted don't shoot massa don't shoot for de lord's sake don't ye shoot my father went straight toward the voice we done lost massa someone shouted as soon as he reached the open we is lookin for massa guest's place come in come in my father came back into the kitchen with two negro fugitives where have you been mass snedecker done drap us ober dere said one of the negroes pointing west he was running you off yes massa and finding he was chased let you down and so you got lost yes massa just then a loud knocking at the front door came with terrible suddenness for during the talk and confusion no one had heard any noise in the road my father took his gun and standing at one side of the door asked who was there isaac snedeker answered a familiar voice open went the door and in rushed ike snedeker one of the most intrepid souls that ever risked death for the sake of conscience a man stood before us who had never known fear one glance at his face would be enough to make an enemy stop and think twice before coming to close quarters with such a being he was courage incarnate with the shaggy head of a lion the sharp invisible eye of an eagle the frame of an athlete the earnestness of a convinced reformer his hair stood out thick and bushy and his bearded face with the upper lip clean shaven gave to the whole countenance a massive formidable look that inspired every fugitive with confidence and struck fear into the hearts of his secret foes i've lost two runaways he said as he walked through to the kitchen had to let them out of the wagon over there near the maple grove we were followed i think they are here said my father and i came near shooting one of them by mistake i directed them to come this way as near as i could hoping they would strike through the prairie at this place 
my mother was now bringing the fugitives something to eat when isaac snedeker said peremptorily come along it's now or never we've got to get to brother guests with that load before midnight you see i've had to gather em up here and there in different places and i have in the wagon out there two lots one sent over by ebenezer carter and the other by brother wolcott if we get caught it'll be the first time but they'd get a haul that would amount to something i've got fourteen altogether the two fugitives left without having time to drink a cup of coffee and we all went to the road to see them off the wagon was full of frightened trembling runaways negroes mulattoes octoroons not a moment was lost isaac snedeker had only to speak to his horses a fine powerful team to send them going at a great speed down the road toward the appointed meeting-place at elihu guests we went back into the house where my mother sank exhausted into a rocking-chair but she had still another ordeal to go through prayers had been said and we were all about to retire for the night when the noise of galloping horses and men talking could be heard in the road one moment of suspense followed another footsteps were heard near the kitchen door then there came a light and somewhat timid rapping as if the persons outside were not certain about this being the right place my father opened this time without asking who was there two disreputable-looking men stood before him one of them scowling at us through the door like some ferocious animal they carried pistols and dirks their eyes were shaded by slouched hats that partly concealed the upper part of their faces so that for all we knew they might have been neighbors living at no great distance from the log house have ye seen any runaways hangin round hya asked the elder man looking up from under his hat and with an expression that told of a fearful admixture of malicious cunning and moral cowardice i have answered my father who delegated you to look for them the fellow hesitated then he stammered be you a fire-eating abolitionist i have voted for abraham lincoln once if that is what you mean by being an abolitionist ye ain't been long in this country observed the younger man long enough to become an american citizen and vote this surprised them they looked confused but they braced themselves for a final effort we're arter them runaways and we don't calculate to leave hya without taking em all along they went from here some time ago so you'll have to look elsewhere if you want to find them let's go over to the barn said the elder of the two they started for the barn but stopped just beyond the big locust tree and i heard the words say jake i don't like the look of that old britisher no more do i he'll shoot the fust thing we know he's got something mighty juberous in that eye o hisn not another word was said they wheeled about made for the road mounted their horses and were off they had been cowed and disarmed by my father's coolness his independence by his towering height and a scorn that was withering to the two slave hunting villains End of section sixty two this recording is in the public domain section sixty three of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section sixty three the great lincoln douglas debate eighteen fifty eight by francis grierson it was the fifteenth day of october eighteen fifty eight crowds were pouring into alton for some days people had been arriving by the steam packets from up and down the river the upboats from st louis bringing visitors with long black hair goatees and stolid indian-like faces slave owners and slave dealers from the human marts of missouri and kentucky the northern visitors arriving by boat or rail abolitionists and republicans with a cast of features distinctly different from the types coming from the south they came from villages, townships, the prairies, from all the adjoining counties, from across the Mississippi, from faraway cities, from representative societies north and south, from congressional committees in the east, 
from leading journals of all political parties and from every religious denomination within hundreds of miles, filling the broad space in front of the town hall, eager to see and hear the now famous debaters, the popular Stephen A. Douglas, United States Senator, nicknamed the Little Giant, and plain Abraham Lincoln, nicknamed the Rail Splitter. The great debate had begun on the 21st of August at another town, and today the long-discussed subject would be brought to a close. Douglas stood for the doctrine that slavery was nationalized by the Constitution, that Congress had no power to prevent its introduction in the new territories like Kansas and Nebraska, and that the people of each state could alone decide whether they should be slave states or free. Lincoln opposed the introduction of slavery into the new territories. On this memorable day, the irrepressible conflict predicted by Seward actually began, and it was brooded about that Lincoln would be mobbed or assassinated if he repeated here the words he used in some of his speeches delivered in the northern part of the state. From the surging sea of faces, thousands of anxious eyes gazed upward at the group of politicians on the balcony, like wrecked mariners scanning the horizon for the smallest sign of a white sail of hope. The final debate resembled a duel between two men of war, the pick of a great fleet, all but those two sunk or abandoned in other waters, facing each other in the open, the little giant hurling at his opponent from his flagship of slavery the deadliest missiles. Lincoln calmly waiting to sink his antagonist by one simple broadside. Alton had seen nothing so exciting since the assassination of Lovejoy, the fearless abolitionist, many years before. In the earlier discussions, Douglas seemed to have the advantage. A past master in tact and audacity, skilled in the art of rhetorical skirmishing, he had no equal on the stump, while in the Senate he was feared by the most brilliant debaters for his ready wit and his dashing eloquence. Regarded in the light of historical experience, reasoned about in the light of spiritual reality, and from the point of view that nothing can happen by chance, it seemed as if Lincoln and Douglas were predestined to meet side by side in this discussion, and unless I dwell in detail on the mental and physical contrast the speakers presented, it would be impossible to give an adequate idea of the startling differences in the two temperaments. Douglas, short, plump, and petulant. Lincoln, long, gaunt, and self-possessed. The one white-haired and florid the other black-haired and swarthy, the one educated and polished, the other unlettered and primitive. Douglas had the assurance of a man of authority. Lincoln had moments of deep mental depression, often bordering on melancholy, yet controlled by a fixed, and I may say, predestined will, for it can no longer be doubted that without the marvelous blend of humor and stolid patience, so conspicuous in his character, Lincoln's genius would have turned to madness after the defeat of the Northern Army at Bull Run and the world would have had something like a repetition of Napoleon's fate after the burning of Moscow. Lincoln's humor was the balance pull of his genius that enabled him to cross the most giddy heights without losing his head. Judge Douglas opened the debate in a sonorous voice, plainly heard throughout the assembly, and with a look of mingled defiance and confidence, he marshaled his facts and deduced his arguments. To the vigor of his attack there was added the prestige of the Senate chamber and for some moments it looked as if he would carry the majority with him, a large portion of the crowd being pro-slavery men, while many others were on the fence waiting to be persuaded. At last, after a great oratorical effort, he brought his speech to a close amidst the shouts and yells of thousands of admirers. And now Abraham Lincoln, the man who, in 1830, undertook to split from Mrs. Nancy Miller 400 rails for every yard of brown jeans dyed with walnut bark that would be required to make him a pair of trousers. The flat boatman, local stump speaker, and country lawyer rose from his seat, stretched his long bony limbs upward as if to get them into working order, and stood like some solitary giant on a lonely summit, very tall, very dark, very gaunt, and very rugged, his swarthy features stamped with a sad serenity. And the instant he began to speak, the ungainly mouth lost its heaviness, the half-listless eyes attained a wondrous power, and the people stood bewildered and breathless under the natural magic of the strangest, most original personality known to the English-speaking world since Robert Burns. There were other very tall and dark men in the heterogeneous assembly, but not one who resembled the speaker. Every movement of his long, muscular frame denoted inflexible earnestness, and a something issued forth, elemental and mystical, that told what the man had been, what he was, and what he would do in the future. There were moments when he seemed all legs and feet, and again he appeared all head and neck. 
yet every look of the deep-set eyes, every movement of the prominent jaw, every wave of the hard-gripping hand produced an impression. And before he had spoken twenty minutes, the conviction took possession of thousands that here was the prophetic man of the present and the political savior of the future. Judges of human nature saw at a glance that a man so ungainly, so natural, so earnest, and so forcible had no place in his mental economy for the thing called vanity. Douglas had been theatrical and scholarly, but this tall, homely man was creating by his very looks what the brilliant lawyer and experienced senator had failed to make people see and feel. The little giant had assumed striking attitudes, played tricks with his flowing white hair, mimicking the airs of authority with patronizing illusions. But these affectations, usually so effective when he addressed an audience alone, went for nothing when brought face to face with realities. Lincoln had no genius for gesture and no desire to produce a sensation. The failure of Senator Douglas to bring conviction to critical minds was caused by three things, a lack of logical sequence in argument, a lack of intuitional judgment, and a vanity that was caused by too much intellect and too little heart. Douglas had been arrogant and vehement. Lincoln was now logical and penetrating. The little giant was a living picture of ostentatious vanity. From every feature of Lincoln's face there radiated the calm, inherent strength that always accompanies power. He relied on no props. With a pride sufficient to protect his mind and a will sufficient to defend his body, he drank water when Douglas, with all his wit and rhetoric, could begin or end nothing without stimulants. Here, then, was one man out of all the millions who believed in himself, who did not consult with others about what to say, who never for a moment respected the opinion of men who preached a lie. My old friend, Don Piat, in his personal impressions of Lincoln, whom he knew well and greatly esteemed, declares him to be the homeliest man he ever saw. But serene confidence and self-poise can never be ugly. What thrilled the people who stood before Abraham Lincoln on that day was the sight of a being who, in all his actions and habits, resembled themselves, gentle as he was strong, fearless as he was honest, who towered above them all in that psychic radiance that penetrates in some mysterious way every fiber of the hearer's consciousness. The enthusiasm created by Douglas was wrought out of smart epigram thrusts and a facile superficial eloquence. He was a match for the politicians born within the confines of his own intellectual circle, witty, brilliant, cunning, and shallow. His weight in the political balance was purely materialistic. His scales of justice tipped to the side of cotton, slavery, and popular passions, while the man who faced him now brought to the assembly cold logic in place of wit, frankness in place of cunning, reasoned will and judgment in place of chicanery and sophistry. Lincoln's presence infused into the mixed and uncertain throng something spiritual and supernormal. His looks, his words, his voice, his attitude were like a magical essence dropped into the seething cauldron of politics, reacting against the foam, calming the surface, and letting the people see to the bottom. It did not take him long. Is it not a false statementship, he asked? that undertakes to build up a system of policy upon the basis of caring nothing about the very thing that everybody does care the most about? Judge Douglas may say he cares not whether slavery is voted up or down, but he must have a choice between a right thing and a wrong thing. He contends that whatever community wants slaves has a right to have them. So they have, if it is not a wrong. But if it is a wrong, he cannot say people have a right to do wrong. He says that upon the score of equality, slaves should be allowed to go into a new territory like other property. This is strictly logical if there is no difference between it and other property. If it and other property are equal, his argument is entirely logical. But if you insist that one is wrong and the other right, there is no use to institute a comparison between right and wrong. This was the broadside. The great duel on the high seas of politics was over. The Douglas ship of state sovereignty was sinking. The debate was a triumph that would send Lincoln to Washington as president in a little more than two years from that date. People were fascinated by the gaunt figure in long, loose garments that seemed like a huge skeleton in clothes, attracted by the homely face, and mystified yet proud of the fact that a simple denizen of their own soil should wield so much power. When Lincoln sat down, Douglas made one last feeble attempt at an answer. But Lincoln, in reply to a spectator who manifested some apprehension as to the outcome, rose and, spreading out his great arms at full length, like a condor about to take wing, exclaimed, with humorous indifference, Oh, let him go it! These were the last words he uttered in the greatest debate of the antebellum days.
The victor bundled up his papers and withdrew, the assembly shouting, Hurrah for Abe Lincoln as next president! Bully for old Abe! Lincoln forever! Excited crowds followed him about. Reporters caught his slightest word, and by nighttime, the barrooms, hotels, street corners, and prominent stores were filled with his admirers, fairly intoxicated with the exciting triumph of the day. End of section 63「Section 64 of the United States」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Okite, Rockford, Illinois. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 64, Just Before the War, 1858, by Morris Scheff. Sometime during the winter of 1857-58, to 58, I received from the Honorable Samuel S. Cox, member of Congress from Ohio, representing the district composed of Licking, Franklin, and Pickaway, an appointment as cadet at West Point. I know it was winter time for across the vanished years I can see the family gathered before the big wood fire, and I can see my father, who had been to Newark and had stopped at the Kirkersville post office, coming in, clad in his greatcoat, and bearing in his hand a large and significant-looking official letter. Removing his coat and adjusting his glasses, he opened the communication from Washington and read my appointment. Oh, the quiet radiance of my mother's face! Never, I think, did the fire burn so cheerily as ours burnt that night. And somehow, I am fain to believe, the curling smoke communicated the news to the old farm. For the fields, how often I had wandered over them from childhood. Oh, yes, how often I had seen the cattle grazing, the corn tasseling, and their sweet pomp of daisies and clover, and shocks of ripened wheat all seemed to greet me the next morning as I walked out to feed the sheep. We sat long round the fire, and read and re-read the entrance requirements, both physical and mental, as set forth in the circular accompanying the appointment. This circular, prepared by Jefferson Davis, Secretary of War, himself a graduate of West Point, announced that only about a third of all who entered were graduated and counseled the appointee that, unless he had an aptitude for mathematics, etc., it might be better for him not to accept the appointments. Thus he would escape the mortification of failure for himself and family. In view my lack of opportunity to acquire more than the simplest rudiments of an education in any branch, I wonder now that I dared to face the ordeal. But how the future gleams through the gates of youth! It was in the days before competitive examinations, when appointments to West Point and Annapolis were coveted and usually secured by the sons of leaders of business, political influence, and social standing, and ours was the capital district. At that time our country differed widely from that in which we are now living, and so great have been the changes that, could the leading merchants of our cities of fifty years ago or the farmers who settled amid the primeval timber of the West return, they could not distinguish one street from another, and would look in vain for the fields and woods that met their eyes from the doorstep. The population of the country, now rising eighty millions, was less than thirty-two millions, not counting the territories, and of these, nineteen millions were in the northern or free states, and twelve in the southern or slave states. The frontier was along the western boundary of Arkansas, and thence north to the Canadian line. The great tide of emigration that set in with the building of the National Road was still flowing west, while the railroads and telegraph were just beginning to push their way thither. Steamboats, called floating palaces, could be seen at almost every bend of the beautiful Ohio, and on every long reach of the solemnly impressive Mississippi. Practically all the vast area lying west of the Hudson was devoted to agriculture, while the south, 
as from the early days, was still raising cotton and tobacco, and finding itself year after year dropping farther and farther behind the more progressive north in commercial weight and importance. But there were no great fortunes at that time, either north or south. It is safe to say that there were not throughout the land a score of men worth a million dollars. If an estate amounted to fifty thousand dollars, it was considered large. And yet under those conditions there were refinement, courage, good manners, and wide knowledge, qualities that went to the making of gentlemen. Colleges called universities were springing up everywhere over the land. Irving, Poe, Hawthorne, and Bancroft, Longfellow, Cooper, Whittier, and Emerson had laid the foundations for our literature. In public life, the foremost statesmen of the time were Benton, Cass, Corwin, Cox, Douglas, Chase, Wade, and Giddings in the West, Seward, Hale, Banks, Sumner, and Adams in the East. While the South counted among its leaders such men as Jefferson Davis and Quitman of Mississippi, Alexander H. Stevens in Tombs of Georgia, and Hunter and Mason of Virginia. Besides these, there were Breckinridge and Crittenden of Kentucky, Benjamin and Slidell of Louisiana, Wigfall of Texas, and Yancey of Alabama. Not to mention a group of arrogant and almost frenzied agitators for secession, who seemed to rise right up from the ground that was thrown out when Calhoun's grave was dug and to whom may be attributed in great measure the dire adversity of our Southland. The war with Mexico was still fresh in the memories of the people, and the majority of the officers who had gained distinction in it were still living, and also veterans here and there of the War of 1812. And to emphasize the march of time, I may say that a frequent visitor at my father's house was a French veteran by the name of Genet, who had actually fought under Napoleon at Waterloo. Save with Mexico, our country had been at peace with all of the world for nearly fifty years. Its future, save as shadowed by slavery, glowed warmly, and pride and love for it burned in every heart. The army consisted of 16,435 officers and men. Its organization was made up of engineers, topographical engineers, ordnance, supply departments, artillery, cavalry, dragoons, and mounted rifles. The heaviest guns in the forts were ten-inch columbiads, and the small arms were all muzzle-loading smoothbores and rifles. Grant, in utter obscurity and almost utter poverty, and fronting an outlook of utter hopelessness, was a clerk in a store at Galena. Farragut was sailing the seas, and not dreaming of the days to come, when, lashed to the rigging, he would lead his squadron into the Battle of Mobile Bay. Lee was commanding a post in Texas, and probably had never heard of the little town of Gettysburg. Cedric and Thomas and Jeb Stewart were all on the Texas frontier, and the future seemed to offer only a slow chance for promotion. And yet, in less than five years, they had risen to enduring frame. Stonewall Jackson was an instructor at the Virginia Military Institute, the West Point of the South, but he was dwelling more on the sins of this earth than on its honors, either military or civil, and was regarded by his intimates as a queer and uninteresting type of belated roundhead. Within five years he was to rise to the pinnacle of fame, his star to the country's zenith. Sherman was teaching in Louisiana, little dreaming that he should one day lead a victorious army from Atlanta to the sea. Longstreet, the Johnstons, the Hills, Hooker, Bragg, and Forrest, the latter a slave dealer, but the ablest cavalry leader in the Confederacy, and many another in the blue and the gray, unknown outside of local and professional associations, rose on the stormy tides of the mighty rebellion. Of these... Reynolds, who fell at Gettysburg, Webb, Warren, McCook, Howard, Griffin, Schofield, Hartsuff, Saxon, Weitzel, and Hazen of the Union, Hardy, Beauregard, Fitzley, Alexander, 
and field of the Confederate Army, were on duty as officers at West Point. In the Corps as cadets were Wilson, Upton, Harding, Horace Porter, Merritt, Custer, and Mackenzie of the North, while bound in ties of friendship with them were Ramsour, Wheeler, Rosser, Pelham, Young, Semix, and Deering of the South. Whenever and wherever I have thought of them, as officers or cadets, and it has been many and many a time, imagination has painted them marching unconsciously to the field of the high test of the soldier and the gentleman. The war between the states was gathering much faster than we realized. Every little while, as from a cloud, sounded low and heavy rumblings, but like distant thunder in the summer they died away. And notwithstanding they came again heavier, and at shorter intervals, hopes of peace like birds in the fields sang on. Everywhere there was a growing fever in the blood. The progress of events in the seventy-five years during which they had been bound together in the Constitution had forced freedom and slavery, so mutually and innately antagonistic, nearer and nearer to each other. The closer the approach, slavery on the one hand saw herself growing more and more repulsive, while on the other the South, with increasing anger and alarm, saw in the cold look of the self-controlled North that her happiness, prosperity, social fabric, and political supremacy were threatened, if not doomed. In the Ordinance of 1787, she had seen herself excluded from all the territory north of the Ohio. In 1820, forever prohibited in all the territory ceded by France and known as Louisiana, north of 36 degrees 30 minutes. In 1846, excluded from all the territory purchased from Mexico. In 1850, California admitted as a free state, and the slave trade abolished in the District of Columbia. In 1854, slavery was expelled from the territory of Kansas, the blood of northern men dripping from its hands, after a savage and brutal contest with freedom. During this process of being hemmed in, the South became more and more irritable, and unfortunately, more domineering. Naturally enough, the social, idealistic, and temperamental differences Elementary in the natures and traditions of the people grew apace. We in the West, especially those of us with Southern affiliations, hated slavery and hated New England, but generally sympathized with the South. Yet in her arrogance she fast assumed an attitude of condescension and superiority over us all. Meanwhile, the abolitionist, despised on all hands, had begun the most systematic, deliberate, and stubborn crusade that was ever waged against an institution. And this crusade was carried on until, at last, the harassed South demanded, and Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Law. It was a law hateful in every feature, arousing the indignation of every natural impulse, and humiliating to the self-respect of every official called on for its execution. Then Uncle Tom's cabin appeared. From door to door it went, and slavery heard its knell from every hearthstone before which it was read. From that time, an open hostility to the institution was in the plank of every northern platform, and constantly engaged benevolent and religious associations in earnest discussion. There was no respite, day or night, thenceforward, for the great body of the people, who, standing between the fire-eaters on the one hand, and the abolitionists on the other, were ready and longing to do anything for the peace, glory, and welfare of the South, as well as the North. As early as 1850, South Carolina and Mississippi, in their provincial egotism, had threatened secession, declaring in a bullying way that they would not submit to degradation in the Union, referring to the barricades that people of the free states had thrown up against the extension of the institution of slavery. Meanwhile, Sumner, with manners more imperious and egotism more colossal than the southern states had ever exhibited, assailed slavery and, indirectly, the representatives of the South in Congress, with a kind of dogmatic statesmanship and scholastic venom, the latter intended to irritate and succeeding in its purpose. 
roared out in pompous and reverberating declamation. The effect of these deplorable extremes was to weaken the natural ties that bound the sections, to drive out friendship and goodwill from many a home, and to substitute in their places deep and dangerous ill feelings. Now, as I look back over it all, never, it seems to me, did provincial egotism born of slavery and bigotry born of political and moral dogma pursue their ways more blindly to the frightful wastes of blood and treasure. But let this question rest. The fire-eater is gone, and the abolitionist is gone. Were they to come back, the surprise of both of them at the results would be astounding. However that may be, in due time an idea took possession of the North, as if it had seen a vision. The Democratic Party began to break before it, and the Republican Party sprang up from Maine to California with almost the speed of a phantom. When I finally left home for West Point, James Buchanan was president, and drifting into a deeper eclipse than has befallen any other who has filled that high office. Abraham Lincoln was still unknown beyond his prairies of central Illinois. End of section 64 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Okite, Rockford, Illinois. Section 65 of the United States, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Last Moment of John Brown by Thomas Hovenden, born in Ireland, 1810, died in America in 1895. Painting, page 290. According to the Compromise of 1850, it was agreed that when Kansas and Nebraska should be ready to enter the Union as states, they might be either free or slaveholding, as their inhabitants should prefer. Both pro-slavery and anti-slavery men pressed into Kansas, and what was really war on a small scale raged between them. One of the fiercest of the anti-slavery fighters was John Brown, whose one aim was, as he said, to wage eternal war with slavery. This was in 1856. Three years later he formed a plan to free the slaves. He thought that if some place in the mountains could be fortified, large numbers of slaves would escape to it, and a general revolt would result. He rented a farmhouse six miles from Harper's Ferry. To get arms, he, with twenty followers, seized the United States arsenal at that place, and took some forty prisoners. On the following day he was captured by troops under Robert E. Lee, after a fight in which two of his sons and nearly all of his men were killed, and he himself was several times wounded. Governor Wise of Virginia, under whom he was tried for treason, said of Brown, he inspired me with great trust in his integrity as a man of truth. He was hanged, but manifested, even on the scaffold, the utmost calmness and fortitude. It is said that on the way to the place of execution, he paused a moment to kiss the little child of a slave mother. End of section 65. This recording is in the public domain. Section 66 of the United States, read for LibriVox.org, by Jim Locke. The United States, Volume 2, Part 10, From Fort Sumter to Chancellorsville, Historical Note. On April 12, 1861, the Confederate batteries open fire on fort sumter in charleston harbor the civil war had begun armies were promptly raised by the united states and by the confederacy and richmond was chosen as the confederate capital little heavy fighting was done during the first year of the war except at bull run where the confederates won a decisive victory in 1862, affairs in the West were generally favorable to the Unionists. By the capture of Forts Henry and Donaldson, the greater part of Tennessee was wrested from the Confederates, and by Grant's victory at Shiloh, their second line of defense in the West was broken. To gain control of the Mississippi was an 
important matter to the union for this would separate the confederacy into two parts and would also make it easy to transport men and supplies from the north the first step was to capture new orleans if possible and this was accomplished by farragut soon after the confederate river fleet was destroyed at memphis and as far south as vicksburg the mississippi was controlled by the unionists new orleans was also as has been said in their hands and a strict blockade was established along the whole southern coast even more important than these successes was the victory of the monitor over the merrimac a victory that preserved the naval supremacy of the north and revolutionized naval warfare in the east the advantage was with the confederates in the peninsula campaign general mcclellan's advance toward richmond was thrust back with heavy loss and general lee who was now in command of the confederate army pushed forward into maryland but was defeated at antietam and withdrew into virginia a few days later lincoln issued his emancipation proclamation declaring that on the first of january eighteen sixty three all slaves in the rebellious states should be free on december thirteenth burnside who replaced mcclellan endeavored to force the confederate lines at fredericksburg but was driven back with great loss and was superseded by general hooker end of section sixty six this recording is in the public domain section sixty seven of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sawyer ruiz the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by ava march tappan section sixty seven the bombardment of fort sumter eighteen sixty one by orville j victor punctually at the hour indicated twenty minutes past four a m the roar of a mortar from sullivan's island announced the war begun a second bomb from the same battery followed then fort moultrie answered with the thunder of a columbade cummings point next and the floating battery dropped in their resonant notes then a pause but only for a moment a roar of fifty guns burst in concert chorus up to the solemn prelude which must have startled the spirits of the patriotic dead in their slumbers sumter lay off in the waters the center of that appalling circle of fire the early morning shadows had lifted from its ramparts to discover the stars and stripes floating from the garrison staff but it was as silent amid that storm as if no living soul panted and fretted within its walls it was the silence of duty of men resolved on death if their country called for the sacrifice for months the little garrison had been pent up in the fortress overworked and underfed but not a murmur escaped the men and the hour of assault found all prepared for their leader's orders to defend the fort to the last the sentinels were removed from the parapet posterns closed and the order given for the men to keep close within the casements until the call of the drum breakfast was quietly served at six o'clock the shot and shell of the enemy thundering against the walls and pouring within the enclosure with remarkable precision after breakfast disposition was calmly made for the day's work the casements were supplied from the magazines the guns without tangents or scales and even destitute of bearing screws were to be ranged by the eye and fired by guess the little force was told off in relays composed of three reliefs equally dividing the officers and men captain doubleday took the first detachment and fired the first gun at seven o'clock the captain directed his guns at moultrie at the cummings point iron battery the floating ironclad battery anchored off the end of sullivan's island and the infilding battery on sullivan's island all of which were then pouring in a scathing storm of solid shot an officer who was present thus spoke of the bombarding the explosion of shells and the quantity of deadly missiles that were hurled in every direction and at every instant of time made it almost certain death to go out of the lower tier of casements and also made the working of the barbet or upper uncovered guns which contained all of our heaviest metals and by which alone we could throw shells quite impossible during the first day there was hardly an instant of time that there was a cessation of the whizzing of balls which were sometimes coming at half a dozen at once there was not a portion of the work which was not seen in reverse that is 
exposed by the rear from mortars. At noon, Friday, the supply of cartridges in the front was exhausted when the blankets of the barracks and the shirts of the men were sewed into the required bags and served out. No instrument was in the fort for weighing the powder, thus forbidding all precision in the charge and, as a consequence, causing much variation in planting the shot. When we add that the guns wanted both tangents, breech, or telescopic sights, that wedges served instead of bearing screws, we can only express astonishment at the accuracy attained. Not a structure of the enemy escaped the solid balls of the columbades and faxons. The village of Moultrieville, a gathering of summer houses belonging to citizens of Charleston, was completely riddled. Saturday morning, at the earliest light, the cannonading was resumed with redoubled fury. By eight o'clock, the red-hot balls from the furnace in Moultrie came to prove that the revolutionists would use every means to dislodge the obstinate Anderson. Soon, the barracks and quarters were in flames, past all control. The men were then withdrawn from the guns to avert their now impending danger to the magazine. The powder must be emptied into the sea. Ninety barrels were rolled over the area exposed to the flames and pitched into the water. By this time, the heat from the burning buildings became intense, fairly shifting the men with its dense fumes. The doors of the vault were therefore sealed while the men crept into the casements to avoid suffocation by cowering close to the floor, covering their faces with wet cloths. An occasional gun could only be fired as a signal to the enemy and the fleet outside that the fort had not surrendered. With the color still floating from the staff, the winds bore the smoke and flames aside. Its fold revealed to the enemy the glorious stars and stripes, waving there amid the ruin and treble terror unscathed. Its halyards had been shot away, but becoming entangled, the flag was fixed. Only the destruction of the staff could drag it down. This appalling conflagration seemed to inflame the zeal of the assailant. The entire circle of attack blazoned with fire, and the air was cut into hissing arches of smoke and balls. The rebel general in command has stated that two hours probably would suffice to reduce the fortress, but twenty-eight hours had not accomplished the work. And now, as the besiegers beheld another and more invincible power coming to their aid, they acknowledged the service rendered by frenzied shouts and redoubled service at their guns. About noon of Saturday, the upper service magazine exploded, tearing away the tower and upper portions of the fort, and doing more havoc than a week's bombardment could have effected. One who was present wrote, The crash of the beams, the roar of the flames, the rapid explosion of shells, and the shower fragments of the fort, with the blackness of the smoke, made the scene indescribably terrific and grand. This continued for several hours. Meanwhile, the main gates were burned down, the chassis of the barbic guns were burned away on the gorge, and the upper portions of the towers had been demolished by shells. There was not a portion of the fort where a breath of air could be got for hours, except through a wet cloth. The fire spread to the men's quarters on the right hand and on the left, and endangering the powder which had been taken out of the magazines. The men went through the fire and covered the barrels with wet cloths, but the danger of the fort's blowing up became so imminent that they were obliged to heave the barrels out of the embrasures. While the powder was being thrown overboard, all the guns of Moultrie, of the iron floating battery, and of the infilling battery, and the Dahlgren battery, worked with increased vigor. All but four barrels were thus disposed of, and those remaining were wrapped in many thicknesses of wet wool and blankets. But three cartridges were left, and these were in the guns. About this time, the flagstaff of Fort Sumter was shot down, some fifty feet from the truck, this being the ninth time it had been struck by a shot. The men cried out, the flag is down, it has been shot away. In an instant, Lieutenant Hall rushed forward and brought the flag away, but the halyards were so inextricably tangled that it could not be righted. It was, therefore, nailed to the staff and planted upon the ramparts, while batteries in every direction were played upon them. During the bombardment, a vast concourse of people gathered in Charleston and lined the wars and promenade to witness the sublime contest. The surrounding county poured in its eager, excited masses to add to the throng. Men, women, and children stood there, hour after hour, with blanched faces and praying hearts, for few of that crowd but had some loved one in the works under fire. Messengers came hourly from several positions to assure the people of the safety of the men. The second day's conflict found the city densely filled with people crowding in by railway and private conveyance from the more distant counties until Charleston literally swarmed with humanity. The rest of the story is told in Major Anderson's dispatch to the United States government. Steamer Baltic off Sandy Hook, April 18, 1861. The Honorable S. Cameron, Secretary of War, Washington, D.C. Sir, having defended Fort Sumter for 34 hours until the quarters were entirely burned, the main gates destroyed by fire, the gorge wall seriously injured, the magazine surrounded by flames, and its doors closed from the effects of heat, four barrels and three cartridges of powder only being available, and no provisions but pork remaining, 
I accepted the terms of evacuation offered by General Beauregard, being the same offered by him on the 11th instant prior to the commencement of hostilities, and marched out of the fort Sunday afternoon, the 14th instant, with colors flying and drums beating, bringing away company and private property, and saluting my flag with 50 guns. Robert Anderson, Major First Artillery. End of Section 67. This recording is in the public domain. Section 68 of the United States Recorded for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Battle Hymn of the Republic 1861 by Julia Ward Howe Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored he has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. I have read the fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. As ye deal with my contempt, no so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel, since God is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, while God is marching on. End of section 68. This recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 69. The Gathering of the Great Army. 1861. By Charles Carlton Coffin. At the call of the President, every village sends its soldiers, every town its company. When you listen to the soul-thrilling music of the band, and watch the long winding train as it vanished with the troops in the distance, you had one little glimpse of the machinery of war as when riding past a great manufactory you see a single pulley or a row of spindles through a window you do not see the thousands of wheels belts shafts the hundred thousand spindles the arms of iron fingers of brass and springs of steel and the mighty wheel which gives motion to all and so you have not seen the great complicated far-reaching and powerful machinery of war but there is activity everywhere drums are beating men assembling soldiers marching and hastening on in regiments they go into camp and sleep on the ground wrapped in their blankets it is a new life they have no napkins no tablecloths at breakfast dinner or supper no china plates or silver forks each soldier has his tin plate and cup and makes a hearty meal of beef and bread it is hard baked bread they call it hard tack because it might be tacked upon the roof of a house instead of shingles they also have cincinnati chicken at home they called it pork fowls are scarce and pork is plenty in camp so they make believe it is chicken there is drilling by squads companies battalions and by regiments some stand guard around the camp by day 
and others go out on picket at night to watch for the enemy it is military life everything is done by orders when you become a soldier you cannot go and come as you please privates lieutenants captains colonels generals all are subject to the orders of their superior officers all must obey the general in command you march drill eat sleep go to bed and get up by order at sunrise you hear the reveille and at nine o'clock in the evening the tattoo then the candle which has been burning in your tent with a bayonet for a candlestick must be put out in the dead of night while sleeping soundly and dreaming of home you hear the drum beat it is the long roll there is a rattle of musketry the pickets are at it every man springs to his feet turn out turn out shouts the colonel fall in fall in cries the captain there is confusion throughout the camp a trampling of feet and loud hurried talking in your haste you get your boots on wrong and buckle your cartridge box on bottom up you rush out in the darkness not minding your steps and are caught by the tent ropes you tumble headlong upsetting to-morrow's breakfast of beans you take your place in the ranks nervous excited and trembling at you know not what the regiment rushes toward the firing which suddenly ceases an officer rides up in the darkness and says it is a false alarm you march back to camp cool and collected now grumbling at the stupidity of the picket who saw a bush thought it was a rebel fired his gun and alarmed the whole camp in the autumn of eighteen sixty one the army of the potomac encamped around washington numbered about two hundred thousand men before it marches to the battlefield let us see how it is organized how it looks how it is fed let us get an insight into its machinery go up in the balloon which you see hanging in the air across the potomac from georgetown and look down upon this great army all the country round is dotted with white tents some in the open fields and some half hid by the forest trees looking away to the northwest you see the right wing arlington is the centre and at alexandria is the left wing you see men in ranks in files in long lines in masses moving to and fro marching and counter marching learning how to fight a battle there are thousands of wagons and horses there are from two to three hundred pieces of artillery how long the line if all were on the march men marching in files are about three feet apart a wagon with four horses occupies fifty feet if this army was moving on a narrow country road four cavalrymen riding abreast and men in files of four with all the artillery ammunition wagons supply trains ambulances and equipment it would reach from boston to hartford or from new york city to albany a hundred and fifty miles to move such a multitude to bring order out of confusion there must be a system a plan and an organization regiments are therefore formed into brigades with usually about four regiments to a brigade three or four brigades compose a division and three or four divisions make an army corps a corps when full numbers from twenty five to thirty thousand men when an army moves the general commanding it issues his orders to the generals commanding the corps they issue their orders to the division commanders the division commanders to the brigadiers they to the colonels and the colonels to captains and the captains to the companies as the great wheel in the factory turns all the machinery so one mind moves the whole army the general-in-chief must designate the road which each corps shall take the time when they are to march where they are to march to and sometimes the hour when they must arrive 
at an appointed place the corps commanders must direct which of their divisions shall march first what roads they shall take and where they shall encamp at night the division commanders direct what brigade shall march first no corps division or brigade commander can take any other road than that assigned him without producing confusion and delay the army must have its food regularly think how much food it takes to supply the city of boston or cincinnati every day yet here are as many men as there are people in those cities there are a great many more horses in the army than in the stables of both of those cities all must be fed there must be a constant supply of beef pork bread beans vinegar sugar and coffee oats corn and hay the army must also have its supplies of clothing its boots shoes and coats it must have its ammunition its millions of cartridges of different kinds for there are a great many kinds of guns in the regiments springfield and enfield muskets french belgian prussian and austrian guns requiring a great many different kinds of ammunition there are a great many different kinds of cannon there must be no lack of ammunition no mistake in its distribution so there is the quartermaster's department the commissary and the ordnance department the quartermaster moves and clothes the army the commissary feeds it and the ordnance officer supplies it with ammunition the general-in-chief has a quartermaster-general a chief commissary and a chief ordnance officer who issue their orders to the chief officers and their departments attached to each corps they issue their orders to their subordinates in the divisions and the division officers to those in the brigades then there is a surgeon-general who directs all the hospital operations who must see that the sick and wounded are all taken care of there are camp surgeons division brigade and regimental surgeons there are hospital nurses ambulance drivers all subject to the orders of the surgeon no other officer can direct them each department is complete in itself it has cost a great deal of thought labor and money to construct this great machinery in creating it there has been much thinking energy determination and labor and there must be constant forethought in anticipating future wants necessities and contingencies when to move where and how the army does not exist of its own accord but by constant unremitting effort the people of the country determined that the constitution the union and the government bequeathed by their fathers should be preserved they authorized the president to raise a great army congress voted money and men the president acting as the agent of the people and as commander-in-chief appointed men to bring all the materials together and organize the army look at what was wanted to build this mighty machine and to keep it going first the hundreds of thousands of men the thousands of horses the thousands of barrels of beef pork and flour thousands of hogsheads of sugar vinegar rice salt bags of coffee and immense stores of other things thousands of tons of hay bags of oats and corn what numbers of men and women have been at work to get each soldier ready for the field he has boots clothes and equipments the tanner courier shoemaker the manufacturer with his swift flying shuttles the operator tending his looms and spinning jennies the tailor with his sewing machines the gunsmith the harness maker the blacksmith all trades and occupations have been employed there are saddles bridles knapsacks canteens dippers plates knives stoves kettles tents blankets medicines drums swords pistols guns cannon powder percussion caps bullets shot shells wagons everything walk leisurely through the camps and observe the little things and the great things see the men on the march then go into the army and navy departments in washington in those brick buildings west of the president's house in those rooms are surveys maps plans papers charts of the ocean of the sea-coast currents sandbar shoals the rising and falling of tides in the topographical bureau you see maps of all sections of the country there is the ordnance bureau with all sorts of guns rifles muskets carbines pistols swords shells rifled shot fuses which the inventors have brought in 
there are a great many bureaus with immense piles of papers and volumes containing experiments upon the strength of iron the trials of cannon guns mortars and powder there have been experiments to determine how much powder shall be used whether it shall be as fine as mustard seed or as coarse as lumps of sugar and the results are all noted here all the appliances of science industry and art are brought into use to make it the best army the world ever saw end of section sixty nine this recording is in the public domain section seventy of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tapin section seventy jonathan to john by james russell lowell in the latter part of eighteen sixty one the confederate sent messrs mason and slidell to ask for aid from england and france when on board the british vessel the trent they were seized by an american captain the british government was ready to declare war on the united states but president lincoln said why this is exercising the right of search that we went to war with england about in eighteen twelve and the men were surrendered the editor it don't seem hardly right john when both my hands was full to stump me to a fight john your cousin too john bull old uncle s he says i guess we know it now says he the lion's paw is all the law according to j b that's fit for you and me you wonder why we're hot john your mark was on the guns the neutral guns that shot john our brothers and our sons old uncle s he says i guess there's human blood says he by fits and starts in yankee hearts though it may surprise j b more than it would you and me if i turn mad dogs loose john on your front parlor stairs would it just meet your views john to wait and sue their heirs old uncle s he says i guess i only guess says he that if vettel on his toes fell twould kind of rile j b as well as you and me who made the law that hurts john heads i win ditto tails j b was on his shirts john unless my memory fails old uncle s he says i guess i'm good at that says he that sauce for goose ain't just the juice for ganders with j b no more'n we you or me when your rights was our wrongs john you didn't stop for fuss Britanny's trident prongs john was good enough law for us old uncle s he says i guess though physic's good says he it doesn't follow that he can swallow prescriptions signed j b put up by you and me we own the ocean too john you mustn't take it hard if we can't think with you john it's just your own backyard old uncle s he says i guess if that's his claim says he the fencing stuff will cost enough to bust up friend j b as well as you and me why talk so dreadful big john of honour when it's meant you didn't care a bit john but just for ten per cent old uncle s he says i guess he's like the rest says he when all is done it's number one that's nearest to j b as well as to you and me we give the critters back john cause abram thought twas right it weren't your bullying clack john provoking us to fight old uncle s he says i guess we've a hard row now says he to hoe just now but that somehow may happen to j b as well as you and me we ain't so weak and poor john with twenty million people and close to every door john a schoolhouse and a steeple old uncle s he says i guess it is a fact says he the surest way to make a man is think him so j b as much as you or me our folks believe in law john and it's for her sake now they've left the axe and saw john the anvil and the plough 
old uncle ass he says i guess if twarn't for law says he there'd be one shindy from here to indy and that don't suit j b when taint twixt you and me we know we've got a cause john that's honest just and true we thought twould win applause john if nowhere else from you old uncle s he says i guess his love of right says he hangs by a rotten fibre of cotton there's nature in j b as well as in you and me the south says poor folks down john and all men up say we white yellow black and brown john now which is your id old uncle s he says i guess john preaches well says he but sermon through and come to do why there's the old j b a crowdin you and me shall it be love or hate john it's you that's to decide ain't your bonds held by fate john like all the world's beside old uncle s he says i guess wise men forgive says he but not forget and sometime yet that truth may strike j b as well as you and me god means to make this land john clear through from sea to sea believe and understand john the worth of being free old uncle s he says i guess god's price is high says he but nothing else than what he sells wears long and that j b may learn like you and me end of section seventy this recording is in the public domain recording by alan mapstone in oxford england Section 71 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 71 the merrimac and the monitor eighteen sixty two by john s wise the building of the ironclad afterwards famous all over the world as the virginia or the merrimac was a subject of daily conversation in our household from the time the gosford navy yard was burned and abandoned by the union troops in april eighteen sixty one my father during his service in congress was for some years upon the committee on naval affairs his acquaintance with naval officers resulting from that fact and from his long residence at rio de janeiro was unusually widespread commodore james barron was one of his constituents and warm friends commodore barron was the gallant but unfortunate officer who killed decatur in a duel and was himself severely wounded besides other contributions of value to the navy he conceived the idea of an impregnable steam propeller armed with a pyramidal beak and a terrapin shaped back at an acute angle to the line of projectiles fired from its own level he called it a marine catapulta and had complete models plans and descriptions which he exhibited to the naval committee in the effort to have a ship constructed on these lines he made little impression however for in those days steam navigation had attained no very great success much less the utilization of iron upon ships he subsequently presented the model to my father who had also a large number of models of other vessels in our rummaging about the place we boys found these models in some old boxes and took them down to our mill pond where we anchored them as part of our miniature fleet the baron model and one constructed by lieutenant williamson of the navy were the most conspicuous making quite a proud addition to our naval display this was in eighteen sixty we also possessed a brass cannon about eighteen inches long which had been cast for us 
by a convict in the virginia penitentiary that cannon was stamped with the words union and constitution but its use by its possessors was most lawless modelling slugs for it by pouring melted lead into holes made by sticking our rammer in the sand we were constantly firing these slugs to the great peril of everybody in the vicinity one of our neighbors a captain johnson an old seaman living about a mile down the creek had a flock of geese and from one of his voyages in indian seas he had brought back six coolie boys who were probably apprenticed to him these coolies were passionately fond of the water and were almost constantly in sight bathing or rowing or sailing a felucca rigged boat after trying the range of our gun upon captain johnson's geese we began to practise upon the coolies on a certain evening captain johnson appeared in full marine rig at our landing rowed by his six coolies and announcing to our father the sport in which we had been engaged gave notice that he had a gun of his own with which if we did not promptly cease our diversion he would open a return fire my father who was a friend of captain johnson and indignant at our reckless misconduct gave us all a but half hour in consequence of this visit we were summoned before him and after considerable discussion concerning the punishment we should receive were marched in a body to the landing and made to apologize to the coolies who grinned and showed their teeth after that we were good friends of the coolies and our future operations with the gun were confined to the mill-pond on the opposite side of the farm in our new field it promptly occurred to us as it would to most boys that the best targets for our cannon were the models of the ironclads anchored out in the pond unfortunately they had no iron upon them and such was the precision we had acquired in our practice upon johnson's geese and coolies that in a few days the models of commodore baron and lieutenant williamson were riddled and ignominiously disappeared they were resting in the mud at the bottom of our mill pond when the war broke out the following spring after visiting the navy yard and seeing the partially burned merrimac my father became enthusiastic upon the subject of raising her and building upon her frame an ironclad ship on the lines of commodore barron's model imbued with this idea he instituted rigorous inquiries for the model but for reasons which may well be understood none of us boys aided him much in the search failing to find his model he wrote to general lee who was then commander-in-chief of the virginia forces an elaborate description of commodore barron's invention and made rough drawings urging the use of the merrimac for carrying out the design he always believed and declared that this was the first suggestion which led to the building of the virginia we all knew that an ironclad ship was being built and from time to time informed ourselves of the progress made and great things were expected from her so deep was my father's interest in her that he several times visited the navy yard to inspect her he repeatedly expressed the opinion that she was being built to draw too much water and that her beak or ramming prow was improperly constructed in this that it was horizontal at the top and sloped upward from the bottom whereas it should have been horizontal on the bottom and made to slope downward to a point when the ship was launched he was indignant because the lower edge or eaves of her armor-clad covering stood several feet out of the water and it was necessary to ballast her heavily to bring her sheathing below the water-line this increased her draught to eighteen feet which was as he declared entirely unnecessary he insisted that this condition was due to the failure of the naval architects in calculating the water which she would draw when sheathed with iron to deduct from the weight of her sheathing the weight of masts spars rigging and sails which were dispensed with admiral buchanan commodore forrest captain brooke and all the prominent naval men connected with the norfolk navy yard were personal and warm friends of my father he did not hesitate to express his views concerning these things but they as professional men generally do made light of the criticisms of a layman nevertheless i think that many naval authorities are 
now disposed to admit that the chief reason why the virginia did not triumph completely over the monitor was her great draught of water the loss of her prow and the twisting of her stem in ramming the cumberland after the disaster of roanoke island my father returned to his home on sick leave where for some time his life was in danger from pneumonia aggravated by exposure on the retreat from roanoke island our house was visited almost daily during this period by distinguished military and naval officers from the city who came to express their interest and sympathy it was before the day of steam launches and the appearance of the distinguished officers and of the naval boats which came up manned by a dozen oarsmen whose stroke fell as that of one man was very striking during these visits they diverted my father with full descriptions of the progress made in arming and equipping the virginia and we were advised that the time of her completion and the attack upon the vessels in hampton roads was rapidly approaching there was dear old commodore forrest tall dignified and with a face as sweet as that of a woman surmounted by a great shock of white hair like the mane of a royal beast and captain buchanan far less striking in appearance quiet kindly and as unpretentious as a country farmer but with an eye which age had not dimmed and which even then was filled with the light of battle they were both old men commodore forrest was sixty-five and captain buchanan sixty-two there was also captain brooke taciturn and dreamy and lieutenant catesby jones a quiet man of forty and lieutenant minor young quick and fidgety as a wren and all the rest of them mingling with us simply and unostentatiously as if unconscious that the issues of one of the greatest struggles the world ever witnessed were committed to their keeping and that they were to emerge from it with names which will be remembered as long as the records of naval warfare are preserved almost daily we boys went to norfolk for the mail or on some domestic mission we preferred our boat and seldom failed before we left norfolk harbour to stand over toward the gosport navy yard and sail around and take a look at the merrimac such we called her for we had never become accustomed to the new name virginia my father was now convalescent and secured the promise that he would be advised when the ship was ready to sail for the attack on march seventh he received a note from commodore forrest or one of those who knew advising him that the attack would be made upon the following day he consented that my brother richard and myself should accompany him and the next morning the horses which now had been well fed and rested for a month at home were saddled and ready for us at the door when we reached the city the merrimac accompanied by two little gunboats the beaufort and the raleigh had already passed out and all three were below fort norfolk the waterway is more circuitous than that by land and we were sure we should reach sewell's point the most favorable position for observing the conflict before the slow-moving vessels in this we were correct after a sharp gallop of eight miles we rode out upon the sandy hills facing hampton roads at sewell's point the scene was truly inspiring hampton roads is as beautiful a sheet of water as any on the face of the globe it is formed by the confluence of the james and the nansemond and the elizabeth rivers the james enters it from the west the nansemond from the south and the elizabeth from the east the tides in the roads run north and south and pass to and from the chesapeake bay through a narrow entrance at the north between old point comfort and willoughby's spit midway between these is the fort then known as rip raps the proper name of which was fort calhoun now changed to fort wool on the eastern side of the roads the confederates had fortified two points sewell's point where we were and lambert's point at the mouth of the elizabeth on the southern side between the mouths of the elizabeth and nansman rivers were the confederate fortifications on craney island on the western side at the entrance to the roads is fortress monroe from there the land runs westwardly to hampton thence southwardly to newport news which marks the entrance of the james river the roads are about four miles in width and seven in length from where we stood looking north fortress monroe and the riprap's were perhaps four miles away looking westward across the roads newport news was five miles away and looking south lambert's point and craney island were plainly visible three miles off 
upon the battlements of fortress monroe and the riprap's great numbers of union troops could be seen through field glasses and we could also make out the camps and fortifications of the enemy at newport news and between that point and hampton while our own people lined the shores and crowded the ramparts at craney island and lambert's point anchored in the roads were a great number of vessels of every description steam and sail from the smallest tugs and sloops to the largest transports and warships rumors of the attack had brought down to sewell's point a number of civilians and the whole appearance of the scene was suggestive of the greatest performance ever given in the largest theatre ever seen the merrimac and her attendants had passed craney island and were coming down the channel east of craney island light when we arrived as she passed our fortifications she was saluted and cheered and returned the salutes from the way in which she was shaping her course when first seen it looked to the uninitiated as if she proposed to sail directly upon the rip-raps such hurrying and scurrying was seen among the non-combatant craft in the roads as was never witnessed before from great three-masters and double-deck steamers to little tugs and sailboats all weighed or slipped anchor and made sail or steam for fortress monroe except three dauntless war vessels two steamers the minnesota and the roanoke and one sailing vessel the st lawrence whose duty called them in the opposite direction a long tongue of shoal running out from craney island compelled the merrimac to go below sewell's point before she struck the main channel then she swung into it and pointed westward showing her destination for she headed straight for newport news where the masts and spars of the congress and the cumberland were plainly visible it was now past midday the merrimac on her new course was nearly stern to us and grew smaller and smaller as she followed the south channel to newport news the three united states vessels minnesota roanoke and st lawrence started after her by what is known as the north channel it was a bitter disappointment to us that the battle was to be waged so far away but the ships and their movements were still in view the sun was shining and a fresh march breeze would we thought blow away the smoke it seemed an eternity before the first gun was fired the merrimac cumberland and congress were nearly ranged in our line of vision the merrimac appeared to us as if she was almost in contact with the nearest of the two vessels captain buchanan states in his report that he was within less than a mile of the cumberland when he commenced the engagement by a shot at her from his bow gun we saw a great puff of smoke roll up and float off from the merrimac a moment later the flashes of broadsides and tremendous rolls of smoke from the congress the cumberland the batteries on shore and the union gunboats and then came the thunderous sounds following each other in the same order in which we had seen the smoke the engagement had begun it was a time of supreme excitement and supreme suspense for the details we who had no glasses were dependent upon those who had she has passed the congress exclaimed an officer who was straining forward trying to descry the positions of the ships through the smoke which now enveloped the point of newport news and the water beyond bang crash roar went the guns single shots and broadsides making all the noise that any boy could wish she is heading direct for the cumberland shouted another between the thunders of the broadsides she has rammed the cumberland was announced fifteen minutes after the first gun was heard and our people gave three cheers our teeth chattering with excitement we waited the next announcement it soon came the cumberland is sinking and again we cheered then came an ominous lull the meaning of which we did not know those watching through the glasses notified us that three steamers were in sight standing down james river and we knew it was commander tucker with the patrick henry jamestown and teaser think of it the jamestown which but four years ago had brought the remains of president monroe to richmond with the new york seventh regiment on that visit of fraternity and good will here she was armed as a war vessel fighting those very men once more the cannon belched and thundered this time what we saw and heard was alarming the merrimac is running up the river away from the congress and other vessels she is fighting the shore batteries as she goes it looked indeed as if she were disabled in some way again a lull and anxious waiting the merrimac is turning around and coming back again the roar of a hot engagement with the forts another lull and another heavy roll she is back pounding the congress and raking her fore and aft the congress is aground again our people went wild with enthusiasm poor fellows on the congress when the merrimac withdrew and passed upstream it was only to gain deep water 
in order to wind her for where she had rammed the cumberland her keel was in the mud and she could not be put about the fearless sailors on the congress deluded by the appearance of retreat believed that she had hauled off and leaving their guns gave three cheers having brought his ship around into position to attack the congress captain buchanan now came back at her and as he approached blew up a transport alongside the wharf sunk one schooner captured another and proceeded to rake the congress where she had run ashore in shoal water describing this stage of the fight captain buchanan says in his report the carnage havoc and dismay caused by our fire compelled them to haul down their colors and to hoist a white flag at their gaff and half mast and another at the main the crew instantly took to their boats and landed our fire immediately ceased and a signal was made for the beaufort to come within hail he then ordered lieutenant commander parker to take possession of the congress secure the officers as prisoners allow the crew to land and burn the ship this captain parker did receiving her flag and surrender from commander smith and lieutenant pendergrast with the side-arms of those officers they delivered themselves as prisoners of war on board the beaufort and afterwards being permitted at their own request to return to the ship to assist in removing the wounded never returned the beaufort and raleigh while alongside the congress after her surrender and while she had two white flags flying were subjected to a heavy fire from the shore and from the congress and withdrew without setting her afire after losing several valuable officers and men the lieutenant minor was sent to burn the ship which he was fired upon and severely wounded his boat was recalled and captain buchanan ordered the congress to be destroyed by hot shot and incendiary shell by this time the ships from old point opened fire upon the merrimac the minnesota grounded in the north channel the shoalness of the water prevented the near approach of the merrimac the roanoke and st lawrence warned by the fate of the cumberland and congress retired under the guns of fortress monroe the merrimac pounded away at the ground of minnesota until the pilots warned her commander that it was no longer safe to remain in that position then returning by the south channel she had an opportunity to open again upon the minnesota although the shallow water was between the two and afterwards upon the st lawrence which responded with several broadsides it was too tantalizing to see these vessels which in deep water would have been completely at her mercy protected from her assaults by the shoals by this time it was dark and the merrimac anchored off sewell's point the western sky was illuminated with a burning congress her loaded guns were successively discharged as the flames reached them until a few minutes past midnight her magazine exploded with a tremendous report thus ended the first day's doings of the merrimac soon after she anchored some of her officers came ashore and we who had been waiting all day and who had now decided to remain all night in order to see the next day's operations were gratified with a full and graphic description of the fighting captain buchanan lieutenant minor and the other wounded were sent to norfolk having been tendered the hospitality of sewell's point by some of the officers our party remained and were lulled to sleep by the firing of the guns of the burning congress and rudely aroused about midnight by the tremendous explosion of her magazine up betimes in the morning we saw the minnesota still ashore she was nearly in line with us and about a mile nearer to us than newport news a tug was beside her and a very odd-looking iron battery we expected great things from this day's operations about eight o'clock the merrimac ran down to engage them firing at the minnesota and occasionally at the iron battery she was now under command of lieutenant jones we confidently expected her to be able to get very near to the minnesota but in this the pilots were mistaken when about a mile from the frigate she ran ashore and was some time backing before she got afloat her great lengthened draught rendered it difficult to work her notwithstanding these delays she succeeded in damaging the minnesota seriously and in blowing up the tugboat dragon lying alongside her while this was going on the iron battery which looked like a cheese-box floating on a shingle moved out from behind the frigate and advanced to meet the merrimac the disparity in size between the two was remarkable we could not doubt that the merrimac would either by shot or by ramming make short work of the cheese-box but as time wore on we began to realize that the newcomer was a tough customer her turret resisted the shells of the merrimac and not only was she speedier but her draught was so much less than that of her antagonist that she could run off into shallow water and prevent the merrimac from ramming her 
there was no lack of pluck shown by either vessel the little monitor came right up and laid herself alongside as if she had been a giant she was quicker in every way than her antagonist and presented the appearance of a saucy kingbird pecking at a very large and very black crow the first shot fired by the merrimac missed the monitor which was a novel experience for the gunners who had been riddling the hulls of frigates then again when the eleven-inch solid shot struck the casemates knocking the men of the merrimac down and leaving them dazed and bleeding at the nose from the tremendous impact they realized that the cheese-box was loaded as none of the other vessels had been neither vessel could penetrate the armor of the other both tried ramming unsuccessfully the monitor had not mass sufficient to injure the merrimac the merrimac only gave the monitor a glancing ram weakened by the monitor's superior speed and then the monitor ran off into shallow water safe from pursuit twice we thought the merrimac had won the fight on the first occasion the monitor went out of action it seems to replenish the ammunition in the turret it being impossible to use the scuttle by which ammunition was passed unless the turret was stationary and in a certain position the second occasion was about eleven o'clock when a shell from the merrimac struck the monitor's pilot-house and seemed to have penetrated the ship she drifted off aimlessly towards shoal water her guns were silent and the people on board the minnesota gave up hope and prepared to burn her this was when lieutenant warden commander of the monitor was blinded and the steersman stunned their position was so isolated that no one knew their condition for some minutes then lieutenant green discovered it took command and brought the vessel back into action shortly afterwards lieutenant jones withdrew the merrimac in his report of the action he said the pilots declaring that we could get no nearer the minnesota and believing her to be entirely disabled and the monitor having run into shoal water which prevented our doing her any further injury we ceased firing at twelve o'clock and proceeded to norfolk the stem is twisted and the ship leaks we have lost the prow starboard anchor and all the boats the armor is somewhat damaged the steam-pipe and smoke-stack both riddled the muzzles of two of the guns shot away when from the shore we saw the merrimac haul off and head for norfolk we could not credit the evidence of our own senses ah we thought dear old buchanan would never have done it lieutenant jones was afterwards fully justified by his superiors but it did seem to us that he ought to have stayed there until he drove the monitor away beside the reasons assigned above lieutenant jones declared that it was necessary to leave when he did in order to cross the elizabeth river bar the inconclusive result of that fight has left to endless discussion among naval men the question which was the better ship of the two it is not within the scope of this work to investigate that problem it is certain that up to the time the monitor appeared the merrimac seemed irresistible and that but for the presence of the monitor she would have made short work of the minnesota it is equally certain that the monitor performed her task of defence it is said she was anxious to renew the fight but two weeks later the merrimac went down into deep water where the monitor was lying under the guns of fortress monroe and tried to coax her out but she would not come and even permitted the jamestown and beaufort to sail up to hampton and capture two schooners laden with hay the truth is that if the merrimac could have induced the monitor to meet her in deep water she would easily have rammed and sunk her on our ride back to the city my father while greatly elated at what had been done continued to deplore the errors of construction in the merrimac which the two days fighting had made all the more manifest but we boys thought she had earned glory enough and joined the others in the general jubilation everybody in norfolk knew the officers and men on board our ships many of them were natives of the town when they were granted to relief they were given a triumphal reception sometimes since i read an account of the dutch admiral de ruder who the day after his four days battle with the english fleet was seen in his yard in his shirt-sleeves with a basket on his arm feeding his hens and sweeping out his cabin it reminded me of the simple lives and unpretentious behaviour of those splendid fellows who handled the merrimac yesterday they revolutionized the naval warfare of the world to-day they were walking about the streets of norfolk or sitting at their firesides as if unaware that fame was trumpeting their names to the ends of the earth end of section seventy one this recording is in the public domain section seventy two 
of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section seventy two taken prisoner at shiloh eighteen sixty two by henry m stanley henry m stanley the famous african explorer was born in wales in eighteen forty one at the age of sixteen he came to america and on the outbreak of the civil war enlisted in the confederate army he was captured at the battle of shiloh but escaped and returned to wales his natural love of adventure soon lured him back to america and he again enlisted this time on the union side at the close of the war he served as a newspaper correspondent on the western plains and in abyssinia an account of his african explorations will be found in volume three the editor day broke with every promise of a fine day next to me on my right was a boy of seventeen henry parker i remember it because while we stood at ease he drew my attention to some violets at his feet and said it would be a good idea to put a few into my cap perhaps the yanks won't shoot me if they see me wearing such flowers for they are a sign of peace capital said i i will do the same we plucked a bunch and arranged the violets in our caps the men in the ranks laughed at our proceedings and had not the enemy been so near their merry mood might have been communicated to the army we loaded our muskets and arranged our cartridge pouches ready for use our weapons were the obsolete flintlocks and the ammunition was rolled in cartridge paper which contained powder a round ball and three buckshot when we loaded we had to tear the paper with our teeth empty a little powder into the pan lock it empty the rest of the powder into the barrel press paper and ball into the muzzle and ram home then the orderly sergeant called the roll and we knew that the dixie grays were present to a man soon after there was a commotion and we dressed up smartly a young aide galloped along our front gave some instructions to the brigadier hindman who confided the same to his colonels and presently we swayed forward in line with shouldered arms newton's story big broad and straight bore our company banner of gay silk at which the ladies of our neighbourhood had laboured as we tramped solemnly and silently through the thin forest and over its grass still in its withered and wintry hue i noticed that the sun was not far from appearing that our regiment was keeping its formation admirably that the woods would have been a grand place for a picnic and i thought it strange that a sunday should have been chosen to disturb the holy calm of those woods before we had gone five hundred paces our serenity was disturbed by some desultory firing in front it was then a quarter past five they are at it already we whispered to each other stand by gentlemen for we were all gentlemen volunteers at this time said our captain l g smith our steps became unconsciously brisker and alertness was noticeable in everybody the firing continued at intervals deliberate and scattered as at target practice we drew nearer to the firing and soon a sharper rattling of musketry was heard that is the enemy waking up we said within a few minutes there was another explosive burst of musketry the air was pierced by many missiles which hummed and pinged sharply by our ears pattered through the tree-tops and brought twigs and leaves down on us those are bullets henry whispered with awe at two hundred yards farther a dreadful roar of musketry broke out from a regiment adjoining ours it was followed by another farther off and the sound had scarcely died away when regiment after regiment blazed away and made a continuous roll of sound we are in for it now said henry but as yet we had seen nothing though our ears were tingling under the animated volleys forward gentlemen make ready urged captain smith in response we surged forward for the first time marring the alignment we trampled recklessly over the grass and young sprouts beams of sunlight stole athwart our course the sun was up above the horizon just then we came to a bit of pack land and overtook our skirmishers who had been engaged in exploring our front we passed beyond them nothing now stood between us and the enemy there they are 
was no sooner uttered than we cracked into them with levelled muskets aim low men commanded captain smith i tried hard to see some living thing to shoot at for it appeared absurd to be blazing away at shadows but still advancing firing as we moved i at last saw a row of little globes of pearly smoke streaked with crimson breaking out with spurtive quickness from a long line of bluey figures in front and simultaneously there broke upon our ears an appalling crash of sound the series of fusillades following one another with startling suddenness which suggested to my somewhat muttered sense a mountain upheaved with huge rocks tumbling and thundering down a slope and the echoes rambling and receding through space again and again these loud and quick explosions were repeated seemingly with increased violence until they rose to the highest pitch of fury and in unbroken continuity all the world seemed involved in one tremendous ruin this was how the conflict was ushered in as it affected me i looked around to see the effect on others or whether i was singular in my emotions and was glad to notice that each was possessed with his own thoughts all were pale solemn and absorbed but beyond that it was impossible for me to discover what they thought of it but by transmission of sympathy i felt that they would gladly prefer to be elsewhere though the law of the inevitable kept them in line to meet their destiny it might be mentioned however that at no time were we more instinctively inclined to obey the voice of command we had no individuality at this moment but all motions and thoughts were surrendered to the unseen influence which directed our movements probably few bothered their minds with self-questionings as to the issue to themselves that properly belongs to other moments to the night to the interval between waking and sleeping to the first moments of the dawn not when every nerve is tense and the spirit is at the highest pitch of action though one's senses were preternaturally acute and engaged with their impressions we plied our arms loaded and fired with such nervous haste as though it depended on each of us how soon this fiendish uproar would be hushed my nerves tingled my pulses beat double quick my heart throbbed loudly and almost painfully but amid all the excitement my thoughts swift as the flash of lightning took all sound and sight and self into their purview i listened to the battle raging far away on the flanks to the thunder in front to the various sounds made by the leaden storm i was angry with my rear rank because he made my eyes smart with the powder of his musket and i felt like cuffing him for deafening my ears i knew how captain smith and lieutenant mason looked how bravely the dixie gray's banner ruffled over newton story's head and that all hands were behaving as though they knew how long all this would last back to myself my thoughts came and with the whirring bullet they fled to the blue bloused ranks afront they dwelt on their movements and read their temper as i should read time by a clock through the lurid haze the contours of their pink faces could not be seen but their gappy hesitating incoherent and sensitive line revealed their mood clearly we continued advancing step by step loading and firing as we went to every forward step they took a backward move loading and firing as they slowly withdrew twenty thousand muskets were being fired at this stage but though accuracy of aim was impossible owing to our laboring hearts and the jarring and excitement many bullets found their destined billets on both sides after a steady exchange of musketry which lasted some time we heard the order fix bayonets on the double quick in tones that thrilled us there was a simultaneous bound forward each soul doing his best for the emergency the federals appeared inclined to await us but at this juncture our men raised a yell thousands responded to it and burst out into the wildest yelling it has ever been my lot to hear it drove all sanity and order from among us it served the double purpose of relieving pent-up feelings and transmitting encouragement along the attacking line i rejoiced in the shouting like the rest it reminded me that there were about four hundred companies like the dixie greys who shared our feelings most of us engrossed with the musket work had forgotten the fact but the wave after wave of human voices louder than all other battle sounds together penetrated to every sense and stimulated our energies to the utmost they fly was echoed from lip to lip it accelerated our pace and filled us with a noble rage then i knew what the berserker passion was it deluged us with rapture and transfigured each southerner into an exulting victor at such a moment nothing could have halted us 
those savage yells and the sight of thousands of racing figures coming towards them discomfited the blue coats and when we arrived upon the place where they had stood they had vanished then we caught sight of their beautiful array of tents before which they had made their stand after being roused from their sunday morning sleep and huddled into line at hearing their pickets challenge our skirmishers the half-dressed dead and wounded showed what a surprise our attack had been we drew up in the enemy's camp panting and breathing hard some precious minutes were thus lost in recovering our breaths indulging our curiosity and reforming our line signs of a hasty rouse to the battle were abundant military equipments uniform coats half-packed knapsacks bedding of a new and superior quality littered the company streets meantime a series of other camps lay behind the first array of tents the resistance we had met though comparatively brief enabled the brigades in rear of the advance camp to recover from the shock of the surprise but our delay had not been long enough to give them time to form in proper order of battle there were wide gaps between their divisions into which the quick flowing tide of elated southerners entered and compelled them to fall back lest they should be surrounded prentice's brigade despite their most desperate efforts were thus hemmed in on all sides and were made prisoners i had a momentary impression that with the capture of the first camp the battle was well nigh over but in fact it was only a brief prologue of the long and exhaustive series of struggles which took place that day continuing our advance we came in view of the tops of another mass of white tents and almost at the same time were met by a furious storm of bullets poured on us from a long line of blue coats whose attitude of assurance proved to us that we should have tough work here but we were so much heartened by our first success that it would have required a good deal to have halted our advance for long their opportunity for making a full impression on us came with terrific suddenness the world seemed bursting into fragments cannon and musket shell and bullet lent their several intensities to the distracting uproar if i had not a fraction of an ear and an eye inclined toward my captain and company i had been spellbound by the energies now opposed to us i likened the cannon with their deep bass to the roaring of a great herd of lions the ripping cracking musketry to the incessant yapping of terriers the windy whisk of shells and zipping of many bullets to the swoop of eagles and the buzz of angry wasps all the opposing armies of gray and blue fiercely blazed at each other after being exposed for a few seconds to this fearful downpour we heard the order to lie down men and continue your firing before me was a prostrate tree about fifteen inches in diameter with a narrow strip of light between it and the ground behind this shelter a dozen of us flung ourselves the security it appeared to offer restored me to my individuality we could fight and think and observe better than out in the open but it was a terrible period how the cannon bellowed and their shells plunged and bounded and flew with screeching hisses over us their sharp rending explosions and hurtling fragments made us shrink and cower despite our utmost efforts to be cool and collected i marvelled as i heard the unintermitting patter snip thud and hum of the bullets how any one could live under this raining death i could hear the balls beating a merciless tattoo on the outer surface of the log pinging vivaciously as they flew off at a tangent from it and thudding into something or other at the rate of a hundred a second one here and there found its way under the log and buried itself in a comrade's body one man raised his chest as if to yawn and jostled me i turned to him and saw that a bullet had gored his whole face and penetrated into his chest another ball struck a man a deadly rap on the head and he turned on his back and showed his ghastly white face to the sky it is getting too warm boys cried a soldier and he uttered a vehement curse upon keeping soldiers hugging the ground until every ounce of courage was chilled he lifted his head a little too high and a bullet skimmed over the top of the log and hit him fairly in the centre of his forehead and he fell heavily on his face but his thought had been instantaneously general and the officers with one voice ordered the charge and cries of forward forward raised us as with a spring to our feet and changed the complexion of our feelings the pulse of action beat feverishly once more and though overhead was crowded with peril we were unable to give it so much attention as when we lay stretched on the ground just as we bent our bodies for the onset a boy's voice cried out oh stop please stop a bit i've been hurt and can't move i turned to look and saw henry parker standing on one leg and dolefully regarding his smashed foot in another second we were striding impetuously toward the enemy vigorously plying our muskets stopping only to prime the pan 
and rammed the load down when with a spring or two we would fetch up with the front aim and fire our progress was not so continuously rapid as we desired for the blues were obdurate but at this moment we were gladdened at the sight of a battery galloping to our assistance it was time for the nerve-shaking cannon to speak after two rounds of shell and canister we felt the pressure on us slightly relaxed but we were still somewhat sluggish in disposition though the officers voices rang out imperiously newton's story at this juncture strode forward rapidly with the dixie's banner until he was quite sixty yards ahead of the foremost finding himself alone he halted and turning to us smilingly said why don't you come on boys you see there is no danger his smile and words acted on us like magic we raised the yell and sprang lightly and hopefully toward him let's give them hell boys said one plug them plumb center every time it was all very encouraging for the yelling and shouting were taken up by thousands forward forward don't give them breathing time was cried we instinctively obeyed and soon came in clear view of the blue coats who were scornfully unconcerned at first but seeing the leaping tide of men coming on at a tremendous pace their front dissolved and they fled in double quick retreat again we felt the glorious joy of heroes they carried us on exultingly rejoicing in the spirit which recognizes nothing but the prey we were no longer an army of soldiers but so many schoolboys racing in which length of legs wind and condition tell we gained the second line of camps continued the rush through them and clean beyond it it was now about ten o'clock my physical powers were quite exhausted and to add to my discomfiture something struck me on my belt clasp and tumbled me headlong to the ground i could not have been many minutes prostrated before i recovered from the shock of the blow and fall to find my clasp deeply dented and cracked my company was not in sight i was grateful for the rest and crawled feebly to a tree and plunging my hand into my haversack ate ravenously within half an hour feeling renovated i struck north in the direction which my regiment had taken over a ground strewn with bodies and the debris of war i overtook my regiment about one o'clock and found that it was engaged in one of these occasional spurts of fury the enemy resolutely maintained their ground and our side was preparing for another assault the firing was alternately brisk and slack we lay down and availed ourselves of trees logs and hollows and annoyed their upstanding ranks battery pounded battery and meanwhile we hugged our resting places closely of a sudden we rose and raced towards the position and took it by sheer weight and impetuosity as we had done before about three o'clock the battle grew very hot the enemy appeared to be more concentrated and immovably sullen both sides fired better as they grew more accustomed to the din but with assistance from the reserves we were continually pressing them towards the river tennessee without ever retreating an inch about this time the enemy were assisted by the gunboats which hurled their enormous projectiles far beyond us but though they made great havoc among the trees and created terror they did comparatively little damage to those in close touch with the enemy the screaming of the big shells when they first began to sail over our heads had the effect of reducing our fire for they were as fascinating as they were distracting but we became used to them and our attention was being claimed more in front our officers were more urgent and when we saw the growing dyke of white cloud that signalled the bullet storm we could not be indifferent to the more immediate danger dead bodies wounded men writhing in agony and assuming every distressful attitude were frequent sights but what made us heartsick was to see now and then the well-groomed charger of an officer with fine saddle and scarlet and yellow edged cloth and brass tipped holsters or a stray cavalry or artillery horse galloping between the lines snorting with terror while his entrails soiled with dust trailed behind him our officers had continued to show the same alertness and vigor throughout the day but as it drew near four o'clock though they strove to encourage and urge us on they began to abate somewhat in their energy and it was evident that the pluckiest of the men lacked this spontaneity and springing ardor which had distinguished them earlier in the day several of our company lagged wearily behind and the remainder showed by their drawn faces the effects of their efforts yet after a short rest they were able to make splendid spurts as for myself i had only one wish and that was for repose the long continued excitement the successive tautening and relaxing of the nerves the quenchless thirst made more intense by the fumes of sulphurous powder and the caking grime on the lips caused by tearing the paper cartridges and a ravening hunger all combined had reduced me to a walking automaton and i earnestly wished that night would come and stop all further effort finally about five o'clock we assaulted and captured a large camp 
after driving the enemy well away from it the front line was as thin as that of a skirmishing body and we were ordered to retire to the tents there we hungrily sought after provisions and i was lucky in finding a supply of biscuits and a canteen of excellent molasses which gave great comfort to myself and friends the plunder in the camp was abundant there were bedding clothing and accoutrements without stint but people were so exhausted they could do no more than idly turn the things over night soon fell and only a few stray shots could now be heard to remind us of the thrilling and horrid din of the day excepting the huge bombs from the gunboats which as we were not far from the blue coats discomfited only those in the rear by eight o'clock i was repeating my experiences in the region of dreams indifferent to columbiads and mortars and the torrential rain which at midnight increased the miseries of the wounded and tentless an hour before dawn i awoke from a refreshing sleep and after a hearty replenishment of my vitals with biscuit and molasses i conceived myself to be fresher than on sunday morning while awaiting daybreak i gathered from other early risers their ideas in regard to the events of yesterday they were under the impression that we had gained a great victory though we had not as we had anticipated reached the tennessee river van dorn with his expected reinforcements for us was not likely to make his appearance for many days yet and if general buell with his twenty thousand troops had joined the enemy during the night we had a bad day's work before us we were short of provisions and ammunition general sidney johnston our chief commander had been killed but beauregard was safe and unhurt and if buell was absent we would win the day at daylight i fell in with my company but there were only about fifty of the dixies present almost immediately after symptoms of the coming battle were manifest regiments were hurried into line but even to my inexperienced eyes the troops were in ill condition for repeating the efforts of sunday however in brief time in consequence of our pickets being driven in on us we were moved forward in skirmishing order with my musket on the trail i found myself in active motion more active than otherwise i would have been perhaps because captain smith had said now mr stanley if you please step briskly forward this singling out of me wounded my amour propre and sent me forward like a rocket in a short time we met our opponents in the same formation as ourselves and advancing most resolutely we threw ourselves behind such trees as were near us fired loaded and darted forward to another shelter presently i found myself in an open grassy space with no convenient tree or stump near but seeing a shallow hollow some twenty paces ahead i made a dash for it and plied my musket with haste i became so absorbed with some blue figures in front of me that i did not pay sufficient heed to my companion greys the open space was too dangerous perhaps for their advance for had they emerged i should have known they were pressing forward seeing my blues in about the same proportion i assumed that the greys were keeping their position and never once thought of retreat however as despite our firing the blues were coming uncomfortably near i rose from my hollow but to my speechless amazement i found myself a solitary grey in a line of blue skirmishers my companions had retreated the next i heard was down with that gun see shesh or i'll drill a hole through you drop it quick half a dozen of the enemy were covering me at the same instant and i dropped my weapon incontinently two men sprang at my collar and marched me unresisting into the ranks of the terrible yankees i was a prisoner end of section seventy two this recording is in the public domain section seventy three of the united states Read for LibriVox.org by Devorah Allen. The first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation by Francis Bicknell Carpenter, United States, 1830 to 1900. Painting, page 346. At the time of the memorable first reading, Lincoln called his cabinet together and spoke as follows. Gentlemen, I have, as you are aware, thought a great deal about the relation of this war to slavery, and you all remember that several weeks ago I read to you an order I had prepared on this subject, which, on account of objections made by some of you, was not issued. Ever since then my mind has been much occupied with this subject, and I have thought all along that the time for acting on it might probably come. 
I think the time has come now. I wish it was a better time. I wish that we were in better condition. The action of the army against the rebels has not been quite what I should have best liked. But they have been driven out of Maryland, and Pennsylvania is no longer in danger of invasion. When the rebel army was at Frederick, I determined, as soon as it should be driven out of Maryland, to issue a proclamation of emancipation, such as I thought most likely to be useful. I said nothing to anyone, but I made the promise to myself, and, hesitating a little, to my maker. The rebel army is now driven out, and I am going to fulfill that promise. I have got you together to hear what I have written down. I do not wish your advice about the main matter, for that I have determined for myself. This I say without intending anything but respect for any one of you. I am here, I must do the best I can, and bear the responsibility of taking the course which I feel I ought to take. From left to right, the persons seated are Stanton, the President, Wells, Seward, and Bates. Those standing are Chase, Smith, and Blair. End of section 73 this recording is in the public domain. Section 74 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 74 Boston Hymn by Ralph Waldo Emerson Footnote Read in Music Hall, January the 1st, 1863, at a celebration of the passing of the Emancipation Proclamation. End footnote The word of the Lord by night to the watching pilgrims came, as they sat by the seaside and filled their hearts with flame. God said, I am tired of kings, I suffer them no more. Up to my ear the morning brings the outrage of the poor. Think ye I made this ball a field of havoc and war, where tyrants great and tyrants small might harry the weak and poor? My angel, his name is Freedom, choose him to be your king. He shall cut pathways east and west, and fend you with his wing. Lo, I uncover the land, which I hid old time in the west, as the sculptor uncovers the statue, when he has wrought his best. I show Columbia, of the rocks which dip their foot in the seas, and soar to the airborne flocks, of clouds and the boreal fleece. I will divide my goods, Call in the wretch and slave. None shall rule but the humble, And none but toil shall have. I will have never a noble, No lineage counted great. Fishers and choppers and ploughmen Shall constitute a state. Go cut down trees in the forest, And trim the straightest boughs. Cut down trees in the forest, And build me a wooden house. Call the people together, the young men and the sires, the digger in the harvest field, hireling and him that hires. And here in a pine state house they shall choose men to rule, in every needful faculty, in church and state and school. Lo now, if these poor men can govern the land and sea, and make just laws below the sun, as planets faithful be. And ye shall succour men, tis nobleness to serve. Help them who cannot help again, beware from right to swerve. I break your bonds and masterships, and I unchain the slave. Free be his heart and hand henceforth, as wind and wandering wave. I cause from every creature his proper good to flow, as much as he is and doeth, so much he shall bestow. But laying hand on another, To coin his labour and sweat, He goes in pawn to his victim, For eternal years in debt. 
Today unbind the captive, so only are ye unbound. Lift up a people from the dust, trump of their rescue sound. Pay ransom to the owner, and fill the bag to the brim. Who is the owner? The slave is owner, and ever was. Pay him. O oh, North, give him beauty for rags, and honour, O oh, South, for his shame. Nevada, coin thy golden crags with freedom's image and name. Up, and the dusky race that sat in darkness long, be swift their feet as antelopes and as behemoth strong. Come east and west and north by races and snowflakes, and carry my purpose forth, which neither halts nor shakes. My will fulfilled shall be, for in daylight or in dark, my thunderbolt has eyes to see his way home to the mark. End of section 74. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 75 of the United States Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke The United States, Volume 2, Part 11 The Turning Point, Historical Note On May 1, 1863, General Hooker, with 105,000 men, attacked the Confederate Army of 50,000 men at Chancellorsville, and suffered the worst defeat experienced by the North during the war. During the battle, Stonewall Jackson was mortally wounded by the mistake of his own men. Lee again attempted to invade the North, but was met at Gettysburg on July 1 by the Union Army under General Meade. After three days of the most desperate fighting of modern times, the Confederates were forced to retreat. On the day after this great battle, Vicksburg, the strongest and most important Confederate position in the West, was captured by General Grant after a long siege, and the entire Mississippi was henceforth in the hands of the Unionists. These two victories mark the turning point of the war. While the wealthy and populous northern states could continue the struggle indefinitely, the resources of the South were rapidly nearing exhaustion, and it would soon be a question merely of how long the South could continue its resistance. Grant's almost uniform success in the West had been in such contrast with the Union operations in the East that in March 1864, he was made commander-in-chief of all the northern armies having given command of the western army to sherman he advanced with the army of the potomac directly toward richmond undeterred by the terrible slaughter of his men at the wilderness spotsylvania and cold harbor he pushed forward and invested petersburg where he was held at bay by lee until the following spring a force detached from the confederate army to threaten washington was defeated by sheridan and the fertile shenandoah valley was devastated in the meantime general sherman after a brilliant campaign against johnston captured atlanta and started on his march to the sea end of section seventy five this recording is in the public domain Section 76 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Valerie Marino. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 76, Stonewall Jackson by the River. 1863. By Mary Johnston. The Battle of Chancellorsville was one of the most important engagements of the whole war. 
An exceedingly brilliant part of the battle was the flank movement of Jackson, which is described as follows. Lee ordered Jackson, who had been stationed on his extreme right with 30,000 men, to make a wide detour and swinging round to the extreme right of the Federal position, make an unexpected assault upon the enemy's flank. The direction of this movement was not apparent to the Federals, who began to regard it in the nature of a retreat. About 6 p.m., after a march of some 15 miles, Jackson fell suddenly upon the flank and rear of Howard's Corps, which constituted the right flank of the Federal Army, and, taking it by surprise, stampeded it. Jackson, while in advance of his troops, was fired upon and mortally wounded by his own men, who mistook his escort for a detachment of Federals. The Editor A very few yards from Chancellorsville, he checked Little Sorrel. The horse stood four feet planted. Horse and rider, they stood and listened. Hooker's reserves were up, about the Chancellor House on the Chancellorsville Ridge. They were throwing up entrenchments. They were digging the earth with bayonets. They were heaping it up with their hands. There was a ringing of axes. They were cutting down the young spring growth. They were making an abetus. Tones of command could be heard. Hurry, hurry, hurry! They meant to rush us. Hurry, hurry! A dead creeper matling, a dead tree, caught by some flying spark, suddenly flared through its length, stood a pillar of fire, and showed readily the enemy's guns. Stonewall Jackson sat his horse and looked. Cut them off from the ford, he said. Never let them get out of Virginia. He jerked his hand into the air. Turning little sorrel, he rode back along the plank road toward his own lines. The light of the burning brush had sunk in, the cannon smoke floating in the air, the very thick woods made all things obscure. There are troops across the road in front, said an aide. Yes, Lane's North Carolinians awaiting their signal. A little to the east and south broke out in the wildness a sudden rattling fire, sinking, sinking again, the blue and gray skirmishes now in touch. All through the vast, dark, tangled, beating heart of the place sprang into being attention. The gray lines listened for the word advance. The musket rested on the shoulder, the foot quivered, eyes front, tried to pierce the darkness. Sound was unceasing, and yet the mind found a stillness, a lake of calm. It was the moment before the moment. Stonewall Jackson came toward the Carolinans. He rode quickly past the dark shell of a house sunken among pines. There were with him seven or eight persons. The woods were deep, the obscurity great. Suddenly, out of the brush rang a shot, an accidentally discharged rifle. Some gray soldier among Lane's tensely waiting ranks, dressed in the woods to the right of the road, spoke from the core of a fearful dream. Yankee cavalry, Fire! called an officer of the 18th North Carolina. The volley, striking diagonally across the road, emptied several saddles. Stonewall Jackson, the aides, and Wilburn wheeled to the left, dug spur, and would have plunged into the wood. Fire, said the Carolinans, dressed to the left of the road and fired. Little Sorrel maddened and dashed into the woods. An oak bough stuck its rider, almost bearing him from the saddle. With his right hand, from which the blood was streaming, in which a bullet was embedded, he caught the bridle, managed to turn the agonized brute into the road again. There seemed a wild sound, a wild confusion of voices. Someone had stopped the firing. My God, men, you are firing into us. In the road were the aides. They caught the rein, stopped the horse. Wilborn put up his arms. General, general, you are not hurt? Hold there, Morrison, Lee. They laid him on the ground beneath the pines, and they fired the brushwood for a light. One rode off for Dr. McGuire, and another with a penknife cut away the sleeve from the left arm, through which had gone two bullets. A mounted man came at a gallop and threw himself from his horse. It was A.P. Hill. General, general, you are not much hurt? Yes, I think I am, said Stonewall Jackson, and my wounds are from my own men. Hill drew off the gauntlets that were all blood-soaked, and with his handkerchief tried to bind up the arm, shattered and with the main artery cut. A courier came up. Sir, sir, a body of the enemy is close at hand. The aides lifted the wounded general. No one, said Hill, must tell the troops who was wounded. The other opened his eyes. Tell them simply that you have a wounded officer. General Hill, you are in command now. Press right on. With a gesture of sorrow, Hill went, returning to the front. The others rested at the edge of the road. At that moment, the Federal batteries opened. A hissing storm of shot and shell, a tornado meant measurably to retard that anticipated gray onrush. The range was high. Aides and couriers laid the wounded leader on the earth and made of their bodies a screen. The trees were cut, the earth was torn up, there was a howling as of unchained fiends. There passed what seemed an eternity and was but ten minutes. 
The great blue guns slightly changed the direction of their fire. The storm howled away from the group by the road, and the men again lifted Jackson. He stood now on his feet, and because troops were heard approaching, and because it must not be known that he was hurt, all moved into the darkness of the scrub. The troops upon the road came on Pender's brigade. Pender, riding in advance, saw the group and asked who was wounded. A field officer, answered one, but there came from some direction a glare of light, and by it Pender knew. He sprang from his horse. "'Don't say anything about it, General Pender,' said Jackson. "'Press on, sir, press on. General, they are using all their artillery. It is a very deadly fire. In the darkness it may disorganize. The forage cap was gone. The blue eyes showed full and deep. "'You must hold your ground, General Pender. You must hold out to the last, sir.' "'I will, General, I will,' said Pender." A litter was found and brought, and Stonewall Jackson was laid upon it. The little procession moved toward Dowdall's tavern. A shot pierced the arm of one of the bearers, loosening his hold of the litter. It tilted. The general fell heavily to the ground, injuring afresh the wounded limb, striking and bruising his side. They raised him, pale now and silent, and at last they struggled through the wood to a little clearing where they found an ambulance. Now, too, came the doctor, a man whom he loved, and knelt beside him. I hope that you are not badly hurt, General. Yes, I am, Doctor. I am badly hurt. I fear that I am dying. In the ambulance lay also his chief of artillery, Colonel Crutchfield, painfully injured. Crutchfield pulled the doctor down to him. He's not badly hurt? Yes, badly hurt. Crutchfield groaned. Oh, my God. Stonewall Jackson heard and made the ambulance stop. You must do something for Colonel Crutchfield, Doctor. Don't let him suffer. A.P. Hill, riding back to the front, was wounded by a piece of shell. Boswell, the chief engineer, to whom had been entrusted the guidance through the night of the advance upon the roads to the fords, was killed. That was a fatal cannonade from the ridge of Chancellorsville. Fatal and fateful. It continued. The wilderness chanted a battle chant, indeed to the moon, the moon that was pale and wan, as if wearied with silvering battlefields. Hill lying in a litter, just back from his advanced line, dispatched couriers for Stuart. Stuart was far towards Eli's ford, riding through the night in plume and fighting jacket. The straining horses, the recalling order reached him. General Jackson badly wounded. A.P. Hill badly wounded. I in command. My God, man, all changed like that. Right about face. Forward. March. There was that night no gray assault. But the dawn broke clear and found the gray lines waiting. The sky was a glory. The wilderness rolled in emerald waves. The red bird sang. Lee and the Second Corps were yet two miles apart. Between was Chancellorsville, and all the strong entrenchments, and the great blue guns, and Hooker's courageous men. Now followed Jeb Stewart's fight. In the dawn, the Second Corps swung from the right by a master hand, struck full against the Federal Center, struck full against Chancellorsville. In the clear May morning broke a thunderstorm of artillery. It raged loudly, peal on peal, crash on crash. The gray shells struck the Chancellor House. They set it on fire. It went up in flames. A fragment of shell struck and stunned fighting Joe Hooker. He lay senseless for hours, and Couch took command. The gray musketry, the blue musketry, rolled, rolled. The wilderness was on fire. In places it was like a prairie. The flames licked their way through the scrub. The wounded perished. Ammunition began to fail. Stuart ordered the ground to be held with the bayonet. There was a great attack against his left. His three lines came into one and repulsed it. His right and Anderson's left now touched. The Army of Northern Virginia was again a unit. Stuart swung above his head the hat with the black feather. His beautiful horse danced along the gray lines, the lines that were very grimly determined, the lines that knew now that Stonewall Jackson was badly wounded. They meant the grain lines to make this day and the wilderness remembered. "'Forward charge!' cried Jeb Stuart. "'Remember Jackson!' He swung his plumed hat. "'Yay! Yay! Yay! Yay!' yelled the gray lines and charged. Stuart went at their head, and as he went, he raised in song his golden ringing voice. "'Old Joe Hooker, won't you come out of the wilderness?' By ten o'clock the Chancellor Ridge was taken. The blue gun silenced. Hooker, beaten back toward the Rappahannock. The wilderness, after all, was Virginian. She broke into a war song of triumph. Her flowers bloomed, her birds sang, and then came Lee to the front. Oh, the army of northern Virginia cheered him. Men, men, he said. You have done well, you have done well. Where is General Jackson? He was told. Presently, he wrote a note and sent it to the field hospital near Dowdall's tavern. General, 
I cannot express my regret. Could I have directed events, I should have chosen for the good of the country to be disabled in your stead. I congratulate you upon the victory, which is due to your skill and energy. Very respectfully, your obedient servant. R. E. Lee. An aide read it to Stonewall Jackson where he lay, very quiet in the deeps of the wilderness. For a minute he did not speak. Then he said, General Lee is very kind, but he should give the praise to God. For four days yet they fought in the wilderness, at Salem Church, at the fords of the Rappahannock, again at Fredericksburg. Then they rested. The Army of the Potomac, back on the northern side of the Rappahannock, the Army of Northern Virginia, holding the southern shore and the road to Richmond. Richmond, no nearer for McDowell, no nearer for McClellan, no nearer for Pope, no nearer for Burnside, no nearer for Hooker, no nearer after two years of war. In the wilderness and thereabouts, Hooker lost 17,000 men, 13 guns, and 1,500 rounds of cannon ammunition, 20,000 rifles, 300,000 rounds of infantry ammunition. The Army of Northern Virginia lost 12,000 men. On the 5th of May, Stonewall Jackson was carefully moved from the wilderness to Guinea Station. Here was a large old residence, the Chandler House, within a sweep of grass and trees, about it one or two small buildings. The great house was filled, crowded to its doors with wounded soldiers, so they laid Stonewall Jackson in a rude cabin among the trees. The left arm had been amputated in the field hospital. He was thought to be doing well, though at times he complained of the side which, in the fall from the litter, had been struck and bruised. At daylight on Thursday he had his physician called. I am suffering great pain, he said. See what is the matter with me. And presently, is it pneumonia? That afternoon his wife came. He was roused to speak to her, greeted her with love, then sank into something like stupor. From time to time he awakened from this, but there were also times when he was slightly delirious. He gave orders in a shadow of the old voice. You must hold out a little longer, men. You must hold out a little longer. Press forward, press forward press forward. Give them canister, Major Pelham. Friday went by and Saturday. The afternoon of this day, he asked for his chaplain, Mr. Lacey. Later in the twilight, his wife sang to him old hymns that he loved. Sing the fifty-first psalm in verse, he said. She sang, Show pity, Lord. O oh, Lord, forgive. The night passed, and Sunday the tenth dawned. He lay quiet, his right hand on his breast. One of the staff came for a moment to his bedside. Who is preaching at headquarters today? He was told, and said, Good, I wish I might be there. The officer's voice broke. General, General, the whole army is praying for you. There is a message from General Lee. Yes, yes, give it. He sends you his love. He says that you must recover, that you have lost your left arm, but that he would lose his right arm. He says, tell you, that he prayed for you last night as he had never prayed for himself. He repeats what he said in his note, for that the good of Virginia and the South, he could wish that he were lying here in your place. The soldier on the bed smiled a little and shook his head. Better ten Jacksons should lie here than one Lee. It was sunny weather, fair and sweet, with all of the bloom of May, the bright trees waving, the long grass rippling, the water flowing, the sky azure, bees about the flowers, the birds singing piercingly sweet, Mother Earth so beautiful, the sky down bending the light of the sun so gracious, warm, and vital. A little before noon, kneeling beside him, his wife told Stonewall Jackson that he would die. He smiled and laid his hand upon her bowed head. You are frightened, my child. Death is not so near. I may yet get well. The doctor came to him. Doctor, Anna tells me that I am to die today. Is it so? Oh, General, General, it is so. He lay silent a moment. Then he said, Very good, very good. It is all right. Throughout the day, his mind was now clouded, now clear. In one of the latter times, he said there was something he was trying to remember. There followed a half hour of broken sleep and wandering, in the course of which he spoke a name, Dedrick. Once he said, Horse Artillery, and once, White Oak Swamp. The alternate clear moments and the lapses into stupor or delirium were like the sinking or rising of a strong swimmer, exhausted at last, the prey at last of a shoreless sea. At times he came head and shoulders out of the sea. In such a moment he opened his gray-blue eyes full on one of his staff. All the staff was gathered in grief about the bed. When Richard Cleave, he said, asks for a court of inquiry, let him have it. Tell General Lee— the sea drew him under again. It hardly let him go any more. Moment by moment now, it wore out the strong swimmer. The day drew on to afternoon. He lay straight upon the bed, silent for the most part. 
but now and then, wandering a little, his wife bowed herself beside him. In a corner wept the old man Jim. Outside the windows there seemed a hush as of death. Pass the infantry to the front, ordered Stonewall Jackson. Tell A.P. Hill to prepare for action. The voice sank. There came a long silence. There was only heard the old man crying in the corner. Then, for the last time, in this phase of being, the great soldier opened his eyes. In a moment he spoke, in a very sweet and calm voice, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. He died. End of section 76. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Valerie Marino. Section 77 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Valerie Marino. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 77, A Three Hours' Truce at Vicksburg, 1863 by W. H. Tenard of the Confederate Army. The report of a single gun within the breastworks was the signal for a concentrated fire of the enemy's batteries, which poured a perfect storm of shot and shell upon the faded point, resulting usually in the destruction of the battery and killing and wounding numbers of the artillerymen. No less than five cannonries were shot in an attempt to apply a lighted fuse to the vent of a loaded gun. Nearly all the artillery along the lines was dismounted by the furious bombardment of the 22nd. General Grant sent in a flag of truce, asking permission to bury his dead, which were lying unburied in thick profusion outside of the entrenchments, where the enemy had assaulted the lines. General Pemberton refused to grant the request, replying that the battle was not yet decided. The enemy commenced an undermining our parapet, with the intention of blowing it up. As the sound of their voices could be distinctly heard, our brave boys began to annoy them by hurling upon them every species of deadly missile which human ingenuity could invent. Twelve-pounder shells were dropped over the breastworks among them, and kegs filled with powder, shells, nails, and scraps of iron. A more deadly, vindictive, and determined species of warfare was never waged. The chief aim of both combatants seemed to be concentrated in the invention of apparatus for taking human life. In the afternoon of May 25th, a flag of truce was sent into the lines, requesting a cessation of hostilities for the purpose of burying the dead, and the request was granted for three hours. Now commenced a strange spectacle in this thrilling drama of war. Flags were displayed along both lines, and the troops thronged the breastworks, gaily chatting with each other, discussing the issues of the war, disputing over the differences of opinion, losses in the fights, etc. Numbers of the Confederates accepted invitations to visit the enemy's lines, where they were hospitably entertained and warmly welcomed. They were abundantly supplied with provisions and supplies of various kinds. Of course, there were numerous laughable and interesting incidents resulting from these visits. The foe were exultant, confident of success and in high spirits. The Confederates, defiant, undaunted in soul, and equally well assured of a successful defense. The members of the 3rd Regiment found numerous acquaintances and relatives among the Ohio, Illinois, and Missouri regiments, and there were mutual regrets that the issues of the war had made them antagonistic in a deadly struggle. Captain F. Gallagher, the worthy commissionary of the regiment, had been enjoying the hospitality of a Yankee officer, imbibing his fine liquors and partaking of his choice viands, and as they separated, the Federal remarked, Good day, Captain. I trust we shall meet soon again in the Union of Old. Captain G, with a peculiar expression on his pleasant face and an extra side poise of his hand, quickly replied, I cannot return your sentiment. The only Union which you and I will enjoy, I hope, will be in kingdom come. Goodbye, sir. At the expiration of the appointed time, the men were all back in their places. The stillness which had superseded the uproar of battle seemed strange and unnatural. The hours of peace had scarcely expired ere those who so lately intermingled in friendly intercourse were once again engaged in the deadly struggle. Heavy mortars, artillery of every caliber, and small arms once more with thunder tones awakened the slumbering echoes of the hills surrounding the heroic city of Vicksburg. End of section 77. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Valerie Marino. Section 78 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Union Gunboats on the Mississippi. From an Engraving. Painting page 366. 
Early in 1863, New Orleans and the Mississippi River above Vicksburg were in the hands of the Union. If Vicksburg and Port Hudson could be taken, the whole river would be under the control of the federal government, but it was not easy to take Vicksburg. The city stood on a bluff so high that shot could not be thrown to it from vessels on the river, while the city guns could easily sink any ship that attempted to pass. For three months, General Grant and General Sherman tried to get into a position to attack the town. At last they succeeded, and the siege of seven weeks began. Day and night the shells were falling. People dug caves into the side of the hill to be safe from flying fragments. A lady who lived in one of the caves wrote that even the mules in the town seemed wild, and the dogs howled madly whenever a shell exploded. By and by the cornbread and bacon failed, and mules, rats, and mice were eaten, but finally the brave, suffering, starving people surrendered. The Confederate flag was hauled down, and the banner of the Union run up. The whole Union army witnessed the scene, but not a cheer was given, says General Grant, so deeply were the courage and endurance of the people respected. A few days later, Port Hudson yielded, and the Mississippi was now controlled by the Union. End of section 78. This recording is in the public domain. Section 79 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sebastian Levine. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 79, A Drummer Boy at Gettysburg, 1863, by Harry M. Kiefer. Harry, I'm getting tired of this thing. It's becoming monotonous, this thing of being roused every morning at four with orders to pack up and be ready to march at a moment's notice, and then lying around here all day in the sun. I don't believe we're going anywhere, anyhow. We had been encamped for six weeks, of which I need give no special account, only saying that in those summer quarters, as they might be called, we went on with our endless drilling, and were baked and browned and thoroughly hardened to the life of a soldier in the field. The monotony of which Andy complained did not end that day, nor the next. For six successive days we were regularly roused at four o'clock in the morning, with orders to pack up and be ready to move immediately, only to unpack as regularly about the middle of the afternoon. We could hear our batteries pounding away in the direction of Fredericksburg, but we did not then know that we were being held to well in hand till the enemy's plan had developed itself into the great march into Pennsylvania, and we were led off in hot pursuit. So, at last, on the 12th of June, 1863, we started, at five o'clock in the morning, in a northwesterly direction. My journal says, Very warm, dust plenty, water scarce, marching very hard. Halted at dusk at an excellent spring, and lay down for the night, with aching limbs and blistered feet. I pass over the six days' continuous marching that followed, steadily on toward the north, pausing only to relate several incidents that happened by the way. On the fourteenth we were racing with the enemy, we being pushed on to the utmost of human endurance, for the possession of the defenses of Washington. From five o'clock of that morning till three the following morning, that is to say, from daylight to daylight, we were hurried along under a burning June sun, with no halt longer than sufficient to recruit our strength with a hasty cup of coffee at noon and nightfall. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve o'clock at night, and still on. It was almost more than flesh could endure. Men fell out of line in the darkness for the score, and tumbled over by the roadside, asleep almost before they touched the ground. I remember how a great tall fellow in our company made us laugh along somewhere about one o'clock that morning. Pointer, we called him, an excellent soldier, who afterward fell at his post at Spotsylvania. He had been trudging on in sullen silence for hours, when, all of a sudden, coming to a halt, he brought his piece to order arms on the hard road of the ring, took off his cap, and, in language far more forcible than elegant, began forthwith to denounce both parties to the war, from A to Izzard, in all branches of the service, civil and military, army and navy, artillery, infantry, and cavalry, and demanded that the enemy should come on in full force here and now, and I'll fight them all, single-handed and alone, the whole pack of them. I'm tired of this everlasting marching, and I want to fight. Three cheers for Pointer, cried someone, and we left heartily as we toiled doggedly on to Manassas, which we reached at 3 a.m., June 15th. I can assure you, we lost no time in stretching ourselves at full length in the tall summer grass. James McFadden, report to the adjutant for Camp Guard. 
James McFadden. Anybody know where Jim McFadden is? Now, that was rather hard, wasn't it? To march from daylight to daylight, and lie down for a rest of probably two hours before starting again, and then to be called up to stand throughout those precious two hours on guard duty. I knew very well where McFadden was, for wasn't he lying right beside me in the grass? But just then I was in no humor to tell. The camp might well go without a guard that night, or the orderly might find McFadden in the dark if he could. But the rules were strict, and the punishment was severe, and poor McFadden, bursting into tears of vexation, answered like a man, "'Here I am, orderly. I'll go.' It was hard. Two weeks later, both McFadden and the orderly went where there is neither marching nor standing guard any more. Now comes a long rest of a week in the woods near the Potomac, for we have been marching parallel with the enemy and dare not go too fast, lest, by some sudden and dexterous move in the game, he should sweep past our rear and upon the defenses of Washington. And after this sweet refreshment, we cross the Potomac on pontoons, and march, perhaps with a lighter step since we are nearing home, through the smiling fields and pleasant villages of Maryland, my Maryland. At Poolsville, a little town on the north bank of the Potomac, we smile as we see a lot of children come trooping out of the village school, a merry sight to men who have seen neither woman nor child these six months and more, and a touching sight to many a man in the ranks as he thinks of his little flaxen heads in the faraway home. I think of them now, and think of them full tenderly, too, for many a man of you shall never have child climb on his knee any more. As we enter one of those pleasant little Maryland villages, Jefferson by name, we find on the outskirts of the place two young ladies and two young gentlemen, waving the good old flag as we pass, and singing, Rally round the flag, boys! The excitement along the line is intense. Cheer on cheer is given, by regiment after regiment. As we pass along, we drummer boys beating at the colonel's express orders, the old tune, The Girl I Left Behind Me, as a sort of response. Soon we are in among the hills again, and still the cheering goes on in the far distance to the rear. Only ten days later, we passed through the same village again, and were met by the same young ladies and gentlemen, waving the same flag and singing the same song. But though we tried twice, and tried hard, we could not cheer at all. For there's a difference between five hundred men and one hundred, is there not? So that second time, we drooped our tattered flags, and raised our caps in silent and sorrowful salute. Through Middletown next, where rumor reaches us that the enemy's forces have occupied Harrisburg, and where certain ladies, standing on a balcony and waving their handkerchiefs as we pass by, in reply to our colonel's greeting, that we are glad to see so many Union people here, answer, yes, and we are glad to see the Yankee soldiers, too. From Middletown, at six o'clock in the evening, across the mountain to Frederick, on the outskirts of which city, we camp for the night. At half-past five next morning, June twenty-ninth, we are up and away, in a drizzling rain, through Lewistown and Mechanicstown, near which latter place we pass a company of Confederate prisoners, twenty-four in number, dressed in well-worn gray and butternut, which makes us think that the enemy cannot be far ahead. After a hard march of twenty-five miles, the greater part of the way over a turnpike, we reach Emmitsburg at nightfall, some of us quite barefoot, and all of us footsore and weary. Next morning, June thirtieth, at nine o'clock, we were up and away again, on the road leading towards Gettysburg, they say. After crossing the line between Maryland and Pennsylvania, where the colonel halts the column for a moment, in order that we may give three rousing cheers for the old Keystone State, we march perceptibly slower, as if there were some impediment in the way. There is a feeling among the men that the enemy is somewhere near. Toward noon we leave the public road, and taking across the fields, form in line of battle along the rear of a wood, and pickets are thrown out. There is an air of uncertainty and suspicion in the ranks as we look to the woods, and consider what our pickets may possibly unmask there. But no developments have yet been made when darkness comes, and we bivouac for the night behind a strong stone wall. Passing down along the line of glowing fires, in the gathering gloom, I come on one of my company messes, squatting about a fire, cooking supper. Joe Gutelius, corporal and color guard from our company, is superintending the boiling of a piece of meat in a tin can, while Sam Rule and his brother Joe are smoking their pipes nearby. Boys, it begins to look a little dubious, don't it? Where is Jimmy Lucas? He's out on picket in the woods yonder. Yes, Harry, it begins to look a little as if we were about to stir the Johnnies out of the brush, says Joe Gutelius, throwing another rail on the fire. If we do, says Joe Rule, Remember that you have the post of honor, Joe, and if any man pulls down that flag, shoot him on the spot. Never you fear for that, answers Joe Gutelius. We of the color guard will look out for the flag. For my part, I'll stay a dead man on the field before the colors of the 150th are disgraced. You'll have some tough tussling for your colors, then, says Sam. If the Louisiana Tigers get after you once, look out. Who's afraid of the Louisiana Tigers? I'll back the bucktails against the Tigers any day. Say and take supper with us, Harry. We're going to have a feast tonight. 
I have the heart of a beef boiling in the can yonder, and it is done now. Sit up, boys, get out your knives and fall to. We're going to have a boiled lion heart for supper, Harry, says Joe Rule with mock apology for the fare. But we couldn't catch any lions. They seem to be scarce in these parts. Maybe we can catch a tiger tomorrow, though. Little do we think, as we sit thus cheerily talking about the blazing fire behind the stone wall, that it is our last supper together, and that ere another nightfall, two of us will be sleeping in the silent bivouac of the dead. Colonel, close up your men and move on as rapidly as possible. It is the morning of July 1st, and we are crossing a bridge over a stream, as the staff officer, having delivered this order for us, dashes down the line to hurry up the regiments in the rear. We get up on a high range of hills, from which we have a magnificent view. The day is bright, the air is fresh and sweet with the scent of the new mown hay, and the sun shines out of an almost cloudless sky. And as we gaze away off yonder down the valley to the left, look, do you see that? A puff of smoke in midair, very small and miles away, as the faint and long-coming boom of the exploding shell indicates. But it means that something is going on yonder, away down in the valley, in which, perhaps, we may have a hand before the day is done. See? Another! And another! Faint and far away comes the long-delayed boom, boom, echoing over the hills, as a staff officer dashes along the lines with orders to double-quick, double-quick. Four miles of almost constant double-quicking is no light work at any time, least of all on such a day as this memorable first day of July, for it is hot and dusty. But we are in our own state now, boys, and the battle is opening ahead, and it is no time to save breath. On we go, now up a hill, now over a stream, now checking our headlong rush for a moment, for we must breathe little. But the word comes along the line again, double-quick and we settle down to it with right good will, while the cannon ahead seems to be getting nearer and louder. There is little said in the ranks, for there is little breath for talking, though every man is busy enough thinking. We all feel, somehow, that our day has come at last, as indeed it has. We get in through the outskirts of Gettysburg, tearing down fences of the town lots and outlying gardens as we go. We pass a battery of brass guns drawn up beside the seminary, some hundred yards in front of which building, in a strip of meadow land, we halt, and rapidly form the line of battle. General, shall we unsling knapsacks? shouts someone down the line to our division general, as he is dashing by. Never mind the knapsacks, boys, it's the state now. And he plunges his spurs into the flanks of his horse, as he takes the stake and rider fence at a leap, and it is away. Unfurl the flags, color guard. Now four, double, colonel, we're not loaded yet. A laugh rungs along the line as, hath the command, load at will, load. The ramrods make their merry music, and at once the word is given. Forward, double quick, and the line sweeps up that rising ground with banners gaily flying, and cheers that run the air. A sight, once seen. Never to be forgotten. I suppose my readers wonder what a drummer boy does in time of battle. Perhaps they have the same idea I used to have, namely, that it is the duty of a drummer boy to beat his drum all the time the battle rages, to encourage the men or drown the groans of the wounded. But if they will reflect a moment, they will see that amid the confusion and noise of battle, there is little chance of martial music being either heard or heeded. Our colonel had long ago given us our orders. You drummer boys, in time of an engagement, are to lay aside your drums and take stretchers and help off the wounded. I expect you to do this, and you are to remember that, in doing it, you are just as much helping the battle along as if you were fighting with guns in your hands. And so we sit down there on our drums and watch the line going in with cheers. Forthwith we get a smart shelling, for there is evidently somebody else watching that advancing line besides ourselves, but they have elevated their guns a little too much, so that every shell passes quite over the line and plows up the meadow sod about us in all directions. Laying aside our knapsacks, we go into the seminary, now rapidly filling with the wounded, this the enemy surely cannot know, or they wouldn't shell the building so hard. We get stretchers at the ambulances, and start out for the line of battle. We can just see our regimental colors waving in the orchard, near a log house about three hundred yards ahead, and we start out for it, I in the lead, and Danny behind. There is one of our batteries drawn up to our left a short distance as we run. It is engaged in a sharp artillery duel with one of the enemies, which we cannot see, although we can hear it plainly enough, and straight between the two our road lies. So up we go. Danny and I had a lively trot, dodging the shells as best we can, till, panting for breath, we set down our stretcher under an apple tree in the orchard, in which, under the brow of the hill, we find the regiment lying, one or two companies being out on the skirmish line ahead. I count six men of Company C lying yonder in the grass, killed, they say, by a single shell. Close beside them lies a tall, magnificently built man, whom I recognize by his uniform as belonging to the Iron Brigade, and therefore probably an Iowa boy. He lies on his back at full length, with his musket beside him calm looking as if asleep, but having a fatal blue mark on his forehead, and the ashen pallor of death on his countenance. Andy calls me away for a moment to look after some poor fellow whose arm is off at the shoulder, and it was just time I got away, too, for immediately a shell plunges into the sod where I had been sitting, tearing my structure to tatters, 
I plow up a great furrow under one of the boys who had been sitting immediately behind me, and who thinks, That was rather close, Javin, wasn't it now? The bullets whistling overhead make pretty music with their ever-varying zip, zip, and we can imagine them so many bees, only they have such a terribly sharp sting. They tell me, too, of a certain cavalryman, Dennis Buckley, 6th Michigan Cavalry it was, as I afterward learned, let history preserve the brave boy's name, who, having had his horse shot under him, and seeing that first-named shell explode in Company C with such disaster, exclaimed, That is the company for me. He remained with the regiment all day, doing good service with his carbine, and he escaped unhurt. Here they come, boys. We'll have to go and add them on a charge, I guess. Creeping close around the corner of the log house, I can see the long lines of gray sweeping up in fine style over the fields, but I feel the colonel's hand on my shoulder. Keep back, my boy. No use exposing yourself in that way. As I get back behind the house and look around, an old man is seen approaching our line through the orchard in the rear. He is dressed in a long blue swallow-tailed coat and high silk hat. Coming up to the colonel, he asks, Would you let an old chap like me have a chance to fight in your ranks, colonel? Can you shoot? inquires the colonel. Oh, yes, I can shoot, I reckon, says he. But where are your cartridges? I've got them here, sir, says the old man, slapping his hand on his trousers pocket. And so old John Burns, of whom every schoolboy has heard, takes his place in the line, and loads and fires with the best of them, and is left wounded and insensible on the field when the day is done. Reclining there under a tree while the skirmishing is going on in front, and the shells are tearing up the sod around us, I observe how evidently hard-pressed is that battery yonder in the edge of the wood, about fifty yards to our right. The enemy's batteries have excellent range on the poor fellows serving it, and when the smoke lifts or rolls away in great clouds, for a moment we can see the men running, and ramming, and sighting and firing, and swabbing, and changing position every few minutes, to throw the enemy's guns out of range a little. The men are becoming terribly few, but nevertheless their guns, with a rapidity that seems unabated, belch forth great clouds of smoke, and send the shells shrieking over the plain. Meanwhile, events occur which give us something more to think of than mere skirmishing and shelling. Our beloved Brigadier General, Roy Stone, stepping out a moment to reconnoiter the enemy's position and movements, is seen by some sharpshooter off in a tree, and is carried severely wounded into the barn. Our Colonel, Langhorn Wister, assumes command of the brigade. Our regiment, facing westward, while the line on our right faces to the north, is observed to be exposed to an enfilading fire from the enemy's guns, as well as from the long line of grey now appearing in full sight on our right. So our regiment must form in line and charge front forward, in order to come in line with the other regiments. Accomplished swiftly, this new movement brings our line at once face to face with the enemy's, which advances to within fifty yards and exchanges a few volleys, but is soon checked and staggered by our fire. Yet now, see, away to our left and consequently on our flank, a new line appears, rapidly advancing out of the woods a half mile away. And there must be some quick and sharp work done now, boys, or between the old foes in front and the new ones on our flank we shall be annihilated. To clear us of these old assailants in front before the new line can swoop down on our flank, our brave colonel, in a ringing command, orders a charge along the whole line. Then, before the gleaming and bristling bayonets of our bucktail brigade as it yells and cheers, sweeping resistlessly over the field, the enemy gives way and flies in confusion. But there is little time to watch them fly, for that new line on our left is approaching at a rapid pace, and, with shells falling thick and fast into our ranks and men dropping everywhere, a regiment must reverse the former movement by changing front to rear and so resume its original position, facing westward, for the enemy's new line is approaching from that direction, and if it takes us in the flank, we are done for. To change front to rear is a difficult movement to execute even on drill, much more so under severe fire, but it is executed now, steadily and without confusion, yet not a minute too soon, for the new line of grey is upon us in a mad tempest of lead, supported by a cruel artillery fire almost before our line can steady itself to receive the shock. However, partially protected by a post and rail fence, we answer fiercely, and with effect so terrific that the enemy's line wavers, and at length moves off by the right flank, giving us a breathing space for a time. During this struggle, there have been many an exciting scene all along the line, as it swayed backward and forward over the field, scenes which we have had no time to mention yet. See yonder, where the colors of the regiment on our right, our sister regiment, the 149th, have been advanced a little to draw the enemy's fire, while our line sweeps on to the charge. There ensues about the flags a wild melee and close hand-to-hand -hand encounter, some of the enemy have seized the colors and are making off with them in triumph, shouting victory. But a squad of our own regiment dashes out swiftly, led to the rescue of the stolen colors by Sergeant John C. Kensill of Company F, who falls to the ground before reaching them, and amid yells and cheers and smoke you see the battle flags rise and fall, and sway hither and thither upon the surging mass as if tossed on the billows of a tempest, until wretched away by strong arms they are borne back in triumph to the line of the 149th. See yonder again! Our colonel is clapping his hand to his cheek, from which a red stream is pouring. 
our Lieutenant Colonel Henry S. Hood Coper, is kneeling on the ground, and is having his handkerchief tied around his arm at the shoulder. Major Thomas Chamberlain and Adjutant Richard L. Ashurst both lie low, pierced with balls through the chest. One lieutenant is waving his sword to his men, although his leg is crushed at the knee. Three other officers of the line are laying over there, motionless now, forever. All over the field are strewn men, wounded or dead, and comrades pause a moment in the mad rush to catch the last words of the dying. Incidents such as these the reader must imagine for himself, to fill in these swift sketches of how the day was won, and lost. Ay, lost, for the balls which have so far come mainly from our front begin now to sing in from our left and right, which means that we are being flanked. Somehow, away off to our right, a half mile or so, our line has given way, and is already on retreat through the town, while our left is being driven in, and we ourselves may shortly be surrounded and crushed, and so the retreat is sounded. Back now along the railroad cut we go, or through the orchard in the narrow strip of woods behind it, with our dead scattered around on all sides, and the wounded crying piteously for help. Harry! Harry! It is a faint cry of a dying man yonder in the grass, and I must see who it is. Why, Willie! Tell me where you are hurt, I ask, kneeling down beside him. And I see the words come hard, for he is fast dying. Here my side, Harry. Tell... Mother... Mother... Poor fellow, he can say no more. His head falls back, and Willie is at rest forever. Ah, now, through that strip of woods, at the other edge of which, with my back against a stout oak, I stop and look at a beautiful and thrilling sight. Some reserves are being brought up, infantry in the center, the colors flying and officers shouting cavalry on the right, with sabers flashing and horses on a trot, artillery on the left, with guns at full gallop sweeping into position to check the headlong pursuit. It is a grand sight and a fine rally, but a vain one. For in an hour we are swept off the field, and are in full retreat through the town. Up through the streets hurries the remnant of our shattered corps, while the enemy is pouring into the town only a few squares away from us. There is a tempest of shrieking shells and whistling balls about our ears. The guns of that battery by the woods we have dragged along, all the horses being disabled. The artillery men load as we go, double-charging with grape and canister. Make way there, men, is the cry and the surging mass crowds close up on the sidewalks to right and left, leaving a long lane down the center of the street through which the grape and canister go rattling into the ranks of the enemy's advance guard. And so, amid scenes which I have neither space nor power to describe, we gain Cemetery Ridge toward sunset, and throw ourselves down by the road in a tumult of excitement and grief, having lost the day through the overwhelming force of numbers, and yet somehow having gained it, too, although, as yet we know it had not, for the sacrifice of our corps has saved the position for the rest of the army which has been marching all day and which comes pouring in over Cemetery Ridge all night long. Aye, the position is saved. But where is our corps? Well may our division general, Doubleday, who early in the day succeeded to the command when our brave Reynolds had fallen, shed tears of grief as he sits there on his horse and looks over the shattered remains of that First Army Corps, for there is but a handful of it left. Of the five hundred and fifty men that marched under our regimental colors in the morning, but one hundred remain. All our field and staff officers are gone. Of some twenty captains and lieutenants, but one is left without a scratch, while of my own company, only thirteen out of fifty-four sleep that night on Cemetery Ridge, under the open canopy of heaven. There is no roll call, for Sergeant Wayne Saul will call the roll no more. Nor will Joe Gutelius, nor Joe Rule, nor McFadden, nor Henning, nor many others of our comrades whom we miss, ever answer to their names again, until the world's last great reveille. End of Section 79 this recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sebastian Levine. Section 80 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States, edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 80. John Burns of Gettysburg, 1863, by Bret Hart. Have you heard the story that gossips tell of Burns of Gettysburg? No? Ah, oh, well. Brief is the glory that hero earns. Briefer the story of poor John Burns. He was the fellow who won renown 
the only man who didn't back down when the rebels rode through his native town, but held his own in the fight next day when all his town's folk ran away. That was in July 63, the very day that General Lee, flower of southern chivalry, baffled and beaten backward reeled from a stubborn mead and a barren field. I might tell how, but the day before, John Burns stood at his cottage door, looking down the village street, where in the shade of his peaceful vine he heard the low of his gathered kine, and felt their breath with incense sweet. Or I might say, when the sunset burned the old farm gable, he thought it turned the milk that fell like a babbling flood into the milk-pale red as blood. Or how he fancied the hum of bees were bullets buzzing among the trees. But all such fanciful thoughts as these were strange to a practical man like Burns, who minded only his own concerns, troubled no more by fancies fine than one of his calm-eyed long-tailed kine. Slow to argue, but quick to act. That was the reason, as some folks say, he fought so well on that terrible day. And it was terrible, on the right, raged for hours the heady fight, thundered the battery's double bass, difficult music for men to face, while on the left, where now the graves undulate like the living waves that all that day unceasing swept, up to the pits the rebels kept. Round shot ploughed the upland glades, sown with bullets, reaped with blades, shattered fences here and there, tossed their splinters in the air. The very trees were stripped and bare. The barns that once held yellow grain were heaped with harvests of the slain. The cattle bellowed on the plain, the turkeys screamed with might and main, and brooding barnfowl left their rest, with strange shells bursting in each nest. Just where the tide of battle turns, erect and lonely, stood old John Burns. How do you think the man was dressed? He wore an ancient long buff vest, yellow as saffron but his best. And buttoned over his manly breast was a bright blue coat with a rolling collar, and large gilt buttons, size of a dollar with tales that the country folk call swaller. He wore a broad-brim bell-crowned hat, white as the locks on which it sat. Never had such a sight been seen for forty years on the village green since old John Burns was a country beau and went to the quiltings long ago. Close at his elbows all that day, veterans of the peninsula, sunburnt and bearded, charged away and striplings downy of lip and shin, clerks that the home guard mustered in, glanced as they passed at the hat he wore, then at the rifle his right hand bore, and hailed him from out their youthful lore with scraps of slangy repertoire. How are you, white hat? Put her through. Your head's level and bully for you. Called him daddy, begged he disclose the name of the tailor who made his clothes. And what was the value he set on those? While Burns, unmindful of jeer and scoff, stood there picking the rebels off, with his long brown rifle and bell-crowned hat, and the swallow tails they were laughing at. Twas but a moment for that respect which clothes all courage their voices checked, and something the wildest could understand spake in the old man's strong right hand and his corded throat and the lurking frown of his eyebrows under the old bell crown, until, as they gazed, there crept an awe through the ranks in whispers, and some men saw, in the antique vestments and long white hair, the past of the nation in battle there. And some of the soldiers since declare that the gleam of his old white hat afar, like the crested plume of the brave Navarre, that day was their oriflamme of war. So raged the battle, you know the rest, how the rebels, beaten and backward pressed, broke at the final discharge and ran, at which John Burns, a practical man, shouldered his rifle and bent his brows, and then went home to his bees and cows. 
That is the story of old John Burns. This is the moral the reader learns. In fighting the battle, the question's whether you'll show a hat that's white or a feather. End of section 80. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Mapstone. Section 81 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln. Delivered at the dedication of the Gettysburg National Cemetery, November 19, 1863. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense we cannot dedicate... We cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it, far above our power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember, what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honoured dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. End of section 81. This recording is in the public domain. Section 82 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 82 Alabama Dressmaking in the Days of the Blockade, 1861-1865 through 1865, by Parthenia Antoinette Haig Before the war, there were in the South but few cotton mills, these were kept running night and day as soon as the Confederate Army was organized, and we were ourselves prevented by the blockade from purchasing clothing from the factories at the north or clothing imported from France or England. The cotton which grew in the immediate vicinity of the mills kept them well supplied with raw material. Yet, notwithstanding the great push of the cotton mills, they proved totally inadequate, after the war began, to our vast need for clothing of every kind. Every household now became a miniature factory in itself, with its cotton, cards, spinning wheels, warping frames, looms, and so on. Wherever one went, the hum of the spinning wheel and the clang of the batten of the loom was borne on the ear. Great trouble was experienced in the beginning to find dyes with which to color our stuffs, but in the course of time, both at the old mills and its smaller experimental factories, which were run entirely by hand, barks, leaves, roots, and berries were found containing coloring properties. I was well acquainted with a gentleman in southwestern Georgia who owned a small cotton mill, and who, when he wanted coloring substances, used to send his wagons to the woods and freight them with a shrub known as myrtle that grew teeming in low, moist places near his mill. This myrtle yielded a nice gray for woolen goods. That the slaves might be well clad, the owners kept, according to the number of slaves owned, a number of Negro women carding and spinning, and had looms running all the time. 
Now and then a planter would be so fortunate as to secure a bale or more of white sheeting and osnobergs from the cotton mills in exchange for farm products, which would be quite a lift, and give a little breathing spell from the almost incessant whir, hum, and clang of the spinning wheel and loom. Wide, unbleached sheeting was also used for making dresses, and when dyed a deep, solid color and tastefully made up, the effect was quite handsome. On one occasion, when Mr. G. had been fortunate in getting a bale of unbleached factory sheeting, Mrs. G. gave to me, to her two oldest daughters and a niece of hers, who was as one of the family, enough of the sheeting to make each one of us a dress. We had to hie us to the woods for coloring matter, to dye as each one pleased. I have often joined with neighbors, when school hours for the day were over, in gathering roots, barks, leaves, twigs, sumac berries, and walnuts for the holes, which dyed wool a beautiful dark brown. Such was the variety we had to choose from, to dye our cloth and thread. We used to pull our way through the deep, tangled woods, by thickly shaded streams, through broad fields, and return laden with the riches of the southern forest. Not infrequently, clusters of grapes mingled with our freight of dyes. The pine tree's roots furnished a beautiful dye, approximating very close to garnet, which color I chose for the sheeting for my dress. A strong decoction of the roots of the pine tree was used. Caparis of our own production was used as the mordant. A cask or some small vessel was set convenient to the dwelling house and partly filled with water, in which a small quantity of salt and vinegar had been mingled. Then pieces of rusty useless iron, such as plows too much worn to be used again, rusty broken nails, old horseshoes, and bits of old chains, were picked up and cast into the cask. The liquid caparis was always ready, and a very good substance we found it to fix colors in cloth or thread. The sheeting for the dress was folded smoothly and basted slightly so as to keep the folds in place. It was first thoroughly soaked in warm soap suds, then dipped into the dye, and afterwards into a vessel containing liquid lye from wood ashes. Then it went again into the dye, then the lye, and so on till the garnet color was the required shade. By varying the strength of the solution, any shade desirable could be obtained. My garnet-colored dress of unbleached sheeting was often mistaken for worsted delaine. Many of the planters in southern Alabama began to grow wool on quite a large scale, as the war went on, and no woolen goods could be had. All the woolen material that could be manufactured at the cotton mills was used to clothe our soldiers— so that all the varied kinds of woolen goods that hitherto had been used with us had now to be of home handmake. In this we achieved entire success. All kinds of woolen goods, flannels both colored and white, plaids of bright colors which we thought equal to the famed Scotch plaids, balmorals which were then in fashion, were woven with grave or gay borders as suited our fancy. Woolen coverlets and blankets were also manufactured. The woolen blankets were at first woven with the warp of cotton thread, but a woman of our settlement improved on that by weaving some blankets on the common house loom, both warp and woof of wool, spun by her own hands. The borders were bright red and blue, of texture soft and yielding. They were almost equal to those woven at a regular woolen mill. The process of weaving all wool blankets with warp and woof hand spun was quite tedious, yet it was accomplished. Various kinds of twilled woolen cloth were also woven. In weaving coverlets, the weaver had the draft before her to guide her in tramping the petals and throwing the design of flower, vine, leaf, square, or diamond on the right side. Beautiful carpets were also made on the same plan as coverlets. Many of the planters, after the shearing of their sheep, used to carry the wool to the nearest cotton mill and have it carted into rolls to facilitate the making of woolen cloth and often large quantities of lint cotton were hauled to the factories to be carted into rolls to be spun at home. But carting rolls by common hand cards was a rather slow and tiresome process. There was some pleasant rivalry as to who should be the most successful in producing the brightest and clearest tinge of color on thread or cloth. Most of the women of southern Alabama had small plats of ground for cultivating the indigo bush, for making indigo blue, or indigo mud as it was sometimes called. The indigo weed also grew abundantly in the wild state in our vicinage. Those who do not care to bother with indigo cultivation used to gather from the woods the weed in the wild state when in season. Enough of the blue was always made either from the wild or cultivated indigo plant. We used to have our regular indigo churnings, as they were called. When the weed had matured sufficiently for making the blue mud, 
which was about the time the plant began to flower. The plants were cut close to the ground. Our steeping vats were closely packed with the weed, and water enough to cover the plant was poured in. The vat was then left eight or nine days undisturbed for fermentation to extract the dye. Then the plant was rinsed out, so to speak, and the water in the vat was churned up and down with a basket for quite a while. Weak lye was added as a precipitate, which caused the indigo particles held in solution to fall to the bottom of the vat. The water was poured off, and the mud was placed in a sack and hung up to drip and dry. It was just as clear and bright a blue as if it had passed through a more elaborate process. The woods, as well as being the great storehouse for all our dye stuffs, were also our drug stores. The berries of the dogwood tree were taken for quinine, as they contained the alkaloid properties of cinchona and Peruvian bark. A soothing and efficacious cordial for dysentery and similar ailments was made from blackberry roots, but ripe persimmons, when made into a cordial, were thought to be far superior to blackberry roots. An extract of the barks of the wild cherry, dogwood, poplar, and wahoo trees was used for chills and agues. For coughs and all lung diseases, a syrup was made with the leaves and roots of the mullein plant, globe flower, and wild cherry tree bark was thought to be infallible. Of course, the castor bean plant was gathered in the wild state in the forest for making castor oil. Many also cultivated a few rows of poppies in their garden to make opium, from which our laudanum was created, and this at times was very needful. The manner of extracting opium from poppies was of necessity crude, in our hedged round situation. It was, indeed, simple in the extreme. The heads or bulbs of the poppies were plucked when ripe, the capsules pierced with a large-sized sewing needle, and the bulbs placed in some small vessel, a cup or saucer would answer, for the opium gum to exude and to become insipated by evaporation. The soporific influence of this drug was not excelled by that of the imported article. Bicarbonate of soda, which had been in use for raising bread before the war, became a thing of the past soon after the blockade began. But it was not long ere someone found out that the ashes of corn cobs possessed the alkaline property essential for raising dough. Whenever soda was needed, corn was shelled, care being taken to select all the red cobs, as they were thought to contain more carbonate of soda than white cobs. When the cobs were burned in a clean, swept place, the ashes were gathered up and placed in a jar or jug, and so many measures of water were poured in according to the quantity of ashes. When needed for bread making, a teaspoonful or tablespoonful of the alkali was used to the measure of flour or meal required. Another industry to which the need of the times gave rise was the making of pottery, which, although not food or clothing, was indispensable. Of course, our earthenware was rough, coarse, and brown, and its enameling would have caused a smile of disdain from the ancient Etruscans. Nevertheless, we found our brown-glazed plates, cups, and saucers, washbowls and pitchers, and milk crocks exceedingly convenient and useful as temporary expedients, as no tin pans could be had, and we were thankful that we could make this homely ware. All in our settlement learned to card, spin, and weave, and that was the case with all the women in the South when the blockade closed us in. Now and then, it is true, a steamer would run the blockade, but the few articles in the line of merchandise that reached us served only as a reminder of the outside world, and of our once great plenty, now almost forgotten, and also more forcibly to remind us that we must depend on our own ingenuity to supply the necessities of existence. Our days of novitiate were short. We soon became very apt at knitting and crocheting useful as well as ornamental woolen notions, such as capes, sacks, van dykes, shawls, gloves, socks, stockings, and men's suspenders. The clippings of lamb's wool were especially used by us for crocheting or knitting shawls, gloves, capes, sacks, and hoods. Our needles for such knitting were made of seasoned hickory or oak wood a foot long or even longer. Lamb's wool clippings, when carded and spun fine by hand and dyed bright colors, were almost the peer of the zephyr wool now sold. To have the hanks spotted or variegated, they were tightly braided or plaited and so dyed. When the braids were unfolded, a beautiful dappled color would result. Sometimes corn husks were wrapped around the hanks at regular or irregular spaces and made fast with strong thread, so that when placed in the dye the encased parts, as was intended, would imbibe little or no dye, and when knit, crocheted, or woven, would present a clouded or dappled appearance. Handsome mittens were knit or crocheted of the same lamb's wool dyed jet black, gray, garnet, or whatever color was preferred. 
a bordering of vines with green leaves and rosebuds of bright colors was deftly knitted in on the edge and top of the gloves various designs of flowers or other patterns were used for gloves and were so skillfully knitted in that they formed the exact representation of the copy from which they were taken for the bordering of capes shawls gloves hoods and sacks the wool yarn was dyed red blue black and green of course intermediate colors were employed in some cases the juice of pokeberries dyed a red as bright as aniline but this was not very good for wash stuffs a strong decoction of the bark of the hickory tree made a clear bright green on wool when alum could be had as mordant sometimes there were those who by some odd chance happened to have a bit of alum there grew in some spots in the woods though very sparsely a weed about a foot and a half high called the queen's delight which dyed a jet black on wool we have frequently gone all of two miles from our home and after a wide range of the woods would perhaps secure only a small armful of this precious weed we did not wonder at the name it was so scarce and rare as well as the only one of all the weeds roots barks leaves or berries that would dye jet black the indigo blue of our make would dye blue of almost any shade required and the hulls of walnuts a most beautiful brown so that we were not lacking for bright and deep colors for borderings here again a pleasant rivalry arose as to who could form the most unique bordering for capes shawls and all such woolen knit or crocheted clothing there were squares diamonds crosses bars and designs of flowers formed in knitting and in crocheting we were our own wool sorters too and after the shearing had our first choice of the fleeces all the fine soft silky locks of wool were selected for use in knitting and crocheting our shoes particularly those of women and children were made of cloth or knit someone had learned to knit slippers and it was not long before most of the women in our settlement had a pair of slippers on the knitting needles they were knit of our homespun thread either cotton or wool which was for slippers generally dyed a dark brown gray or black when taken off the needles the slippers or shoes were lined with cloth of suitable texture the upper edges were bound with strips of cloth of color to blend with the hue of the knitwork a rosette was formed of some stray bits of ribbon or scraps of fine bits of merino or silk and placed on the uppers of the slippers then they were ready for the soles we explored the seldom visited attic and lumber room and overhauled the contents of old trunks boxes and scrap bags for pieces of casimir merino broadcloth or other heavy fine twilled goods to make our sunday shoes as we could not afford to wear shoes of such fine stuff every day home woven jeans and heavy plain cloth had to answer for everyday wear when one was so fortunate as to get a bolt of osnaburgs scraps of that made excellent shoes when colored what is now called the baseball shoe always reminds me of our wartime colored osnaburgs but ours did not have straps of leather like those which crossed the baseball shoe our slippers and shoes which were made of fine bits of cloth cost us a good deal of labor in binding and stitching with colors and thread to blend with the material used before they were sent to the shoemaker to have them sold sometimes we put on the soles ourselves by taking worn-out shoes whose soles were thought sufficiently strong to carry another pair of uppers ripping the soles off placing them in warm water to make them more pliable and to make it easier to pick out all the old stitches and then in the same perforations stitching our knit slippers or cloth made shoes we also had to cut out soles for shoes from our home tanned leather with the sole of an old shoe as our pattern and with an awl perforate the sole for sewing on the upper i was often surprised at the dexterity with which we could join soles and uppers together the shoes being reversed during the stitching and when finished turned right side out again and i smile even now as i remember how we used to hold our self-made shoe at arm's length and say as they were inspected what is the blockade to us so far as shoes are concerned when we can not only knit the uppers but cut the soles and stitch them on each woman and girl her own shoemaker away with bought shoes we want none of them but alas we really knew not how fickle a few months would prove that we were our sewing thread was of our own make spools of coats thread which was universally used in the south before the war had long been forgotten for very fine sewing thread great care had to be used in drawing the strand of cotton evenly as well as finely it was a wearisome task and great patience had to be exercised as there was continual snapping of the fine hand-spun thread from brooches of such spun sewing thread balls of the cotton were wound from two to three strands double according as how coarse or fine thread was needed 
The ball was then placed into a bowl of warm soap suds, and the thread twisted onto a bobbin of corn husks placed on the spindle of the wheel. During the process of twisting the thread, a miniature fountain would be set playing from the thread as it twirled upon the spindle. Bunch thread from the cotton mill, number 12, made very strong sewing thread, but little could we afford of that. It was exceedingly scarce. When the web of cloth, especially that of factory bunch thread, had been woven as closely up as the sleigh and harness could permit the warp openings for the shuttle to pass through, the ends of the weaver's threads, or thrums, generally a yard long when taken from around the large cloth beam, would be cut from the cloth and made into sewing thread. We spent many evenings around the fire if winter time, or lamp if summer weather, drawing the threads singly from the bunch of thrums and then tying together two or three strands, as the thread was to be coarse or fine. It was also wound into balls and twisted in the same manner as other sewing thread. The ball would be full of knots, but a good needleful of thread, perhaps more, could always be had in between the knots. There were rude frames in most people's yards for making rope out of cotton thread, spun very coarse, and quite a quantity of such rope was made on these roperies. A comical incident occurred at one of the rope makings which I attended. One afternoon I had gone out in the yard with several members of the household, to observe the method of twisting the long coil of rope by a windlass attached to one end of the frame after it had been run off the brooches onto the frame. Two of the smaller girls were amusing themselves, running back and forth under the rope while it was being slowly twisted, now and then giving it a tap with their hands as they ducked under it, when, just as it was drawn to its tightest tension, it parted from the end of the frame opposite the windlass, and in its curved rebound caught one of the little girls by the hair of her head. There was music in the air for some little time, for it was quite a task to free her hair from the hard, twisted coils of rope. Our hats and bonnets were of our own manufacture, for those we had at the beginning of the war had been covered anew, made over, turned and changed until none of the original remained. As we had no flowers of sulfur to bleach our white straw bonnets and hats, we colored those we had with walnut hulls and made them light or dark brown as we wished. Then we ripped up our tarlatan party dresses of red, white, blue, or buff, some all gold and silver bespangled, to trim hats with. Neighbor would divide with neighbor the tarlatan for trimming purposes, and some would go quite a distance for only enough to trim a hat. For the plumes of our hats or bonnets, the feathers of the old drake answered admirably, and were often plucked, as many will remember, for that very purpose. Quaker or shaker bonnets were also woven by the women of Alabama, out of the bulrushes that grew very tall in marshy places. Those rushes were placed in the opening of the threads of warp by hand, and were woven the same as if the shuttle had passed them through. Those the width of the warp were always used. The bonnets were cut in shape and lined with tarlatan. The skirt of the shaker was made of single slayed cloth, as we called it. In common woven heavy cloth, two threads of warp were passed through the reeds of the sleigh. For the skirts of our bonnets we wanted the cloth soft and light, Hence, only one thread was passed through the reeds, and that was lightly tapped by the batten. It was then soft and yielding. When the cloth was dyed with willow bark, which colored a beautiful drab, we thought our bonnets equal to those we had bought in days gone by. There was variety enough of material to make hats for both men and women, palmetto taking the lead for hats for Sunday wear. The straw of oats or wheats and corn husks were braided and made into hats. Hats, which were almost everlasting, we used to think, were made of pine straw. Hats were made of cloth also. I remember one in particular of gray jeans, stitched in small diamonds with black silk thread. It was as perfect a hat as was ever molded by the hatter, but the oddness of that hat consisted in its being stitched on the sewing machine with silk thread. All sewing machines in our settlement were at a standstill during the period of the war, as our homemade thread was not suited to machines, and all sewing had to be done by hand. We also became quite skilled in making designs of palmetto and straw braiding and plaiting for hats. Fans, baskets, and mats we made of the braided palmetto, and straw also. Then there was the bonnet squash, known also as the Spanish dish rag, that was cultivated by some for making bonnets and hats for women and children. Such hats presented a fine appearance, but they were rather heavy. Many would make the frame for their bonnets or hats, then cover it with the small white feathers and down of the goose color bright red with the juice of pokeberries, or blue with indigo mud, some of the larger feathers, and on a small wire form a wreath or plume with bright colored and white feathers blended together, 
or if no wire was convenient, a fold or two of heavy cloth or paper doubled, was used to sew the combination of feathers on for wreath, plume, or rosette. Tastefully arranged, this made a hat or bonnet by no means rustic-looking. End of section 82. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 83 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Meg Huskin. General Order Number 11 by G. C. Brigham. Painting page 390. During the Civil War, it was in the border states that the struggle was waged with the greatest ferocity. Missouri had been with difficulty retained by the North, but it was the scene of the operations of several guerrilla bands of Southern sympathizers. In August 1863, Quantrell, the most notorious of the guerrilla leaders, with a company of 300 men, swept across the Kansas border into the abolition town of Lawrence, pillaged and burned the settlement, and killed 140 of its inhabitants. When news of this raid reached Schofield, the Union commander, he wrote General Ewing that since these deeds were connived at by Confederate sympathizers in certain parts of Missouri, quote, it is therefore ordered that the disloyal people of Jackson, Cass, and Bates counties will be given until the blank day of blank to remove from those counties with such of their personal property as they may choose to carry away. At the end of the time named, all houses, barns, provisions, and other property belonging to such disloyal persons, and which can be used to shelter, protect, or support the bands of robbers and murderers which infest those counties, will be destroyed or seized and appropriated to the use of the government. Property situated at or near military posts and in or near towns which can be protected by troops so as not to be used by the bands of robbers will not be destroyed, but will be appropriated to the use of such loyal or innocent persons as may be made homeless by the acts of guerrillas or by the execution of this order. The commanding general is aware that some innocent persons must suffer from these extreme measures, but such suffering is unavoidable and will be made as light as possible. A district of country inhabited almost solely by rebels cannot be permitted to be made a hiding place for robbers and murderers from which to sally forth on their errands of rapine and death, end quote. General Order No. 11, to this effect, was immediately issued by Brigadier General Ewing to be carried out within 15 days. End of Section 83 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Meg Huskin Section 84 of the United States Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke. The United States, Volume 2, Part 12. The End of the Struggle. Historical Note. In 1864, Lincoln was re-elected to the presidency by 212 votes, as against 21 for McClellan, his opponent whose platform declared that the war was a failure and should be ended in his inaugural address delivered in march eighteen sixty five lincoln said neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding with malice towards none with charity for all with firmness in the right as god gives us to see the right let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds 
to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphans to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations the end of the war was close at hand sherman with sixty thousand men had marched from atlanta to savannah cutting a swath sixty miles wide and three hundred in length and destroying the last resources of the confederacy lee's ranks were thinning for in the utter hopelessness of his cause men were deserting by scores he could no longer protect richmond and he withdrew pursued by grant at appomattox court house a little village west of richmond lee surrendered on april ninth eighteen sixty five two weeks later johnston surrendered to sherman in north carolina thus ended the war but the heartfelt joy throughout the north was turned into mourning by the assassination of president lincoln on the fourteenth of april end of section eighty four this recording is in the public domain section eighty five of the united states read for librivox dot org by adrian stevens the battle of the crater petersburg by j d woodward painting page four zero six after his bloody repulse at cold harbour grant ordered an advance upon petersburg as the capture of that city would force the evacuation of richmond the unionists moved slowly the confederates quickly and when the former reached petersburg they found it strongly fortified after losing ten thousand men in several assaults grant settled down for a siege a mine five hundred and twenty feet long was dug under the confederate works and exploded on july thirtieth with terrific force an officer who witnessed the explosion thus describes its effect Quote, it was a magnificent spectacle as the mass of earth went up into the air carrying with it men guns carriages and timbers and spread out like an immense cloud as it reached its altitude so close were the union lines that the mass appeared as if it would descend immediately upon the troops waiting to make the charge little did those men anticipate what they would see upon arriving there at the crater an enormous hole in the ground about thirty feet deep sixty feet wide and a hundred and seventy feet long filled with dust great blocks of clay guns broken carriages projecting timbers and men buried in various ways some up to their necks others to their waists and some with only their feet and legs protruding from the earth End quote. a regiment of confederates was destroyed by the explosion but the union troops who poured into the crater expecting that the works could now be easily taken were signally disappointed as the confederates quickly rallied and drove them back after a desperate struggle with a loss of more than four thousand men. End of section eighty five. This recording is in the public domain. Section eighty six of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Valerie Marino. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 86, The Day of the Evacuation of Richmond, 1865, by Morris Schaff. Sunday, and the bells were calling the people to worship. Old and noted Richmond families uncovered at the door and reverently sought their pews at St. Paul's. Seven out of ten of the women were in mourning. In the solemn quiet sat the aged fathers their hair falling white, and many a mother with high-bred face sorrowing for the boys who would never come home. There, in the subdued light of the sanctuary, they sat, while the bells, which had clanged so joyfully at the birth of the Confederacy, 
reluctantly and sadly boomed their final notes, as if they already knew what the congregation little expected, that when they should ring again on the next Sunday at that very hour, the Confederacy would be on its deathbed, breathing its last. Jefferson Davis, president of the ill-fated cause above middle height, lithe, distinguished, neatly arrayed in gray, came up the center aisle with modest, dignified quietude of manner, entered his pew on the right, and bowed his head in prayer. His spare, austere face showed the effects of four years of care, as well it might, for whoever faced a longer and fiercer tempest. But he carried with him to St. Paul's, as everywhere, his habitual atmosphere of invincible courage and the never-failing bloom of urbanity. The organ droned the last of the colorless vinetti, and the service began. Along the sunshiny side of the empty streets, here and there, convalescents from the hospital sauntered, pale, some armless and some on crutches. On its staff above the roof of the nearby capital, the flag of the Confederacy drooped in the mild sunshine, the stars of its blue saltier shining from its folds above steeple and chimney, and over the springtime gladness of the fields. Out in Hollywood, where Stuart lay with so many of the best and the bravest, and where Mr. Davis's dust is now resting, the robins, sparrows, catbirds, redbirds, turtle doves, and mockingbirds were building their nests among the evergreens and native trees. Over the rapids, at the foot of the knolls of Hollywood, the stately James flowed murmuring by the shores of Belle Isle and the baleful walls of Libby Prison, from whose dreary grated windows looked hollow-eyed half-starved northern prisoners of war, who, as they heard the bells of Richmond ringing, no doubt recalled the bells of home and longed for release and peace. It was Communion Sunday, and the sacred elements covered with a white cloth were on the table. Dr. Charles Mingerod, the rector of St. Paul's, a diminutive, fervid, transplanted German, was delivering his usual tense, extemper address, when the sexton, a portly man, with ruffles at his wrist and bosom, and polished brass buttons on a faded suit of blue, advanced up the aisle with soft but stately tread, and after touching the president on the shoulder with solemnity becoming his station and his one day in the week lofty importance, condescendingly handed him a message. Mr. Davis threw his blue-gray eyes rapidly over the fatal dispatch. He grasped his soft, creamy white hat, rose and withdrew calmly. Hardly had he left the door before the sexton again marched up the aisle, and bending spoke to General Joseph Anderson, who at once took his leave. Then followed two more grand entries, and I think the Confederacy, though weighing her cheek, smiled faintly, for like everything born in America, she must have had a sense of humor. Heaven be blessed for the gift, and I hope they buried the dignified sexton in his ruffled shirt and suit of blue with brass buttons in due pomp. Peace to his clay wherever it lies. At his fourth presageful march up the aisle again with a message to a prominent official, anxiety seized the congregation, and like alarmed birds they rose at once and left the church, and not until the bewildered people cleared the door and mingled with the throng that had already gathered in the modest vestibule and on the pavement was the purport of the message to Mr. Davis revealed. There, in consternation, they saw government employees of a department that occupied an opposite building, frantically carrying bundles of public documents out into the middle of the street and setting them on fire. Then the appalling significance of it all broke on them, and they melted away to their homes in dread and anguish. The smoke of the burning records soon became the breath of panic, and by the time the sun went down and twilight came on, the city was in tragic confusion. Lee's lines were broken, and Richmond was to be evacuated that night. End of section 86. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Valerie Marino. Section 87 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 87. Carrying a Message to General Lee by John S. Wise. 
on the morning of april sixth eighteen sixty five mounted upon as fine a mare as there was in the confederacy i sallied forth in search of general lee i started northward for the south side railroad it was not long before i heard cannon to the northeast thinking that the sounds came from the enemy in the rear of lee i endeavored to bear sufficiently westward to avoid the union forces seeing no sign of either army i was going along leisurely when a noise behind me attracted my attention turning in my saddle i saw at a distance of several hundred yards the head of a cavalry command coming from the east and turning out of a cross-road that i had passed into the road that i was travelling they saw me and pretended to give chase but their horses were jaded and my mare was fresh and swift the few shots they fired went wide of us and i galloped out of range quickly and safely my filly after her spin was meddlesome and as i held her in hand i chuckled to think how easy it was to keep out of harm's way on such a beast but this was not to be my easy day i was rapidly approaching another road which came into my road from the east i saw another column of union cavalry filing into my road and going in the same direction that i was going here was a pretty pickle we were in the woods did they see me to be sure they did of course they knew of the parallel column of their own troops which i had passed and i think they first mistook me for a friend but i could not ride forward i should have come upon the rear of their column i could not turn back the cavalry force behind was not a quarter of a mile away i stopped thus disclosing who i was several of them made a dart for me several more took shots with their carbines and once more the little mare and i were dashing off this time through the woods to the west what a bird she was that little mare at a low fence in the woods she did not make a pause or blunder but cleared it without turning a hair i resolved now to get out of the way for it was very evident that i was trying to reach general lee by riding across the advance columns of sheridan who was on lee's flank going at a merry pace just when my heart was ceasing to jump and i was congratulating myself upon a lucky escape i was struck flat aback as sailors say from behind a large oak a keen racy-looking fellow stepped forth and levelling his cavalry carbine called halt he was not ten feet away halt i did it is all over now thought i for i did not doubt that he was a jesse scout that was the name applied by us to union scouts who disguise themselves in our uniform he looked too neat and clean for one of our men the words i surrender were on my lips when he asked who are you i had half a mind to lie about it but i gave my true name and rank what the devil are you doing here then he exclaimed his whole manner changing i told him if that is so said he lowering his gun to my great relief i must help to get you out the yankees are all around us come on he led the way rapidly to where his own horse was tied behind some cedar bushes and mounting bade me follow him he knew the woods well as we rode along i ventured to inquire who he was curtis said he one of general rooney lee's scouts i have been hanging on the flank of this cavalry for several days they are evidently pushing for the high bridge to cut the army off from crossing there after telling him of my adventure i added you gave me a great fright i thought you were a yankee sure and came near telling you that i was one it is well you did not i am taking no prisoners on this trip he rejoined 
tapping the butt of his carbine significantly there they go said he as we came to an opening and saw the union cavalry winding down a red clay road to the north of us travelling parallel with our own route we must hurry or they'll reach the flat creek ford ahead of us fitz lee is somewhere near here and they'll be fun when he sees them there are not many of them and they are pressing too far ahead of their main column after a sharp ride through the forest we came to a wooded hill overlooking the ford a flat creek a stream which runs northward entering the appomattox near high bridge wait here a moment said curtis let me ride out and see if we are safe going on to a point where he could reconnoitre he turned back rose in his stirrups waved his hand and crying come on quick galloped down the hill to the ford i followed but he had not accurately calculated the distance the head of the column of union cavalry was in sight when he beckoned to me and made his dash they saw him and started toward him as i was considerably behind him they were much nearer to me than to him he crossed safely but the stream was deep and by the time i was in the middle my little mare doing her best with the water up to her chest the yankees were in easy range making it uncomfortable for me the bullets were splashing in the water all around me i threw myself off the saddle and nestling close under the mare's shoulder i reached the other side unharmed curtis and a number of pickets stationed at the ford stood by me manfully the road beyond the ford ran into a deep gully and made a turn behind the protection of this turn curtis and the pickets opened fire upon the advancing cavalry and held them in check until i was safely over when my horse trotted up with me wet as a drowned rat it was time for us all to move on rapidly in the afternoon i heard fitzley pouring hot shot into that venturesome body of cavalry and i was delighted to learn afterward that he had given them severe punishment curtis advised me to go to farmville where i would be beyond the chance of encountering more union cavalry and then to work eastward toward general lee i had been upset by the morning's adventures and i was somewhat demoralized about a mile from farmville i found myself to the west of a line of battle of infantry formed on a line running north and south moving toward the town not doubting they were union troops i galloped off again and when i entered farmville i did not hesitate to inform the commandant that the yankees were approaching the news created quite a panic artillery was put in position and preparations were made to resist when it was discovered that the troops i had seen were a reserve regiment of our own falling back in line of battle to a position near the town i kept very quiet when i heard men all about me swearing that any cowardly panic-stricken fool who would set such a report afloat ought to be lynched i had now very nearly joined our army which was coming directly toward me early in the afternoon the advance of our troops appeared how they straggled and how demoralized they seemed eastward not far from the flat creek ford a heavy fire opened and continued for an hour or more as i afterward learned fitz lee had collided with my cavalry friends of the morning and seeing his advantage had availed himself of it by attacking them fiercely to the north about four o'clock a tremendous fire of artillery and musketry began and continued until dark i was riding toward this firing with my back to farmville very heavy detonations of artillery were followed time and again by crashes of musketry it was the battle of sailor's creek the most important of those last struggles of which grant said there was as much gallantry displayed by some of the confederates in these little engagements as was displayed at any time during the war notwithstanding the sad defeats of the past weeks my father's command was doing the best fighting of that day when ewell and curtis lee had been captured when pickett's division broke and fled when bushrod johnson his division commander left the field ingloriously my fearless father bareheaded and desperate led his brigade into 
action at sailor's creek and though completely surrounded cut his way out and reached farmville at daylight with the fragments of his command it was long after nightfall when the firing ceased we had not then learned the particulars but it was easy to see that the contest had gone against us the enemy had in fact at sailor's creek stampeded the remnant of pickett's division broken our lines captured six general officers including generals ewell and curtis lee and burned a large part of our wagon trains as evening came on the road was filled with wagons artillery and bodies of men hurrying without organization and in a state of panic toward farmville i met two general officers of high rank and great distinction who seemed utterly demoralized and they declared that all was lost that portion of the army which was still unconquered was falling back with its face to the foe and bivouacked with its right and left flanks resting upon the appomattox to cover the crossings to the north side near farmville upon reaching our lines i found the divisions of field and mahone presenting an unbroken and defiant front passing from camp to camp in search of general lee i encountered general mahone who told me where to find general lee he said that the enemy had knocked hell out of pickett but he added savagely my fellows are all right we are just waiting for em and so they were when the army surrendered three days later mahone's division was in better fighting trim and surrendered more muskets than any other division of lee's army it was past midnight when i found general lee he was in an open field north of rice's station and east of the high bridge a campfire of fence rails was burning low colonel charles marshall sat in an ambulance with a lantern and a lap desk he was preparing orders at the dictation of general lee who stood near with one hand resting on a wheel and one foot upon the end of a log watching intently the dying embers as he spoke in a low tone to his amanuensis touching my cap as i rode up i inquired general lee yes he replied quietly and i dismounted and explained my mission he examined my autograph order from mr davis and questioned me closely concerning the route by which i had come he seemed especially interested in my report of the position of the enemy at burkeville and westward to the south of his army then with a long sigh he said i hardly think it is necessary to prepare written dispatches in reply they may be captured the enemy's cavalry is already flanking us to the south and west you seem capable of bearing a verbal response you may say to mr davis that as he knows my original purpose was to adhere to the line of the danville road i have been unable to do so and am now endeavouring to hold the south side road as i retire in the direction of lynchburg have you any objective point general any place where you contemplate making a stand i ventured timidly no said he slowly and sadly no i shall have to be governed by each day's developments then with a touch of resentment and raising his voice he added a few more sailors creeks and it will all be over ended just as i have expected it would end from the first i was astonished at the frankness of this avowal to one so insignificant as i it made a deep and lasting impression on me it gave me an insight into the character of general lee which all the books ever written about him could never give it elevated him in my opinion more than anything else he ever said or did it revealed him as a man who had sacrificed everything to perform a conscientious duty against his judgment he had loved the union he had believed secession was unnecessary he had looked upon it as hopeless folly yet at the call of his state he had laid his life and fame and fortune at her feet and served her faithfully to the last after another pause during which although he spoke not a word and gave not a sign i could discern a great struggle within him he turned to me and said you must be very tired my son you have had an exciting day go rest yourself and report to me at farmville at sunrise i may determine to send a written dispatch the way in which he called me my son made me feel as if i would die for him hesitating a moment i inquired general can you give me any tidings of my father your father he asked who is your father general wise ah said he with another pause no no at nightfall his command was fighting obstinately at sailor's creek 
surrounded by the enemy i have heard nothing from them since i fear they were captured or or worse to these words spoken with genuine sympathy he added your father's command has borne itself nobly throughout this retreat you may well feel proud of him and of it my father was not dead at the very moment when we were talking he and the remnant of his brigade were tramping across the high bridge feeling like victors and he bareheaded and with an old blanket pinned around him was chewing tobacco and cursing bushrod johnson for running off and leaving him to fight his own way out i found a little pile of leaves in the pine thicket and laid down in the rear of field's division for a nap fearing that somebody would steal my horse i looped the reins around my wrist and the mare stood by my side we were already good friends just before daylight she gave a snort and a jerk which nearly dislocated my arm and i awoke to find her alarmed at field's division which was withdrawing silently and had come suddenly upon her warned by this incident i mounted and proceeded toward farmville to report as directed to general lee for further orders north of the stream at farmville in the forks of the road was the house then occupied by general lee on the hill behind the house to the left of the road was a grove seeing troops in this grove i rode in inquiring for general lee's headquarters the troops were lying there more like dead men than live ones they did not move and they had no sentries out the sun was shining upon them as they slept i did not recognize them dismounting and shaking an officer i woke him with difficulty he rolled over sat up and began rubbing his eyes which were bloodshot and showed great fatigue hello john said he in the name of all that is wonderful where did you come from it was lieutenant edmund r bagwell of the forty sixth the men a few hundred in all were the pitiful remnant of my father's brigade have you seen the old general asked ned he's over there oh we have had a week of it yes this is all that is left of us john the old man will give you thunder when he sees you when we were coming on last night in the dark he said thank god john is out of this dick why dick was captured yesterday at sailor's creek he was riding the general's old mare maggie and she squatted like a rabbit with him when the shells began to fly she always had that trick he could not make her go forward or backward you ought to have seen dick belaboring her with his sword but the yanks got him and ned burst into a laugh as he led me where my father was nearly sixty years old he lay like a common soldier sleeping on the ground among his men we aroused him and when he saw me he exclaimed well by great jehoshaphat what are you doing here i thought you at least were safe i hugged him and almost laughed and cried at the sight of him safe and sound for general lee had made me very uneasy i told him why i was there where is general lee he asked earnestly springing to his feet i want to see him again i saw him this morning about daybreak i had washed my face in a mud puddle and the red mud was all over it and in the roots of my hair i looked like a comanche indian and when i was telling him how we cut our way out last night he broke into a smile and said general go wash your face the incident pleased him immensely for at the same time general lee made him a division commander a promotion he had long deserved for gallantry if not for military knowledge no dick is not captured he got out i'm sure said he as we walked down the hill together he was separated from me when the enemy broke our line he was not writing maggie i lent her to frank johnson he was wounded and remembering his kindness to your brother jennings the day he was killed i tried to save the poor fellow and told him to ride maggie to the rear dick was riding his black horse i know it when the yankees advanced a flock of wild turkeys flushed before them and came sailing into our lines i saw dick gallop after a gobbler and shoot him and tie him to his saddle bow he was coming back toward us when the line broke and mounted as he was he has no doubt escaped but is cut off from us by the enemy yes the yanks got the bay horse and my servants joshua and smith and all my baggage overcoats and plunder a private soldier pinned this blanket around me last night and i found this tap when i was coming off the field he laughed heartily at his own plight i've never since seen a catchpin half so large as that with which his blanket was gathered at the throat as we passed down the road to general lee's headquarters 
the roads and the fields were filled with stragglers they moved looking behind them as if they expected to be attacked and harried by a pursuing foe demoralization panic abandonment of all hope appeared on every hand wagons were rolling along without any order or system caissons and limber chests without commanding officers seemed to be floating aimlessly upon a tide of disorganization rising to his full height casting a glance around him like that of an eagle and sweeping the horizon with his long arm and bony forefinger my father exclaimed this is the end it is impossible to convey an idea of the agony and the bitterness of his words and gestures we found general lee on the rear portico of the house that i have mentioned he had washed his face in a tin basin and stood drying his beard with a coarse towel as we approached general lee exclaimed my father my poor brave men are lying on yonder hill more dead than alive for more than a week they have been fighting day and night without food and by god sir they shall not move another step until somebody gives them something to eat come in general said general lee soothingly they deserve something to eat and shall have it and meanwhile you shall share my breakfast he disarmed every thing like defiance by his kindness it was but a few moments however before my father launched forth in a fresh denunciation of the conduct of general bushrod johnson in the engagement of the sixth i am satisfied that general lee felt as he did but assuming an air of mock severity he said general are you aware that you are liable to court-martial and execution for insubordination and disrespect towards your commanding officer my father looked at him with lifted eyebrows and flashing eyes and exclaimed shot you can't afford to shoot the men who fight for cursing those who run away shot i wish you would shoot me if you don't some yankee probably will within the next twenty-four hours growing more serious general lee inquired what he thought of the situation situation said the bold old man there is no situation nothing remains general lee but to put your poor men on your poor mules and send them home in time for spring ploughing this army is hopelessly whipped and is fast becoming demoralized these men have already endured more than i believe flesh and blood could stand and i say to you sir emphatically that to prolong the struggle is murder and the blood of every man who is killed from this time forth is on your head general lee this last expression seemed to cause general lee great pain with a gesture of remonstrance and even of impatience he protested oh general do not talk so wildly my burdens are heavy enough what would the country think of me if i did what you suggest country be damned was the quick reply there is no country there has been no country general for a year or more you are the country to these men they have fought for you they have shivered through a long winter for you without pay or clothes or care of any sort their devotion to you and faith in you have been the only things which have held this army together if you demand the sacrifice there are still left thousands of us who will die for you you know the game is desperate beyond redemption and that if you so announce no man or government or people will gainsay your decision that is why i repeat that the blood of any man killed hereafter is upon your head general lee stood for some time at an open window looking out at the throng now surging by upon the roads and in the fields and made no response then turning his attention to me he said cheerfully that he was glad my father's plight was not so bad as he had thought it might be at the time of our conversation the night before after a pause he wrote upon a piece of paper a few words to the effect that he had talked with me and that i would make a verbal report if occasion arose he would give further advices this said he you will deliver to the president i fear to write lest you be captured for those people are already several miles above farmville you must keep on the north side to a ford eight miles above here and be careful about crossing even there he always referred to the enemy as those people then he bade me adieu and asked my father to come in and share his breakfast i hugged my father in the presence of general lee and i saw a kindly look in his eyes as he watched us remembering that my father had no horse i said take my mare i can easily get another what said he laughing a dispatch bearer giving away his horse no sir that is too pretty a little animal to make a present to a yankee 
i know they will bag us all horse foot and dragoons before long no i can walk as well as anybody have you any chewing tobacco i was immensely flattered at this request and gave him a plug of excellent tobacco it was the first time that he had recognized me as entitled to the possession of all the modern improvements of a soldier and so i left them as i rode along in search of the ford to which general lee had directed me i felt that i was in the midst of the wreck of that immortal army which until now i had believed to be invincible End of section eighty seven this recording is in the public domain